you are live now ma'am right good morning everyone i welcome you all to the first session of day 2 of aios uc forum 2022 Uh, this we've got a, a lineup of amazing sessions today, and I hope you all enjoy them as much as we enjoyed putting it all together. So the first session is beginning right now. Uh, it is about the extraordinary resident. What will make a resident stand out in his residency, which will set the tone for his or her future career in ophthalmology. so we have a host of great speakers who have put in their thoughts to uh, formulate talks and topics about uh, amazing uh, issues that residents face and it is a very diverse program and uh, we are really looking forward to what each of you has to say our first speaker is uh, dr rajat shrivastava Dr. Rajat is um, associate professor in KGMU Lucknow. Uh, he has done his uh, uh, post graduation from RP Center Ames, and currently he is in charge of the glaucoma sub specialty in KGMU Lucknow. He is actively involved in teaching and research activities related to glaucoma at the state and national level. His topic is knowing the residency program, the expected and unexpected. looking forward to hearing from dr rajat please share your screen thank you uh, a very good morning to all of you and nice to see you all on a sunday morning uh at the outset i would like to thank uh, the all india ophthalmology society and also the young ophthalmology society of india to have given me this opportunity this platform to connect with you all today so residency training the residency program becomes a very crucial part of our professional lives in fact it is the first time when we are getting initiated to the nitty gritties of our sub specialty and uh, what i have realized is unfortunately at that point of time when we are getting exposed to the maze of residency we are not truly aware of what exactly we are supposed to do in it or what do we expect out of the residency program so the entire purpose of this program is to familiarize you with the terrain of the residency program so that we can all achieve the desired outcomes so let's begin with the very beginning now all of us would be very familiar with the happy memories which we have you know all the congratulatory Uh, messages they start pouring in once we clear our entrance examination, and it's just all lovely at that point of time. And the moment you join your residency program and you see all those experienced, accomplished surgeon working around you, you feel awesome because you know that in a period of time, maybe after the end of your residency, you might be in their shoes, and soon you start believing that your dreams are shifting into realities and. Uh, suddenly you find that the sky is bright the horizons are absolutely clear and you love it it's just a matter of three more years fast forward three more years now this is what i am afraid of it's a thing which we often come across people land up at a situation after completing their residency where they were not supposed to be in the first place there are times when you really don't know how do you land it over there this is not the train you were actually boarded for the destination is very different to what your ticket was for and this is concerning it is almost like swallowing a bitter pill of disillusion so uh, what i've seen that this kind of a situation i thought could have been unique to some individual but no i think a lot of us do have some issues once we finish our residency because what we realize at the end of residency is that the residency just happened to us we didn't do the residency and this concern has also been raised a lot by our past researcher our seniors who have tried to voice their concern who have tried to put in their efforts to show what are the deficiencies in our residency program and what steps should be taken in order to provide a wholesome experience to the entire residency program in the country the national medical council uh as well known as the indian medical council uh medical council of india has actually put in a lot of hard work they have actually brainstormed with our uh, 
with this revised curriculum for the residency program and and, and they have actually posted a document like this online the thing is that uh, not long time ago, I was aware that such a document actually exists, which is kind of a blueprint to the entire residency program. And maybe had I been aware of such a program initially, or the residents were aware of it initially, then things could have been a little better. And so the, the objective of today's talk is that I'll be taking up clues from these documents, the link to which I have mentioned at the end of my presentation. And I would highlight some of the important aspects of a residency program with the hope that this would help not only the students, but also the teachers in, in uh, enhancing the experience of residency program. So let's see how, what are the salient features of a residency program. The first thing which I would like to put across to our residents is residency program is unlike anything we have experienced in the past. It's, it's not like the kind of teaching which we have been exposed to in a school and colleges, which are primarily teacher oriented. Residency program is a situation where you don't have teachers or you are not students. You have facilitators and you have learners. So both of you are at similar plane and it's a mutual learning experience. The facilitator is going to facilitate your learning process, but that learning process has to be initiated by the learner itself. Unlike the previous exposures which we have, wherein the teacher gives you an absolute truth and you can fly it and you can, uh, you know, uh, just blindly follow. That's not how the residency program will actually work. We keep complaining for those things, but we have to understand that we are in a different environment altogether and that is not actually expected out of it. It is an adult learning program wherein the... <clears throat> Objectives are based around the learner. You are the one who would be actually initiating the process and your teachers, your facilitator would be the one who, who would be uh, facilitating. This. So it's a continuous learning process and herein you will learn with experiences. So that is the first point which we need to understand about our residency program. It's not like the ones which we have seen in our schools and colleges. The next and another most important point which we need to understand is what is the goal of this residency program? See, nobody uh, prepares somebody to be a Sachin Tendulkar. Okay, you don't expect that you train and you are as good as what Sachin Tendulkar was at 200 matches. You, but what we definitely aim is what he was at the time of his debut. And similarly, when it comes to a residency program, we don't aim to produce masterful surgeons or clin clinicians. Definitely not. But what do we aim for? We aim to produce a good specialist who has a sound knowledge of subject and who can provide to the needs of the community while working within the frameworks of his professional ethics. Now, that is what we want. We want a person, a resident trained, to be a blend of a good clinician. He should be a teacher and should also have some teaching experience, some teaching qualities as well. So you see, the residency program is actually kind of <clears throat> a math stick. It is something which will in a, which will uh, flame the uh, the process of uh, scientific curiosity, the the process of continuous learning, and the ability to adopt to the best practices over time when you deal with patients. So that is what we want to impart in a person. We want him to get the uh, the foundation strong enough <coughs> and as robust that uh, he is well exposed to the understanding of the subject and then he can apply those, build on those, uh, on those uh, foundation and then maybe build a structure the way he wants, okay? So if you understand that you are not going to be an accomplished person at the end of residency, that is something which will happen over a period of time. If you have that thing in your mind, you can focus on what you are supposed to. So we know what is the goal of our residency program. But then how do we achieve such a goal? And a lot of work has been done there as well. It is a well-known fact that our residency program is a competency-based program. And what do we mean by competencies? There are small little skills, small little things which we need to learn over a period of residency. And if you end up learning each of the competency, you would end up being a well-trained Postgraduate, whether it, in, whether it is in ophthalmology or elsewhere. 
So you would be surprised to know that a lot of work has been done to, to actually make large number of competencies out of the ophthalmology curriculum. So in our residency program, which we have, the documents actually outlines all competencies. All you need to do is make sure that you end up initiating the learning process in each one of them and learn it over a period of time. This applies both for the facilitator as well as for the learner. The facilitators need to see whether the competencies mentioned in here are being picked up by the learners and learners need to put in efforts to get those competencies. So there can be a, a direct communication between the learners and the facilitators and both of them can actually monitor the progress. And if you can find any deficiencies in the process, you can put in timely intervention to enhance <clears throat> the learning process. So competency, uh, knowing uh, about the competency is equally important because it becomes a self-directed learning uh, in the long run. And because it is a self-directed learning, it becomes even more important for the learners to know what exactly they're supposed to do. So I would actually, uh, I can, I'll share the link for this document. I would really urge all our residents and even the teachers to please go through that, uh, through that, through that draft so that you will know about the competencies which we are talking about. And in addition to all the competencies which a person is supposed to learn, it also gives a broad outline of the syllabus and the teaching learning methods and also how we are going to assess these competencies in these uh, students. So we have a very well made uh, residency program provided we get aware about what we are supposed to do. Both the facilitators and the learners, if they're aware of, they can reach the desired outcomes. So that is what we expect out of the program. But expecting is not enough. We have, you know, if you're given something, you want a whole of it. There will be hurdles, no doubt about it. We are living in a diverse population. There will be problem in, in, in actually implementing the program as it is. There will be some challenges, some of them unexpected. We complain of infrastructure, the faculty motivation, patients, opportunities, and so many things. We always find that, you know, greener pastures also. But believe me, Barring a few institutes of national importance, more or less the institutes are of similar types. So you can't just continue whining for things which are not there. If you're aware of what you are supposed to learn, what you need to grab out of the residency program, you can make a change for yourself. You can find a way. Where there's a will, you can make a way and you can actually overcome all these uh, uh, hurdles. Many times we don't even realize how these hurdles are because we don't know what we are actually looking out for. We just believe that, okay, they come in, like we say, residency just happened to us. So you have to overcome these unexpected things that will happen, but that should not deter you from getting the best out of the residency. So what I would like to say is how your residency program would be will actually depend upon the choices you make during your residency. And what kind of choices you ultimately make depends upon the level of your understanding and awareness of the program is about. So I hope that by sensitizing you to a document like this, which is existing in online, that our programs had certain objectives, certain ways to achieve it. If you have that awareness, I'm sure you will make the right choices to, to get it through. You have to understand that it is always going to be a self-directed learning process. So more input you put in, the better output it is going to be. Don't expect just help to come from anywhere, even because if you don't go for it, you won't. Get it. Is yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, I'll just close it in a moment. Just, just a last, just two minutes. So, uh, last thing which I want to say is that in this uh, era of uh, uh, of uh, globalization, communication, and socialization. You can actually resort to online teachings, to UOC platform, to AOS platform, to YouTube's, where you can actually learn the competencies which you find are deficient. You need to collaborate to take the best out of other institutes. And remember that all it takes is a little bit of exploration and discovery by which you can upgrade the experience of your residency program and make it a happy residency. So best wishes and thank you. This was just to sensitize you with what you should can expect. These are the links to the documents. And if there are any further queries, I would be happy to answer them at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajat, for that lovely presentation. And in fact, uh, I would say looking at residency programs in a very different way 
I think this is something that you probably have realized as a faculty once you've gone, gone into that situation. As a resident, you know, for us, it's just what gets passed on from, you know, seniors. I think most of the times we are just looking at them for our inputs and all. But formal documents like this definitely, you know, can, uh, can be a strong guideline for that process. Yes, sir. I mean, you know what you're supposed to do, so it becomes easier for you to do it. Right. And I think, as, I, as you also mentioned, that uh, you know, so there is a, so there are certain institutions where you are, you possibly are able to fulfill all of these parameters. In some places, you'll have to struggle a bit. But I think, on the whole, uh, you know, if we look at it in an open way, and if we look at it, uh, I mean, it's a broad kind of, as you said, the broad uh, objectives of the process. Yes. I suppose that can be fulfilled in, I think, any of the programs, and that I think yes. they, it is ensured by the authorities. Yes. So. Uh, an interesting question to you now, basically. Yes, sir. So what, in your residency program, what was the one unexpected thing that happened that you realized that you probably hadn't thought of? Uh, the unexpected thing which I realized was that uh, I always thought that, okay, uh, I'll tell you one thing very honestly. In RP Center, we follow certain protocols. We know, okay, if we just follow it, things will happen that way and the patient is going to be benefited. And we keep on doing it so many times that it just becomes a spinal reflex. For instance, if we are managing corneal ulcer, we know that you have to scrape, you have to do this and you have to look out for that thing. Many times you don't have any sound knowledge about this is what you were supposed to do. And it just happens to you. And it dawns you at the end of the residency, okay, why you did a particular kind of thing or whether the, what things were missed out on. Uh, so if you have an idea about what you're supposed to do, see, uh, people don't read initially that much. People are not aware of, you know, we keep coming, I have been coming to you asking, okay, which book should I refer to? But the fact is very simple. You have to just pick up any book and start reading it. It is not that you have to read from the bosses to be a boss. You have to read from somewhere and build upon it to become a boss in a period of time. Then uh, the another, uh, uh, since I was in an institute where everything was already well taken care of, so the chances of me coming across something which are unexpected are less. But let's talk of an institute where not everything you are exposed to. Suppose if there is a person who is there in an institute which has absolutely no infrastructure for, say, last sake or, or, or for the recent advancement, then what will that person do? He will just continue seeing what is happening in this uh, his setup. For instance, in, in a setup in Uttar Pradesh, you will see that somebody is just performing SICS routine day in and day out. And that is the only thing that person is doing. So what goes in the mind of the resident is, this is perhaps the only thing which I'm supposed to learn because there's nobody to guide you. And then once you finish your residency and you move out, you realize, okay, there were a lot of things else to which, to which we had to read and to learn. But we didn't know that we are supposed to. And when you realize it, when you go in a conference and you see your colleague is doing something of which you had absolutely no idea about it. So if you, when you're getting to a residency program and you realize, okay, at the end of my residency program, it is not just that I need to be a surgeon who would be performing cataract surgery. I need to be good at in diet of the muscle. I need to know how to do a 90 day examination. And if you are aware of such a thing, at least you will make an effort. You'll tell, you'll ask your teacher, the teacher would assist you in doing it. And if, even if you find that there are deficiencies at your place, you will look for the solutions elsewhere. You can't just find a solution without knowing a problem. So the unexpected issue here is that many times we just don't know what the problem is. We realize all these problems at the end of residency when we ask, hey, mujhe kya dubara comprehensive fellowship karni chahiye. So that imagine somebody going for a comprehensive fellowship at the end of three years of residency, is it justified? by any means of imagination. I'm totally against such a thing that, okay, you have invested three years of your life for doing a thing and then you're planning for a comprehensive. It is a complete failure for all of us as teachers and as a system altogether. And that is what struck me. Okay, let, let us make the student realize, okay, this is what you are entitled for. This is what we are doing for you. This is what you're supposed to learn. And if we cannot fulfill it for you, it won't come otherwise. It wouldn't come. Because unexpected has that un after expected. You don't know what the expected part is altogether. So you just accept everything, whatever comes along. And that is where I want to go in that if a child is going for any uh, residency program, he should be aware of what the outcome which we are wanting him to be. 
and if that outcome is clear there will be less of un unexpected things for instance one very simple thing uh, for psychomotor uh, for skills it is mandatory that the institutes should have a skill lab if the students are aware of it that they need to practice if they cannot practice on patient they need to have skill lab wouldn't they ask for it so yeah, i it think it will the... just go unknown and and i have realized students not knowing having absolutely no no idea about what they are going to do in this aap unko jo bata dijiye wo kar le and that is why we are landing into such topics so we I have to talk about are you seeing like this should be kar lo tum fellow in the beginning something like this should come in the beginning as an orientation of the residency as a you know as a mandate Do you think to yeah, should, and that is what my plan is that we should take our orientation right at the beginning of our residency. Explain them what our objectives are, and then initiate the process. And it will not only help you overcome your deficiencies as an institute, but it will also help the student also to look out for alternatives. Rather, at the end of the surgery, uh, at the end of the okay, I think we'll uh, so the schedule thing is. I'll be happy to answer all the queries at the end as well. No, no, Dr. Yes. Just to share those documents with me, I'll share with it, it amongst our groups as well. Thank so, you. Yeah, thank you for your I, talk. I'll just mail it to you. Thank you for your talk. Indeed, an excellent talk. Thank you. And uh, something that I think all of us have got uh, sensitized to. So, uh, Apurva, the next you'd like to call? Yes. So, uh, thank you uh, for the next talk. I invite Dr. Prithvi Chandrakant. He'll be talking about frugal ophthalmic imaging techniques for residents. i think it's the need of the hour uh, because of the gross imbalance in availability of infrastructure so i invite dr prithvi good morning everybody uh, i'll be talking about an innovative residents uh, the video the video is going to be uh, uh, split into two parts uh, one is the uh, the first part will uh, cover all the needs what a resident uh, how a resident should innovate and the second is uh, innovations which i have done and which could help all the residents and uh, first of all i would like to uh, thank uoc and all india ophthalmic society for giving me this opportunity to talk uh, i'll be playing a video right now hope it's visible the innovative resident there are three terms that sound similar but are very different from each other discover invent and innovate while discover means to obtain sight or knowledge of something for the first time invent means to produce for the first time to the use of imagination or ingenious thinking and experiment innovate means to make changes in something established especially by introducing new methods ideas or products so what is innovation it is an idea that has been transformed into practical reality or a process to bring new ideas new methods or new products to an organization let's take an age old example if not for innovation we would be exchanging monetary medium via barter system in ophthalmology let's take few basic examples diagnostic yeah. innovations in the field of refraction led to the introduction of smartphone refractometers from the plain mirror retinas the evolution of cataract extraction from couching to femtosecond laser due to the innovation in the surgical techniques now the question is why do we need innovation innovation is important to us and the entire society as it can be time saving provide ease better quality affordable accessible and improved version altogether the important questions to the smallest of the idea would be will it make a positive difference the main aim of innovation is to solve a real problem or an unmet need for the development and benefit of the society how can we innovate it is by a thorough understanding through direct observation of what people want and need in their lives and what they like or dislike about the way particular products are made all we need is to find a problem statement with an inquisitive mind and work on it further so now where to find the problem we can find problems everywhere around us but it is important to address the right problem which can benefit both the doctor and the patient 
the problem should address a large audience and should solve real problems as a resident when we start fresh our inquisitive minds can search many such problem statements easily in our daily life work which seems to be often ignored by others who have made peace at these common problems around don't look for a great idea look for a good problem when should you innovate there is no particular date or time to innovate one doesn't need any extra time to search a new problem and find a solution to it it's a part of our daily life and just by focusing on the real problems you can innovate the simplest of solutions so let's stop giving excuses to ourselves and be in constant search or thought of it because these problems are right in front of us we just need to fill the gaps of the jigsaw puzzle now for the main question who can innovate the answer is anyone and everyone we are all different in our own way have our own different creativity or art of doing things we all have certain unknown qualities which we need to find out every person will have a different approach to a certain problem and that's where all of us can innovate in their own possible way people who want to innovate need to make it their priority it should be a skill combined with a will few important lessons that i have learned during my journey of innovation first is to be yourself second stay away from negative people who would always laugh at your ideas be surrounded by positive people who are going to lift you higher mentoring is important it could be anybody like it could be your parents who will support you your friends who will push you for doing new things or your teachers who can guide you with their expertise so always think positive stay away from negativity because they will always hold you back talking about my journey into innovation i was always passionate about photography and was that inquisitive kid since childhood who would just want to create something useful from waste products which would be lying unused i loved to create something new and show it to my friends when i was in school then i met my mentor my friend john sir during my post graduation who saw that i was just focusing on my career and not doing things which i was really passionate about he suggested me to introduce my photography skills into ophthalmology and create something which would make me enjoy my work even more this led to my three innovations which were all related to photography and smartphones those are trash to treasure red cam anti segment photography with intraocular lens and i old school all these instruments were then published in the indian journal of ophthalmology in the section of innovation which would help others make it and use it for ophthalmic imaging my first innovation was trash to treasure red cam 20 cm sanitizer bottle was cut in the bottom to fit the 20d lens and the smartphone attached to the mouth of the bottle and you could take fundus photos once you turn on the flash we used the trash to treasure red cam to see if it was efficient enough to see for diabetic retinopathy screening these were the images taken the upper half was from the tabletop fundus camera and the lower half was from the trash to treasure red cam it was found to be comparable the second innovation was anti segment photography with the intraocular lens here we take a chart paper we cut it into 10 cm into 1.5 cm length and breadth make a fold in the center stick a double sided tape at one end of the folded paper once that is done we use a puncher to make a hole at one end of the paper once the hole is done we remove the double ended tape a intraocular lens of the desired power stuck to the double sided tape the chart paper is folded back to sandwich it in between your aspi is ready the aspi is then taken and aligned in front of the smartphone camera this helps the camera of the phone to be used as a macro lens on it on video mode flashlight is on to take photos and here are few photos taken from the aspi the outreach program called the aroma arvin rural outreach using mobile application was initiated during the covid pandemic which used macro lens attached to smartphone for ophthalmic screening via local volunteers 
who would then share the images to the clinicians at the main center. Aspie, in collaboration with John Hopkins University, developed a concise smartphone device which is now being used in the Aruma project for telescreen. My third innovation on ophthalmic imaging was the Ioloscope. It is very similar to Aspie, but here, instead of one intraocular lens, we use four intraocular lens of 30 diopter power. As you see, we need to glue all the four intraocular lens haptics using Fevicol liquid adhesive. Once that is done, the ioscope is ready to be aligned on the phone. Keeping the slide on the torch, you can take photos of any microorganism. Here are a few photos of fungus taken from the ioscope. We went on to use it during a live surgery. This is a video showing FES being conducted on a patient suspected of mucomycosis and we diagnosed it intraoperatively right at the operating room. This comes to the next innovation that is SLIM, slit lamp based intraocular lens microscope. It is a very simple attachment of ioloscope to the slit lamp. As you can see, the mobile adapter is fixed to the slit lamp. Once the adapter is fixed to the slit lamp, we use the ioloscope to take photos and videos of microorganisms at the OPD. Simple innovations are those which gives you the best results and that is what is a great innovation. If it is a really good idea, you should patent it or if it's not patentable, it should at least be published in a reputed journal. I would like to conclude by saying that innovations are the brick laid by each one of us to lay a foundation that will turn into a beautiful monument in the future. Thank you. Fantastic talk, Dr. Prithvi. Uh, it was very, very cool actually using uh, 430 diopter lenses. That IOL scope was like ultra cool thing to do. Very inspiring. And uh, congratulations. Hearty, hearty congratulations. It was quite thrilling to see your uh, video. Although I really think that the first uh, what is innovation could have been avoided and we, we would like to see more of your innovations. Yes. So, yeah. Anybody has anything to say? Well, I think, uh, you know, that's uh, quite a, I mean, I think the, the whole idea, the thought from having the idea to executing it to, you know, probably, you know, patenting it and you've gone, gone ahead with that process as well. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. We have, uh, I've tried uh, patenting and also if, if not patentable, then I've always uh, published it in IGO innovation section because that has very good reach uh, to uh, Indian residents and all over the world, actually, and getting it targeted to the all ophthalmologists. And uh, all my all my ophthalmic uh, innovations are mostly frugal, which anybody can do it. You just need some five to ten minutes. You can just make it by yourself and then you can uh, use it in OPD. And it, it's very easy to you know do it and execute it. Right. So, could you briefly describe that process of you know how how do you go about uh, you know trying to patent it if you have patented something? I mean, uh, just briefly describe that for all of us. Uh, like I said, all all my products are such that it is a do it yourself concept. So anybody can just do it in their house. So basically, uh, patenting actually requires uh, two things. One is if if you are require if you want uh, a name as a you like you have a patented uh, material in your name so just for fame kind of thing the second thing is if you want to make it into, into a proper business model or you wanted to make a product which is readily available for people so those are the two main things which i feel uh, you re require to patent so if you require to patent uh, you have a lot of people uh, there is a website in which you can actually go all india uh, the Indian government has made a website available where you can uh, submit all the papers uh, required for the uh, uh, product and then you can get it patent, patented or even uh, there are uh, the attorneys who can help you with it. So uh, two, three things that we need to uh, very uh, be clear that is uh, whether you wanted to make it a business model 
uh, and you know uh, make a monetary uh, outcome out of it so if that is a thing then you will have to go for patenting if not then it is it, it takes a lot of energy and money actually and the other thing is i wanted to make it more available for people so the best thing was to publish it and make it available for other people to use it so i didn't uh, have much uh, you know I, i i felt it was it wouldn't be much of a patentable product so i had to publish it that would actually help all the people uh, use it in a much broader way true true i think so uh, i also done couple of patents for some softwares and all and i think there is a whole process and i just want to you shared it quite rightly for all the uh, people even if you got something that you know tomorrow should not get uh, exploited by somebody else then also the patent helps and getting a provisional patent is not very expensive you can at least start with that and then obviously you can go for a permanent patent yeah. and uh, look in your in your own country good is good enough to do but uh, indeed interesting and was there any uh, so before you reached your final product how many tries did you have to make you know how many times did you have to attempt it before you could finally say that oh now it works yeah it uh, each each product actually had you know kind of one to six months of work behind it so first it would be initially it would be an idea a theor- theoretical idea then we'll have to go by you know trying trial and error method and then going by its optics the physics involved in it and slowly come to a, a better product of its own and then even now i keep uh, uh, you know uh, exploring new grounds like the aspi uh, product has actually we have used it for uh, gonioscopy right now so it's in the on the the patent uh, patency and uh, publication process right now so we are exploring new grounds with all these uh, instruments which we have made Uh, recently we even made uh, instruments uh, which could record uh, retinoscopic uh, reflexes which has never been tried before we don't uh, we really don't have any instrument which would actually uh, record the retino- retinoscopy reflex so there are a few other innovations coming up and uh, yeah it's 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 a uh, you know we keep exploring new things each time so it's always a learning process wonderful wonderful so let's i think move on to the next talk now and uh, we have uh, uh, dr mega will be talking about how to ace theory exams again something which is probably very important so over to you right so dr mega has uh, really aced all her exams in her life i think she's got gold medal for her ms exam gold medal for her dnb exam she's been the winner of erudio quiz and she's been given grants to attend conferences in singapore i think we have a stellar uh, person here who's going to tell us exactly how to ace the theory exam so over to you dr megha all the best uh, thank you so much ma'am thank you for the kind introduction i'll just uh, share my screen and requesting all the speakers to just stick to time we are behind schedule already thank yeah you. yeah sure sir Uh, are my slides visible yeah please go ahead yeah uh, so how to ace the uh, theory exams is uh, probably a million dollar question that we all want to know during our residency so first year right as we have joined we all have questions like should i buy all the books or should i read standard books or exam oriented right from beginning or should i read for knowledge or for exams should i read every day or should i start reading articles right from now on so in the first year what are the basics book basic books which i feel you have to buy are the parson's diseases of the eye which is uh, at least the symptomatology in the first few chapters are really good in this kansky's clinical ophthalmology and the ug ak khurana book which you have it's better you just go through it once and the anatomy and physiology of eye by ak khurana these uh, basic sciences books are also necessary uh, this doesn't mean that you need to stick on to these only books and don't get discouraged when you when you start reading bigger books like albert jacobi and people tell you not to read such books it's always good you read from standard books as well so always patient is your first teacher so more the number of patients you see the more you learn so never get uh, don't start cribbing about going to the opd and seeing patients try to do a complete workup of uh, all the patients um, at least when the time permits and once you do the workup uh, discuss it with your seniors as to how the patient has presented and what are the treatment modalities you can do for that patient and then go back and read the theory of that the same day so that that particular case is etched in your mind 
uh, come back the next day and start teaching your juniors the more you teach more and more you learn so not only your juniors if you have undergraduates and paramedicals don't hesitate to take classes for them as well um for refraction in places where most of us have optometrists now we all lag behind this uh, great skill so at least in the mornings when the patient load is less uh, better go and start practicing your refraction uh, for refraction the theory part i feel the duke elder practice of refraction is really good uh, book wherein uh, you can see the uh, even refractive errors have been described in a story like format but of course it would be difficult to write from Uh, for right for exams from this book so for that the elkington is a good book so with the various materials start collecting them right from the first year various notes and uh, ppts and articles like uh, the dos articles and uh, review articles are really great materials which uh, so that in the last moment you don't have to sit and search for which kind of material you need to know start collecting them right from first year nowadays there are various uh, online resources available like the uh, since most of the webinars are occurring uh, online and uh, youtube channels like i focus online are uh, really good sources other than that you have the one network ico e learning i wiki the orb cyber site these are also great resources uh, always be proactive in your classes uh, come prepared for the class uh, i know it would be difficult for most of the classes but at least the uh, important topics and then ask doubts in class and if the seniors or professors have asked you some questions uh, go back and uh, find answers for that don't just leave it off there and then the topic is always forgotten uh, the place where i did my post graduation we used to have a whiteboard wherein uh, all the questions which were unanswered were uh, written on that uh, whiteboard and the next class uh, would start only after those questions had to be i mean it had to be answered only then the class would start uh, attend various quizzes which are available uh attend conferences uh see they'll you'll have a visual memory when you see attend conference so that uh some few rare topics you may be able to gain through that try to present uh, papers and posters as well so uh, you're already in your second year and uh, you've crossed your first year but this would be ideal time to read various reference books like uh, shields or becker shafers krashmer collins and uh, the nema and for dnb students the clinical trials is a sure shot question so it would be good if you have a handbook of clinical trials as well so preparing notes uh, from these reference books it would be difficult to go back in uh, during your exams and go read the whole thing so it's always better you make up notes uh, like this and at the beginning of the notes you can, you can have an index uh, so that uh, at the last moment you can just go and flip to the page you want to the topic you want to uh to the specialty postings uh, plan priorly by talking to fellows and seniors and present cases especially those which are frequently kept for exams uh investigations and interpretation of reports and ot observations so plan priorly by talking to the fellows or the senior residents in that particular uh we there are uh, many institutes which have annual exams or the formative assessment tests for uh, the fat exams in the dnb institutes uh, take this exam seriously and uh, you can also attempt for fic or frcs by your second year the first part in your uh, second year so those of you who are already in your third year and haven't done any of these or haven't found time to do most of the things which i just told uh, thesis is, uh, takes up a major chunk of your uh, time in third year so uh, start planning and uh, fill up your master chart right from first year so that uh, most of the time i mean it, it won't take most time in your uh, third year then prepare question banks if you don't already have one uh, make the question bank uh, topic wise and mark the number of times the particular question has asked has been asked so uh, suppose this terms gone it's been asked five to six times so you'll know which topic you need to concentrate on during your exams and also you can make a short note uh, behind it as to from where you have read that particular topic there are various websites like the eofta.com or dnb websites or your particular uh, university websites to, uh, wherein you can ask your i mean if you can find the question papers preparing for the exams as such there is no single golden book there are multiple books each one of you might find one particular book as uh, more interesting anything like kansky datta zia choudhury or payman Uh, you can make one of these books as your base books like if you're uh, not that great in making notes like i am you can just uh, stick on notes from various uh, other topics and put it on various other books and uh, stick it on to your uh, base book 
suppose you find a particular topic is better in some other book rather than the base book which you have kept make the base book make that particular book as your base book and uh, add topics onto it and just make a note in your uh, uh, question bank as to where you have read that topic from so uh, other than that you can make various uh, stories and mnemonics what i used to do is make them and stick it on the wall especially those volatile uh, topics so that every day morning when i just go through them it will get uh, it will stay in your mind uh one more important thing is practice diagrams uh, if not all it not all of us are very artistic so basic things like eyelid eyelid surgeries the orbit retina anatomy ray diagrams sturm's connard visual pathway so these things uh at least among these at least one or two is a short shot in any of your theory exams so make sure at least the common ones you practice group discussions are also really helpful for you to remember later on then revision is the key as you all know so coming to the day it has come this is a theory exam so stay calm carry all your stationeries like uh, pens color pencils stencils bangles and uh, one rupee coin to make those smaller circles uh, try to write down as many as possible point wise and classify properly if, if you have uh, classifications in that particular answer uh, have flow charts and tables rather than writing paragraphs together underline and diagrams make you need not be really beautiful diagrams but then make correct markings and preferably with pencil and not pen and uh, follow the color coding for uh, the corneal and the retinal diagrams so this is an example of one of my residents you can see it's probably actually supposed to be a ray diagram but it's all wavy and uh, even this diagram it's it's going right from somewhere to somewhere we have no idea what that person is trying to show so for ray diagrams always use scale and pencil and uh, Uh, for you to be correct in that you'll have to practice earlier so this is one more example you can see that there are some small circle and large circle whether the resident is trying to show two right eyes or two left eyes no idea so so simple thing like using a bangle to draw the circle would have made it look much better ma'am on is mein abhi jo is mein hai na ma'am has logged in sorry please mute yourself main ek bari inko wo मैं ये वाला फोटो मैंने जो अभी पॉइंट नोट आउट नोट डाउन किए तो या मैं आपको ये फोटो भेज दूं आप उनको मैम से भेज दोगे मिस्टर शारी सो सो यू जस्ट यू जस्ट से से टू मैम शारी प्लीज म्यूट योरसेल्फ प्लीज शारी प्लीज म्यूट योरसेल्फ सो पॉइंटर्स भेज दीजिए सो शी इज जस्ट प्रिपेयर्ड कि हम मेगा कंटिन्यू कर so just by using a bangle to draw the fundus would have the diagram would have much, looked much better so try to draw as many diagrams as possible that doesn't mean you sit and draw a pig and a taper and even the digestive tract is drawn and uh, uh, blood vessel and even colored it but ultimately she is not drawn the diagram of the fundus in a toxoplasmic uh, question so that doesn't mean you sit and waste time for all these things as well so usually there are various patterns but the usual pattern is of eight questions with 180 marks the key is time management and attempt all the questions that's the most important thing so you by the first star complete the long essays there's a 220 mark questions which is a completed and the rest don't exceed about 16 to 18 minutes and uh, if you feel the particular topic you want to write more leave a page or two empty so that if you have time later on you can come back and uh, fill it up so make a basic format for most questions like for a disease you can make it like incidence it your pathogenesis mm -hmm. then classification then the clinical features uh management in form of investigations medical and surgical and differential diagnosis like there's some format you can so that in the exam you don't have to think what what i have to write next so everything said and done uh, theory exams so how much ever the best you write the um, marks usually hover around the same uh, uh, marks so it's always um, in order to reach that uh, notch Hello. and get the gold medal it is better uh, you have to focus on the practical Hello. exam more so two main books which i would suggest are uh, faqs and uh, ophthalmology clinics for post graduates but then uh, class notes are uh, most important i feel whenever you are attending any of the classes write down whatever the professors or the seniors are asking because whatever they are going to ask you in the class is the same thing what they are going to ask you in the exams as well so uh, ophthalmology is a lifelong learning so exam is just one point wherein it probably to get your degree but you will have to learn lifelong uh so for all the residents who are listening yeah you are welcome and uh, thank you to aos uc opus for this uh, great opportunity thank you thanks so much dr megha that was a wonderful talk very comprehensive i hope everyone goes to the youtube uh, video and watches it multiple times to get uh, you know inspired by you 
So Thank our you. next topic is uh, by Ajinkya Deshmukh, a very good friend of mine. Uh, is he here? Yeah. Yes. Ajinkya uh, uh, is going to talk about uh, a squint case not being the end of the world when you get it in practical exams. I think squint is something everybody uh, is afraid of. So Ajinkya is a uh, uh, president residency. He finished from Prabha Eye Clinic. He did his long term fellowship in Peds of Thal and Strabismus from Melvi Prasad, and he's back in his alma mater as a consultant in pediatric ophthalmology. Go ahead, Ajinkya. Thank you so much, Dr. Apurva. Thank you, AIOS and UOC, for this wonderful opportunity. So I'll directly go to the topic. Bob Dylan said, "Doesn't expecting the unexpected." make the unexpected expected so quite a confusing quote but it is very relevant so we usually hear this yaar mujhe exam mein squint case to nahi aana chahiye but no mind you the first and foremost step expect the squint case in your practicals i tell by my example my experience we were four people who were appearing for practical exams together and two of us got either short or long case in squint so yes there is fairly 50% of the chance that you will get a squint case in your practical exam so yes so now you expect the squint case how to prepare so benjamin franklin said by failing to prepare you are preparing to fail so now you know that you can get the squint case in exam now you have to prepare for it where does the preparation start so the preparation starts right in the clinic right during your clinical posting in the department of squint the preparation for this squint case in exam start now i understand not all the institutes and hospitals have a dedicated squint department but you must have an ophthalmologist who is dealing with such pediatric and squint cases so whenever you are posted with them or make sure that you get some time dedicated time like during your residency to be around squint cases so that you know the basics of squint you know the basics of assessment of the squint case so that once you start doing it once you have seen it then you know how to prepare for it so long as i know what's expected of me i can manage so now if you have a case in exam what are the points what what are the things you must know now first and foremost throughout the residency don't neglect squint you should know the squint everyone reads everyone sees cornea everyone sees retina so everyone knows it so unless you make an attempt to see a squint case and understand it you will not get it so know uh, know all the terms in squint thoroughly you should know exo iso hypo hyper propria foria dissociated deviation be thorough with it you should know how to assess for abnormal head posture you should just not miss it that is the first thing you observe in your patient when the patient is sitting right next to you in the examination chair the most important test in squint assessment is extraocular motility assessment it does not require any fancy instruments or anything it just requires one near target and you can assess the motility and it can lead to the diagnosis of most of the cases then you should know how to look for hirschberg corneal reflex and how to interpret it then again the very important test is cover and cover and alternate cover test however times how many times you read it in book you know it you understand it but unless you do it on a patient unless you get an occluder of yourself put it over the eye look for the motility of the eye under the cover the other eye so make a habit do it do it yourself unless you do it unless you see it unless you keep doing it it will not come in exam be habitual of doing cover and cover test and last is prism alternate cover test not all people would have access to prisms but at least know how to use prisms what are different types of prisms what are base in prisms what are base out prisms how to hold the prism how to stack the prism how not to stack the prisms at least know the basics so that even if in the exam you might not have the prism box but at least if the examiner asks you how would you put put a prism in this case to assess to de- to measure the deviation you should know there should be no confusion in the exam you should know it beforehand 
so these are some few must know things now again like any other topic there are few cold cases few hot cases we never expect any hot case in exam hot case means any acute case or any any child who is very small and is will be uncooperative for examination so we can like when we are thinking about the practical exams now we can forget about these cases and focus on cold cases what are the cold cases so in committent squint accommodative isotropia intermittent exotropia sensory or constant exotropia these are the committent uh, squint cases which you can expect other than that in incommitant squint you can expect now pulses ischemic nerve paralysis are seen very often in all the opds daily in each hospital in each opd there will be at least one case so on the day of exam they would definitely have one case presenting to their opd if not prior so you can definitely expect ischemic uh, isolated cranial nerve paralysis and there also can be a case of duan retraction syndrome so just in brief very brief about all these cold cases what are the must know or good to know things when you need to pass the exam so when there is a child you know 2 to 5 or 8 years of age who is wearing the uh, you know uh, hyperopic glasses you don't know what is the case just take out the glasses it is likely to be a case of accommodative isotropia so you should know the types of isotropia you should know how to def how, what is refractive accommodative what is partially accommodative isotropia you should know what is high ac by ratio then always remember to measure the squint in these cases with and without glasses and then in brief you should know about the management intermittent exotropia you should know the types and classification different classifications for that you need to measure the deviation for distance and near both you should know how to assess the control what are the different types to assess the control what is home control what is clinic control so you you know already you know you have read these things for theory but while examining the patient ask these things to the patient do these things yourself check for the control once you do it you know it and then you can keep doing it and in brief you can know the management options then third cranial nerve palsy the eye is down and out there is a ptosis the case is clear there is third nerve palsy then you should for all cranial nerve palsies like for all cranial nerve related cases you should know the course of these cranial nerves 3 4 6 the course should be on tip of your tongue then you should try to, and depending on the location and the lesion or the symptoms and signs you you should you should try at least to localize the possible lesion the location of the possible lesion then you should see and not miss if it is pupil involving or pupil sparing why it is important that you should know if it is painful or painless it is complete or partial these are all must know things then know what all are the indications for for any uh, cranial nerve palsy for that matter what are the indications to neuroimage what are the different vascular syndromes one can encounter and again the management options in brief and always remember for any cranial nerve palsy always check for all the cranial nerves it does not take more than 5 minutes if it is an if it is a habit to you it will be just done in 5 minutes but always check for all the cranial nerves or at least mention then fourth cranial nerve palsy the patient complains of vertical diplopia is coming with ahp so this incommitent vertical diplopia will probably be your uh, exam case even if you have this uh, case or not make like be sure that at least 50% of you would be asked about pass three step test either in a theory or practicals somewhere you will be answerable to what is this pass three step test then assess the hp know how to differentiate between bilateral versus unilateral course localization and management options six no palsy again you should know the course you should know the localization know what is pseudo localizing sign look for other neurological signs ask for other neurological symptoms again there are different vascular syndromes associated with six no palsy so ask for related signs and again you should know the management options in brief whenever there is a drs case first thing you should identify that it is a drs case the patient with hp with blob retraction with overshoot or and the exotropia or isotropia so first and foremost is identify diagnose type of drs is it exotropic isotropic type 1 type 2 type 
then what is the mechanism of overshoot what is the mechanism of globe retraction these are the basic things one should know and then if you know the management that that is like a brownie point and you will definitely score great now few points about oski uh, in a oski pattern you can definitely expect diplopia chart hash chart worth 4 dot test medox rod double medox rod and synapto 4 so these are the things tuck 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 it should come in your uh, to do or, or checklist before your oski exam then you should know different kinds of chart they can, they can show you the chart and just you should know what is this type of chart what is the principle behind using this chart so these are different pediatric vision assessment charts and in spotters again you can have a drs case a brown syndrome case med case or a case of leukocoria and they would probably ask you for the differential diagnosis these are the few i could think of but again there are always many things but at least these things are uh, like very often seen and so you are probably most likely to get this so take home tips are be familiar and used to examining a case of a squint know the basics know the theory don't forget the theory go methodical the most important thing which examiner looks for you in an exam is how you approach the case. They don't expect you to manage that case or diagnose that case correctly. But what is your approach? Did you ask the history properly? Did you look for the HP? Did you check the extracular motility? So have a set pro forma. And if you are lucky, so imagine that you are lucky if you get a screen case because examiner think that it is hard for you, but now you are prepared. And so you will nail it. And so there is a low threshold for obtaining passing marks when you get a screen case and make sure that you get few brownie points by knowing in detail about each of these things. Thank you so much. I hope Dar Kya Ke Jeet Hai. Excellent talk, uh, Dr. Arjinkya. Thank you so much for making it easy for everyone to understand. And I'm sure nobody will be scared of a squint case after uh, watching your talk. So our next uh, speaker is Dr. Aditya Anand. Yes, ma'am. Can you listen to me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. We can see oh. you. Please share your screen. Yeah. He's yeah. going to talk to us about how to deal with work relationships and academics during your residency. I think a very pertinent topic. Ma Go is ahead. The screen, is the screen visible, ma'am? Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, uh, my topic I would like to discuss about uh, how to balance work relationships and academics during your residency. So first of all, it's a very uh, casual and very important topic. And I myself, uh, uh, I did my diploma from RIO Bindo, and currently I am a secondary TNB resident at Arvindai Hospital, Pondicherry. And I would like to thank Apurva Ma'am and Dikijay Sir and uh, our entire AIOS and UOC to give me the opportunity to talk today. Uh, Uh, yeah, uh, see, uh, uh, first of all, <laughs> I'd like to say that this life is all about balance. So we need a balanced journey to sail through the challenges of era, which changes from time to time. So as a resident, there are a lot of things which we face. And I myself, I am a resident. So I know what are the common problems which my colleagues and which my other friends are facing. So. The it's here, not running in a, a presentation mode. Could you run it in the slideshow mode? Uh, so yes, sir. Showing as a slide uh, navigation mode. Uh, so, so the slides are changed. So this is, is an issue yesterday also. I think you can go ahead like this only. It's fine. Oh, okay, okay, then proceed. It's, it's showing a slideshow on your slide, then that's fine. Just proceed. Maybe some okay. issue. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, first of all, there are three things which a resident, <clears throat> any resident actually should balance. And currently, uh, and it's always a problem, like to balance how the work pressure in the institute and the relationships and the academics. So, many of the residents face this usual problem during their residency. So one by one, we will just like to pick up the uh, uh, like uh, the balancing sectors. So first of all, I'd like to talk about the work. 
So basically, I am just dealing with each and every point one by one. So I see I according to me and most of the people during the residency, we have to be very dedicated and honest towards our work, and we have to we just should not consider it a pressure because so many residents they tell me or they many of my friends also they tell that it's a work pressure and we don't enjoy it. So right. First of all, we should enjoy our field, enjoy our work, and then we can really do, we we can really face the pressure during the work which we which we face. And there is always a complaint about the seniors and juniors, like uh, they are not uh, what you call uh, they are not uh, working in symbiosis. In many of the institutes, the so many seniors and even the juniors are not very friendly. So first of all. if this is the situation we have they have to sort it out together or there has to be a atmosphere which has to be created which is usual for which is useful for entire entire batch or the entire the uh, post graduates so they need there should be a need of a proper channel and understanding between every one of us and so many residents they complain about the work given to them they tell that they are mostly given the clerical work or the written work or something like that they are like devoid of being given a surgical chance or something so if this is the situation first of all every work is important first year second year and third year everything is divided according to the uh, it's, a, it's a tradition like see everything we have to learn but the, even the clerical work is most important how to write the op sheets opd sheets how to record how to see the patient and recording everything is important and then gradually the residents are given a chance to move on the surgical surgical side so but so many residents they are they just want to neglect this and only crave about or mainly complain about the work given to them so everything has to be learned whether it's a recording clerical work also or your uh, uh, even the seeing the patient also and the surgical part also so gradually you will move on to that so this is the first, this is the first, this is how we should actually carry or we have to create a work atmosphere so that it is good for entire uh, institute so now what how to next come on to the relationship so now what happens this is a very important and but so many residents face it so but the thing is but majority of people think that it's a very it's too complex so the thing is it's all in our mind so we have to vent first of all relationships doesn't mean that you have to be uh, it, it, it's with everyone it's with family also friends also and even your close colleague also and if you are married even with your spouse also so now this is the majority of people think that it's a too complex topic but it's actually not it's it's how we take it so now here what happens is now even your relationship with anyone during your residency so and it it should not first of all it should not affect your academics that should be the most most important so you should always you should always decide in which category it lies if it is a fragile relationship or casual or if it's a very serious or toxic so we have to uh, we have to uh, divert our uh i get the our goal according to that because see if it the relationship is carrying you away from the academic so always always choose academics first so this is a everyone says that and we should also follow this so if given a choice we have to prioritize our career first so this is how we should like it's a very serious thing so we should maintain relationships along with the academic so many residents face it so now how do relationships come and go is it so but that is i is a very casual talk so we should not uh, put this into the uh, like how we analyze our growth so the thing is that if it is important for your growth if your partner is good then very very well ahead go according to you can uh, we can actually mutual we can study and they can grow together so it is not a very big thing so come on to the acad so people say that academics is a way to attract people so but according to me first of all it, that is 
always there. If you are good, then people will always ask you. They always uh, praise you. But for ourselves also, it gives the essence of life. So uh, first, it is always required to keep ourselves busy in a good, in a very good academic atmosphere, and we should always dedicate our time to study various uh, uh, these topics and uh, and to keep ourselves busy. So this is what is very important. So now how to study like my previous speakers have told everything all the materials which is needed to excel in details so but people think their like, own study and combined study it all depends on them so nowadays there are a lot of materials available all over so people can study like even the self study can also uh, like lead they can excel with that and combined study with discussion is anyways fruitful so and more important is a good academics and more of a balanced academic along with your work it makes you more confident in any stuff like how you even to deal with your professors even to deal with your friends it will show that confidence in your face and in your work also so uh, i would like to highlight some of the important things uh, with, with this points i have actually asked so many residents and then i have uh, put it in a one uh, very uh in a point wise so people like who are in the residency like me so they have to like they can follow these things so first of all the self discipline is the most important self discipline means like how you prioritize your work and your academics and even uh, if, if if anyone is in relationship so they can they have to prioritize everything and they have to balance everything and that too in a very disciplined mode so first of all in this thing we have to stop procrastination and we have to uh, we have to involve ourselves in a fruitful thing okay and later this is exam time schedule means the study schedule which people make near to their exam so that is also very very important we have to draw down the points and we have to make it and moreover only exam time schedule is not very important we have to make we have to be like into the study throughout the year that is we call it the whole year series along with your work so it's most important that after duty hours how you spend how to spend the time most of the residents okay almost like more than 50% of the residents they become so tired after duty so they can't even study they can't even uh, like watch anything i mean the, the obviously the duty is so hectic so if people can't do that but in this issue we have to make ourselves very focused and we have to we have to create a plan in a week at least something or some days we have to give uh, to our self study or it's a or discussion with the, our colleagues so that along with the work we can give but we can study also so even if we, even if a resident can't study daily after duty hours so he can actually spend it for 2 3 days or for three four days in a week we can make a schedule and do according to that and most important we have to keep ourselves involved in all the research activities and attend as like entire whatever conferences and other activities also and to and, and already discussed with the other speakers that we have to keep like it's better to keep our involved in publishing and to read various topics so and most uh, like this uh, avoid we have to avoid take any kind of nicotine liquor or watching explicit material see this is this is very uh, uh, common thing so because see, any kind of thing which divert our mind so we should all we should avoid that in in fact even we should avoid the negative people who do not who do not focus on our growth and who actually are jealous and try to divert us so these are the things which we should uh, actually uh, see the see that and judge and according to that we should act so what are the priority we should keep as a resident so the thing is we have to clarify your our goals what like what you want to achieve and along with the study and all there should be little time we should give to our exercise or practice yoga or any kind of meditation and whenever we feel like uh, depressed or something like that or some we should watch motivational stuff whenever we need and obviously we should not wait for that 
time. We should avoid procrastination. Whatever we want to do, we should do right ahead, whether it is related to whatever kind. Like even our yeah, work. Aditya, you need to wrap up, please. We have two yeah. more talks. And we should be always joyful. And that's why, and that will lead to our all-round growth. So, thank you. Thank you, Aditya. That was superb. It was very refreshing to see a resident having such, uh, you know, uh, mature and concise and quite succinct uh, thoughts about such complex and uh, broad topics. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thank you, ma'am. So you. next, uh, we have Dr. Pranesh Balasubramaniam. Uh, you know, he needs no introduction. He is very active, uh, uh, young ophthalmology teacher. He is a fellow in uh, uh, Arvindai Hospital, Coimbatore. And he is an online teacher with a very robust YouTube channel with thousands of views. And he's deeply passionate about ophthalmic pedagogy and medical education. Uh, go for it, Pranesh. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the opportunity. Uh, hope my slide is visible. Yes, yes, go ahead. Right. <coughs> so the topic is scientific proven strategies to create a successful resident search. So uh, you might wonder this topic is an outlier. In a session which is intended for extraordinary residents, here I am putting the teachers or trainers as the primary audience. But when you know how to train one, you know how to be one. As I always maintain that by teaching, you can become a better learner. And this talk is relevant for residents as much as it's intended for the trainers or the surgeon teachers. So sit back, relax, and enjoy, dear trainees and trainers. For the ease of understanding, I've divided this talk into three subdivisions. So what are the principles we need to have in mind before even we venture into training a young surgeon? And what you should have in mind while we, while we train them surgery? and how to take it further. So three levels will take it. Before even we start to train a young surgeon, it is important to know that we are teaching, we are training, not adolescents, not children, but adults. That's why it is not pedagogy, it is andragogy, which is very different from teaching an adolescent or a teenager. In adult learning, it is important to know these assumptions of which the most important and more pertinent to us as trainers is that experience. Adults learn based on their previous experience. And it's very important when we train a fellow, a secondary DNB resident, a foreign graduate. Uh, if you have learned a faulty practice, it is very difficult to make them unlearn and make them relearn the right one. That is something which a trainer should have in mind. So residents learn the steps correctly. Secondly, the adults learn what is important for them, what is relevant for them. They don't care about some, some uh, theory, some kind of irrelevant content. If you can appeal to their interests, you can teach them, can train them well. <clears throat> and not only they learn differently, uh, not only they are different from the pediatric age group or from the adolescent age group, but they learn different in different ways. Not all prefer watching videos. We all tell about, you know, let's train them by watching videos, but not everybody prefers watching videos. Some wants to get their hands dirty. Some want to read books. Some want to teach and discuss. Some want to journal. I'm one of those rare species who love auditory learning. So what I do is I kind of make a running commentary on my surgery. Okay. And I record it on my phone. It's right there, even on my phone. So I will say, Pranesh, now we have sit down and now we are focusing on the microscope. The focus is clear on the conjunctival vessels, take your scissors, make a nick, peritomy. So I give a running commentary, like an audio version, and I listen to that every night before I operate. And it works. It really works. So find what the resident prefers to learn. They may have multiple ways of learning. And this auditory worked for me. Uh, you know, it's like a hypnosis tape. I think you might all remember Chandler embracing his femininity after listening to a hypnotic tape. So something like that, maybe you can wake up as a master surgeon. So know what learning style is predominant in your student and the resident also should know what he or she learns the best way. But no matter how different we learn, we all come together in this very important Maslow's hierarchy of needs. See, the concept is that only when my physiological needs are fulfilled, only when my thirst is quenched, only when my hunger is satiated, only when I am employed, when I feel secure, 
when i feel trusted by my friends and family only when i get the respect and confidence from my peers and from my friends only then i perform better now this might look like a deep philosophy but it is important to know what is running behind my training what is running behind my students mind before they come for training for surgery as a trainer it is very important to know that fulfill these needs first or at least ask them whether these needs are being fulfilled before you take them before we push them towards a challenge so now our trainee has its uh, you know has um the idli and vada now he is very satiated very satisfied well hydrated now sitting for surgery what to have in mind the trainee and trainers operate not just on a patient but we operate in two different zones the learning zone and the performance zone please watch the ted talk on these two zones brilliant talk you should watch as a teacher the learning zone is where there is a comfort zone where you have a cushion maybe in a wet lab maybe the simulation models or operating on a patient under extreme supervision so the more time the student is going to spend on the learning zone the better he becomes at the performance zone where the stakes are very very high so the whole idea is the more they sweat on the ground the less they bleed on the battlefield so the lessons learned in the learning zone has to be applied in the performance zone and it doesn't end there in the performance zone we are operating in a very high volume setup like arvind we are operating under intense pressure note what you are doing record your surgeries take it back reflect practice what you have done and go back again to the cycle of learning zone it's like a vicious constant cycle of improvement is what makes a resident a better surgeon and as a teacher as a trainer it is important to facilitate the reflection part of it and speaking of reflection moving on to the last part what to do after the training the most important element is getting a good feedback feedback is very very important not just for the students but for the teachers as well so how i give feedback i follow always this rule of this pendleton's rules of giving an effective feedback it works very well every time for me first i'm sitting with the resident the resident has done his or her surgery he's asking me so what did it went i'll first ask them what you felt what you felt went well in the last they will tell me only then i will tell them what went well then i will ask them what went wrong and only then i will tell them what went wrong now this ask tell ask tell approach works beautifully and it kind of reduces the intensity and makes the feedback far more palatable for the students so uh, what i do is whenever i train my residents i i ask them to perform this reflective learning it's kind of again it's like a deep philosophy like a stoic philosophy journaling okay it's one of the best research methods on improving any skill for that matter so here is my resident who has done her reflective writing on a patient she has done her beautifully and she's even uh, mentioned or journaled about her mindset the emotions she had before she entered to the ot and then the various steps she performed what went right what went wrong when it means when it comes to what went wrong i always tell them to maintain these four things first the errors they did and how these errors became a complication like pcr how this error could have been managed and how this complication was managed so these four things should be written on any error or any negative steps being done so one well researched document on how to perform surgeries or how to assess a resident surgeries oscar rubric this rubric was built by dr karl golnik a great teacher and he has done rubrics he has devised these to do lists or these assessment checklists for almost any skill for any surgery you have for fake you have for trab you have for pediatric surgeries you can find it online for free uh it is it is a blessing for trainers and i'm quoting what dr rajat sir told in the very first talk when we know what we are supposed to do life becomes a lot more easier i think we have come to a full circle right now and you, you you even have an app for oscar rubric you can type in ico oscar on play store or uh, app store you can download them for free you have one minute remaining sir yes so what you have tried to do here is to introduce proven principles of effective teaching and imparting those principles into our daily surgical practice there is a way to do rexes there is a way to do trench if there is a way to do trench there is a way to teach how to do trench so let's teach surgery scientifically let's all teach to reach thank you yosi for the opportunity a uh, superb pranesh it's always a pleasure to hear you talk and it was 10 minutes well spent 
we really learned a lot from you i think i'll give you my feedback and uh, my uh, you know appreciation for you on personal messaging as well so i look forward to learning mm-hmm. more so uh, next we have dr anujit paul uh, he is a resident in pondicherry he's going to tell us about avenues and perspectives of a resident after two cruel covid waves he's got a lot of publications i believe on the same subject uh, it's very nice to have you uh, mm-hmm. and you have so much clarity yeah. even as a resident so go ahead anuj uh, thank you so much ma'am and thank you aios and yosi for the platform so uh, the session was about the extraordinary resident but the two cruel waves of covid affected most of my residency and most of the residency of a lot of people and these are my perspectives and the perspective of any resident going forward after two waves and how they can make the most of residency as well as how not all is lost there is something to salvage from both the waves of covid as well so um, sometimes the goals of a resident are not exactly clear but i went on to the nmc guidelines and these are the quote and quote statements mentioned by the nmc as what a resident should ultimately achieve after 3 years uh, they are the following a resident must be well versed in clinical and investigative modalities he must have individually performed as well as managed complications of lip surgeries and other superficial surgeries he must be competent in cataract surgeries and he must have a desirable knowledge to perform intraocular surgeries rather than cataract like retina as well as glaucoma surgery now turning back the clock we all know that the covid wave has now loomed upon us for about 2 years there was one wave in 2020 followed by a second wave in 2021 uh, the second wave sort of waned in september 2021 and there was a small third wave as well as covid variants in 2022 so we are looking at a period of almost 2 years of residency training loss having said that there are some perspectives of a resident going forward and for the purpose of making it a slightly more simple i will be dividing it into a clinical and surgical an academic a research and a psychosocial perspective so patient care during the entire covid-19 pandemic shifted immensely both for clinics opd specialty clinics as well as surgeries uh, a retrospective study that was done between the periods of 2020 comparing it between the periods of 2019 actually showed a reduction of 97% of opd outflow as well as emergency services decreased by 35% uh coming to the surgical aspect of it we all know for a resident to hone their skills ultimately it is the state sponsored camps that they get cases from uh the dbcs or the npcb target for every year is about 66 lakhs and though the data for 2020 and 2021 is not out yet uh you can see that the 2019 2018 and 2017 data is more or less meeting with the target it is well assured that the 2020 and the 2021 data will be much less which means that residents have got a really really lack of of surgical skills going forward in fact dr dr rakshay nayar at all conducted an online survey where he saw that our residents are deeply impacted by the decreased surgical training as high as 80.7% so these are some photos of what i was doing during my residency instead of being in the ophthalm opd or as well as the uh, ot room these are photos of lit suturing done by ppe the photos are purposely they are not purposely hazy in fact they are hazy because this is the exact view that you get while you are screening a patient this is some photos from the second wave of covid when we had to screen for crao in cases of mucor mycosis in fact the photo on the right has been published in igo as well which i will come to a little later these are some more photos of where i was in my second year of residency instead of the ophthal clinics the photo on the right is uh, someone exclaiming and the admission of one more patient into the covid wards in the middle of the night so there have been a lot that has been lost in two years but it's not fully lost in fact there have been some mitigative measures as well two of the primary mitigative measures that maybe can be taken forward is wet lab training as well as the changing paradigm of resident teaching wet labs have a huge advantage because they help you hone your skills and also protect patient safety there have been a lot of innovations in the wet lab as well in this regard the changing paradigm of ospi teaching has actually allowed consultants professors to vary their teaching among residents for example 
you are only stuck with a couple of cases which you end up knowing the night before before your final exams but oski goes for a more compound a more comprehensive knowledge uh, taken from the resident having said that we come to an academic perspective where academic uh, classes or patient exposure or better teaching or clinical teaching has been extremely hampered but there has been an exponential rise of online classes which has actually augmented post graduate teaching so the photo on the right shows me actually eating an apple and attending an arvin seminar which i believe would be impossible in a real life scenario so as the photo states you can eliminate the cost of travel you can eliminate the time and place and actually cater your learning and taper your learning to your convenience which is actually an advantage for residents in going into this um, these couple of two years additionally it's difficult for residents to attend every single conference but from the comfort of their home and almost every conference going virtual for the past two years this has been made quite easy so this is me attending um uh, an ask uh, yosi panel of uh, two years back as you can see the who's who of ophthalmology is on this screen and without the covid 19 pandemic i don't feel i would have stood the chance to share screen with them this is from our uh, 2021 aioc yosi forum another chance which i only got because of probably the covid 19 pandemic and physical uh, meets certain then we come to a research perspective so a new disease obviously breeds scope for new research in fact dr bharat gulani sir uh, wrote an article in the igo mentioning how there was a rising trend of covid 19 related articles as well however with this positive note there has been a problem with dissertations because students are and postgraduates are missing to meet their sample size for correction as well as core fields of ophthalmology taking the sidelines research in the core fields of ophthalmology not done now might not seem like a big deal but maybe 5 or 10 years from now will have an effect in fact through this uh, covid 19 pandemic i myself got to uh, test myself in the field of research these are two articles that i published uh, we noted the case of bilateral retroid optic neuritis in a covid 19 patient as well as give my take on making the most of wet lab resources with a single microscope as well as single wet lab setup last but not least we come to the psychosocial impact of covid so uh, dr khanna et al conducted a study in 2020 to assess the mental health among the residents and trainees during covid 19 and found that there was uh, 32% of them had some degree of uh, depression this is primarily attributed to the fear of a longer training period after residency because of inadequate exposure frontline work being not the domain of expertise for ophthalmology residents has not been familiar with management of covid patients the fear of contracting the disease itself it still looms quite high as well as family constraints and financial constraints going forward so two years have been lost there's been a loss of clinical as well as surgical skill there has been a boom of academics but the loss of wet lab teaching there has been a boom in research but a stark effect on thesis completion as well as core fields of ophthalmology plus there's are always a looming threat of covid this has affected us for two years but then there are some valuable additions that we can take forward firstly the impact of covid has affected all residents in the same way you have one minute has, remaining sir okay it has opened a uh, new avenues for research online platforms eliminate the need for time and location as well as eliminate uh, resident specific teaching and finally there are wet labs and simulators which previously would play a second fiddle to patient care are now taking primary importance so there are some takeaways that we can go forward and uh, make the most of what has been lost over the past few years thank you very much for your attention thank you anujit i think for that lovely presentation and indeed uh, something that was a you know a unique uh, situation and the best use you can make of it so uh, if we can just get all the speakers to switch on their videos and uh, you know we don't have too much time for discussion actually we have to hand it over to the next session but we can take a quick snapshot so all the speakers are you there mega yes uh admin can you take a screenshot i am taking one you take it okay yeah one second yeah done wonderful session i think everyone and uh, 
amazing lot of insights very nice talks and uh, i'm glad we started with this session right in the morning so i think a purva over for you to continue the proceedings uh, and yes. next thank you digvijay sir and thank you all the speakers for amazing talks i really enjoyed the session thank you for making it so worthwhile so let's have the next session now karan and uh, divakant are here they going to take over from here thank you guys thank, thank, thank you purva uh, it it really was a fantastic session and everybody brought out you know wonderful talks uh, so our next session is continuing with the flow and the credit actually goes to apurva and i think we should say this multiple times for which because she is the one who has designed the and planned the entire program our academic in charge so the next session is the peers interactive get all your burning questions on fellowship answered by uh, yours so this will be moderated by myself and uh, devakant devakant are you there yes sir i am there so yeah. let's uh, without wasting any further time I hope all the panelists are here, Dr. Nilupparna, Dr. Aparna, Dr. Siddharth, Dr. Aditi, Dr. Raman, and Dr. Harika. And may I invite Dr. Bhavya uh, to start sharing his screen? And just before the session, I was discussing with Dr. Karan. So we realized that the best best person to introduce oneself is yourself. So please give a very small one-line introduction before you start your talk. Please, Dr. Bhavya, over to you. uh thank you so much dr devakant sir for bringing this around uh my name is dr bhavya i am a consultant with azi hospitals i've been an alumni of uh, shri shankara deva netralay and uh, here i am so is my screen and uh, voice everything legible around yeah yes bhavya but you have to share your screen yeah, yeah. enter slide to mode yeah yeah i'm good yeah Yes, please yeah. go ahead. And Doctor okay, Bhavya so is the know. only is the only stand-up uh, comedian who is also an ophthalmologist, or the other way around. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so go ahead, Doctor Bhavya. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Good morning. So, and... Bhavya, you should expect a bit of comedy in the middle as well. Yeah, absolutely, it's it's just coming. The the very fact that we are talking about fake emulsification in the morning, whether to go for fellowship or trust, is. It's... because biggest form of humor <laughs> so good morning uh, as we start the topic it's a burning one it's a fake emulsification perplexities fellowships versus trust hospitals i'm going to dive into the different paradigms the different dimensions that as a resident as a fresher and as an ophthal himself all of us we have faced it and uh, proceeded with that so there are no financial disclosures it's just a story of struggle for the most perplexed perplexities which is i don't know how to do a fake o that is what the 10 minutes are going to be all about so the confusion whether to take up a fellowship or whether to go to a trust hospital the eternal confusion between both of them so we bring our hero back uh, to this new juncture called fake emulsification and i fondly call, call this uh, hero as motio man the cataract learner the fake o man and let him reintroduce himself to the new challenges which he is going to face ahead so the spectrum of questions why what how where as soon as you are a first year resident the the word fake or becomes a part and parcel of your uh, thoughts why come on because it is the cataract statistically speaking cataract is the world's leading cause of blindness said by who and learning cataract is the most important surgery in ophthalmology referred by who's who of ophthalmology what makes this perplexity so important because it is my story because it is your story because it is our story and it is every single ophthal's story all of us are aware of the fact that uh, this meme is very self explanatory instead of first year resident i could uh, by all the residents instead of diverging towards this type of soft cataract surgery a resident is busy doing his ward work in most of the institutes that uh, we see so let's actually throw some light to why do we really need a fake fellowship or a trust hospital as a stepping stone to our careers statements that all of us hear during the residency which are not so pro cataract learning my next turn comes too late 
patient's bp miraculously shoots up to 200 by 120 because he has forgotten to take medications on the same day your turn gets cancelled and the seniors do their cases and a very sad uh, story i don't like going to the vet lab i've been fondly quoting this that vet labs are like dinosaurs all of them have heard about it they knew that they exist but nobody has ever seen them so all in all residency at a number of places is holistically a bad destination of doing cataract surgery and hence the common dictum bahar nikal kar kar lenge now the struggles post residency deciding a fellowship with a burning introspection if they give a cataract training along i have seen the most focused and the most elite and the most intelligent residents turning into fellows going for fellowships other than phaco refractive still asking if they are going to get some phaco exposure in their residency evolution to phaco emulsification from sics because yes that's a very important step and of course the economic aspect because the moment you are an ms the moment you are a dnb the moment you are a dms the economic aspect starts shooting in the second question where would you learn phaco emulsification Uh, this is a very nice uh, triangle of learning curve, which I call the triangle of freshers, which I have uh, developed. Uh, it shows surgical exposure, good pay, and comfort zone at three different points. If you see any setup where a fresher is working, if you see any setup where a fresher is serving or learning, only two out of these three will happen. You go to an elite center, you do your SR ship. you'll have a decent pay you'll be in your comfort zone but there won't be a surgical exposure you go to a very peripheral center where there is too much amount of surgical exposure they'll pay you good but it will be out of your comfort zone at the same time if you go for a city which has high volume and it is in your comfort zone also of course they won't pay you good so out of these three only two will be suffice at one point of time and that's the biggest uh, confusion that a fresher faces so the road called trust hospitals suddenly popped up and it's not new it has been there since the previous generation of ophthalmologists these trust hospitals they um, they function under the umbrella where you can actually do numbers they could be a solo practice they could be a clustered practice a trust hospital where basically they are doing charity cases and the ophthal side of the story is you go there to do numbers you go there to learn and you go there to polish your skills the first perplexity is the first phaco surgery because you have studied for residency and then suddenly you start learning or you start having to do phaco the pros you are a consultant there it's independent it relatively has more numbers they pay good patient expectation is low there is no fixed timeline like you are not bonded for a year or two if you are not into a bonded Uh, with that particular trust as i call it you have an independent decision making and of course it's a professional growth you start serving that trust if it is somewhere around your uh, area of settlement your you you start building up your name and your patient pool the cons the independence becomes aloneness like i i might get personal at this moment of time because i come from uh, uh, gujarat and uh, we usually have solo trust and practicing alone does become an issue because probably you don't have anybody to handle your complications or to teach you at the point where you get stuck up opd surgical imbalance because you are the one who is seeing opd you are the one who is operating low salaries eventually because if you feel that the trust hospitals are paying good i'm sorry we are mistaken low patient expectation induces recklessness which is a very derogatory or which is a very detrimental term for learners like us surgical misadventures complication rates because they shoot up when you are working alone or when you are at a place where you relatively are there to learn tunnel vision towards cataracts you start focusing your career or you start focusing your learning more only towards cataract and of course detachment from the academic world because you get into the number game the second number is the fake of fellowships they could be short term they could be long term and they could be with refractive surgery as most of the institutes are provide the major purpose city is there which is hands on and numbers because they say that they don't give so optimum numbers as compared to your own 
a trust learning curve or a short term fellowship which is paid in nature the pros being yes of course you learn under an expert guidance they give a step by step approach there is an academic touch there is a quality and a corporate exposure there is a fixed timeline that it's a one and a half year course or it's a two months short term paid pick of fellowship so you know that you're going to get a finite number of cases so this is how you're supposed to learn of course you get a wet lab training uh, exposure and you get uh, exposed to the most fancy machines and the different uh, dynamics of the fake emulsification under expert guidance of course you get a refractive exposure of course you get to see complicated cataracts and how do the people manage which probably being in an independent trust setup you would not have ventured to do that and of course it is patient satisfaction oriented the cons majorly based on the teaching surgeon which is very subjective in nature paid short term fellowships of course you call it paid right so step, stepping out of your ms and having to pay to learn something is not everybody's cup of tea it's a long term course it's a skewed at the ends in the starting you learn less and in the last 6 months it picks up pace or you get major chunk of your hands on in the last 6 months the relatively less term the independent exposure to complications is curbed because obviously you have somebody above you and of course geographical disparity like somebody living in the northern most one minute remaining sir would have to travel oh my god so what do you do you start with sics and uh, there are two types i would have to skip fast 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 so things to consider you inquire proper numbers you go for bonded non bonded you go for complication management and uh, you th- these are the things that you consider and look for an institute that teaches you a to z of fico dynamics because to draw is a skill to paint is an art and of course time and space are relative so be wise in choosing the institute uh, sr should bonded avenues are also considered go to the institute where they meticulously teach and you are allowed to be verbal about your insecurities be it a running rexis or a hydro dissection and a, a setup with a posterior segment is always beneficial on a lateral thought and finally how because well we are the entire uc exists to guide it allows you networking how do you decide these institutes you have a list of institutes which are there at these particular junctures and my story specifically insignificant but yet worth sharing dms from a government institute a paid short term fellowship a trust hospital exposure and finally secondary dnb from shri shankara deva netralay and as a coincidence and as a pleasure i have somebody i consider my guru dronacharya dr nilod pana devri ma'am who is a uh, uh, trainee uh, who is a panelist and who was taking care of all the trainees uh, i i specifically remember the meticulousness that after trust hospital exposure i came down to uh, shankara deva and you know th- this is how it gets instilled and currently finally i'm a vaco refractive surgeon at uh, AZI hospital so this was the the entire scenario exposure optimum complications plenty and learned infinite so uh, seen all the worlds possible and that's how landed up deciding that this could be an uh, this could be a nice way to do that probably you could start with a fellowship under a training or under a trained setup and then you could go to a place where you are relatively doing numbers so that would be an ideal thing to do and finally uh, be be aware of two optimistic people one over optimistic who says that so your time is up uh, can i take 30 seconds yeah the last controversial food that i would leave the young ophthalmologists is do we really need a fellowship for cataract can the residency programs become self sufficient and are we genuinely lost in the number game so uh, i guess that's the take home messages don't take home messages take home optimism take home some beautiful bonds take home the stories and take back home a part of you that's lost in the rat race so uh, that's it from my side dr bhavya gokani signing off thank you so much uc and aos for having me here thank you so much thank you so much dr bhavya uh, so uh, dr nilit panna you are there right so a wonderful talk bhavya and you have uh, yeah. pointed out some very pertinent points uh, and you have uh, also uh, mentioned that dr nilotparna is your drona chare so we'll we'll ask her uh, for her comments so dr nilotparna uh, it's Hi. difficult for us <laughs> it is difficult for us at uc to really you know uh, 
control how the residency programs function in our country uh, yeah. but uh, if somebody comes to you post residency for cataract training so what yeah. are your top pointers for that person so that <laughs> that process can be expedited because from a very practical perspective cataract is indeed fortunately unfortunately the bread and butter uh, in the market today right if we see from a very financial and economic perspective so your yeah. pointers on that please yeah i have a few pointers in that uh, first and foremost thank you so much for including me in this uh, session and second uh, dr bhavya gokani thank you for considering me your donacharya i think i have been harsh on you a lot of times but thank you so much the pointers that i would like to say as he has mentioned in the slides also first and foremost the resident who has uh, come to us for learning sometimes they come from the same uh, locality or sometimes they come from outside so the best thing is to first adapt adapt to the environment and then uh, get a uh, idea about the institute what you are supposed to get as a teacher i feel that we should be more comfortable with the uh, students when they come we should be more welcoming that gives a comfort zone for the students now second point is uh, how to go ahead with the surgical uh, aspect so in order to go ahead with the surgical aspect i would definitely say that you should be very observant in what you are uh, watching one second you should be like a sponge to take in whatever you are getting do not compare with others how much they are doing what they are doing because every individual has his own set of skills to learn and it's not that everyone learns from one single case some takes 10 cases some takes one case so i feel that <clears throat> it is uh, really important that uh, you have a conceptual learning both for um, uh, acad- as you have for academics you should also have a con- sorry uh, you should have a conceptual learning for your surgical skills as well so that is my take on that excellent points i would you know this question i would also like to take it up with the dr aman uh, because i remember us discussing this point before he was about to go for his fellowship aman is an excellent by the way of echo and a retina surgeon and uh, just quick 30 seconds aman on what would be your take on it <coughs> yeah before uh, when i when i finished my residency i hardly did any cataract surgery so this was a big question in front of me also to decide whether to go to a trust hospital or to do a fellowship so i had a lot of discussion with karan regarding this <clears throat> so now at the end of after completing my fellowship and a very good presentation by dr bhavya he has put all the points forward so when you when you do a uh, <clears throat> join a trust hospital the basic problem is that when you land into trouble there is no one uh, nobody to stabilize you or nobody to handle your complications so if you end up doing complication in five or six cases it kinds of demotivates you and you tend to fall back and there is nobody <clears throat> to hold you there so my opinion would be like first you go for a good feco fellowship or any paid fellowship or a long term fellowship depending on the options you get and if you want to join a trust hospital yes you can join after your fellowship at trust hospital so that you can just polish your skills before going into a corporate or a private practice so that will be my <clears throat> opinion on this but doctor uh, amin it's not really fair you know grabbing best of both the worlds <laughs> retina and cataract <laughs> but that's fine we'll live with that uh, dr karan let's start the next one excellent talk uh, over to dr ajinkya who will be speaking on is pediatric ophthalmology a good career choice thank you dr karan so i am ajinkya i am practicing pediatric ophthalmologist and strabismologist and with special interest in community ophthalmology and research so coming to the question of my topic i would answer in one word first yes it is very good career choice and a very promising one why let's see so children are one third of our population and all of our future and so is the magnitude of this problem even in india there are 
more than 410 million children who are less than 16 years of age and the prevalence of childhood blindness is five times as that of it's seen in developed world overall 60 to 70 percent of the childhood blindness is either avoidable or treatable and rest 30 percent requires low vision and rehabilitation care so you understand what is the magnitude of a pediatric eye care problem in our country as per who one children's eye care center is required for every 10 million population where at least one specialty trained or specialty oriented ophthalmologist should be available and now this warrants immediate doubling of the number of dedicated children's eye care units across India. So this is the first point, the magnitude of problem and the requirement. There is a huge gap. Now, what is our patient base? So we deal with this huge patient base right from the preterm newborn to the newborn, infant, toddler, preschool children, school going children and adolescent. All these different age group patients present with varied spectrum of eye related problems. Additional to this, we also deal with adult squint patients. So we have a huge patient base and a lot to work and a lot to do in this field of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. Now, you know, monopoly is the condition of every successful business. So how do we have the monopoly? Many comprehensive care providers do not feel comfortable managing pediatric patients. And we manage various ocular issues, right? From the eyelid to the anterior segment to the optic nerve to the posterior segment. I would go even behind to the cortex in cases of cortical visual impairment or cerebral visual impairment. And we manage these patients with rare and complex disorder, and we get to work as a team with other pediatric subspecialties. And we are a hot commodity. There are very low numbers of pediatric ophthalmologists, and this allows us for ability to find work in an otherwise saturated job market. I'm not sure about the increased power of negotiation, though, but yes, few say it is true the most important thing which we usually talk these days and people are getting aware not only in medical field but otherwise also so this work-life balance is very important so how do we have it how do we achieve it so being in pediatric ophthalmology there are relatively low after us and on-call responsibilities compared to the re emergent retinal detachments and entrapped or battle flow fractures, there are relatively few amblyopia and strabismus related emergencies. So we pediatric ophthalmologists, we enjoy a good work-life balance. Now strong relationships. Many pediatric ophthalmology issues such as amblyopia, strabismus, glaucoma, ptosis, ROP, these all problems, they have long lasting impact on the eyes and the visual system, and it requires continued follow-up. So if you are someone who likes to build the relationships with your patients and watch them grow and improve, mind you, this field is for you. Again, there is a lot to do in public health and international work. One can find funding opportunities for community outreach program, both locally and abroad, where there is significant need for pediatric ophthalmology care providers. Now, what is QALY? We have all learned in the preventive and social medicine. It is quality adjusted life years. So the vision that you save in a child in, in childhood will serve your patients their whole lives. So you operate one adult cataract and you gain 20 years of vision on an average. You operate one infantile cataract, you gain 80 years of vision. Again, if you treat an amblyopia, you see the amblyopia being treated, the vision getting better with each visit. The, this dramatic improvement in vision will assure you that these patients will get to keep this vision for their adult lives. And mind you, the satisfaction that gives you by preventing or gaining these light years in these terms is really very satisfying. 
and taking care of children is fun you get to play the games use toys you and you you stay young at heart i remember uh, most of my youtube playlist now consists of five little monkey jumping on the bed or baba black sheep and i really enjoy it and kids in opd when you see them at least in each opd you will have that one cute kid which will enlighten your day and you will be free from all the tensions and relief uh, and all the worries which you are facing throughout the day and they will do the funniest thing and you will always have the stories to tell and share with your friends and colleagues so i will leave you with this thought that the idea is to die young as late as possible and being in the field of pediatric ophthalmology will ensure you to get closer of this idea closer to this idea thank you so much for the opportunity Uh, thank you, Ajinke, uh, for that wonderful uh, talk. So we have a pediatric ophthalmologist here amongst us. That is Dr. Andy, ma'am. Hi, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Ajinke, it's uh, great to see you after. Great I to think, see you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, after two after, years, I guess. Yeah. After physical oh, uh, AMS. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> yes. It's a great uh, just, talk. Yeah. Dr. Nice. Lampanna. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to say that. Uh, Dr. Adesh Rajinkya has made uh, a very good pitch for pediatric of health. So oh, he has he, he has pointed out all the good things about pedia. And yeah. I work with a pediatric of health in my current practice, and I can I vouch that, that. All, I that all of them all of them are true. But uh, we would like you to focus on some of the challenges uh, that a pediatric of health might face, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. See. Um, Basically, to even take up pediatric ophthalmology as a fellowship subject is that you must like children and you should have a lot of patience for these children. So that is the basic idea about this fellowship. Because uh, if you think that it's just like uh, any other surgical procedures uh, or surgical fellowships, it's not like that. It's not like that. You have, as Ajinkya has uh, pointed out, it, it is about dealing not only with the children, you have to deal with the parents as well. And you have to be very, very educative about uh, your uh, management protocol. You need to educate even the parents what you are going to do and how you are going to set your follow-ups with the children. So I feel the most uh, difficult um, times that the um, fellows face is that they feel that uh, uh, that is the most uh, important thing that they say when they first come to us and if you ask any resident or any fel uh, any resident to say do you want to take a pediatric ophthalmology he says no ma'am no ma'am we just can't do that because they they feel that uh, uh, it is difficult to um, handle the children so that is why i am saying that the most important criteria is that you have to like the children and you have to dedicate yourself towards the child care services. That is most important. And it really takes up a long time for you, uh, the counseling part, the training part. So patience is the most important factor here. So these two aspects I'll definitely say. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Dr. Nirmal Farna. And uh, thank, thank you, you. Dr. Ajinkya, uh, for a great talk. I would talk. Uh, like to add yeah. one more thing. Uh, yeah. I think Ajinkya, he has presented a good paper in the morning. Uh, squint is something that students are scared of. So don't get scared of strabismus. That is actually fun. <laughs> no, Karan, don't raise your hand. <laughs> you have five pieces in pediatrics. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, the best thing that I got is my wife is pediatric of cell. So I don't have to actually worry about squint. Otherwise, squint has to be. <laughs> this is what I'm saying, the attitude. You have to change the attitude to get into pediatric of health. That's why he is not into pediatric of health. <laughs> now, Karan, let's, let's move yeah, ahead. Let's the, move the forward. Yes. So the next talk is by Dr. Shishir Varughis on the reviews of Surgical Retina Fellowship. What you expect from one. Dr. Shishir, can you please share your screen? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sushil, I would request you to keep it brief so that we can have more time to discuss with you and the other panelists. Thank yeah, you. sure, definitely. Yeah, can you see the first slide? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, perfect, perfect.
perfect yeah okay so thank you uh, yosi for giving me this opportunity you all want to me to talk on retina something which takes more than 2 years to complete in 10 minutes but okay so here we go it's not moving forward yeah so before you start the fellowship you should decide why you really want to do a fellowship and talk to somebody you know there are a lot of pros and cons of a retina practice so the pros are you you have your mind challenged there's you can be a savior for the anterior segment uh, complications you will be recognized in your community you know you'll be popular among the local ophthalmologist community and also if you are a posterior segment why not get married to somebody who has anterior segment but there are a lot of cons also you see that all cases like other subjects to retina all, all cases are different and there is an effort required to learn and practice a lot of effort is required actually to gain clinical as well as surgical skills and there's a steep learning curve monetary gains are not so much for the amount of effort you put in and even if you gain something the profit margin is quite minimal, minimal not like how you have in cataract surgeries and it requires a long term fellowship because we don't believe that you can do a full retina surgery in 3 months or 6 months it's not possible and obviously after fellowship also of 2 years it require a guidance so i have asked this to a lot of our fellows why retina you know like why have you chosen retina so no retina surgeon in my home city that was one answer my spouse is practicing anterior segment never had the opportunity of learning retina during pg i want to do a short term retina because i can manage my own nucleus drops so i like the surgical aspect it's very challenging it's a very fascinating intriguing subject in my hospital the retina department was very chilled out very cool people so i want to take up retina it has more scope i was inspired by a mentor who was in retina and some some even answer that i found other sub specialties uh, more difficult so my reason was obviously intriguing yes but the main reason was without knowing retina you won't know the cause for uh, decreased vision in a patient and it's also you will be confident and do a complete ocular examination when you when a patient presents to the opd so the first question you ask before you join is like i said before time are you willing to put in time so most surgical retina fellowships are 2 years but that's actually not enough and uh, vitreoretinal surgery is a steep learning curve like i said before need complete all right thodi kam hui pata lagega dr bhavya can you please mute yourself dr bhavya can you please mute yourself yeah i would request people who are not speaking to actually mute yourself so that the you know the speaker's flow doesn't get disturbed over to you dr bhavya sorry for the interruptions yeah so before you join any you think of taking up retina fellows fellowship you do a self analysis you know after i finish my post graduation in ophthalmology yes i surely want to do retina but am i familiar with good anterior segment examination and surgical techniques do i have enough hands on in managing anterior segment if i do yes you should be your retina fellowship will be a relative ease it's not easy but it will be a relatively easy if no then your struggle is increased as the first few months or first even half a year or more than that will go in just managing anterior segment you know because you are you will be struggled struggling to do ac paracentesis holding the globe difficult in managing the microscope you know simple procedures will make it even more difficult so better to get a hands on comprehensive training like at least for 6 months or 1 year before you actually think of joining a uh, retina fellowship have a good anterior segment management training so then you come to choosing an institute so that has a lot of factors which you decide when you choose an institute if you go to vrsi.in or even the ios website there are a lot of uh, retina fellowships uh, centers which are described there so it depends on uh, observation so first of all you can go there for an observation you talk to any ex fellows or seniors from the institute see how many how much hands on you get you tell them about how much your experience your decision can also be based on the city and also on the surgical chances which the institute provides also you have a option between a private going for a corporate institute or versus a tertiary i care center where the numbers will obviously be more and you can have a structure and go for an institute which has a structured training you know you will be here and then after a week you will be posted somewhere else you know something like that a structured training you are going to get your numbers like that and then obviously some some of them will have a waiting period they last and in that time you can probably you know brush up on your anterior segment more and you can also choose institutes with a bond versus you know no bond that's also influencing factor and obviously short term versus long term so short term i really don't believe in you should always retina is always a long term fellowship so you are a new we are fellow in the department so what can you what do you, what you can expect 
So you can expect to see a lot of patients, obviously, in the OPD, and there'll be a lot of variation of normals. So you have to, you will get access to diverse cases, different presentations of a disease, access to imaging, and also uh, you'll get classes by and teaching by the seniors. Now, what is expected of you? You are supposed to learn, perform, and show indirect ophthalmoscopy as a beginner. Charting of retinal detachments, obviously. Ask questions, any doubts you have to ask. And if you find see something interesting, you have to read upon it on the same day. So all this goes into gaining a clinical uh, skill. So the depressor and the indirect ophthalmoscopy and your 90D will be part and parcel of your life. You'll be going through the OPD, see, seeing the retinal diseases or fundus examination, doing indirect, learning about FFA, interpreting FFA angiograms, doing B scans on patients, doing as well as interpreting, uh, interpreting OCTs, and also you'll be doing uh, uh, indirect lasers as well as lasers on sit lamp assisted laser. So all this forms part of your OP workup as well as OP uh, procedures. So charting of RD is very, very important. When you are an, as an initial uh, fellow, you'll be taught how to chart. The problem nowadays is most of the system has become EMR. So you really, the, the practice of charting is actually lost as now most of the things are on the uh, EMR, but charting, if you if you do, it's really good. And then it forms a basis of, you know, you'll be perfect in your anatomy and you'll be perfect in your examination and you'll be confident as a surgeon if you are doing your charting. So, and also in the OP, you'll be posted in different subspecialties. You know, now retina is multiple subspecialties. You, you can go, you can choose, you can uh, be posted in UVITIS. You will have a, a, be learning with a, with a mentor for macular diseases. Even pediatric retina and intraocular tumors are a different subspecialty now. And Arvind is offering a one-year uh, pediatric retina fellowship separate after you finish your two years of uh, VR fellowship. So you will be uh, having, you'll be screening for ROP. Then also you'll be doing uh, access to ROP laser. So all this forms part of your basic uh, OP uh, training and procedures. So it's an ever winding road. So once you will be in retina OPD, uh, you know, you'll be starting off and then in one to two, after you learn the basics of the OPD, you know, you can manage and see, identify some amount of retinal diseases. You'll be starting off with your OP procedures, your B scans, your lasers, other things. And then in three months, you'll be posted in the ret After three months, once you have a basic training in the OPD, you'll be accessed to the retina uh, operation theater. And then you'll be giving injections. And after the one or two weeks, you know, that's already, by the time it's already six months and you'll be starting your cases uh, silicon oil removal or clearly fixated IOL. These are the initial cases where you can judge the fellows on how they are doing their anterior segment, you know, how they're doing well with their globe management. And then down the line, slowly, slowly, six to eight months, almost towards the end, like, you know, three months before or even six months before your fellowship, depending on the capability, you'll be given uh, retinal detachment cases or, you know, vitreous hemorrhage cases, and you'll be confident in handling them uh, single-handedly. So in the, uh, when you are doing your fellowship, you have to set some goals. It's easy to get lost due, because it's OPD is quite busy. It's easy to get lost. So you have to have your own personal expectation as well as you have to manage the Institute's expectations too. So, and you also have to manage different personalities uh, and gain a collective experience. Not everybody is bad. Not everybody is good, but learn all the good points from everybody. That's what, uh, you know, uh, sets you apart from the others. So you have to have a good clinical education and a self-directed uh, learning. It's like I said, go back and read something and then you'll get to uh, manage the next time in a different way. So at the end of fellowship, you should have a clear plan or an action or an algorithm for managing common uh, retinal diseases. So next coming you have to- one minute remaining, sir. Yeah, coming to maximizing VR surgery. So earlier, before you should do a simulated training, learn your machine, your microscope, the foot pedal, read on retinal, uh, read, go back and read regarding surgery, assist and uh, answer, uh, question the seniors. So simulators, not all institutes will be having, sit with a mentor and learn and see how they do surgeries in a different way. Then once you are an intermediate, do a step properly, then do a case properly. And numbers don't matter. It all matters how you manage the patient. And next day, the post-operatively, the patient should be good. You should do a good job on a single patient. Don't go for numbers. Watch a lot of videos. Okay. And then, so sit. Uh, once you're performing surgery, a mentor will sit with you and assess how you're doing. Learn to put ports properly. Okay. And then once you're advanced in your end of fellowship, record your videos. Discuss these videos with your seniors. Log your cases. Follow up your patients. And also 
teach others, teach more juniors on how you perform. So once towards the end of your fellowship, you can sit single-handedly and manage simple cases. So initially you'll be given silicon oil removals like this. You should know how to do a proper exam, depress the fundus, see the periphery, see the aura. Then you'll be, and if you're, not, if you're complacent, you'll have problems like this, retinal touch, that too with a light pipe when you go inside. Then you'll be managing oil removals along with sclerally fixated intraocular lenses. So all this will decide in the initial phases how you manage well the globe, your anterior segment management and all those things. Then you'll be moving on to simple RDs like this, where the PVD is already there. And once you are confident in your simple RDs, more complex cases where the PVD is not there. So here's a, a video of a fellow trying to induce a PVD. And then you can sit and assist, obviously, scleral buckles. And also you will be given chance to uh, put sutures and putting the bands. So go back and read, look at a lot of videos. We are surgical procedures, uh, you know, a lot of uh, material is available, YouTube, Facebook, iTube, and even on Instagram, Retina Tips is there. You can go back and look at those uh, videos. Try to squeeze in some amount of research. Personally, I did only one or two, I got only one or two papers out during my fellowship. It's, it was mostly after that where I uh, started doing research. But if you have time, you can, that's also a part of uh, learning. So always a multitasking, you have to learn how to start to learn multitasking. You'll feel that there are not many hours in a day. So time management is very important. Work-life balance may be difficult. So you have to fully immerse in the field to gain the most, especially when you are in uh, retina. So after you are finished, you know, you feel like you have had a well-rounded fellowship. You can discuss your options with your mentors and colleagues and see, you know, you can do a self-assessment. Am I good or do I need to continue? So you can continue in the same institute or you can join elsewhere, but under guidance. You feel if you can manage on your own, yes, go ahead, but be wary. And also you have an option of further continuing in pediatric retina or in uveitis. So to conclude, clarity before you enter and during while you're doing, you should have a clarity of the clear goal of what you want to do. When you are in retina fellowship, you should learn and maximize that opportunity. Enhance your clinical skill. That's the most important. Watch, discuss and learn surgery. Sorry, your time is up, sir. Yeah, whatever the path, enjoy the journey and it should be committed to lifelong learning. So thank you. And if you are in retina, it, it is fun and time flies when you're having fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vergis. May I request the next speaker to start sharing the slide? Meanwhile, we can discuss a few points. Uh, so very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Shushir, and you have almost covered all the points that I wanted to discuss. Uh, so one thing uh, that I wanted to ask you was, what is your take on a solo retina practice? I mean, do you think it is feasible uh, in the present scenario? Yeah, a solo retina practice is, uh, is feasible. But as you, uh, you need to have a dedicated team, you know, a dedicated team of uh, sisters. And even uh, if you have like a mentor who, who's guiding you uh, through the practice, it will be easier, uh, at least for the initial period of time, after which then you can be kind of uh, independent. So if you're asking me whether you should go for a solo practice immediately after fellowship, no, I would not uh, recommend it. Because the whole idea is that you should be, uh, you should know how to handle not a case, but how to handle a retina OT. So when you are outside in a practice, when you're doing your own solo practice, you should know how to handle a retina OT by which it, what I mean is that you should know how to handle your complication as well as if you're training somebody, you should know how to handle their complications. So managing a retina OT is different from managing a retina case. So uh, you, after, even after your fellowship, you should be confident in how to manage a retina OT. So once you're confident in that, then I guess you can go ahead with the uh, solo retina uh, practice. Thank you so much, Dr. Shishir. And uh, Dr. Aman, if you are there, your take on life after uh, fellowship in, a, in the real world, in the, uh, you know, in the private setup, your take on that. You see, I very well agree with uh, what Dr. Shishir said that uh, immediately after your uh, fellowship, because uh, during your fellowship, I don't get, I think you get uh, your hands on to the complicated cases like a grade C PVR or a, a diabetic vitrectomy with TRD. So during your fellowship, I guess your goal should be <clears throat> to learn the basics of the surgery. And after that, gradually, see retina has a very long curve. It is not like uh, you will learn everything very quickly. So it has a very long curve. So before going to a private practice, you should learn all the aspects of retina surgery. Like handling a retina OT is a completely different thing uh, 
as compared to just doing a case that was uh, what was uh, said by dr shishir so <clears throat> because there are a lot of aspects attached with it you have to keep the all the equipment ready because during your fellowship you don't learn all these things during your fellowship you learn how to operate and uh, but um, in the retina ot you have to learn about the machine you have to see the microscope you have to see all the instruments which you have to use so there are a lot of aspects before going to a private practice i think one should focus on all the on uh, these aspects and then only you can uh, think about uh, starting into a private practice hello perfect perfect uh, dr kanal let's uh, move ahead with the next talk uh sure we can actually take up is dr siddharth there yeah i am there yes uh, would you Funny give some comments on the things siddharth is also a vr surgeon yeah actually i was listening to talk by dr vargis and it would be just an my talk would be an extension of uh, what dr vargis has said that uh, how the pediatric rop is going to be uh, as a fellowship so what i would understand from his talk is that after 2 years of fellowship the residents are not really much confident because initially they would be going in through screening programs opds then they would uh, be acknowledged with lasers as we were discussing they would be just inducing pvds so full blown surgeries they may not be really confident at the end of 2 years they need more time and going into as a as he mentioned pediatric oncology is a separate uh, field being offered by arvind so that is their choice later on so point being that they have to be more dedicated to taking up a certain specialty uh, individually so if they are totally into ocular oncology then they cannot mix it up with rop that is what i would say so a long term fellowship is a must and their specialty sub specialties after retina can be decided after 2 years that is what i think that 2 uh, years are not just enough for them to build up their confidence that is what i have understood maybe my talk can incite more questions and maybe we can discuss thank you uh, sure yeah. let's move on to dr rashmi deshmukh who will be speaking of international fellowships in uh, in the united kingdom over to you rashmi uh, thanks karan i would like to thank uh, uc for inviting me for this talk so today i'm going to talk about international fellowship uh, in the uk Uh, most of the questions that come regarding an international fellowship in the uk start from um how to shortlist the course up to how to actually reach there so that is what i'm going to give you an overview about so first you shortlist the course and then how you reach the final destination that you have in mind uh, that you want to do a fellowship in this particular place so the different types of fellowships that are available for us as indians to do in the uk would be a clinical fellowship a clinical and research fellowship um a research fellowship which will not have any clinical work or surgical exposure or a proper phd which is anywhere between 3 to 5 years uh, when we say clinical fellowship then you don't have any research sessions in that you just have clinical uh, slots and you have some admin slots where you have to do a little bit of admin work for the department when it is a clinical and research fellowship then you have a balance of both so you might have 2 to 3 days of clinical work and 2 to 2 to 3 days of research work a research fellowship is full time in the lab and clinical research only and phd again depends on the topic that uh, you are pursuing then how would you want to shortlist a course is first you've decided what kind of fellowship you want then this is one of the websites uh, idocs.uk which i used to visit quite frequently to see what all opportunities are there it gives you details about the fellowship which is available including the mentor who would be supervising you and the duration of the course and the royal college of ophthalmologists also has this particular uh, list which also gives you very similar information like the idocs uk where it gives you again which supervisor will be there what is the university and how do you contact them and what is the duration of your course once you have shortlisted then how do you apply for the course so for applying there is this website called jobs.nhs.uk which advertises all the uh, available fellowship slots so it is it comes under a jobs category for them so it will 
uh, show you whether you have a cornea fellowship, a cataract fellowship, whether it is 12 months or 18 months or six months. And uh, the good thing is it always uh, gives in description of what kind of work you should expect and what kind of work they are expecting from you, uh, including the salary and working hours and everything else. So then you could look at these um, this website and then shortlist your jobs and then start applying. Now on this website, you will see usually two kinds of fellowship. One is a post CCT fellowship and the other one is a, just a clinical fellow in ophthalmology kind of a thing. And this one is the one that you are looking for because wherever they mention that it is a post CCT fellowship, that is the one where we are not eligible. CCT is completion of training, certificate of completion of training. So that is not equivalent to MS ophthalmology. CCT is a training which is done there. So if you have done your res residency there, then you are el eligible for this kind of fellowship. If you have done your residency in India, then you need to go for other fellowships which do not mention that they want a post CCT person. But then they can write something like they want somebody who is FRC of part two or equivalent. And we are eligible for that equivalent portion. So MS of Tal is considered equivalent to FRC of. And the second criteria that usually these fellowships will have is that you need a full registration and a license to practice from the General Medical Council. So similar to how we have Indian Medical Association uh, they have the general medical council and you need a license before you start seeing their patients and start operating there. And of course, GMC license would be important if you're looking for a clinical fellowship or a clinical research fellowship, not for the other two. So the next step is how you go about uh, applying for your GMC license. So there are different routes which are available for applying uh, for a GMC license. First is the PLAB test, which is the Professional and Linguistic Assessment Board exam. It is in two steps. I'll talk about it. Second is the sponsorship program that the UK has, through which I had gone. And third is approved postgraduate qualifications. So before you apply for a GMC license through any of these routes, there is an English exam called the IELTS test, which we are expected to appear and clear. Usually it is the academic IELTS that we have to give. There are different kinds of IELTS exams which are available of which the academic IELTS is the one which we are expected to clear as uh, clinicians just to get the license. It has four, four parts of the exam usually done on the same day. One is the reading part in which they just give you a paragraph and you're supposed to answer all the questions. They will assess how you interpret English language. Uh, then there is a writing part uh, where they give you a graph or a picture and you're supposed to describe it in limited number of words. Most of it is doable. Uh, the listening part is where you listen to a conversation. Here you might require a little bit of practice because you need to get used to the accent that those people use and then you need to answer those questions. And then there's a speaking test where somebody just sits in front of you and they talk to you and uh, they assess how your communication skills are. So your overall score is expected to be more than 7.5 and individually you should score a more than seven and then you are eligible to apply for a GMC. Then deciding on the route that you want to take, like I mentioned, there are three different routes which are available for you to apply for the GMC. So once you have applied and cleared your IELTS, then uh, first thing is the PLAP test, which is the first route, which is very common. Uh, people uh, appear for this exam most often. So there are two parts. First is PLAB part one, which has MCQ questions. So they'll give you a short scenario and they'll ask you MCQs on it and you have to answer. Uh, it's a three hour test. Once you clear first part, then is the second part, which is a structured clinical exam where they are going to assess the clinical skills that you have. And you are expected to have clinical skills equivalent to a second year resident in UK. So UK has a seven year residency program of which the first two years are called as the foundation year. So you're expected to have that kind of clinical equivalence. So there they give you 18 short scenarios, clinical scenarios, and then you have a mock consultation. It can include an emergency sometime. There are different stations that are created and you go in and you perform your consultation and they observe how you are doing. Once you have cleared PLAB exam, it is necessary for you to apply for your GMC application within two years. After that, you have to uh, appear for the exam again. That is important. It's the same thing for the IELTS as well. So if you clear an IELTS exam, your score is valid only for two years. 
the next route is the dual sponsorship scheme so when they say dual sponsorship means there are two sponsors that you have when we talk about sponsor that mean there's a person who has trained you and who are ready to vouch for your clinical skills and your ethics so in a dual sponsorship scheme there is a uk sponsor which is uh, involved and there is an indian sponsor the criteria for your indian sponsor is they should be involved in your training of ophthalmology so ideally it should be your um, thesis guide or hod or somebody from your department who has actively seen you in your residency and was involved in your training and is ready to give you a certificate saying you are okay with your clinical skills your uk sponsor usually is the person who is recruiting you there or is your fellowship supervisor there now why there are two routes is because not all uk sponsors can directly sponsor you there is a list on the gmc website uh, where there is a list of sponsors so some universities or some individuals also can act as uk sponsors directly but route b is for people if you have a fellowship in a place which is not a uk sponsor so they act as your primary uk sponsors and your secondary uk sponsor is the royal college of ophthalmology which coordinates with them and gives you a certificate and your indian sponsor again will be the same and the third route is if you have an approved postgraduate qualification for example you just decide to go and do your residency there for 7 years it's your choice so you will have a ccp or you appear for those exams like frcs and frc of so the approved qualifications are frcs of ophthalmology edinburgh and glasgow and mrcs glasgow and MRC, mrcs edinburgh and the royal college in these cases sponsors your gmc license but you after even after your gmc license you still need to have a frc of if you directly want to go for a um, fellowship there and then they work towards your visa once you have a gmc license usually the university uh, helps you get your visa it's the hr department that goes through it so the if you are going through a dual sponsorship scheme then you get a certificate of sponsorship from them saying okay all the sponsorship things are fulfilled and you get a tier 5 visa uh, that um, and if you are going through plab or the royal college of ophthalmology then they sponsor the entire thing so they sponsor your visa via the letter of appointment and then you are working for a tier 2 visa which is a workers visa one minute remaining ma'am yeah i am done and yeah so this is the summary so first you shortlist the course then you apply for your job once your interviews are done and you you know that they are ready to offer you a job you can give your ielts exam decide on the route of your gmc licensing acquire your license and then they arrange for your visa and then you can reach there so the conclusion is that training can be either at a senior level or junior level you can obtain uh, whichever position you want if you apply at the right places it most of the people think it is only research programs that are available there which is not true you can go in for clinical opportunities as well most of the programs have one to two openings a year so some will be once a year some will be six monthly and then each type of fellowship will have its own rules and timelines and requirements which will be very clearly told to you and accordingly you can make your choice thank you very much i'm happy to take if anybody has any questions excellent talk rashmi there is a question in the chat box by dr megha says do plab mm -hmm. tests have any questions only in ophthalmology or medicine in general no it is medicine in general okay so you even when it is emergency also so emergency uh, situation is not an ophthalmic emergency it will be a systemic emergency and they'll see how you respond to it you had also mentioned that uh, the in the uh, uh, that you know the ms is equivalent to that uh, uh, yes there they write frc of or equivalent so there if you have an ms of ophthalmology then there is a process they have which is called as verification of your degree so you just send your degree certificate to them and they verify and if your universe most of the universities of india are uh, approved in that So, like, for example, my MS degree was from JIPMA, so I just had to send it for approval. And if that university is listed with them, then they consider you for the fellowship. What about DNBs and uh, DOs? DOs, yeah. I am not personally aware of if they actually uh, look at DOs or not. But DNBs, they look at because National Board of Examination is included in that. Okay. But even if you have like a DO, I'm sure it comes from a university and it is an approved thing. So. because the thing that they actually look at is the university from which you are trained or the and the college at which you are trained and most of the colleges and hospitals in india i saw on that list 
So I I'm not, I'm I don't know if everybody knows this. Your fellowship in the UK was under you know Dr. Harminder Dua, and that is yes. uh, you know it is to do a fellowship under somebody like you know somebody who's under whose name is one of the layers of the cornea would have been a fantastic experience. What was your experience uh, under him? So when I went there, like I told you, I went for a dual uh, as a dual uh, through the dual sponsorship scheme, where he was my UK sponsor and my Indian sponsor was from Japan. Um, I had take, opted for the clinical and research fellowship so that I get equal surgical opportunities as well with him. And uh, so we had like three days of clinical work and two days of research work. Uh, like we know, it's a five day week for them. I I think it was a good experience in the sense overall also in the UK apart from just being at the University of Nottingham. I uh, there are some good points there are some uh, points which are negative as well uh, but if you are doing just uh, one particular case then you actually get a lot of understanding so there is a um, i mean most of the people know that the numbers are low in the uk which is very true i think that affects how you want to look at it from long term perspective but if you're looking for a short term fellowship then if you even if you are going just for a single uh theta you do come out learning a lot more is what i thought and again because it was a clinical and research fellowship my research experience also in terms of ideas and the academic perspectives i got from there was i think it was yeah it helped me quite a bit so uh thank you rashmi aditi is also uh you know she is a cornea surgeon as well uh would you like to you know give some comparison point you know about the advantages of a cornea fellowship in india and you know then rashmi can again counter it you know because she has done some uh, fellowship both in india and abroad as to what are the advantages and disadvantages of it first aditi then rashmi thanks karan excellent presentation rashmi as usual and so informative uh, we thanks, all learned so much and yeah definitely and rashmi uh, has also done fellowship in india so in india i think we get a lot of uh, numbers uh, depending on the institution that we are doing our fellowship from we get to learn the basics and you know uh, definitely there are the easiness of you know being in your own country that is there uh, i think that was difficult for rashmi <laughs> i remember that <laughs> yeah <laughs> no matter from where you are doing your fellowship you have to you know maximize that time uh do as much as research as possible learn from the surgery as she rightly said you know numbers might vary but as long as you know the right steps how to do it how to you know uh, handle your own complication when you are teaching your someone if you are teaching your junior how to handle their complication so that is very important no matter wherever you are doing your fellowship from once you have learned the basics i think it is very easy to you know implement it no matter where you go whether it's a government job uh, in india a private practice but your concept should be clear your ethics should be clear and definitely your research you should have a good research exposure and the relationship with your you know mentor the teachers that should be uh, very good because they guide you a lot and i know rashmi will agree to that as well so that in that way you know you can utilize your fellowship to the maximum extent no matter which place you are then i think sky is the horizon over to you karan yes any comments from dr aparna as well she is also a cornea surgeon here oh uh, i definitely agree that a uh, fellowship in uk is like Uh, like icing on the cake like if you actually do a fellowship in india and then you have exposure to you know uh, abroad uh, the exposure to something more uh, better facilities and all so it's definitely like an addition to what you have done so yeah that would be my so from all before we move on to the next talk by dr dolikash uh, i would just wrap it up the cornea and the refractive part and, and what would your as the three cornea surgeons you know in the in the program today what would do you be your take on our our guidance on a cornea and a refractive fellowship both of them can i say something on this first yes please yes please so when it comes to cornea and refractive uh, in uk one of the very important things that i would like to point out is that refractive is not done everywhere in the nhs because it's a cosmetic surgery so you have to be very mindful of that part that you might not get as much refractive exposure as you would get in india 
first thing second thing is when it comes to cornea fellowships where you are expecting like so many keratoplasties i think like dr aparna said it should just be an icing on the cake where you just want to refine your skills but your basic skills if you have acquired in india that always helps because the amount the amount of surgeries the number of surgeries that we do here every day is very different from what you would get there there like i said it should just be a refinement of your skill if you are doing one dal you should just know what how best you can do it but you can't be doing your practicing there that you get in india so it is i think i would advise that you should first have a primary fellowship from here and then you go there and fill up your lacunae and your def- deficiencies uh, thank you rashmi and uh, aparna and aditi any comments on the fellowship programs in india regarding cornea and refractive so is aparna taking it this first uh, i think dr aditi can go ahead first okay. i'll uh, yeah. uh so uh, see for refractive definitely there are small term programs as well later on which you can do uh, i'll just tell about my personal experience in my fellowship uh, i got a lot of cornea and ocular surface but my main interest was ocular surface so i chose uh, an institution where i got the best exposure regarding that and then refractive is something uh which you can definitely learn even after that you, there are many short term uh, centers nn is giving a very good course uh, i personally got trained from dr parth biswas so so there are many if you do not get refractive in your fellowship of cornea then later on you can definitely you know learn about it anyways the academics and the theory the patient selection the complication all are dealt maybe hands on exposure is less during uh, the fellowship in some of the institutions but it can be easily learned later on as well yeah i totally agree with that because uh, even when we plan for a fellowship not all uh, centers give you refractive exposure as well it is either going to be only cornea or like refractive workups will be there but then hands on will be very less or probably in the end so if you want exposure of both i think you'll have to inquire and then go ahead with that fellowship and as you told refractive uh, you can go ahead with lot of uh, paid fellowships and like the one with the narayan netralaya and the other one i think dr fogla is coming up with the new yes. course so they can definitely go for a short term because skills in refractive are not much it's all about the planning and the work up that's more important so yeah this would be so thank you rashmi thank you aditi and thank you aparna for the for your wonderful pointers over to you rolika for your talk on the mentor mentee synergy thank, thank you so much karan sir uh thank you yoshi for giving this opportunity to talk and uh, my screen is visible i'm audible yes please go ahead all right so uh i'm rolika bansal currently pursuing my fellowship under dr santosh anave sir in ophthalmic and facial plastic surgery and ocular oncology at center for sight hyderabad and i'll be talking on the mentor mentee synergy so we have all had mentors right from the beginning from like you know our parents onwards in school in college and every mentor has played a very important role in our lives and shaped up or shaped us up into who we are today however fellowship is a phase where the mentor mentee synergy is the most important because it's a one on one interaction and uh, it's very important for you to understand what a mentor means so these are the questions that are often asked by the residents when to apply for a fellowship which institute to apply to and which specialty to choose and which city to go to i feel that a very golden and important question goes unanswered and in fact not asked itself and that is which mentor yes that is the most important question and that question answers every other question that has been popped up so uh, how do you choose the mentor and who do you think makes the first choice the choice is made by the mentor of course but the first choice is by the mentee so yes the ball is in your court because you have to first make the cho- choice you have to apply apply so you have to make sure that you have chosen the right mentor if you have not put everything together and if you don't think that this sync is going to work then no the mentor mentee sync is not going to work and how do you make this choice so the pointers that i kept in mind were attend conferences and webinars be active and overcome your inertia be out there be go and uh, interact with people 
check out surgical videos you might not get the uh, like you know the exposure in your college so it's important for you to go ahead and check out surgical videos of different specialties different mentors and see what goes for you discuss with your professors my professors have played a very important role and have taught me like you know and have encouraged me to go ahead and apply for my fellowship and express your interest to your mentor and this is a very difficult thing to do and i remember when i expressed my intent interest to dr santosh nagar sir and he said you're applying to soon like you know you know it's just 3 years more to go for before you really have to apply and i had it from the day one of my uh, residency of where i want to apply and whom i want to apply to so um what santosh nagar sir told me once was that um, you know write to me on the december before you have to apply so i sat down and i opened my inbox to write an email to him on the 1st of december 2019 and this is what popped up in my email believe it or not this is exactly what happened and this is an article written by sir with where he has mentioned mentoring is a serious business call it coincidence but i'm thankful to that in this article sir has enlisted what a mentor means a mentor is the one who is the one who motivates who empowers and encourages who nurtures self confidence who teaches by example who offers wise counsel and who always raises the performance bar he is absolutely right in saying these but i have an answer to him now and that is what a mentee should stand for a mentee is somebody who masters the art taught by the mentor somebody who embraces the efforts of the mentor and has faith in his or her belief and somebody who never fails to observe it is very important to observe each and every clinical or surgical skill by your mentor and you should be thankful and loyal it's an often forgotten thing but you have to understand that this is your mentor for life and you should be eager to learn and evolve and always remember efficiency is always rewarded you might not know it you might not understand it your mentor might not even express it but it is true so you must remember while you are in your fellowship these are the pointers which nobody tells you but you should understand that this fellowship is based on your mentor's pattern your mentor's comfort zone his or her work your mentor's patience staff rules principles skills everything is about your mentor and you have to understand that you are a part of their program and you have to understand that if the best of it is going to come when you blend well in their pattern so the one thing that you should remember and understand which is very difficult in this covid era is to understand the phases of the mentor or the faces of the mentor i hope my mentor is not watching this but i'm sure that he's always watching me so this is the face of your mentor mostly this is when he's giving me tasks like you know when he is giving me difficult tasks each and every day this is the phase of mentor which he is always trying to perfect my skills or like you know trying to teach me often seen phase by dr santosh nagar where he is like amazed as why am i doing what am i doing and uh, i would call it uh, like a little disappointed this is the more disappointed phase and this is when he is rolling his eyes at me when i am not uh, working as per his expectation this is the phase which we see very often and that is after he is done with the wonderful surgery and i think this is a phase we all go in after the amazing surgery that he puts up and this is mostly in opd i think this is the better one in the opd but this is a phase which i have still not understood or uh, you know uh, like you know this is when he wants to be calm and meditating in his zone and i'm very bad at it because i disturb him most in this zone this is a phase which my seniors have not seen but i have seen that he has for them and that is the phase of achievement that he has and when they finish a fellowship and they go like thank you for you know understanding what i what all i had to teach and this is the phase which i have seen uh, he him having for his for my seniors and that is inner peace achieved when he sees their achievements the so things to remember about your mentor uh are that you have the the mentor has chosen you for a reason the mentor maintains your focus polishes you effortlessly teaches and hones you selflessly and is afraid of you not recognizing your potential often uh, my mentor asks me that you know you don't know what you are supposed to do you don't know why am i pushing you and he's right and because they bring out the best in you and they always want you to excel the things that you should remember as a mentee trust your mentor's instincts and be loyal they have seen more than like uh, 
80 or 100 fellows maybe they know the moment they see a fellow they know what are they looking at what kind of fellow you're going to be what kind of person you have to be carved into observe them very carefully be dedicated and disciplined never get discouraged often you're going to have your mentor uh, be disappointed and you know not agree with you but that's okay you have to compete with yourself only. You don't have to compete with your uh, co-fellows. You don't have to compete with your mentor. You have to only compete and be better every single day. Don't judge your mentor. It's not your place. And be creative and speak up. And remember the lessons always. And it is important for you to hand over these lessons in future one day to you know the next group of mentees. And the synergy that I've been talking about is that your contribution, your mentor's contribution together, that synergy is when your efforts and your output gets multiplied. And this is something Nasir Atal had mentioned in their, uh, in their article very successfully, that is a successful mentor is the one who celebrates the mentor's, mentee's success, listens to them, assesses their progress. And at the same time, a successful mentee has to be productive, identify the right mentor, set your expectations, and have clear career goals. The extended world of mentors that I have had, and I'm thankful for Sir to be introducing them to me. And uh, you know they have taught me a lot. And um, Sir has probably understood of what all we need in our lives. And we learn from everybody including our co-mentees. I'm actually thankful to all of these people, my juniors or seniors, who have taught me one or the other element. Uh, we do not understand what they're trying to do when uh, till we come in their position. So you have to step into their shoes and then only you'll be understand what they were going through. And uh, thank you for introducing me to this world. And um, you have to make sure that you get the right flavor of your m, &M. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really, it's such a very wonderful presentation and some very important points that you have uh, shown to us and all our listeners. Uh, what uh, the takeaway from her talk would be that at the heart, at the core of your training program is always the mentor. The Institute, of course, has a lot of importance, but uh, the mentor, I also believe, uh, is the most important pivot around which your training revolves around. Uh, Dr. Karan, your take, and then we can uh, have some input from the panelists as well. Absolutely, a men uh, mentor. Actually, I have had the privilege of having many mentors in my life, from my PG days uh, uh, to my you know fellowship, and for now also for the even the simplest of doubts or silliest of procedures. And I'm a couple of years into my practice that I still do call them up and sir, I'm समझ नहीं आ रहा है मुझे इसमें क्या करना है and just not this and also in life expectations now i'm entering private practice now so then i had called up you know kp sir krishna prasad sir and you know sir what should i do and he's like and then he guided me on some things and then there are multiple uh, you know mentors in which who have been contacting on which machines to buy and just just not the academic thing the mentor is going to stay for your entire life from academics to your clinical and surgical thing, to your practice and to whatever you do in the future. So a uh, big thank you to them. And th the reason what I am today is because of my mentors. Agreed, uh, Roleka? <laughs> Absolutely, sir. They are mentors for life. And actually, more than we can recognize our potential, they know what they are looking for. I mean, uh, they've, as I've said, that they've seen more than 80 fellows. So uh, in their life, they have, and Dr. Raksha Rao had once uh, commented in one of her presentations that they, you get your experience out of their experience, which is already of past 25 years. So they know what they're looking for. And that is why you should just let it be in their hands and let them hone you and let them carve you. I think Dr. Harika is here and she loves absolutely. I was going to take comments from Harika only. She's done, uh, she's been your senior there and done a fellowship under Santosh sir only. What are your comments? And you already mentioned that, you know, there are a lot of been memories that have been refreshed by the pictures there. So Harika. Yes, thank you so much, Rolika. I really could uh, just glance through all my uh, fellowship days. That is too refreshing to have. And she's actually absolutely right. And uh, what mentor we choose is really, really important. And once we choose the right mentor and we can just relax, the things go on their part. They'll automatically go. Maybe you have few good days. Maybe you have few bad days. You might end up crying someday, but definitely 
uh, trust me at the end that is really really gratifying and there won't be any day you won't recall your fellowship maybe during some surgery or you, when you see some patient that is really really gratifying and mentor is really very important and thank you rolika once again excellent presentation thank you to you also for being a part of it ma'am <laughs> my pleasure thank you uh, so uh, we can now devakant yeah uh, yes let's move uh, any yeah. more comments before we move on to the next uh, small uh, we have few small talks left Okay, Doctor Kanal. Let's invite the next speaker. Yeah, Doctor Siddharth Madan. Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. I'm just sharing my screen. Yeah. So he will be speaking about the ROP training program. Over to you, Doctor Siddharth. Yeah, just a second. My slides are visible. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, please do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, good morning, all. Uh, I am Dr. Siddharth Madan. I am currently working as an assistant professor in uh, GTB Hospital, which I joined last year only. And uh, I will be. I am giving a few comments on surgical ROP fellowship because ROP I feel is a little neglected topic. and uh, mostly uh, the primary vr fellowships mostly cater to around the adult uh, retina unless it is a part of uh, a special pediatric uh, vr fellowship is a ongoing topic with that so uh, slides okay so i have no financial disclosures we all know that WHO has estimated that there are 15 million preterms birth in a year. With the increasing number of ICUs and poor neonatal care, there is increased number of severe ROP cases. And to add to that, stage five is a presentation which we mostly come across in our centers because they the, these children have never been screened. So this was a study conducted by RP Center in 2016, where 32.4 percent of outborn babies were referred to them with ROP. and 89% were never screened 74% were picked up by the parents when they noted leukocoria ophthalmologist only referred 25% cases and pediatricians never referred any child so it is there comes the importance of screening these children international guidelines are different we are all well aware but in the indian scenario the guidelines are different so we have to screen more number of babies and unless we come across with a leukocoria at the end and then we are not left with much so to apprise everybody of the screening guidelines the management guidelines are also well formulated it based on the etp ro etrop cooperative group so we are all well aware of the management guideline so how to treat these rop babies we have anti vegf laser and surgery laser is a gold standard treatment level 1 evidence exists from the etp rop study and it is a definitive treatment unless the child comes to with a loss to follow up and may they they may present with a late recurrence anti vegfs this is have given a totally new dimension to rop management so all drugs ranging from bevacizumab ranibizumab and even few eyes few centers are injecting ilia in these eyes but anti vegfs have a double edged sword not everyone can inject these rop babies babies with uh, the eyes are different so it's not that the fellows who have no, never had exposure to anti-vegf injection <laughs> evidence for anti-vegf injections exist reactivations can happen and complications are well known they can be endophthalmitis lens touch so idly such injections should always be administered as we do in our ot setting and it should be done to eye separately with separate uh, instruments having said that children may progress we can come across with stage 4a but i was i am regularly hearing to talks by dr parijath who i uh, look up upon to and uh, he has also emphasized that early surgery is important in such babies unless we wait for full funnel to close and then uh, then the visual potential is minuscule so uh, early surgery is a key intervention 
and it has various advantages and that is the outcome we look for in babies who present with eyes like this so for perspective of surgical rop fellowship if we come across as per this latest classification if we come across a stage 5 where the optic disc is visible we will are on the side of early surgery unlike in 5b when the funnel is totally closed we may not want to operate and in 5c stages some uh, centers and some surgeons it's the choice of the surgeon but it is usually said that the all the results are poor there's a risk of thysis bulbi to happen but you may give a triable of navigable vision to these children by surgery so various surgical approaches have been uh, uh, mentioned we have 25 gauge 27 gauge lens sparing vitrectomy clear corneal surgery and a hybrid technique is known so who is going to operate these babies so vitro retina fellowships are being delivered at various centers across india however pediatric vr as a as a specialty is mostly a part of long term vr fellowship uh, having said this eyes of a child are different from that of adults and lifetime of follow up is indispensable so i went across and researched the various fellowship programs mentioned on the aios portal i uh, shortlisted the centers which were offering pediatric vr fellowship however specifically rop fellowship was only mentioned in one or two uh, of the centers so i had to go back i uh, see the i saw the uh, contact ids i mailed the uh, contact person of these centers i have had a feedback from the fellows and my colleagues and this is a table which i formed so to mention uh, how is the rop training program at rp center it is now at present short postings with only two or more senior residents who are posted at a rotational basis and to a maximum of 3 years which was in the last few years when my colleagues were also part of the rop uh, screening program so there is no separate rop fellowship program at present in rpcs and the uh, residents who are posted in their short postings they are given around 100 lasers or to around 30 anti vegf injections and the ones who have a entire tenure of 3 years they are give, doing around 300 lasers and more than 50 lasers uh, 300 lasers and more than 50 anti vegfs i would correct here and the surgeries are mostly uh, based on observation hardly any uh, residents operate but the ones who are uh, uh, considered surgically confident so they may be given two or three surgeries at the end of their tenure as far as pgi chandigarh is concerned a duration of 3 years where the senior residents are posted they do about 200 eyes of in uh, in total for lasers and anti vegf injections the surgery offered to such senior residents is almost nil to about 2 to 3 if the level of the confidence of the operating surgeon is good enough at the arvind eye care system as we were hearing to the talk by dr varkis there is a 12 month surgical pediatric retina fellowship program which is after the 3 years of post graduation or once the student has completed 2 years of long term fellowship in vr but this is mostly for uh, uh, as per their website it mentions pediatric retinal diseases including retinal retinoblastoma so i had contacted the uh, dr shah for this input and he mentioned that mostly adult surgical and surgical pediatric retina cases are given to the residents and these pediatric retina cases are mostly rops so surgery number of cases given for surgical exposure are dependent on the surgical expertise of the candidate looking at the uh, website of arvind eye care hospital there i could find that vr fellowships are usually for 2 years and after that it is a one year fellowship program where uh, the expertise is offered in rop mostly in the form of anti vegfs and lasers having reviewed the lvpi i get or got a reference from one of these fellows who underwent one month training for rop he was given expertise in lasers however surgical exposure was nil at shankar eye foundation they have a comprehensive vr training program there is no specific rop fellowship which is being offered and this is a part of comprehensive vr training program the surgical exposure here is also not much however the fellows assist the chief operating surgeon 
At the Nitralyam in Kolkata, they also offer the comprehensive VR fellowship, which includes pediatric retina, includes lasers and surgery. Surgeries are offered, as I was told. At the MGMI Institute, Raipur, they have a three-month fellowship program. This was mailed to me by the director of MGI I Institute. Number of ROP screening sessions in three months include 30. Number of babies screened are 200 hands-on. ROP lasers, hands-on are given to the extent of four to five. Number of intravitreal injections are mostly observation as the senior faculty are giving. So are the number of surgeries, which are five to seven, and they are mostly observation. So number of fellows trained at MGMEI are seven. So that is the expertise offered. IQ hospitals, the duration of surgery, is, uh, the duration of fellowship is two years. They have currently one VR fellow and that, and that too, this fellow has done one laser independently and assisted around 10 lasers. Center for Sight has short-term medical retina and long-term VR fellowship. However, there is a no specific ROP fellowship. At Lady Harding Medical College, where I spent around three years of my senior residency and further two years, so I had done almost 50 lasers and more than 30 anti-VEGF injections. I am currently working at UCMS. Uh, the senior residents there are posted with us for three years in one, uh, one team. So since last one year when I have joined, we have initiated lasers and anti-VEGFs and SRs are under training. Surgic, surgeries are yet to start as the machine is the equipment is yet to be uh, procured for these small babies. So I would conclude by saying that ROP is an emerging and evolving challenge. There are limited numbers of centers who are dedicated to ROP screening and management. In the era of anti-VEGFs, the risk for its non-judicious use and over-treatment is likely uh, to be administered by the untrained. So one must not hurry to laser. Early surgery in selective cases may be given for better outcome. So I still feel that ROP fellowship should be a separate program in dedicated centers. And this should be after the candidate or a fellow has gained sufficient experience, say around two years of a long-term VR fellowship and may take ROP as a subspeciality because the management for these babies is mostly different. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madan, for such a well-researched talk. And I personally believe that all of us, uh, all retina surgeons and even uh, general ophthalmologists should be uh, well-trained in at least screening for ROP. And all retina surgeons should be well-versed with uh, lasers and injections. Uh, and yes, uh, surgery is a very challenging aspect uh, of ROP management. And a lot of pe uh, people prefer to do it in a, in a better and a larger setup. Uh, so, uh, what uh, challenges do you think if uh, you are also practicing ROP? So, in terms of screening and uh, the medical and surgical man uh, medical management in terms of laser, what challenges do you feel are there and uh, what somebody who wants to pursue ROP, maybe as a career or as a part of his or her career, so what things you should keep in mind? Yeah, so what I would want to add that I, in my experience over the last five years, what I've seen most of these babies who are referred to us Firstly, the residents are not much exposed, the uh, junior residents or the postgraduates at various medical colleges, they're not exposed to ROP that much because that is not being catered to specifically. So a scleral examination with scleral indentation is hardly performed. At times, we have also observed our fellows just having a look at the posterior pole, think, thinking everything is normal and the disease is progressing in the periphery. So unless the residents are well-trained, they have seen how the examination is basically to be performed, they would never know. So that is first thing that the correct technique is important. Secondly, a good neonatology backup is very important because if you want to laser or you want to give injections to these babies, mean you may not always get anesthesia fitness because there will be a lot of issues, hemoglobin to be built up. If you want to give them blood transfusion, the disease would worsen. So you would want to have a neonatology team who are more confident in managing these babies. And it's a topical anesthesia where you want to give these procedures. So best to have a good neonatology backup. And if not, then you request the pediatrician to assist because at times you have seen four month, five month old baby being referred for a first ROP screen. So that is not the right thing. So screening guidelines should be clear. Neonatologists should be dedicated and they should be... Uh, uh, well uh, approachable and they are usually because in our setup uh, what I have seen in Kalavati Hospital in Lady Harding hardly we had any problem even the outbound babies were promptly admitted 
and uh, we used to give them injections free of cost. So screening guidelines are important. Neonatology backup is very important. Surgery is indicated in selective cases, but that can only be performed in a tertiary level center where you have a good neonatologist, neonatology anesthesia facility available. So I would still feel that for the trainees, they should first know how to screen. Lasers, they can observe under uh, supervision. Then they can do a few lasers because if they do laser, nothing much. If they can't give injection, they do at least a laser in the periphery that will still give a reasonably good outcome in these babies. So I feel a training program is very important. Unless they do it, they won't know it. I think. Perfect points. And one horrifying experience that I would like to tell everyone here. Uh, so I had recently a, a baby gone blind uh, because of ROP. They came to me almost at seven or eight months. And I was very frustrated why an examination was not performed. Uh, but the pediatricians had advised ROP screening. He had gone to some ophthalmologist who had examined the patient uh, through a torchlight. So, I mean, these things is, uh, are something that we should all avoid. And this is uh, at the level of criminal negligence. So all of us should train ourselves and uh, help these ROP babies. Uh, Dr. Karan, over to you and let's wrap up the session. Yeah, next we have Dr. Harika Regni. Uh, uh, Dr. Harika, are you there? Yeah, so Dr. Harika has actually done a long-term fellowship in oculoplasty and then, you know, she did a facial aesthetics course under Dr. Kasturi, ma'am, at uh, Sri Shankar Deva Nitralay Gohati. So what I would ask you on what, boy, what is your take on a long-term versus, versus a short-term oculoplasty course and additional courses such as facial aesthetics, what would be your guidance for the young ophthalmologist? Over to you, Harika. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir. I won't be taking much time. So I was asked to comment on this uh, facial uh, aesthetic fellowship. So basically what I say is this periocular and facial aesthetics is an ophthalmologist domain. So as per an International Society of Aesthetic Plastic Survey, so what they have noticed is there is a growth in the surgical and non-surgical cosmetic procedures every year. And to our surprise, India is among the top 10 countries where these uh, procedures are being done. And the most common surgical procedure done is blepharoplasty and the non-surgical procedures are this Botox injections and the fillers. And unfortunate part is 80% of this blepharoplasty and 90% uh, uh, of this Botox and 70% of this fillers, they are all done by the plastic surgeons or the cosmetic surgeons and our ophthalmologists play a very minor part, minor role in that. So the, and one more unfortunate part is all these patients might have visited an ophthalmologist for any uh, concern, be it refraction or cataract. And our cells, if we are, if we ignore or be ignorant on any wrinkles or their lax skin or any other aesthetic thing. So uh, it is a lack of opportunity, both for the patient to get it corrected and for our cells to enhance our aesthetic practice. So coming to the training part, if given an option, long-term training is the best. There is no replacement for that. But if uh, someone has, are, is uh, keen on this uh, short-term basic approaches, then uh, what I say is there should be a lot of dedication and there should be a lot of planning before even we go and uh, start our short-term fellowship. What uh, I suggest is we should be thorough with our uh, theoretical knowledge before even going for our uh, short-term fellowships. So uh, any workshops or uh, hands-on training programs will be very useful to really grab it and improve on our uh, surgical skills. So uh, usually uh, we, uh, this Botox and these fillers, these are uh, uh, as these uh, the courses are uh, like a promotional courses are being organized by the manufacturers itself and uh, our uh, all in your ophthalmic society and Oculoplastic Association of India. They have dedicated facial aesthetic sessions in their uh, conferences and definitely hands-on training sessions in their physical sessions. So these are a very important platforms for our ophthalmologists to grab the opportunity to enhance our skills where if we are really strong with our theoretical knowledge. So uh, what I uh, say is uh, this facial aesthetics really has a good scope. And for someone who wants to practice solely oculoplasty, this facial aesthetics also serves as a, uh, to increase our revenue uh, in our practice. So uh, I urge all the young ophthalmologists to please be aware of all these things and to 
pick up to counsel create awareness among the patients and uh, you uh, to choose this uh, oculoplasty and facial aesthetics as a sub specialty fellowship thank you so much thank you dr harika uh, i think we can now conclude the session i would like to thank all the panelists and the speakers for giving their valuable time uh it was really an excellent session and would have definitely been beneficial for all the young ophthalmologists and other ophthalmologists of india and the world uh over to you avanish for the next session we can take a screenshot if everybody is can turn on their cameras we can just take a screenshot you know of the session everybody please turn on your cameras okay hello harika how are you hello, okay one two three say cheese one second nobody has said cheese okay cheese <laughs> okay over to you avanish thank you so much for the session wonderful session dr karan excellent Dr. session thanks thanks a lot hi aditi yeah hi yeah, bye bye. 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 bye bye lovely session guys uh thank you everyone and a uh, great session dr devakant and dr uh, karan i think the speakers were very good and uh, there were a lot of insights about your fellowship programs now coming moving further with our session what we can see here is uh, post fellowships uh, what exactly to be done and uh, you know that is where our uh, session comes into picture where we are actually talking about the post fellowship conundrums where we get the gyans from our experience use so we have a panelist here we have dr rohan here uh, we have uh, dr rohan is uh, presently the uh, medical director at cki institute saharanpur he is also a consultant at vision eye center mumbai and he has done his fellowship in phaco and refractive surgery from narayan netralaya bangalore uh, we have dr chintan shah here he is presently uh, a consultant at uh, uh, Dr. Chintan is, yeah. So Dr. Chintan is actually a consultant uh, in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus uh, at Sadguru Netrale Chikitsale at uh, Sadguru Netra Chitra Chikitsale at uh, Chitrakoot, and he has operated more than ten thousand adult and pediatric cases, and he has more than thirty publications to his name. We have Dr. Sahil Bandari. Uh, he's uh, a VR surgeon. He is presently working at Guru Hasti Chikitsale. Paper City in Rajasthan. He has completed his long-term fellowship and the NB from Arvindai Hospital, Pondi. And he was uh, for he was also a senior resident at Ames Jodhpur before this. We have Dr. Gunjan Budhi Raja uh, as our next panelist. Uh, she has uh, she is presently working in IQ for Specialty Hospitals and uh, she has completed a long-term fellowship in cornea and refractive and ocular surface at Shroff Eye Charity Hospitals. So first, we'll move on to the uh, session. We have Dr. Rolika Bansal. She'll be speaking upon the metamorphosis from a resident to a consultant. Uh, Dr. Rolika is presently a fellow uh, working under Dr. Santosh Nawar Sir at uh, Center for Sight, Hyderabad. So, Dr. Rolika, are you there? Can you just yeah? So, Dr. Rolika, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'll be talking on the metamorphosis. Uh, my screen is visible, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'll be talking on the metamorphosis from a resident to a consultant, and I know that I have put a very dark and dingy wallpaper out there, but that is exactly how a resident feels when they enter from MBBS to MS, or or uh, DOMS for that sake. So. Um, talking about what is metamorphosis it's a process in which someone or something changes completely into something different and as franz kafka has put it across that i cannot make anyone understand what is happening inside me i cannot even explain it to myself so it's a change that you will not even understand or realize but you will go through throughout the phase from your residency to your fellowship and to being a consultant and thereafter so if i put across the evolution it would be like from mbbs coming down to residency which includes ms dms dnb secondary dnb and then moving on to a fellowship or sr ship assistant professor associate professor professor and even beyond that so throughout all this you won't even realize the changes that you are going through 
often you come across a path multiple times in your career you will come across a path where there will be different ways to choose you will not know where to go to but this is exactly how you evolve into a some some person a, a new person now this evolution could either be subtle like from a caterpillar slowly growing into a butter, butterfly or a major transformation that people go through and it's okay either way it is okay to be whoever you are and to understand how you would you, how would you like to evolve uh talking about from mbbs to residency so during residency what do you face and what do you feel uh this program has been crafted pretty well because repeatedly several speakers have pointed out these pointers which i'm going to enlist but it's for your uh, you know it's it's for your benefit that i'll be repeating the same and that is entering the world of ophthalmology can be appalling because it can be a little scary it's not like how it's going to be like you know the people think that it's from uh, it's it's going to be an easy world no it's not it is pretty complicated and it is i'm glad that there are so many uh, sub specialties in ophthalmology and you need to plan ahead of time i would say that the first day of your residency is when you should plan you should have a three year or two year or four year plan what are you going to do next which fellowship you are going to take up where are you going to go everything should be sorted in your head you have to explore all the specialties many institutes do not have the opportunities of uh, you know providing you with all sub specialties so it is your uh, you know uh, uh, it's your responsibility to go through videos attend conferences and explore the sub specialties which are available for you watch videos in life surgeries and understand what gives you a rush it's important for you to understand your surgical rush attend conferences as i said and divide your day and read duty yes residency should, residency should be a fun zone but you should still be able to divide and read i did not do so but i'm thankful to the covid times that i got a very good uh, you know uh, break time after my residency where i could study so uh, stay humble throughout your residency because uh, with humility you will be able to learn more it's not possible sometimes to be humble in whatever you are doing but try to do that try to put it Uh, as a part of you and participate actively in each and everything that is possible so if nothing ever changed there would be no such things as butterfly so you have to change you are going to change and you have to understand that learning the basics and avoiding distractions is quite important uh, our uh, professors and our mentors were very lucky that they did not have so many distractions we do so it is important for us to cut short, cut down the screen time and get to work follow instructions of your professors and seniors my professors my mentors in uh, my uh, residency have played a very important role in guiding me and being there for me uh, write parallel exams you don't know when you will need what so if it ico fico or fco or even uh, usmle for that sake just write the exam it doesn't matter you're just going to read a little more compete with yourself only even if the world around you feels that you're competing with them it is really not so because your whole competition is about you tomorrow you have to be a better person than what you were today and uh, trust an advisor and follow their advice paperwork is quite important i used to tell my juniors that paperwork is like you know you have to understand how to get beside you know how to overcome the law work and so everything should be precise and perfect because you don't know which paper is going to be used against your you know it can be used as a litigation phase wise development is important as a junior there were certain roles that you had to play i might not have played extremely good role as a junior but you learn that through all your phase i might not have been a perfect senior but i have learned what it is to put in the elements together and even now we are learning it so every single person plays an important role in your life and please try to participate in research it might not be the thing that you would like to do but you don't know how it will be and you have to want to learn to fly so much that you're willing to give up being a caterpillar so you have to put in your efforts coming to the phase of fellowship that is you have to be calm and patient in this phase and you have to read extensively it was not about ms you have to read beyond you have to read through articles you have to read through books which are specific to your speciality you should have a virtual one year plan or two year plan it is very important because there is a timeline that you are following here and as my consultant says that whatever you learn in ms if it, it was if in your residency if it was x amount in 3 years you will now be learning 10x in 1 year so it's very important for you to rush up keep it easy and yet be in charge and pay attention to small details 
and learn the elements of a complete setup because next you're going to evolve into a consultant. So it is important for you to know and observe what every person is doing, what every staff member is doing and be open to learning from everyone. Have a, a subtle way around it and observe the surgical skills. Each and every movement should be observed. Now, this is the time where you have to pay extreme attention to your details because when you forget uh, what, you know, you, you, you remake yourself. For a caterpillar to become a butterfly, it must forget it was a caterpillar at all, right? But then it will be as if the caterpillar never was and there was only ever a butterfly. You have to evolve. So try to multitask. It's very important. You're not going to be in, you know, it's so easy in MS. Plan your day ahead. Consider an international fellowship. It's always important. Many people have, many speakers have mentioned today that it's important for you to go and learn from the experiences that people uh, have in countries abroad. Learn to balance your life. This is going to be a prob problem for many people because related to age, you have to balance between family and uh, your work. It's fine. And learn to have teamwork. Every single person plays an important role. And every day has to be better. There is no room for error. Be perfect. Whatever you do, try to look at it twice. You're still going to find errors in your work. Uh, when I look at my work, which I had done three months back, I wonder what was I thinking that time. That means that I had made mistakes too. So today I have to learn from my mistakes made yesterday. And you have one minute sure, remaining. Make sure that you publish as much as you can. Then comes the phase which I do not have the experience to talk about is to turn into a consultant. So remember to conclude that I will say that in this phase, you have to learn that you have to grow. You have to become more mature. You have to take, out, take on your clinical and surgical experience. Remember to self-analyze and self-criticize. It's okay to do so. Be determined and stay confident and try to become a multitasker. Balance out and be an innovative researcher. Go beyond your comfort zone. Till you're comfortable, you cannot grow. Take charge and make decisions and form a team. These are the elements required, required for your metamorphosis. So uh, a little darkness is all right. Don't worry because it won't last forever. And it is important for and you need it because that's how you grow and a little caterpillar needs it. It is in the darkness that you will realize your wings. So it's important for you to grow throughout this darkness. Thank you. Excellent talk, uh, Dr. Rolika. I think uh, you have actually put in how actually that metamorphosis actually happens and that transit, you know, where you start actually being under the umbrella and, you know, like you start taking independent decisions about it. Uh, at this moment, I think uh, let me introduce our other uh, speakers also so that we can have a good discussion about these topics where we can actually uh, move ahead as to how, how things happen. We have Dr. Ro uh, Rohit Moti here. He's presently working as a, he's a VR surgeon and he's wor working in cent Centra Clinic and Hospitals in Mumbai. Uh, we have Dr. Bhavik Panchal. He's the head of LVPI uh, uh, Vizac. And we have uh, Dr. Akshay Nair here. Dr. Akshay Nair needs no introduction. He is a practicing uh, oculoplasty and ocular oncology surgeon at Aditya Jyotai Hospitals. And we have Dr. Samiksha Agrawal. She is a VR surgeon presently working uh, at uh, Krishna Eye Foundation Eye Clinic, Prayagraj. She has done a long-term fellowship and, uh, in VR surgery and ROP at Narayan Nitrada. So let's start with Dr. Chintan Shah. Dr. Chintan, uh, can you give us some practical tips when you know you actually feel like you, know, like you are actually getting into the groove of a consultant? So when do you actually feel that, okay, you are ready or maybe you are in that position of actually taking, you know, like decision-making techniques and, you know, what are the practical tips you would want to give us to our, uh, to our team and for the sessions? Dr. Chintan, you're there? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as discussed, it is very important to learn at each and every phase during our training, be it MBBS or the post-graduation or the fellowship. So the learning never ends. That is the first thing. So you cannot expect that, yes, I learn everything in my fellowship and that, that's all. So it is very important to understand that we have to keep learning at each and every day. We need to read at each and every day, read new articles, read new techniques, read new surgeries, watch surgeries and learn everything as much as we can. So it's a very difficult thing to say that one 
uh, that when one is ready so it is up to the individual that uh, how much training he or she needs in a particular field what else uh, we can do the international fellowships and all and then if at the end of fellowship or if after some years of consultancy uh, consultancy in your institutes if you think that yes now you can take independent decisions yes now you can manage uh, your patients very well then it's time maybe you can move on you can do you can explore further things and then you can start your own practice but the most important thing for me is to keep learning and keep knowing new things at all the stage of your life uh, thank you dr chintan uh, i would like to ask dr gunjan here about her speciality and what uh, what practical tips she can actually give it to to the people gunjan are you there yeah yeah so uh, uh, good morning everyone uh, of course uh, i am practicing cornea and uh, before uh, joining uh, consultancy i was uh, doing cornea in an institutional setup so definitely uh, the things were more systematic and uh, the procurement of tissues and everything was so um, well aligned but uh, when once i've started uh, my practice as a cornea surgeon i have understood what are the practical problems i wanted to see everything i have to know from where uh, you know lot of manufacturers are supplying uh, all the uh, all the all the materials that are required for my uh, surgery so before my surgery i need to sometimes plan a lot um, because before that i have i was you know uh, under the umbrella of the institute definitely because all the things were available and i just wanted to you know uh, uh, tell everyone that it's very important when you're doing fellowship please uh, you know when you're finishing you at least know some uh, suppliers or something uh, instruments surgical uh, instruments etc from where you can procure when you are uh, going out uh, for practice thank you dr gunjan I think we can move on to the next topic. Uh, we have Dr. Rohit Modi here. Dr. Rohit Modi would be speaking about freelancing, deciding your own attachments to hospitals. Dr. Uh, Rohit, please uh, upload your uh, presentation, please. Dr. Rohit. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll do that. Just give me a second. Is my slide visible? Yes. Yes, doctor. Yeah, yeah. So thanks to Yossi, uh, my alma mater LVPI, and all my referring surgeons. Doctor Rohit, your voice is slightly uh, not audible. If you can increase the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it audible enough now? Uh, not much, but if you can come uh, a bit closer. Yeah. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. so uh, the first and the foremost uh, important thing which i have learned over a period of 7 uh, to 8 years of practice is defining the area of practice i am a big fan of going hyper local first of all it saves lot of time now for example you know i am working in a city like mumbai and uh, si this city i believe is you know like five to six cities put together so if i think that i can cover the whole city of mumbai that would be wrong so if i just focus on a small area my availability increases i save a lot of time by you know uh, by not traveling a lot and uh, you know it increases my patient time whereas if somebody is practicing in smaller towns one can think of covering the whole town or probably the adjoining town also but we need to realize that it takes some time you know to build up a practice in a particular area or in a particular hospital especially if you are starting with a new sub specialty practice and as your practice grows the traveling time eats away your practice so you may you know have to give up certain hospitals where you are practice earlier because at uh, some other hospitals the practice has picked up better and that's where your hard work you know doesn't reap that benefits so you have sown the seed but the fruits are eaten up by the other person who comes in after you that's why going hyper local makes sense now what does the attachment does for you that is something you need to define especially you know, if you are immediately fresh post fellowship pass out whether it is giving you academics now you know if you are attached to a medical college as a visiting uh, surgeon 
you can uh, teach uh, postgraduates you can publish papers whether it is giving you the additional surgical exposure which you haven't got during your fellowship or post graduation days or it creates a name in the community now if you are attached to the you know local community charitable hospitals it uh, creates a good name in the community which ultimately translates into good practice in your private practice and last obviously money part comes into consideration now the most important thing which i have learned in practice is time the time is the most precious com uh, commodity i remember early on in my practice one of my contemporary retina uh, you know colleague had uh, left uh, from one of the hospitals i had recently joined and to my uh, surprise that hospital was really giving good amount of remuneration and i happened to meet him in a conference and asked him what made you leave that attachment and he told me rohit it was not valuing my time because the traveling time i was spending to reach that hospital was huge and he told me a few years down the line you will also be you know deciding uh, you know whether to value a particular attachment or not so it's important to understand the value of time that's why restrict your visiting days learn to say no to the attachments which may not be for long term and i would recommend no attachment should be twice a week if you're freelancing probably once a week and give time to develop your own practice and you will get other opportunities as your experience grows so if you have some time in hand additional time in hand it is easier to pick up more fancier attachments later and on the topic of remuneration you know when we are young uh, you know freshly passed out we are looking out for work and we are ready to work at a lower cost also but can you put a value to your time and these are the few things which i have learned over a period of two years one is a notional value and other is wage per hour calculation now notional value is you know if i uh, target let's say i value my per day earnings at 1 lakh rupees and i am working for 10 hours a day so per hour my value is 10000 rupees so if i join an attachment are they giving me enough patience and work to generate 10000 rupees as a surgeon fees that's the notional value i put it on my time now wage per hour calculation is going to come in the subsequent slides and always take traveling time into consideration so hospital or an attachment may be paying you fabulously well but if it takes half a day to reach that hospital trust me it is not worth joining that and be frank in the beginning about remuneration so initially you know when we are juniors when we speak to senior directors we may be taken for a ride so if you're clear speak to your senior colleagues about how the remuneration works in a particular city because it can change from place to place and be frank with your expectations now this is an example how your uh, you know wage per hour calculation works so you can calculate your monthly average uh, salary divided by the number of days let's say 25 days or the working days in a month and then you can calculate the per daily salary and divided by the number of hours you put in every day so this will help you understand which attachment is paying you more than the average which attachment is paying you less than the average and it's okay to continue with the attachment which are paying you less than the average because they may be giving you something more like academics or name in the community which in the long run may make a big impact and another thing especially in big cities is the choice to you know uh, do sub specialty practices with solo practitioners or join corporate multi specialty hospitals now corporate hospital i mean not corporate ophthalmology you know setups i mean corporate hospitals uh, where you know you have cardiology orthopedics nephrology all into one so they look you know these big hospitals attachments look fancier on you know, visiting cards but they may not have huge sub specialty load they may be okay for a comprehensive ophthalmology practice but i uh, in my experience solo practitioners provide more high quality specialty cases and also surgical conversions are more because there's a touch of uh, you know that person who's practicing over there who's convincing the patient that you are the best person to operate for that particular condition and corporate hospitals most of the times don't pay well they have a lot of hidden charges like bed charges visit charges you know admission charges which are not there when you are practicing you know doing it in a smaller setup 
so the ultimate surgeon remuneration out of that fat fee the patient pays is very less there are certain advantages obviously with freelancing is that there are multiple sources of income and you you know the patient flow is from multiple places so if one of the hospitals is not doing at a particular time well the other hospitals income compensate for the overall uh, net monthly flow and it increases the outreach you are able to meet different uh, people from different strata of the society a lot of people start knowing you 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 know you get to interact with other doctors your referral base increases but my two paisa aka my two cents on this is own practice is most rewarding i have you know transitioned from just doing freelancing retina and uva practice to slowly starting up my own practice and uh, i am able to provide a much more better quality of care there are standardized protocols which i am following and i can see a drastic difference in the surgical outcomes as well and ultimate goal of for most of us is to have our own patient base because you know the referral surgeons uh preferences may change over time some of the centers which are well paid one minute remaining sir yeah uh their kids may join uh you know back so the things may change in a few years so if you have a own patient base it makes a whole lot of difference in practice and this gives us the maximum returns in the long term thank you for the opportunity uh thank you dr rohit it was an excellent presentation and what i understand is like you have given the nuances of actually how to go about with freelancing uh, i would like to ask dr rohan mehra what is his take on this uh, with since he is actually based in saharanpur and he goes for visiting in mumbai so how much that is worth and as you have said in your uh, talk uh, dr uh, uh rohit where you have actually uh, talked about like having your own practices better than actually going in for corporates or anything and uh, if is dr rohan here can you can you talk us talk uh, yes 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 i am here so uh, excellent presentation dr rohit and uh, what i would like to say is that uh, you know he spoke about time i feel that time is actually the currency uh you know we always uh, sort of go after the money but the ultimate goal should really not be money and it should really be how you are spending your day because we are overworked we are overburdened especially in you know when we get attached to some other uh, attachment which in my opinion uh, as sir said you know is paying you less and taking more out of you so the ultimate goal has to be to be able to strike that balance between of course learning getting the money and spending time with your loved ones and your family so what's important is that if you are going to multiple centers for freelancing you have to make sure that you know you don't spend half a day as sir said in traveling you've got to make sure that you plan your travels in a way that you travel at night and you get the entire day of work over there as sir spoke about that algorithm that he gave i always talk about revenue per minute revenue per minute has to be taken into account how much time you are putting in how much money you are getting out of it so time is the currency money is not according to me yeah thanks uh, we have uh, dr uh, devakant he wants to ask something here yeah uh, dr rohit very nice presentation uh, so there is another aspect to it uh, that i believe uh, as you said that it's important to say no to certain practices when you realize that probably you are not uh, uh, doing well there in terms of revenue or long term prospects uh, but i want to uh, have your input on mending things i mean if you uh, visit a practice and it's not doing that well what can you do as a visiting surgeon to you know develop that practice in terms of your specific speciality any specific pointers or any experiences that you have on that yeah uh, so what i have realized is that you know having a frank discussion uh with the uh director or the hospital owner now uh, you know if you so i would say that when you need to have patience with a particular uh, attachment so for example i had joined a nearby charitable hospital where i didn't get any surgical work for the first 4 5 months and now in a year i am able to operate like 70 to 80 retinal surgeries a year so uh, over a period of time we could develop the retinal surgical load by having frank discussions with the trustees understanding what kind of uh, you know socio economic crowd comes over there and what kind of surgical fees and center fees he can keep and what kind of training can be given to the uh, 
nurses and all the other aspect is when you have these kind of discussions you realize how open is the owner of the place or the trustee of the place is to the whole thing now some of the directors have found are very open they in fact want to develop retina as a specialty and they are not looking at to make out money out of specialty because you know most of the times even in my hospital when oculoplasty surgeon comes and operates honestly i am not making any money but at least that speciality is growing and that is giving a good name to my hospital so if the owner of the hospital where you are visiting has that kind of a goal to grow the speciality a frank discussion can go definitely a long way in building up the practice in that center and uh, have you ever considered investing your own money in terms of you know advertisements or anything else for uh, the development of that uh, specific practice so uh, uh, in mumbai i what i have done is uh, i have invested in certain equipments uh, at couple of hospitals so i carry like you know the biome or certain equipments which the other person has not invested so the other person has invested in a high end uh, operating microscope so that i can operate retinal surgeries probably invested in a uh, you know a vitrectomy machine then uh, probably the laser investment has been you know uh, basically uh, in a partnership and that, the reason behind is that you know i also stay invested in terms of time over there so but in terms of advertisement no i haven't uh, you know spent on the advertisement part but in the equipment parts yeah there have been a couple of places where i partially invested thank you so much doctor thank you Yep. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. Uh, I want to ask Dr. Dr. Sahil here. Uh, he's here. He's actually practicing. Uh, I think he's doing cataracts plus VR. So when you are actually doing some freelancing, uh, do you actually go into looking for general patients, or do you actually go in uh, for your specialty? And what hiccups do you actually feel, or maybe do you tell your uh, respective places if you want to go uh, that this is what I want to see? Because sometimes you travel. and they tend to show you some general patients which are actually not worth your time so how do you actually manage that thing uh thank you avnish and sorry for joining late I got uh, stuck up in some work see uh, technically the uh, the freelancing practice over here in this part of rajasthan is uh, pretty on a lower side uh, most of the my in this western part of the rajasthan like the jodhpur city and the surrounding area here more of the things are based on solo practice or join as a working in a particular when you are under a senior or something when we do a little bit of freelancing most of the people are concerned about you know, mostly higher or nta segments only and so they technically concentrated on cataract or kind of terigium or squint to something like that so nta segment so they have their own uh, uh, set of interest but most of the thing in freelancing is concentrated on uh, cataract for myself per se i limit myself to technically only vr it's for a freelancing system i don't go for any nt segment even though i am uh, located in a trust hospital which is in periphery so i do have to take care of the nt segment but then my freelancing system is only limited to my sub specialty like rop and retina and uh, medical or surgical retina related only so i limit that thing i clearly tell the nt segment or whoever surgeon whoever uh, brings uh, into the freelancing system that okay the thing will be limited to the retina only so i don't take uh, uh, i don't give them an opportunity only to uh, uh, go into that general aspect because that obviously is going to take up lot of time also and uh, as uh, rohit sir said uh, time is uh, your money so when you calculate that thing is even sometimes you feel that when you go for a freelancing retina also that is also sometimes not worthy because uh, the people the patient do not technically turn up to you because uh, if you go for freelancing the patient may not be referred back to you or then may not be followed up in that same particular hospital also many times so uh, i limit myself only to the retina practice and specifically to the rop practice also so these are the two things and i technically exclude everything uh, i don't project myself as a general practitioner when i go for any kind of freelancing other than then uh, my part my practice part of freelancing is only i would say less than 10% practically because i when i am working in this trust hospital so 90 90% more than 90% of the time uh, my goes into the uh, practice over here in the trust hospital where i handle both the nt and post case segment surgeon uh, as a uh, surgeon over there okay uh, dr akshay your take on this topic of freelancing dr akshay nair if you can give us some comments about it with respect to your speciality and your your pointers uh yeah i think 
thankfully oculoplasty being uh, you know having fewer specialists the scope for freelancing is more and uh, unlike other specialties where everybody is able to do a little bit uh, in terms of a general ophthalmologist being able to do some amount of cornea refractive work uh, or medical retina work, injections, you know, assessing, uh, seeing patients on uh, doing, getting OCTs done and investigations and medically managing or even intraventral injections. Oculoplasty uh, almost is, you know, is, is sequestered completely differently so that nobody else wants to do anything. It's all the dirty work that is left to us. So that way, oculoplasty has, uh, you know, uh, is relatively immune to, you know, having people, uh, uh, put their hand, fingers into it. But I think what uh, Dr. Modi said was uh, very valid. At the end of the day, while you do freelancing, freelancing should not be, it cannot be sustainable in the long term. Eventually you need your own patient base and not just for yourself, not just for a source of income, but in terms of the uh, eventual outcome for patients. Having your own practice, whether it is in an institute, in a, in a private setup or your own clinic, allows you to standardize procedures, standardize protocols and, you know, SOPs for every patient. In When you freelance, you your schedule and your availability are the biggest constraints in which everything has to fit in, including the patient's availability. Whereas when you're at a center, the patient's, uh, patient comes first when you're at your own center and you can mold everything around it. So while freelancing is good, it, it cannot be a long-term sustainable, uh, you know, idea. But yes, for us, uh, you know, especially for ophthalmologists who do not have uh, a family background in ophthalmology, it is something that can always, uh, you know, in the short term be used. Uh, inoculoplasty, you know, with, with time, uh, the more you do, the more, uh, it, it, like any surgical grants, the more you do, the better you get. And uh, that's, 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 that's it. I, I actually talk a little more about this in my talk, which is coming up after uh, some. Absolutely, absolutely, Dr. Akshay. I would want to ask just last question to Dr. Digvijay, sir. Uh, what does his take since he has an hospital and he actually has people who come for freelancing at his place? So, how does he manage and what is his take on the other side where he's actually inviting people to join him? And how does he break even or can he give us some tips about it? Dr. Digvijay, are you here? In case not, I think we can move on to the next uh, talk. And if Dr. Digvijay comes around, we'll ask him again. So we have the next talk. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Akshay, sir. If, if yeah, I yeah, please. Uh, Akshay, sir, how often do you think that uh, oculoplasty gets divided? Because it's a part of uh, uh, plastic surgery comes in and a part of uh, cosmetic surgery, like from the dental aspect comes in. How often do you think that gets divided and how do you think it affects um, the work of a, a facial plastic surgeon in general. I I think it is it is unfair. It is ridiculous, and it is absolutely uh, unacceptable that oculoplastic surgeons call themselves facial plastic surgeons. We are not facial plastic surgeons. We are ophthalmic plastic surgeons. Right. So we I think we need to get that straight. We are trained only in the periocular area. We can do a little bit of non-invasive. Uh, injectables around around the face but just by doing that do we get ourselves do we can we call ourselves facial plastic surgeon no uh, there are certain programs where you are specifically trained in that none of which exist in india so if you are trained in that by all means you should do what you do but uh, we should restrict ourselves to the eye alone and addressing what you said earlier at the end of the day it's results that will drive which way a patient would go if you are able to deliver good results, document them, and market yourself, whether it be on social media, on your website, be you know, post videos about your surgical technique, speak on forum, forums like this, automatically people will start referring work to you. Patients will be able to see tangible benefits and improved results you know, before and afters on your website, on your you know, social media handles, and that itself will drive patients to you. Believe me, the best advertisement is a satisfied patient. So as long as you're doing your job good and you're able to deliver results, which way this patient is going, which way that patient is going, why is the plastic surgeon doing a fracture, why is the dentist doing a blepharoplasty? all of that is noise. You can focus on the signal, which is your work, and deliver results. Automatically, work will start coming. 
there are enough patients. We are a country of 1.4 billion people. If we are going to split hairs about why is a plastic surgeon doing a orbital floor fracture, that means there are serious issues with ourselves. We just need to focus on our job. There are enough patients for every specialist of every city uh, for us to do that. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being a little blunt, but this is what it is. No, but that's absolutely. quite important, sir. Yeah. You're absolutely right that it doesn't matter who does what. It's about what we do and uh, what we have to do, right? If as far as our results are good, nothing else matters. Absolutely. And just to add, uh, sorry, Avnish, I'm taking a minute longer. Uh, over the past 10 years that I've been in practice, I've realized that every year I end up dropping one surgery from my uh, repertoire. Like for the past three years, uh, I haven't done a single pan facial complex trauma which means, you know, zygoma, um, Lefort 1, 2, mandible. Earlier, we used to do all of them with the max fat surgeons. But in private practice, these cases get far few in between. And over time, you realize that there is a maxillofacial surgeon who is trained in this, who does this five, six times a month, as compared to one or two times a year that I am doing. Why okay. would my results be better than his? And so therefore, when I get called for these cases, I, you know, you just decide that, you know what, this is not my cup of tea. I know someone who can do it better. You need to go there. And, you know, with time as your hair grays, you realize that doing, focusing on what you do better is, is good. And eventually you hope that everybody else also figures out what is their niche area and sends work that you, you do better to you. That's absolutely right, sir. I agree. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Akshay, for those things. Uh, moving on, we'll go to Dr. Bhavik Panchal here. Dr. Bhavik, uh, his talk is on soft skills, really listening and talking to your patients. Dr. Bhavik, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Avnish, and thank you, everyone, uh, those who are present here. And uh, no, I'm just listening to the conversation between Akshay and Rolika. So Rolika, in her talk, on, when she spoke about mentor and mentee, it's a very apt way to actually go ahead and... Uh, uh, what she presented, she is doing that now. She is uh, reaching out to a mentor in Akshay Nair. And uh, Rolika, I have one comment for you. Do not forget your cataract surgeries. You'll never get into all these things. <laughs> that is that can be a bread and butter for life. Yeah, see, see that. That is what is written on Akshay Nair t-shirt, right? Okay. And part of what you communicated is, uh, is what I'm going to share in my talk as well, uh, which is soft skills communicating with your patient. What you mentioned about uh, why you want to worry for that one patient. Okay. And if someone has experience in doing that surgery, might as well refer to that individual. So uh, without wasting further time, let's proceed with the talk. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, time and again, in the past few years, we are seeing and reading a lot of this, that uh, the litigation cases against the doctors are increasing, especially in India. It is, we know in the West, it is quite common. Uh, the doctors are rude and the patients are complaining about it. And the media also picks up on one small thing and highlights it further. So the, which again uh, demeans the reputation of the doctors. So uh, what is the root cause of this? So the root cause of all of this is one important attributing factor or a bigger factor is poor communication between the doctors and patients. So what you see the picture there, I still believe this is the picture in most of the government setups. May not be in a private practice as of now, but this is what it is. What this is what we have gone through as interns in a medical college as well. So uh, the talk here, which I'm sharing right now, is on how we build upon this, how we improve upon this good communication. So before that, let us look at. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, what are the benefits we get out of good communication? The most important is managing difficult clinical encounters in a better way. I'll come to this in detail in the subsequent part of the talk. Uh, the patients. Yeah, there was some error there, sorry. So good communication skills are integral for the development of meaningful and trustworthy relationship between the doctor and the patient and the attendant as well. Uh, if the trust is not there, no patient is going to allow you to touch their eyes or for that matter, I'm, I'm restricting my talk to mostly ophthalmology and say, for example, you want to go and intervene and give an interventional injection inside the eye. How does a patient trust you? Okay, so uh, it is first thing which starts is a communication between you and the patient and the family. So 
when you listen uh, to the pay to the doc to the patient in a better way your diagnostic capability also improves because you get those hidden clues from the patient this decreases your work stress eventually the patient satisfaction is better and this increases your own job satisfaction and all of this finally relates to improvement in your in a in a better handling of clinical encounters which are difficult in nature so you handle them in a better way so as a result patient's level of satisfaction is improved which directly implies to better compliance with the treatment and this impacts positively on the patient's psychology mental health tolerance power and the quality of care what you provide to the patient so let's quickly look at one of the components of communication the three major components of communication are verbal non verbal and para verbal okay so uh, why verbal skills are extremely important say uh, 90% of what we uh, do is around verbal communication but apart from that we have the non verbal and the para verbal communication as well important is the selection of words a simple statement like andhe ka putra andha what is such a big uh, we have been learning mahabharata and watching it as well uh, it's it's supposedly said that this is the line which started mahabharata which is actually not the correct reason but people do add in for the spice content like what a media does right now okay important is the selection of your words what you utter once the words are spoken is like a like a bow and arrow the arrow which is released cannot be taken back so, so what you speak matters especially the for the patient because sometimes the patient do consider us as gods it still exists and uh, they may get hurt with that uh, so non oral component includes the posture gesture facial expressions the spatial distancing how uh, you how you relate to them your eye contact whereas the para verbal communication part of it is the tone pitch the pacing and the volume of your voice every time you cannot be speaking in the same sense to those patients you have to alter your voice to an extent uh, when there is you are breaking a bad news to them or sometimes you are happy the treatment out outcome is better that should be uh, dealt with uh, so this is about the benefits now when you look at the barriers of good communication skills uh, the most important barrier here is lack of knowledge about the disease or the treatment so if you are not skilled enough if you have not attained the maturity to of the disease to speak in front of the patient you never be able to communicate in the better way so lack of insight so inadequate knowledge adds to the lack of insight so you cannot empathize with the patient the other important factor here since in a country like india is a language barrier people from the west north try to uh, uh, come and learn in the in the in the states of southern india and language becomes a very important factor there so that can be overcome by extra putting extra effort in learning the language uh, apart from that stress tiredness and lack of time in an overburdened setting be it private or a government uh, we have enough number of patients and we are overworked as dr rohit modi also said in his speech so learning is an art and it's an active process through which uh, uh, all the information in mind expressed verbally or non verbally by the patient uh, this is where the cases of litigation can be reduced if you listen properly and listening is a part of verbal non verbal and para verbal communication so the next question is how do i become an artist so make the patient and the attendant comfortable show interest in what the patient is saying with your mannerisms body language so different ways of mannerisms exist like patting the shoulder uh, shaking hands with the patient holding hands nodding when the patient is speaking eye contact only the uh, in india especially holding hands are something which you need to be careful because again that can be taken in a different way uh, avoid interrupting the patient when the patient is speaking let them complete the statement then you can reach out to them also while concluding ask the patient if he or she would like to add something more to the conversation start the conversation introduce yourself do not wait for the patient to come and speak to you this will break the barrier uh, one other important point what i have seen with lot of younger doctors or new uh, residents fellows is that uh, they do not know the patient's name or the age when the patient is sitting in front of them and they ask them so what is your name and they are checking in their records or their uh, the electronic medical records so that is patient feels little dishonored disrespectful so ensure that before the patient comes and you know the data of the patient his name or her name and so and so maintain privacy do not do not allow other patients or your staff as well to come inside when when you examining the patient and speaking to the patient uh, involve the patient and attendant in the decision making 
and explain the details in simple language. This takes time to understand and explain in simple language. We are all trained with medical jargons, but when it comes to patient, patients does, do not understand. Okay, then what is happening to me? Uh, you have uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Patient is not going to understand. You have to explain them, you have night blindness, which cannot be cured. You have to use light during your entire work in the evening and so on and so forth. The communication can go on. Uh, next part of this talk is communication with the attendants and the colleagues and our colleagues. So uh, be formal with the attendants, do not be informal with them, that may backfire. Appreciate their efforts towards the care they have taken towards their loved ones. Involve them in the discussion and resolve the doubts. It is most of the times it is this attendants who are the ones who come with queries from Google because the patient is busy in their own treatment, but the attendants are free and they come with a lot of questions. You may have to take time to resolve the doubts. Explain about seeking second opinion if you feel the patient is inquiring a lot and uh, may have may cause problems in the future, always give them an option of taking a second opinion for the same condition. Though you may be an expert in that, nothing wrong in getting your ego down and asking them go take a second opinion. This will give you a lot of peace of mind. Uh, one more point I would like to add here is that uh, what happens is sometimes you explain in detail, say a post of a case of trauma comes in, you explain in detail about the, the condition and the prognosis to the patient and the attendant. Next time a new attendant comes in, you have to spend the same amount of time in explaining them. Second time, another attendant comes in and then you also lose your mind. So when you're angry, do not talk much and ensure that the same attendant follows the patient and comes with the patient rather than a new attendant every time. Uh, with your colleagues, uh, very important, avoid loose talk, saying that this faculty is not doing a good job, this fellow is not doing a good job or this staff nurse is not good. Okay, respect them. Uh, avoid uh, shouting at them in front of the patients because they are the same kind of individuals who are going to treat the patients in your absence. Lead by setting examples. Uh, last two slides about managing difficult encounters. Uh, it is a combination of factors related to doctors, patient and the circumstances. And the doctor has both ethical and professional obligations to treat the patient irrespective of the ailments and the circumstances. So uh, this is where things are not taught to us. And this is where over a period of time, we need to uh, build our acumen in such a way that we understand how to manage difficult encounters and how to even break bad news. Say a patient, you uh, post end of the you cannot save the eye. You cannot tell the patient you're going to go blind. That patient and the attendant may actually have a vasovagal syncopal attack and may fall down as well, which has happened in the experience in a lot of individuals if you look at the stories. So important is uh, we need to learn the art of how to uh, break bad news to them to an individual it is a complex communication art and majority of the doctors lack the competence as well as the confidence to divulge such bad news so there are ways to tackle this prime up for the situation rehearse practice that what, what if the patient comes in such a way how am i going to tell them say a, a couple comes with a child who has lost one eye it is such a devastation for them and you cannot tell on their face that sorry your child has lost vision we cannot do anything for it but there are different ways to say it you can take them outside not in front of the child explain them that we have tried our best but certain situations go out of hand okay and we are uh, let us see how what can happen and give them time to uh, assimilate the information adjust to the situation and they'll turn around and they'll be very good patients and understand that you have given your best this will all uh, reduce the chance of litigation against you. Assess the patient's knowledge and attitude. Assess the patient's desire to get the level of details of information required. And, and then is the act of actual breaking of bad news and eventually address the patient's emotions. You have to connect emotionally and empathize with the patient. So in short, uh, to, come, to conclude, uh, good communication is important to gain the trust of the patient improve your own uh, knowledge and give the best care available to the patient and avoid any kind of uh, futuristic uh, litigation cases. That's all from my side, Amish. Uh, awesome, uh, Dr. Pavik. That was a very insightful talk. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, let's get back to Dr. Chintan Shah here, I think. Uh, Dr. Chintan, you're here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Chintan, how would you have these uh, communication skills because your patients are usually children and, you know, you have to actually communicate with the parents where they have to be, you know, having that trustworthy 
uh, being you know you are having your fear having faith in you so that you know you can go about with your surgeries or maybe some practical tips which you want to share about yeah so communication is very important in <clears throat> all the branches but it's even more important and i would say even more difficult uh, in uh, my sub speciality because uh, i'm not just dealing with the patient i need to gain uh, trust of uh, small children so that they can give us useful information regarding their disease it's often uh, people feel that uh, why should we uh, uh, take so much time in history taking with the children because the children they they don't know much they won't be able to give proper history but that's incorrect if you spend more time with the children with the family actually you can gain a lot of information and not only the information you gain a lot of trust from the parents from the uh, uh, the children and uh, that uh, goes a long way in the entire diagnostic and the therapeutic process so once we spend time once we spend more time with the patient and uh, here uh, what we do is we don't uh, wear aprons uh, around the children because the children when they think that they are seeing doctors then they get afraid and they they have certain fear regarding the doctors so basically we try to be friendly we have lots of toys around us the chocolates and everything so uh, we don't directly jump to the diagnostic process and everything we just uh, we first try to uh, uh, the, know the patient uh, we interact we chat a little a bit and then we try to find what's wrong with the patient <clears throat> and that's uh, really good that builds the rapport uh, with the patient and uh, it might be difficult for people to believe but here we do operate even 8 10 year old children under local anesthesia with a little bit help of mild sedation so that is possible only if you have a good rapport with the patient with the children with the family when they believe in yourself when the children they don't treat you uh, as a doctor but rather they see a friend in you so i think the communication is extremely important and that was very excellent presentation by dr bavik and there were a lot of good pointers that uh, is very important in our day to in our uh, practice yeah thank you dr chantan uh, dr gunjan are you there i would want to ask you what uh, dr gunjan are you there i think so okay so what we can do is i can ask dr uh, rohan here uh, what difference is there when you are actually like you are working in a institutional practice where you are a fellow and even now as you are a director of a place so what skill sets have changed and since your refractive patients are more demanding what sort of practical tips you want to share with us dr rohan uh dr avnish yeah hello dr gunjan can you yeah. answer this uh, what is the change in skill sets you know from uh, practicing in an institution when when you were a fellow and now since you are working in a corporate setup so what change of uh, things are there and also about the uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah i just wanted to ask uh, what sort of uh, skill Could sets you? can you hear me hello yeah yeah i can hear you yeah so what is the change of uh, your skill you sets yeah yes yes so can you tell us what sort of uh, changes or what are the set uh, skill sets you use or what are the differences when you were uh, when you were a fellow and when you were doing your private practice and uh, some insights about your refractive patients uh, as to uh, as they are more demanding uh, in terms of uh, vision and and their uh, visual outcomes Uh, yeah definitely the refractive patient that everybody knows uh, they are very uh, demanding and some of them are uh, uh, you know they definitely are rejected from lot of places because uh, maybe they are uh, you know they have uh, borderline pachymetries or maybe they have uh, abnormal posterior folds etc so lot of times uh, they come for second opinions as well and uh, so uh, some tell the patient very honest so these patients are taking opinions from lot of places and sometimes are doing doctor shopping as well and they know lot of things uh, by google etc that uh, you know uh, these things are available so uh, 
it's not always necessary that all the patients have a very good uh, visual outcome because sometimes they are amblyopics as well. So uh, before the surgery, definitely uh, I need to be more ca cautious now. During fellowship, definitely uh, I had a cover of the consultants who were actually uh, you know, dealing with refractive patients uh, along with us. So uh, definitely I feel more pressure when I see refractive patients um, before surgery. Has. And it's very important uh, to you know counsel the parents as well because sometimes um, uh, the parents are sometimes very fussy and uh, especially the post-surgery results are uh, very important for them because even if, uh, you know, you have some kind of blurring or some adaptation problems, they don't understand. So I take a lot of time, a uh, lot of chair time before my uh, refractive surgery. It's very important, I feel now. So I just think that uh, definitely, uh, you know, we should always... Uh, give uh, a lot of chair time and should understand the psychology of the patient and a very nice uh, talk by Dr. Bhavik. I definitely had a lot of uh, learnings today in how to, you know, develop my soft skills. Sometimes, you know, these patients may be irritating and, you know, when you tell them that it's not a normal thing, you they keep on uh, getting people uh, and they keep on visiting again and again uh, with some other person of the family. So a lot of times we are not very patient uh, in the clinic, sometimes a very busy clinic or sometimes we are going uh, rushing to OT, etc. But yes, definitely, I think uh, soft skills are, I feel. Thank you. Okay, moving on uh, with Dr. Akshay and I for his next talk. Uh, Dr. Akshay, over to you. Uh, starting from scratch, what worked for me? Dr. Akshay, if you can start your presentation, please. Thank you. Right. So, uh, thank you, Abhish and uh, you know Yossi for this opportunity to uh, present uh, on this topic. So, basically, I'm going to, this is in a sense a continuation of the previous session. What was discussed about how you know different options of freelancing, working at at, a, at your own center. Uh, I'm going to put all of that together. A little bit of my background is that I do only optoplastic surgery. I do not do, uh, I, you know, being a specialist, uh, my practice is now in such a way that I do not get patients or I don't see patients who require cataract refractive surgery or general ophthalmology and refraction. Uh, I am attached to now three hospitals which are under a corporate chain of hospitals as well as some amount of freelancing. I have a weekly, once a week attachment to a government medical college. I don't have a standalone solo private practice of my own. So at the end of the day, what decides uh, what you end up doing? There are multiple things. Uh, you need to you know, sit back and figure out what is it that you want to do in life, whether it is uh, you know, an academic name, name in the academic circles, whether it is uh, a good monetary returns, uh, whether it is a bit of both, or whether it's only good family time with fixed hours. All of these will decide what type of practice you do which is also dependent on the speciality that you practice. Uh, other things that you need to look out for is whether you want to, you're fixed about going back to your hometown, your willingness to relocate to a different city and start all over again, your spouse, their careers, uh, the age of your children or children, if you don't have any, what needs to happen. And also eventually, if you, you know, are shifting from one to the other, like for some time you want to do freelancing, then be a part of a large hospital and then eventually set up your private practice, you need to figure out how long can you wait before you really start earning because different phases or different uh, you know, practice patterns like freelancing versus having your own setup, they, uh, you earn differently on each of these. So what are your different options? You know, one option is for you to stay back in the hospital which you finished your training if that is available. The other is to join a, a, just as a fresh graduate, you join a hospital or a chain of hospital as an associate uh, you can start away, take the plunge and start your own practice. You can do freelancing as discussed by Dr. Modi. Uh, you could go and become, a, you know, be a part of a government or a trust or an NGO organization or what is called a charitable hospital. 
or you become a full timer in a large institute or a corporate firm and i'll just quickly go over the pros and cons of each of these so when you stay back in your training hospital you need to first uh, figure out whether is this for a short term process or a long term because when you're thinking of the long term 10 15 years then you're going to be a part of the hospital's growth and then you add a lot of value to it. if you're going to be there just for getting the name tag of being an ex faculty at so and so so be it but at least you should be clear of what you want now while you're at it try to specialize further in something if you, like say for example oculoplastic surgery if you've done fellowship from an hospital and now you're a faculty that try to make the most of that time maybe say uh, specialize in endoscopic surgery or aesthetic surgery uh, in a way this is buying time before you actually figure out what you want to do or what you don't want to do the advantage is you are in a familiar environment you finish your training you are immediately back in the game and you have some steady source of income uh what about you know joining a hospital or a chain as an associate of some you see the thing with this is that you end up joining an established practice or an established surgeon and you become a full time uh, associate so the 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 onus of building the practice is not on you you directly have adequate volumes and some amount of freedom the good part is that you start working without having to put in any investment from your side and you get paid reasonably well but it also comes with a flip side the downside also which is that you know you are working for someone else you are working for another organization uh, at the end of the day you will be given targets you have to conform to certain working hours and you may be one amongst many so your identity may be lost and as a junior associate there's always a ceiling to earning how much you can earn so this can be a stepping stone to moving on ahead so this is also something that one could explore how about building your own solo practice in when you when i say a solo practice i'm referring to a, a clinic or a stand alone practice of your own with or without an operating room where the patient is referred to you and you are their primary ophthalmologist if you need to you could have other consultants of different specialty coming in for some time the biggest advantage is that you have complete freedom to choose you set out the sop for every patient surgical patient or you know treatment pra- pra- practice patterns for every patient that comes in where you practice what you do you are essentially your own boss as was discussed earlier by being the boss of what you do your earnings are significantly high but also it is the most challenging type it is investment heavy and uh, you need everybody on your team to be aligned with what you're doing on the same page there are going to be overhead costs and you have to be prepared for an incubation period you don't start your practice and start do- doing 10 cases a day the next day also when you have a solo practice in, la- in not in larger cities but in slightly smaller cities it may be difficult to have a specialty practice like only retina or only oculoplastics visiting conferences or other places means your practice is shut and your income goes for a toss for those periods and here there is no one that you know you can refer a case to you will end up learning from your own mistakes and you are your own backup Uh, each upgrade of technology is going to be expensive so it's it has its own share of uh, disadvantages as well uh, so you know in solo practice you need to figure out what is the right timing for you to start solo practice after training whether it's and once you go in it's a long term decision you can't think of starting private practice for 5 years and then come back and say no i don't want to do it you've invested so much time and in uh, equipment into it uh it's not for everybody it doesn't mean that private practice is the ultimate holy grail and the end of practice you know the end of the uh, journey for everyone some people are just not cut out for private practice and you need to figure out whether you're one of them or not how about freelancing freelancing is basically where you offer your services as a specialist to different centers whether it can be in the same city it could be different centers in the same city it could be different parts of the city or even different parts of the country you could visit a different city in a different state once a week once a month depending on the need for you to go there this of course should be in addition to what you are already doing primarily as your hospital attachment how does it work you get to decide along with the center that you're visiting you could either have a fixed schedule or which means once a week or once in 10 days once a month and pre decide this uh, date or it could be an sos where they just call you hey i got a vacuola on rd today can you come in at the end of the day don't undersell yourself just because there is not enough work happening never end up doing surgeries for costs that are lesser than what the market rate is 
it has advantages because practice building there is not your responsibility. You're offering a service to uh, for a need that is already there because there is a need. Volume is, already, is going to be good from your first day. It's freelancing. You have that flexibility and it can be rewarding initially. But disadvantages is that everybody wants flexibility and you don't want to you know, be freelancing at too many places, spreading yourself too thin. Sometimes as a freelancer, you don't always end up seeing what you're trained for. I, as an oculoplastic surgeon, have sometimes been called in to see patients for squint and I've had a tough time explaining that oculoplastics and stroboscopes are different uh, specialties and this is to ophthalmology. Uh, at the end of the day, you're going offering your service to someone at their practice and it's likely that you're replacing someone else. So you are also replaceable. It is not a practice of your own. So that is a disadvantage that is there. And of course, carrying your equipment and consumables everywhere can take a toll over time. How do you break into the scene? Uh, scene I, I talk about ABC, which is availability, behavior, and competence. All of these things have been discussed previously, so I won't take too much time on it. Freelancing is good in the short term, but uh, because you go visit, visit more pay places, meet more people, your visibility improves, but it's not sustainable everywhere, every time in the long run. At the end of the day, like I said uh, in that discussion with Dr. Rolika, good results are the basis for good relationships with ophthalmologists and with patients. How about joining a government hospital or an NGO or what is called a charitable hospital? These are good things where you know you can be an honorary um, an, or be in an academic position in a teaching hospital, especially that allows you to treat a lot of underporting patients. But this I su strongly suggest should be in addition to what you're already doing. This should not be your primary. Uh, you know, center of practice, unless you want to stay in a hospital or as they say, heart safai karna, where you feel you've not had enough surgical practice and you want to go to a place where you learn from a mentor who's already there. Uh, and finally, so you finish your training, you're back. Now what? First thing is take a break. The next thing is to work on visibility. Get a business card printed. You may not have a place that you're already working. Just put your name, your specialty, what you did, where you did your name, your phone number and email address. Get some brochures made, build a website. Having an online presence is important to be on groups of ophthalmologists, on online forum, on Facebook. If not for anything, just for seeing what is happening. You may not want to post every day, but uh, seeing what is happening because visibility is important. Visibility is important, not just online, but also in person. So when you're back in your city, meet the local ophthalmologists. They're the people who are going to refer patients to you. Meet local specialists of allies. Like if you're a pediatric ophthalmologist, you may want to meet local pediatricians. Seek out help. Always in your, if you've trained from a large institute, when you go back to any large city, there are going to be people who also train from your same institute. So meet your alumnus. They are usually the most helpful. Once you've done all of this, go and meet the local ophthalmologists again. Because, you, you know, persistence is important. And do not be dissuaded, dissuaded by all the things that they'll say. <clears throat> Ten years ago, people were telling me that you know you can nobody can be an oculoplastic surgeon alone without doing cataract. But work has been good, so that's not always you know. If you have a decision, you should stick by it and keep meeting them again and again and again because, like I said, persistence is important. Uh, you should go to local meetings now. Of course, things are coming back on track in terms of physical meetings. Meet, stay, go to your local city meeting, state meeting, volunteer to present something so that the guys whom you met three times earlier will see you present and make a connection that, okay, this guy is actually a retina specialist. He's presenting something. He's talking sense. Even if you're not presenting something, go and attend because networking is important. Uh, and something that they don't teach us in medical college or fellowship is fees. You need to be honest, clear, and transparent about it. Like I said earlier, don't undersell, undersell yourself. Uh, you know, affiliations with ophthalmologists where they call you uh, as a freelancer or as an attaching attachment. These are long-term associations. So they should be built on honesty. The foundation has to be good. If you don't know charges, seek out, meet uh, colleagues and ask them. There's no harm in asking. Be honest. Don't operate when you do not want to. Uh, just because someone wants and you feel they feel that there's an indication to operate in whatever specialty. Unless you're convinced, don't do that. Don't compromise on your clinical and ethical foundations. Uh, like I said earlier, your best advertisement is a happy patient, but an unsatisfied patient is your worst nightmare. Go surgeons are a reality of our practice. I leave it up to each of y'all to personally decide whether you want to be a part of it or not. I, I, from my side, never have been 
a ghost surgeon and i don't you know i'm not approving of the the practice of it but i realize that a lot of surgeons do uh, are able to you know get by by operating for someone else and if that works for you so be it in the beginning of our career once you start working you realize that you're working a lot and burnout is a real thing so you need to pace yourself don't spread yourself too thin attending every saturday meeting every sunday conference give personal time to yourself and some family time uh from my side i have no ophthalmological background so i and i came back 10 years ago i kept meeting colleagues i met alumni and that for me worked the best these three hospitals when i am affiliated to all are uh, you know the 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 medical the hospitals are owned and set up by alumnus of people where i trained at and that's how i got in and that's where i have been for the past 10 years uh you know i am also attached to a medical college like i said which allows an outlet for my academic pursuits uh, i used to freelance a lot but nowadays i i have only four places that i visit once in two weeks or so and uh, my website is something that i worked on which i feel every ophthalmologist should do that there has to be a way in 10 years down the line patients are not going to be referred to specialists or other referring doctors patients are going to refer themselves to you and that will happen only online so to summarize uh, you know whenever you figure out what you want to do after your training think discuss and decide with your family members and all stakeholders because it's not only your decision that's going to matter everyone's input should matter as well at the end of the day you decide what you do not others it's like dr bhavik said uh, never forget your cataract so if you feel you want to do cataract so regardless of being a retina specialist or a screen specialist you stand by that decision and do it if you feel that no i am an ocular plastic surgeon i should not be doing cataract because my referrals will get hurt you do that don't let people's thoughts and ideas influence what you do be persistent align your long term and short term plans such that they uh, you know work synergistically towards the goal and at the end of the day don't you know don't forget to have fun not enjoying what you do is the worst thing to do uh, i i i repeat myself we are a country of 1.4 billion people there are enough people with a lot of issues and most of it ophthalmology thankfully is blessed to have so many aging issues that come with it so as people go old there are going to be enough patients for everybody the concept of an unsuccessful ophthalmologist doesn't exist in india so enjoy what you do and eventually you'll uh, have fun uh, this is one of my favorite quotes the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself uh, awesome dr akshay it was a very comprehensive talk on what uh, we have done uh, i think any comments from the panel or we'll move on to the next talk all right then uh, we have dr samiksha agrawal here she'll be speaking about her experience in a two three year a uh, setup a uh, smaller cities bigger dreams dr samiksha over to you actually sir i would just like to add that you're absolutely correct especially in uh, uh, like a sub speciality like ours where uh, we're in uh, ophthalmic so uh, ophthalmic plastic surgery and ocular oncology we have a very small spectrum so the most rewarding part is when the patient recovers when the patient gets better for a long time it's not really the focus is really not about earning for a very long time maybe that happens after 10 years as you have quoted right thank you sir am i audible yes dr samiksha please yeah uh, so i will be telling about the ophthalmology uh, practice in a tier 2 city i work in alabad prayagraj in uttar pradesh so so one second my slides are not moving actually so make sure you can stop the share and try to reshare it yeah is it seen now perfect perfect so uh, after we finish our fellowship once we come to a tier 2 city and if you have done your fellowship from a tier 1 city or a bigger city you get a ch- uh, culture shock like what uh, how you talk to the patients what are the patients expectations and all those things 
so what we see here is like uh, the paying capacity of the patient is less and they tend to pay lesser for the same facilities in a smaller city and they have this mall versus general store mentality like what for the same things uh, you tend to pay higher um, in a mall uh, versus in a general store if you buy it's like you pay lesser there so yeah and the patients are little less educated they they are less aware about their diseases so here what i saw was uh, like you get very chronic rds chronic ulcers like non treatable cases pre thyroidal eyes all those things are very common here and then again um, the quack culture obviously uh, mistreated and uh, all those eyes you will see that chronic steroids and very very bad eyes so uh, what difficulties we see in a smaller cities like there is difficulty in getting good paramedical staff then immediate availability of drugs or injections for that say like if you want it the same day it won't be available then if there is uh, instrument breakdown then obviously immediately it won't get repaired it will take at least 2 to 3 days for that uh, emergency facilities are not that easily available and uh, if you want to send culture reports lab reports they are not immediately available for again if you want any pcrs or uh, higher uh, uh, technologies like icg and all those things are also not available again if when the patient comes to you they think that if you tell them uh, they have retinal detachment or something which needs you know higher cost than guarded prognosis obviously they think that they should go to a bigger city and they'll get better treatments again uh, in terms of conferences and cmes we don't have those regular cmes as you see in uh, bigger cities then uh, all uh, all those bigger machines genetic testing electrophysiology services are not available then uh, then there are this set of patients who are very poor then they go to something like very charitable or a very uh, government set up obviously so there is this middle group of patients and uh, so we have to look for the pros and cons like it the pros of the smaller cities that doctor versus patient ratio is good like there are more number of patients as compared to doctors and sub specialists uh, obviously less competition for specialist doctors then the if you are starting new or uh, if you are starting solo then the cost of living and all those things the investments are lesser and obviously for starting a practice in a smaller city you don't need cutting edge technology uh, the patient's expectations are not so much then you can start in a smaller setup you get staffs at a comparatively cheap, cheaper rate and uh, like bigger cities it's it's not that much saturated also you get fair enough patients if you are starting new so those are the pros of a uh, tier 2 city thank you i think dr avnish will be telling more about tier 1 cities and uh thank you dr samiksha for this brief uh, discussion you can say the com commentary about uh, two tier city experiences we have dr divakant here divak dr divakant can you suggest or maybe give us the some pros about how you have developed when you have gone back to lucknow and what actually went in in your favor about it dr divakant yeah yeah thank you dr nish uh, so uh, before that i think samiksha has uh, pointed out some really good points what challenges uh, people face in a tier 2 or a tier 3 city another challenge i feel uh, that you guys face would be uh, doctors or sub specialists visiting from other cities so whenever i, I go to some other town uh, they might not know me but they are very happy to come and see a lucknow wala doctor or a delhi mumbai wala doctor so they always uh, i may be not as good trained as you are but still uh, they'll keep uh, a doctor from a outstation doctor at a higher pedestal so that is another challenge uh, coming to uh, what dr arneesh has uh, uh, i practice in lucknow and i uh, very soon realized that uh, uh, retina, I, i do exclusive retina practice so i realized that uh, this will only work if you have a good referral channels so that was the thing that i worked on and uh, it is all about 
uh, as Dr. Akshay had pointed out, uh, you need uh, other doctors to have confidence in you and they need to trust you and believe in your uh, work. So that is something that you should work on whenever you start a subspeciality practice in whatever city, whatever area you are in. You need, uh, because developing confidence amongst the general population, general public is, it, it comes slowly. It comes at until unless you invest heavily into advertisements. Uh, but if you're practicing a speciality, you can reach out to doctors. Uh, that is the number one thing uh, that needs to be done. Uh, for that, I think Dr. Akshay has talked about it. You need to be uh, visible. You need to present your work. Uh, they should be aware that what kind of work do you do and what is your speciality area um, within your speciality as well. Uh, so reach out to people, uh, uh, reach out to IMA, reach out to your local bodies, local doctors, go and meet them personally, uh, you know, and there's a lot of uh, the financial aspect of it as well, probably that can be discussed on a more closed uh, uh, group. And uh, yeah, that is it, Dr. Avnish. Uh, thank you, Dr. Devakant. Uh, I would want to ask Dr. Gunjan about her take on working in a place like Delhi NCR and what hurdles she actually faces when it comes to her speciality and uh, how how well you can establish yourself in this sort of a setup. Dr. Gunjan? Uh, can I talk in a minute? Yeah. So I'll ask the same thing to Dr. Rohit. Uh, is Dr. Rohit here? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, sir, can you tell us about your take about uh, this? How do you go about in a one-tier place and uh, what hiccups do you actually see and how do you overcome it? So, I feel there is huge amount of scope. Uh, many a times we feel that in uh, tier one cities, especially metros, there is oversaturation. And there is a famous joke in Mumbai that there are only more than 100 retina specialists working in the city. But uh, still, you know, when I speak uh, to my uh, colleagues who have just come in Mumbai, uh, they are also doing decent number of cases. So there is enough work for all of us. Just we need to be positive about it. Second thing is that uh, in some of the cities, there is a kickback culture. And uh, many a times, uh, a few of us are reluctant to speak about it. I feel uh, if we as a new generation say no to it, we can move away from it, what uh, some of the people from the previous generation have done about the kickback culture in the uh, speciality work. And the third aspect is I believe that instead of going to doctors for referrals, I uh, now my approach has changed that I directly want to get in touch with my community to get the direct patient connect so that uh, I get referrals from them rather than from uh, doctors. Uh, that is something which uh, I started doing recently. Okay, sir. Uh, is Dr. Gunjan there? Okay, we'll get, come back to Dr. Gunjan. We, what we can do is... Uh, Dr. Uh, Lavnish, yeah, yeah. One, one question from uh, Dr. Rohit. So he said uh, something about reaching out to the community. How exactly do you go about doing that? Any tips on that? Uh, yeah, Divya So uh, one is that, you know, uh, you can join the local uh, Rotary Club or the Lions Club. Then uh, also uh, from the community itself, many a times they do refer patients who are not able to afford uh, care at other hospitals. So you can do part charity work also that at your own setup, which will, uh, you know, you can take care of the cost part in the sense, you know, your disposables are taken care. You can probably waive off your surgical expenses initially for the patients who are truly not affording. And that also creates a good of word of mouth. And uh, slowly that name spreads in the community. And uh, like uh, my setup started only two and a half years back, but I can see a significant support from my own community. And uh, we are hardly doing any kind of marketing and we don't even have a hospital PRO. So, uh, you know, that when attending every community function, you know, even if you meet somebody on the road, just going saying hi to that person, uh, you know, makes them feel that you are approachable, you are, you know, and if they feel as a, uh, you know, as a patient, you are approachable, they are more comfortable with you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. 
Dr. Sahil, can you tell us about uh, how do you go about with your locality actually establishing your practice? Uh, uh, see, regarding establishing, um, as uh, uh, Dr. Chana said, that you should meet the local ophthalmologist. So that is one thing you should understand what actually is the practice over there. Because obviously every city has their own rural background or its own periphery. So has its own culture, as everybody has already spoken about. So that is the main thing that you need to understand that where are you going to place yourself and what that area demands in, in all the terms. Like as Dr. Bhavik said about communication, obviously, and there's uh, uh, everybody has spoken about different uh, things. So we need to look into that part first. And then you need to look into it that what you are willing to do in future, your solo practice, you want to work at the hospital, you want to work in multi-specialty trust, whatever it may be. But the base thing is to understand that what is actually going on and uh, try to understand the local ophthalmologists, like seniors and juniors and the colleagues over there. Because obviously you will have a lot of competition, you will have bad mouthing also, you will have good mouthing also, you will have word of mouth spreading also everywhere. So you need to have a good uh, terms and condition with everyone because you may not, uh, if you start a solo practice or you work at the trust hospital, you may not have uh, all the backups. So you may need other people as a backup. So a kind of a coordination with everyone is also required and very important is to understand that particular area. Plus, then you need to understand the paying capacity of your patients over there, the population, the demographics of the population. Because even when I'm working over this particular area, uh, this uh, Jodhpur district belt and all. So if we have four places of this particular district, so each quarter of that district has a different paying capacity. So even the, uh, not every quarter will work as the same. So I cannot have the <coughs> chargeable rate as the other quarters. Have. So I need to keep a lower because paying capacity of this thing will be lower. People are more dependent on free camps and all these things. And they are mostly requesting kind of their uh, poor background so they may need uh, more of a low cost treatment. So uh, there are two things to balance on this. One is uh, less number of patients with a good buying capacity. So you spend more time with each patient and get a good uh, outcome on per patient. Second thing is you understand that if you have to deliver a low cost services, then you always get a bulk over there. So you have to work on that thing. You need the bulk of the patients coming to you so that even if you maintain a low cost for the each patient, the technically when the bulk of the patient comes to you, then the outcome will be a better one. So uh, this thing needs to be balanced as per the local practice over there. And obviously it all depends that where you are finally going to place yourself in a private practice, charitable practice, in a uh, charitable organization also not, always doesn't have like you know, uh, a bulk of doctors over there. You can have a charitable organization, you can join a charitable organization where you are the, technically you are the clinical boss over there because you are the only single person. So you get to see the patient. It's like a more of a private practice only. The only thing is you are working in a charitable organization. But since you are the single doctor, if you give your 100%, probably you can make a very good name out of it right in the uh, future. And obviously, that will be more of a right practice of, of your own well, Slowly the patients will come with your name, on your name, for you, <clears throat> specifically to, to get tested by you. And the rest of the things like good communication skills are very much important to establish yourself. So I suppose but, that thing can be just too much. Uh, that too, uh, thank you, Dr. Sahil. Dr. Uh, Gunjan, your quick comment, and then I think we'll be closing the session. Dr. Gunjan? Yeah, yes, yes. So your take on working in Delhi and CR? Okay, uh, so yes, definitely there are so many, uh, you know, eye centers uh, in Delhi and CR as a hub of ophthalmology and a lot of referrals come from uh, nearby places, Haryana, Rajasthan and uh, UP as well. And some some of them from far, far places because uh, uh, in few times, uh, COVID uh, was picking up and all the government setups were not functioning for the for full capacity so a lot of referrals were coming from uh, far flung places so it, it's not that uh, 
that the patient is uh, coming for a uh, lot of patients are not coming for the first time for consultations they are showing to lot of doctors the treatments are ongoing in different parts of india and different centers and all are very uh, good so it's very important to um, remain very ethical and it's very important to tell the patient also that whatever thing uh, the treatment ha- uh, the other practitioner had done was good and uh, it's very important not to speak bad about uh, any of the practitioner whichever way uh, they have treated uh, might be that time we don't know what was uh, the uh, status of the patient but we should never bad mouth about anybody that's very important because uh, ultimately we all are uh, you know in the same boat and uh, it's very important to support each other as a community so yes um, i think uh, it's very important at all the places even uh, but in uh, delhi ncr because there's a lot of uh, centers that are working nearby at uh, you know on uh, in in different parts of cities as well and a lot of our friends are also nearby so it's very uh, you know easy at some times when you are stuck up somewhere that you can take help from your friends who are or the seniors who are practicing uh, in your specialty or not even your specialty they are in the field since long time so it definitely helps when uh, we are uh, as uh, as a community where we are, we are working so the competition definitely is there but it should be a very healthy competition for everyone to function properly what i feel thank you dr gunjan that was a good uh, way of actually saying that uh, we, should, we all are in the same boat and not to bad mouth uh, just a quick comment from the panel as well as the uh, the speakers about the commentary which we actually had was filling the gaps in covid affected fellowships so since last two years was a problematic for everyone where there was covid and the patient load was less i would want to ask dr akshay how to actually go about uh, doing your specialty uh, in post uh, like you have done your fellowship and after that you had issues with covid and all dr akshay can you give us some insights yeah i think this this is something that even you know medical uh, program directors and academic directors are grappling with uh, thankfully now of course things have opened up but yeah there there, there has been a big lacune uh, in terms of at least 4 to 6 months during the early phase where elective surgeries were significantly affected and especially those in short term or towards the end of their fellowship where your learning uh, with surgical volumes is higher that was affected uh, i think one way to do that is uh, you know to go back to your institute and re you know probably have a short term observership again or you know just you could speak to your own program director if you could continue for a while uh, or try to visit another surgeon in a different city to observe a little more or maybe as a part of your career plan uh, like i said one of those options of either being a part of a charitable hospital or an academic hospital or medical college for some time such that you are able to refine your surgical skills uh, these are different options that we have but uh, at the end of the day we are just you know shooting in the dark that the uh, patients who i mean surgeons who lost surgical training period to the pandemic is is a very real thing in fact uh, uh, not just fellowship in there have been people who joined their residency in 2019 uh, 2019 2020 and 2021 and they are finished with their residency virtually having been in the middle of the pandemic with uh, you know which cause later on will have significant implications yeah uh, dr akshay i i think even uh, uh, it's more of like you know you have to either go back to your institution or you should actually go to places where they have good uh, surgical hands on and it doesn't matter whether you are actually going to a two tier or three tier place it's more about getting experience and then going back to where you actually want to go whether you want to work in a one tier two tier place or or do your practice or do your practice uh, like your specialty with your uh, whether to do cataracts along with that so with that i think uh, thank you so much uh, everyone in the panel as well as the speakers for this session and uh, over to you dr karan and dr uh, uh, devakan for the next session thank you thank you everyone dr devakan you there uh, yeah i am here yeah. devakan you there yeah so thank you avinish for uh, ending the session early we have still have a lot of people joining in and uh, you know it's uh, a very important session that uh, we have uh, 
नेक्स्ट अप इट इज द डू इट योर सेल्फ प्राइवेट प्रैक्टिस सेटअप ऑल यू नीड टू नो दिस इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सेशन एज टू यू नो दे लॉट ऑफ यंग ऑफ सेलमोलॉजिस्ट सच एज माई सेल्फ हु आर एंटरिंग प्राइवेट प्रैक्टिस and i am sure the you know the speakers and the panelists right now will give their insights because they have done this and uh, it will really help uh, guide fellow yous uh, and others in you know uh, better management so before i you know go ahead i'd like to introduce the panel over here so we have dr shraddha surekha dr rohit modi dr swapnesh savant dr tanvir ahmed dr digvijay singh who is the president of uc डॉक्टर मदन गोपालन डॉक्टर विश्वजीत दे डॉक्टर अंकित अग्रवाल डॉक्टर पीयूष चांडक एंड डॉक्टर आरती हेडा द सेशन विल बी मॉडरेटेड बाय डॉक्टर दिवकांत हु इज द सेक्रेटरी ऑफ यूसी एंड माय सेल्फ हु इज द जॉइंट सेक्रेटरी ऑफ यूसी बिफोर आई गो हेड विद द फर्स्ट टॉक नाउ वी हैव अ स्लाइट ऑर्डर चेंज वील हैव डॉक्टर अक्षय नायर टॉक फर्स्ट बट बिफोर वी गो हेड विद दैट i would like to open अ डिस्कशन टू द पैनल फर्स्ट एंड एवरीबडी इज ओपन बिकॉज वी वॉन्ट दिस सेशन टू बी a very very interactive session and uh, what i would like to ask the panelists anybody can come in is when is one ready to enter private practice hi doctor hi sir uh, dr shraddha here so uh, i would uh, like to start off by saying that one is ready for private practice as soon as one is done training we don't need to uh, wait you know to go and join an institute first in uh, the place where we are going to practice and then jump into private practice there is absolutely no need for that you are ready for private practice as soon as you are done with training if you have that mindset in your uh, head then what happens is even during your training you focus on that patient thinking that what if this patient will uh, is is come to me in my own private practice and i don't have the uh, the umbrella of my mentors and my institute over my head to manage this patient so i think we take a lot of uh, of good from the training also during residency and fellowship if we have that mindset excellent points would anybody else want to comment anything yeah else? i think i i i'll just chip in karan i Uh, what what dr uh, sadha said makes a lot of sense but i think we you know we have been fortunate enough to be trained from institutes where uh, which not just taught us to be uh, practice ready but also taught us to be training ready we could we were you know good enough we were luckily you know trained well enough to start training others but that's not the case for others uh, uh, we also see a lot of uh, training institutes in a metro like mumbai where people complete their residency and have done less than a handful of surgeries so uh, i think it's also important to figure out whether you are uh, in a position to offer the basic standard of care for most conditions in terms of medical and surgical and if you think you're sound enough you know technically to do that any time is good time a good time to start practice also just a continuation of what i said in my previous talk Uh, over years we, you know being a freelancer we initially we met a lot of different private practitioners private practice is not the be all and end all of of ophthalmology a lot of people get a lot of pleasure working in charitable hospitals working for the underserved uh, you know people for people who don't have enough uh, uh, resources people some people are built for academics and research and they'd rather be in an institute so i think you need to also figure out whether you're cut out for private practice and only if you feel you are should you do that it, it's not be all and end of i'm sure monetarily it's the most probably the highest rewarding it's also the most challenging but it's not necessary that everybody in ophthalmology any ophthalmologist has to be in private practice of their own hi sir uh, good afternoon good afternoon good afternoon hi sir this is tanvir from assam Uh, so i would like to say that uh, uh, private practices what uh, our teachers uh, told us while we came out of our uh, after completing the uh, ms uh, they said that you only uh, do independently to which you are confident enough it's not like you go you jump into uh, cataract surgeries sics on day one if you are not confident enough or rather i would like to say that yeah we can go for the private practices uh, once we uh, get our registration first of all that makes us legally sound 
Uh, number two is that uh, we should start uh, seeing OPD patients more and more. And once we uh, put our cases on the OT table, definitely we should take help from our seniors. So that uh, on the very first phase of our uh, you know, OT practices, we shouldn't mess it around and uh, like, you know, lose our confidence level. So right now also I'm sitting in my own setup, <laughs> doing a little bit of private practices on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, so I think once we complete our course, we are ready for the uh, private practices and every single day we learn. So uh, we gradually learn and we increase and uh, increase the level of practices and the services that we provide. And right now we are also having this uh, bond is another issue. We cannot just leave that bond and go for a fellowship. We feel kind of stuck in. Uh, so till that time, let's not sit idle. And I think we should continue our uh, practices, basic practices, SICS and all. DCR, Terizium kind of surgeries. Very uh, important. Yes, Dr. Sopnish. First of all, a very good afternoon. And very nice to see Akshay, Rohit, Shraddha and everybody from all over India. To see a, a very short answer from my side. When your skill set is ready and you are mature to handle your economics, I think you are ready for private practice. Absolutely wonderful points put by all the panelists. Yes, Dr. Madan, sir. Last word on that, uh, when you know your limitations. Extremely important point. So uh, now let's move on to our first talk. Is, as I said, there's a slight order change. Uh, we'll have, you know, uh, the first talk by Dr. Akshay Nair on social media and the ophthalmologist. Before that, I would like to ask him, you know, what is written on his uh, t-shirt and, you know, to explain the meaning of it. <laughs> So this is this is this is from a cult movie that uh, uh, all of us grew up uh, watching. Andaz apna apna. That's crime master Gogo. His favorite line is "Akhi nikal ki goti kheta." Only thing is that as an ophthalmologist and an oculoplastic surgeon, this is literally what I do. So uh, I mean, I wouldn't put this on if I were a cataract surgeon, but yeah. All right. So I'll just share my screen if you can see it. Yeah, is my this my screen is visible, right? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. All right. All right. So basically, why do we need to have an online presence? Uh, like why, like we said earlier, uh, in ten years time or even five years time, everything that we do is going to be online. Whether as it is for flights, hotels, everything we look for recommendations and reservations online it's the old school technique of a doctor referring it to a specialist who refers to a specialist is dwindling down patients are going to directly look up doctors look up their credentials look up their reviews and come to them directly so it's important it's imperative that we start having an online presence uh, and an accessible portal at the earliest now it and it goes hand in hand with private practice and it's not just for patients, it's also for peers. So that when someone looks up, if someone needs to refer a patient to you, not everybody can pick up the phone and call you. So they can also be able to look it up online. Also, if you're online and on social media, you're you know posting things about yourself. It helps because you're creating awareness about a new, say, a new examiner laser, or a new femtolacic, an unusual case that you saw. <coughs> a conference that you participated or got an, uh, got an achievement uh, or, or an award in. Let people know about it. Also, you need to, you know, do it measured so that you don't overdo it, but you should definitely do it. Uh, also, in terms of building a practice, uh, being online on, on social media is also a good way to connect with peers, but that doesn't really necessarily build your practice, but it's important. So once you've established and understood why you need to have an online presence, the next is to start off. The first thing and the most important thing is to have your own website. Because this is one place where no one is going to post a review. No one is going to decide what photo goes on. What are the details that will be put up? It's your story in the way you want it in your words. With no restrictions, no limits. And it's not for do other doctors. It's, it's, I mean, maybe for referrals. But it's the most important way patients can connect to you. So you have to start off on your website. Luckily, Oculoplastics for me is a very, very visual branch. So that works well. How do you do that? The first thing is to register your domain, whether that's your name or doctor, your center's name. Go to a hosting site like GoDaddy, Wix, 
uh, mailchimp buy the domain and then slowly you can build content and build the site you don't even need to have a professional web designer website designing now is like making a powerpoint presentation you drag and drop change the font add a picture and you can you know uh, keep modifying it on the go roadblocks that i initially felt was an in a whole an inertia i bought my domain uh, in 2014 but i eventually ended up making my website in 2017 or 18 so uh, it, it's a technological block that we have in our mind and if we think we cannot overcome it then even it, it's even worth hiring a web designer to make it because at the end of the day having your own website and making patients reach do you through a website is going to pay for itself what about facebook is the necessary evil in our lives uh, i absolutely detest it but i spend at least half a day half an hour on each day on it uh, if you look at the average age of the facebook user it's about 40 years uh, so you can use it to your advantage remember that facebook is not just amongst your friends who are already there you can actually harness the use of facebook to reach out to people who don't know you or don't know about you so create a professional page apart from your personal page and don't mix them uh you also want to stay away of you know constantly being on facebook and self promoting or oh, look i went here look i went there i got this award that award don't make it an echo chamber that you know people just get after some time they get bored of it and they don't want to see posts from you interact with people also you know comp- uh, be a little cautious because uh, if you're posting a photograph of a patient or something consent is important if you're using to look uh, to make facebook uh, into a professional uh, you know harness it professionally then i would strongly recommend that don't talk about politics don't talk about uh, cricket or any other thing which could be controversial on facebook because the un- unknown to us a lot of pay pay patients or people who we don't intend to look uh, who we don't want to uh, you know read what we are posting actually end up reading that there are also guidelines about what you can post and what you can't post on facebook uh what about instagram now instagram is obviously we know what it is it's the photo based app but the key things here is hashtags how you tag things to it as uh, now if you look up lasik you would see that half the posts on lasik which are tagged lasik have nothing to do about lasik and yet these are the ones that are the most popular these are the most top most posts uh similarly when you look at cataract sure half of them are of cataract but a lot of them are not cataract because these doctors and these specialists have now realized that you need to up your social media game it's not just about posting academic things and surgical things you should also this is a portal for patients to have a look into your practice your personal life uh, uh you know what you did what say what you you ate, what you ate for breakfast where you went for a vacation people like to see the human side of you so you can also use that to post these things Uh, it's a personal connect that patients have with you remember compared to facebook the average age of the active instagram user is 23 uh so you know you can you can be really popular as well these are ophthalmologists and you know like one is a triathlon and i am an athlete the other used to be a model and now is is a cornea specialist 45000 followers uh, so all of these things can and it's you know you need to uh, if you use it well patient generation can be very high also uh, you thanks to uh, zuckerberg now all platforms are integrated because you can have a post on facebook that also goes on to instagram and you can also have a post on instagram that goes on to facebook and twitter at the same time so you can merge platforms such that you amplify the reach of a post <clears throat> what about youtube youtube is surprisingly very useful now what do you post on youtube you can post surgical videos you can post examination videos informational talks talk, talking to patients about uh, say different types of lenses how what do you expect in a cataract surgery uh, how is your recovery of a cataract surgery uh, you can also have patients to you know give feedback about how their experience was during the treatment with you so that they can you know you can click a small video and put it on that so patients who look for you may also stumble upon that and realize that okay there are patients who had a good time the youtube search algorithm is something that i have never understood but keywords are important just like hashtags are important for instagram as is the case with instagram and it is with youtube posting one thing in one month will not help it has to be high quality it has to be relevant and it has to be frequent you have to be consistent in your efforts 
only then in the long term will these things show results so when you post a surgical video you you've seen dr pradeep mohanta who's a, you know a, a rock star in cataract surgery it's not just for peers it's for residents it's for fellows patients uh, the, the higher the quality of your video the more views it gets it, the more people see it and the higher it will rank up in your search when people look for it in your videos that you post you may want to again integrate everything link it back to your face link it back to your facebook to your website to your instagram and it's also seen as validation and it, it's the ultimate external audit putting your surgical video out there letting the world know hey this is how i operate this is my before and after obviously you know your your every your results are there for everyone to see and only a confident surgeon would be able to do that so patient see it in that way and can also you know that can serve also uh, it can serve as a route for you to generate patients also if your videos do well you could also monetize it if you have enough subscribers and public uh, hours of watching but what would a patient think about uh, you know seeing a youtube video it's important because that's the way they connect with a doctor if you can you can do a, a hospital tour of your of your uh, a video of your hospital tour so that way the patient already knows the hospital before coming to you you will be surprised patients are very tech savvy and they are not afraid of blood a lot of my patients actually end up seeing surgical results uh, a surgical you know uh, Uh, videos and come back this is a, a video that a message that a patient sent me they saw a dermal filler video uh, and said uh, i need to get a filler done uh, you're charging too much i found this i'm going to buy the filler and come it's only 5000 rupees please tell me the cost how much it will cost for you to fill it uh, it's like that uh, patient telling the doctor plastic surgery aapko nahi karna main plastic lata hu aap sirf surgery ka kaam bataiye so you you can have something unusual and weird here but that's how patients are and it can definitely help generating uh, patient footfalls my experience was like i said it, there was a lot of inertia from for four years i wrestled with the idea personally that i am a doctor why should i market myself but that is a reality of today you can easily build it and do it yourself for the past five years uh, four years now five years now i've been on youtube Uh, i have almost 6000 subscribers and that for me serves to be my biggest referral base for patients uh, uh your more, your website should not just thankfully like i said oculoplasty allows you to post before and after and visually tangible results are seen uh, it should be uh, customized to phones also 80% of all people visiting a website do it on their smart devices so your website should be uh, you know customized to how it looks and feels on a mobile phone or an ipad also have accessibility so patients can write to you seek appointments or even get uh, online consultations from you i end up getting 20 to 30 queries a week that result in about 3 to 4 procedures a month instagram has has shown a lot of promise because uh, here it is you who is responding immediately and it's it's a direct connect that you respond quickly with them uh, you know patients have come they send you videos uh they can come and get operation operated uh, these are patients who had surg- seen so this is a patient who got in touch with me on instagram after seeing a youtube video and eventually got operated so uh, all all of these platforms end up pushing at least three four patients a month towards surgery and these are organic searches that have come up themselves without having a pr officer or someone going out and reaching or paying for advertisements uh youtube videos i have almost 40 videos and now 6000 subscribers it helps because this is the widest reach in facebook whatever you post usually reaches within your friend circle but in youtube you just post it then it goes out there anybody who wants to search for what they are looking for will find it if you have it so it it is important to put the right keywords on youtube of course you get a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, patients who would who frivolously come in and keep asking for appointments and things like that but things may not materialize initially but you have to fight through that period uh, you know and be regular in posting what you do for it to uh, get traction uh so to summarize start early if you're starting private practice like you know we were discussing when is the right time whenever you feel you feel you're ready to start private practice you need to have a, a social media presence a website it has to be on the approach you have to be consistent in posting what you do and there will be an incubation period you will see 5 6 months maybe a year or two where you're posting things you know there is not enough interaction not people seeing it but your uh, digital footprint in the inter- internet 
is your place that eventually has to be there. The longer you are there, the more dividends it will play, play uh, eventually later on. Three things that I always tell doctors not to talk about unless you are very clear on uh, you know, on your website, unless you are you, you are doing it deliberately. Is never discuss pricing on phone or on the on, on your website. Never give out prescriptions on the phone or email, and don't post pictures without consent. Uh, paid promotion, I do not ha haven't yet done it, but whether it's ethical or not is is something that each of us need, needs to decide and uh, take a call on it. So I think that is it from me in terms of how to optimize social media presence online and how to market yourself in ophthalmology. Thank you so much, Dr. Akshay, and excellent as always. Uh, one thing that I uh, want to ask you that you do not have a Google profile, right? You haven't listed yourself on Google. Am yes, I correct? I haven't. Yes, you're right. So, so, so any specific reason for that? Yeah, actually, like I said, I don't have a private practice of my own. I'm affiliated to three hospitals where I have fixed clinic days and fixed OT days. Uh, and when you look for me online, it eventually shows up the three hospitals where I'm affiliated and each of those sites have their own Google page, uh, which also is a very good talking point because if you're starting your own private practice, your own center, it's extremely important to have a Google page because that's the first thing that shows up when you search for someone the stars, the number of reviews, the phone number, the website, everything is listed there. So you can do that. And uh, for me, I, you know, my, the second result that shows up when you look for me is my website. So I think that for me was something, the reason why I didn't post or put a Google page, but I think I should start one. What do you think? But I got a question. Yeah, you should uh, definitely uh, because so uh, how, how do you manage, you know, reviews, for example, sometimes you end up with a lot of frivolous reviews and that becomes a problem with a Google page. And there have been, you know, doctors who've reached out uh, in the past because they've had problem with people putting either fake reviews or, you know, PR agencies doing the damage on that. So that's one kind of side of the social media one has to be very careful of. Yeah, actually, actually I, I, you know, Swapnish is very tech savvy, and I think I want to, I would like to hear about him. How do you how do you deal with uh, negative possible or possibility of negative reviews being posted? I think he's not here. Oh, okay. Uh, can I take that question? Please. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So we we had a patient in the clinic who had to wait for a little longer time than usual. And uh, he immediately posted a bad review. So, you know, we, we acknowledged that, uh, you know, by replying that we are sorry for the service. And we will make sure that our systems are in order. So, but it was a genuine patient who had a trouble and uh, and he who came back yeah so he's he's still with us and he brings his family also so uh, that was a little experience we had with the google bad review but most of them have been good reviews so uh, i want to comment on that i have a google profile and it uh, actually gen generates a lot of uh, traffic to your clinic and what uh, digre sir pointed out yes it is uh, a double-edged sword, uh, as uh, Sir has uh, told, uh, but there is these reviews are always editable, so you can reach out to the patient. I've seen people, uh, you know, talking to the patient and uh, asking them to change their reviews, and it also helps in keeping your staff and yourself on your toes, because when you are worried about these reviews, everybody is at their best behavior. And Dr. Akshay, your point, like if anybody is specifically searching for you, then of course your website will come on the top. But if somebody is searching for the best oculoplasty surgeon in Mumbai, then probably it won't. So that is where it helps. And if you have good genuine re reviews, your profile develops and it, it slowly lands up in the top three or four. And a lot of people do pay for these services. So anybody has experience for these Google AdSense and paid so that was my question actually would you how would you go about doing you know search engine optimization or would you do it or not the search engine op optimization would be different i feel uh, i think dr akshay can tell us about that my question was yes. more about paying for mm -hmm. these google ads having a google adsense account and paying uh, then automatically your name comes at the top whenever uh, those keywords are looked for 
Yeah, yeah. especially for investment heavy uh, procedures that have a good, uh, you know, uh, a payout. Like say the most of, of, of course, the most common is refractive surgery. So, you know, you look for one word, say contura or something, and there are only a fixed few, few results that show up. So one way is to make sure that every time someone in a particular, so when you do SEO, you can do it keyword, you can do it geography wise, uh, where, wherein you basically buy a, an ad slot that links to a keyword. Now, if someone looks for LASIK in Bombay, my result should show up as the first one and it will show up as a genuine search result, except that there'll be written a word written on top saying ad sponsor. So uh, if it works for you, it works for you at the end of the, the day, you know, we are, if you're putting ourselves out as a service uh, and if we are allowing patients to review ourselves as if you're offering a service, then I think it's only fair that we also use that same place, same marketplace to advertise ourselves as a service. If it works for you, by all means do it. Uh, you know, like I said, it, ethics are something personally you need to be comfortable with doing. And if it works for you, you can do that. Uh, the only thing is that, uh, you know, it, 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 you, it can skew a lot. It, it, when you buy, do Google's uh, word search, you also end, end up, uh, you know, a lot of, uninter uh, like say, for example, if I look in search Google, you need to be very specific about which search results should show up your name. You don't want traffic from Delhi or Guwahati coming your way if you're based in Bombay. So you need to optimize it geographically, very important. See, also from the ethical standpoint, as far as the medical council and, and you know, our regulations are concerned, uh, a doctor is not allowed to advertise officially, I mean, legally, except you can advertise a new, a new service, a new center, a new technology. So therefore, uh, you know, to, uh, to, let, so to have an advert which says best oculoplastic surgeon in Mumbai, that advert is a wrong advert to have. But if you want to have an advert which is saying Contura LASIK available at this place, is an adword you can use. So, you know, you also need to see what is the word that you want to use. So you cannot market yourself, but you can market a technology, you can market your center, or you can market a new opening or, or, or some kind of, a, you know, so there is a limit, there is a kind of a limitation on that. Uh, taking that forward, so suppose uh, my question would be to Dr. Nair uh, and the panelists, all of them, like if you would want uh, to have a YouTube page, so suppose you're having a YouTube page, would you rather have it in one surgeon's name or would you have it in the hospital's name? Now you just started a hospital, for example. So what would be the preferred way and what would uh, in that scenario? So I, I think, see, when you, like I said, when you put up a YouTube channel, you need to be sure of what is it that you're doing? Are you going to put educational videos? Are you putting surgical videos? Whom is it targeted at? Is it being targeted as... Uh, at residents, at trainees, or colleagues, or patients, and accordingly, if you're going to, you know, uh, tune it to, you know, put surgical videos out there for people to, uh, for doctor, for patients to see what happens, and if you're going to put educational things on it, such that you create awareness, like I mentioned about small talks on types of IOLs or how your recovery is after surgery, uh, I would think that you know, projecting the yourself. Is, is more important. So you can definitely put yourself, but I don't think, I think that splitting has, whether it, if it's your own hospital, whether you project yourself or the hospital, it's the same thing because eventually uh, the, the goal is the same to direct traffic and footfalls towards your practice. So I'm not so sure about that, but a lot of institutes have a clear policy on what you can and cannot post on social media. So if you're in a large hospital or an institute, you need to tread carefully, get permission and then do it. Uh, taking the last yeah uh, yeah i i think uh, the smart thing would be to do both both of them have your hospital account and a personal account you will see a lot of youtubers having multiple channels and it will uh, it will not uh, affect uh, a lot of us think that uh, the the reviews on one specific channel will go down but it doesn't i think it doesn't uh, affect that much so you can have both a hospital account and your own personal account so hospital will be more focused on infrastructure and all those things. And uh, you can concentrate more on your surgeries. And So taking this last question now on this, and then before we move on to the next talk is, would this, uh, this uh, social media accounts be the same for tire one versus tire two versus tire three cities? Or would you change your approach? 
Yeah, I would like to t- answer that. Just go ahead, Ankit. I am working right now in a Tier Two city and in, in Allahabad, UP. So, uh, what I have noticed that uh, so social media reach is almost same everywhere. Even almost every every person has a mobile. Every person using Facebook and YouTube and Google and all. So, what we try to uh, to when we put something on Facebook or YouTube here, what we try to tell them that the facilities which we are offering are almost exactly the same as what you would get in a tier one city like Delhi or Mumbai. And we are in no way inferior to them in terms of service or the results which we give. While when giving in, uh, when, when, uh, when the social media accounts uh, I see in Mumbai and Delhi, what the doctors there put on the Facebook and YouTube, they are giving uh, them the options of uh, world class services, better machines, and uh, uh, the infrastructure is more focused upon, like we are providing a, so- a sober infrastructure. Here uh, in, in tier two, we are more focused upon the outcome and the cost-based uh, uh, advertising. Thank yes, you. Uh, Mr. Karan, uh, yes. in, in, uh, irrespective of the uh, geographic uh, scenario, I think the top two resources would be Google and YouTube. Uh, so mo- most of my patients who come from interiors, they also, uh, who come through the internet or through Google, they have either looked up me, looked up, on me on uh, YouTube or Google. So recently I was operating on a 12 year old child and I just asked him, how did you land up? He was from a, a almost 200, 300 kilometers away. So that 12 year old child told me that I uh, Googled strong retina doctor and your name came up. That's why I've come to you. So, you know, it's the, the penetration of these uh, things are really, uh, you know, very extensive and people are searching a lot and they, they trust these things. So concentrate on those two things. Okay. Thank you for the comments. Let's move on to the next talk. So uh, I would request Dr. Madan. Uh, sir, we'll be talking about being the boss, starting your practice. with. And if we have, and if we have time, we can discuss about these aggregator apps, Practor and all these, if we have time at the end. Yes, de- definitely, definitely. Yes, sir, your slides are visible. Right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks, Karan. Thanks, uh, Dr. Devakant, for having me here. Thanks to Yossi. So I'll be talking about how you equip yourself to be a boss. So at the outset, let me just state that I'm in no way trying to say that owning your practice is the best way to do it. There are other avenues we've been seeing from the morning. Each one has its own benefits. So this is not aimed at influencing people to make a career choice, but rather to provide an outlook for someone who's already made a career choice. So why uh, own your practice? Or in other words, why your own practice? Now, there are certain obvious advantages as has been discussed, but beyond the obvious, one can recognize and nurture productivity, creativity, and innovation in many people, in people around ourselves. You can provide someone with an opportunity, uh, and that's one of the best things that we can do for our fellow men. We can push the economy, develop the local community. We can serve as an agent for social change, integrating marginalized people and you know, contributing to regional progress. These are all things that we can help with. And the earlier we start to equip ourselves, the better it is. So we need to see things from a different perspective. We cannot see what we're not looking for. So I would say one needs to start very early, uh, actually from our residency days itself. Think you're the boss of the place as someone has just pointed out, take responsibility, take ownership. In your mind, think that you're in your own clinic or hospital and you have a patient walking in. What all will be needed? Every object and person in the premises in your institute that you're currently uh, studying in is there to serve a particular purpose. So where are they placed in your institute? What are their roles? Could they be placed or oriented a little better to save the same purpose? So keep thinking where, why, when, how, of every event, however small it may be, is very, very important. Next, after your training in an institute, try to visit, or better still, work in a few places that match the scale of practice that you envision for yourself. This will give you real-world experience. How do they go about doing the same things that you were used to in your large institute? How do they manage their costs? How do people multitask? There's a lot to learn from these places. Replicating something directly from an institute into a nascent practice is really difficult. Now, if you're used to only the top end equipment at your Apex Institute, you will have to get the same to be comfortable in your practice and that costs a lot. 
So in your training, try different machines and instruments. Seek out the most average machines and be comfortable with them. Be it a slit lamp, a microscope, a FACO machine, whatever. Operate or handle those machines. Know them inside out. Understand the value that something offers for its price. Try operating or working without a skilled assistant. I tell this to all my fellows. Try getting the OT ready, laying out the table, operating on your own. I say this as a VR surgeon. Trust me, many a times outside you'll be doing this only in your own practice. Now, besides the science, ophthalmology involves a lot of machines. So learn the technicals. And for that, spend time with all your technicians and staff. Network with them. They know much more than we do. Not about you know what drug to prescribe or what surgery to do. They know how to get a job done. Which machines are workhorses? Which machines are going to you know keep giving you trouble a lot? How to quickly fix something? Or whom should be your first contact when something goes wrong? Even today, if I want to buy the smallest equipment for my OT or OT, I call the technicians from the institutes that I work, and they give me the best possible advice into longevity and running costs. You need to, you need to know everything that keeps the show running. Uh, for example, what happens if uh, you know you're operating and the power goes off? You have a case on the table. First, the UPS comes on, and uh, what's the capacity of the UPS? Uh, is that in a five amp or a ten amp socket? How many sockets that are there in your OT? How high are they from the ground? Next, the genset. Again, who switches that on? Is that person around when you're operating? If he's not around, can somebody else do it? If that somebody else is also not there, can you do it yourself? The point is, you should enjoy all this. It should not be a chore. Now, about 20 years ago, when I, before my dad taught me how to ride a bike, he taught me how I should remove and fix a tire. That's very important. Now, in planning and running your own center, I wouldn't say, I mean, I, would, I wouldn't be wrong if I say that science comes second. Man management skills come first. Identify your team for their aptitude and then train them for skill. Allow people to take decisions and find solutions by themselves. Do not micromanage everything. In this process, be prepared to lose a few. Be prepared to unlearn and relearn. Be prepared to adapt and change. That is what will help in growth. Now, if you expect to work lesser and have more free time, then honestly, this is not how it works when you're the boss. In business terms, you actually work more. The drive is that you're owning something and the difference is that you're creating something. You are the last in the comfort chain. You're the first to step in in case there's an adversity. In the pecking order, the organization always comes first. The needs and values of the organization are paramount and can't be compromised at all. The employee comes next. Take care of your employees, they'll take care of your patients. Individual preferences of the owner comes last. Now learn the language of money, very important. As physicians, we are not aware of the direct and indirect economic impact of our actions. And that is why now you see a whole lot of other people coming in and dictating terms to us doctors. Take it upon yourself to do a cost analysis. X is the amount charged for a particular procedure or surgery. Y is the expense to the organization. X minus Y is what remains. Often X is predetermined by the market. Y has many variables that you can work around with and you will have to optimize Y to provide your running capital. Now get to know interest rates, you know, types of loans. Are you eligible? Do you need collateral? How do you keep your civil score decent? Now, what are your other sources if you're going to start out? Speak to your uh, family about finances and options that you have. Have an open talk. Often you'll be uh, surprised to know what you have or what you don't have. And all this has to be done a good year or two before you even think about starting out on your own. Now, what sets a leader apart is the ability to anticipate. Stay Always stay two steps ahead of the current situation, be it clinical or non-clinical. Now, suppose I have a surgical case, I anticipate this problem, so I have all these instruments ready. So similarly, you anticipate and prepare yourself for many things in the management aspect as well, so that uh, you're not caught surprised when something, you know, an ordinary day spins out of the ordinary. When starting a practice, patients don't walk in simply because I've finished my MS, I've got, you know, so many fancy degrees, I have 20 papers, I speak in conferences, I'm sitting in my own property, all this doesn't matter. The ball game is completely different, and I'd like to think that these are very important. Accessibility, availability, affordability, and finally, appropriate care in that particular order. So we tend to assume that, you know, what we do is very exclusive and that I have a unique uh, skill. In all honesty, just sit back and think, what treatment I can offer, anyone can offer. No one is doing anything that is, you know, drastically different, save a few people. It's not like two, three decades ago where doing FACO was a unique thing and people used to travel uh, long distance for that. So how do I make myself relevant? Accessibility and availability are most crucial, more so for a startup. That brings us to the next point, market analysis. I can't stress this enough, geographical location. 
Now, we saw that from the patient's perspective, not from our perspective. Where do I have the chance of being available and most easily accessible to people who need me? Where does my skill set and expertise match the needs of the community? Now, this is called product market fit. I have something to sell. Where is it not available? It's not about my interests. As I said, that comes last. It's less about what I like. It's more about what value I bring to the table. When we look around now, we see that you know doctors are moving to smaller towns because that's where the need is. That's where we can create a difference. A common mistake that we make at the beginning is to start at a location simply because we own a plot of land there and we can save on the rentals. I know many doctors who have not done great in their initial private practice. They studied the market, moved to a new location, and then were able to provide value. In the end, we are in the business of dealing with people. People don't buy our science or degrees. The patient is not interested. He's least bothered about what I know. He's interested in what I can do for him. So people buy from people. Can I alleviate his suffering? Now that, that's a world of a difference. How genuine am I? Does the person sitting across the table from me feel that I'm genuinely interested in helping him? That's all that matters. The best way to do that is to listen. The needs and perspectives, the language of population in your locality will be unique. One needs to be aware of that and be always in sync with that. Know the pulse of your clientele. Have a ear to the ground always. Think global, act local. We have to understand people. Now, from what they say, it's easy to deduce what they want. And from what they want, I know their circumstances and beliefs. I can relate better and provide relevant solutions. It has to be holistic. That's all most of our patients want. Now, when we're able to do that, we connect with people around us. Slowly but surely, work gets around. And when your basic needs are fulfilled, one can get back to science and academia. Now, that's the icing on a well-baked cake as far as private practice is concerned. Time is the real currency, friends, not money. So being your boss allows you to control your most valuable asset. Being your boss teaches you many things and gives you the confidence. So that can be carried forward and you can diversify into other fields as well. Management principles are almost always the same in any field that requires person-to-person -person interaction. I can give you the example. My wife, she's an ophthalmologist. She's taken her passion to the next level. She owns her own entrepreneurial venture. She runs her own skin uh, skincare products. I'm sure most of you would know doctors who are you know following other uh, passions and uh, they've diversified into other fields. They have time to do it. Most importantly, they also have the confidence that was born out of the struggle and learning and running and owning your own uh, setup. Now, I like to conclude. I like this one sentence from uh, these masters of uh, Tamil music. What it says is, Puduragam padaipadale nanu iraivane. A loose translation would be, if someone who creates is God, then I'm God. Well, that's extreme. But I would say when you create something, you have the ability to provide livelihood. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, you have the ability to be known for the values you inculcated and the values you stood for. You have the ability to create an impact. It may be a small, on a small scale, but then you have the power to change and make an actual difference. The most reliable way to predict the future is to create it. Welcome to the world of entrepreneurship. Thank you all for patient audience. Excellent talk, sir. Uh, it was uh, really mesmerizing. Any comments by the panel? I think it's a, it's, I mean, it's a wonderful talk and it's always a, you know, a scary prospect for somebody to move from an employee to an employer situation. But if you are, uh, you know, if you are due diligent with your homework, if you've looked at things and parameters, I suppose it's something that all of us can actually achieve. It's not just about somebody who has the finances to do it or to go getting, but I think, you know, that is something that's probably is something that you can easily arrange as long as you have the other parameters in place, I think. So that's what this talk is so nicely shown that, you know, do your homework before you get into it. And once you're into it, you will be successful if your homework was done well. Uh, so can I chip in Dr. Bhatia? Yeah, so um, uh, I, I think a lot of residents and fellows would be watching this and a lot of them would be uh, students who do not have an ophthalmology background uh, in their family. Now, uh, it's for, for people who have an ophthalmology background, it kind of becomes, uh, you know, like a logical thing to get into it. But for those who don't, there would be a certain thought process into why you should take up ophthalmology and in ophthalmology why take up private practice so one of the important things to consider is that ophthalmology does not uh, 
uh, as in a general hospital setup does not require you to admit patients uh, at night so it, you can actually run a day care center and uh, that that's little easier to do than you know actually having a 24 hour setup because the cost of staff and the other things reduces drastically the other thing is that in some places uh, because it's a day care center a nursing home registration again may not be required or you can get away with it so again uh, you know the in from the investment aspect uh, the uh, paperwork that you have to do may reduce also uh, it will be a investment heavy branch because you will have to start off with uh, a peco machine or operating microscope but something like say pediatrics you would you can just start with a table a chair and a stethoscope and do your pediatric practice so uh, in that way you need to figure out whether you can put in that much investment uh, into starting your uh, private practice but at the end of the day uh, uh, considering other branches say cardiology or other branches you can be your own boss you can set up your private practice uh, uh, you know your small setup maybe a single practitioner setup but especially for people who don't have an ophthal background it is not something which is not doable it is uh, doable for you if you're scared about getting into it just figure out the finances for you know uh, the staff and the equipment and all those things and you can get into it and the rewards uh, are very good and I don't want to shy away from saying that the rewards are good at the end of the day you need to run your family you need to earn so the rewards are good. Sir can I uh, say a few words on this note uh, like uh, there is always uh, one aspect that comes to the uh, beginners when we uh, think about starting maybe a daycare uh, set up or maybe a notice set up later on about the loans the bank uh, you know just come and just you know uh, attack you from all the sides that i'll provide you loan i'll provide you that loan so uh, any enlightenment on this that uh, whether we should uh, go for the loans uh, at an early stage or we should think that whether we have a stable uh, you know income or not uh, so when actually to take the uh, loans or if at all uh, is it necessary to take the bank loans or we should grow on our own selves so can you please enlighten us on this? So if you have uh, some kind of, uh, you know, support from your family, that's very good. And if you can, if they can spare a few lakhs, that would be a good place to start. But of course, we understand that most of us don't have that luxury. So uh, there's no harm in uh, taking a loan, as I'm sure uh, Dr. Rohit Modi will enlighten us later on. There are refurbished machines also available, and they also do a very good job. You can get loans and it's important. I usually, what I do is I pit uh, the bank agents against each other. I ask them to come on the same day. I ask them to sit down. I ask them, what, what is your offer and what's your offer? So uh, in all honesty, I've taken a loan recently on 8.5% interest. And uh, I think that's a good deal. Don't go for personal loans. Uh, go for doctor's loans. And you do get good deals if you pit them against each other. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Devakant, are you there? There are a lot of questions that we have. We move on to the next talk first. And yeah, we'll yeah, wrap so, up all the talks and then we'll take up all the should... Yeah. Yeah, I was saying that we should uh, finish the talks and then... Yes, yes. yes. Uh, Thank you. Whatever. Sequential man authority points. Yes. So uh, the next talk is by Dr. Swapnesh uh, Savant. I would request you to please share your screen. He's talking on maintaining ophthalmic assets. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can see your screen, but you'll have to enter into slideshow mode. Yeah, yeah perfect. Please go ahead. So thank you, Divakant and Karan for inviting me and all the uh, UOC coordinators and uh, a lot of these questions which have been asked by again Dr. Tanvir also, I would be happy to answer them through my presentation. First of all, it's a big task to follow the presentation after Madan Gopal because he was so brilliant at doing it. So this is my bit. Uh, again, as I always stress, skill set is very, very important. You need to be sure when to start and you need to be sure of your skill set. The second area 
that you need to be very sure is how much investment you have and what is your risk taking capacity how much is your family backed up and what is your realistic plan of going forward area of practice again depends on which city you are uh, starting off like uh, something like in a bombay you need to start with a bank probably if if your skill set and investment can afford that or you need to go to the suburbs of the bombay and then slowly build up your practice and probably open newer centers so that uh, where you want to start off depends on your affordability also and the skill set also type of practice you may start singly on your own or you may have like minded uh, young ophthalmologists coming together for a private practice but in a group like you may be there with your wife and there may might be two three people of different sub specialties coming together and then starting but a private setting. again then it is a issue whether you are able to do multiple things like i i am a vr surgeon but i also do my anterior segment surgeries fully but for lasik and pediatric there are people who are coming on appointment basis and they are seeing my patients so do you want to uh, venture into a multi speciality for as a center or you want to stick to only vr or cataract so that you need to figure out so the answer to tanvir's question that when to take the loan is actually you should prepare a project report and how to prepare a project report of any uh, ca friend or your whoever is your chartered accountant will be able to tell you that and share it with the investors it could be your parents it could be your in-laws it could be the bankers your seniors and then see the feasibility of that because uh, you will not be very perfect in charting out your financial plan but at least preparing a project report will help you to think about various aspects which i'll put forward in the next few slides so the main decision is whether to have a ownership or to go in for a rental pros and cons of both rental will not be a lifetime asset and um, the person who is renting you out may just uh, throw a fit like in covid times and continue to ask for rents even when you are not practicing so my choice would be always to go in for a over ownership even if it is a smaller place but in that uh, you need to know what emi you are comfortable with and what are the maintenance costs for that property and in a city like bombay how much property tax annually are you going to uh, draw on that if it is a family inherited property then it makes uh, a easier sense in that case that you already have pre it pre owned then you just need to see the maintenance and the property tax about it then the main investment according to me though i am a vr surgeon would be that anterior segment is a bread and butter so you need to have in the priority list uh, your expenses on the phaco or the anterior segment then the vr segment if you are skilled or whichever is your sub specialty the rest of the ot equipment and the diagnostic equipment because we are uh, good clinicians and we should be good, good clinicians that we should not depend upon a oct to diagnose a macular hole so that we can probably plan out a better oct in the third or the fourth year but uh, ot setup has to be top notch top notch to the best that you can afford because that is going to give you results also you need to look at uh, the expenses in the cssd the ot complex whether you want to go for a modular ot or you want to you are happy with the split ac anesthesia trolley and the anesthesia setup especially if you are looking uh, at doing rop cases or pediatric squint cases or ga cases in oculoplasty uh, small things like dehumidifiers uh, emergency tray emergency trolley and if you are really um, going into a refractive setup whether you want to want to go in for um, a first hand machine or a second hand machine along with uh, whether you want the the imaging techniques which is the best like uh, pentacam or you are happy with just a just a simple anterior float giving topography so that you need to figure out and you need to make a short list of all these things uh, loan uh, taking a loan with your degree and having a decent family backup should not be a problem but uh, you need to ask for the payout structure before you enter into a loan that what is what is your payout like and uh, not many of us know about the taxation systems so just in brief when you are taking a loan uh, suppose you have taken a 1 crore loan 
and it is over a period of 10 years the first 5 years you are going to pay that interest to the bank and your principal amount which is deducted will be much lesser and uh, so because the interest is uh, is uh, counted uh, or you can take benefit in the income tax in the first 5 years that interest is going to help you in reducing your taxation but after 5 years or 6 years once your more and more principal amount starts going and the interest ratio starts coming down you will find that though you are and after 5 years you are doing good in your practice though you are earning more but you are not saving much because what you pay as a principal is not counted as uh, an expense it is counted as an asset development fees so it that is taxable and the interest portion is less so you get lesser and lesser benefit on the taxation so though you are earning more you are saving lesser in proportion so the framework of the loan has to be understood by uh, by the by the doctor who is who is taking it uh, again our local things like uh, iol bundling you should be beware of the target because it sounds like uh, very promising that uh, i can i i'm i'm committed to apas or me or i am committed to am or alcon or zeis or whoever but uh, are you realistically going to have that many patients because their bundling is going to be six times the amount so if you are buying say uh, autoref from uh, a company which is worth 3 lakh they are going to expect almost 15 to 18 lakhs of business through iols in that particular year they may extend it to two years but you need to be clear about that target also you can ask uh, the companies to have a deferred payment option uh, do an r&d of the equipment performance and also beforehand before committing to buying the instrument uh, take the cmc and the amc rates from them also you need to know what is the exact expense of the air handling unit of the ot systems that that are going to be in place uh, the elevator system if you have uh, one or two floored hospital that you are planning or the maintenance of the elevator in your premises the dg set the ro plant the water cooler and the medical gas piping because as a vr surgeon i need the the nitrogen coming to my constellation machine and obviously i need the o2 piping also so whether it is wise if i am practicing on the third floor to do the piping or to have smaller chambers coming to the ot through a robust elevator and getting it closer so that the piping is lesser so all these things you need to work out ups is one a very important thing only tip i can give is keep separate ups for the ot complex separate ups for your lasik machine and separate for your diagnostic and a separate ups for the rest of the hospital so don't have, don't combine all the tvs together and just have one unit or one dg set because uh, at least in bombay we don't have power cuts but most of other tier 2 cities would be having that so having a good ups will help in maintaining those machines fire is a important issue so you need to invest now only in a fire extinguisher system with a hose pipe and a electrical panel alarm system the sprinkler system if it allows and uh, the wood work which is there especially of the main doors has to be fire resistant because at least uh, in all the major cities having the fire noc is very important without which you can't get the nursing home registration so uh, and the the law is going to now spread to even the tier 2 and the tier 3 cities uh, as akshay mentioned uh, having um, uh, a social media presence is very important and that starts from having a digital backup of all that you do which starts with the emr system uh, so number of pcs the server that you want the intercom system because if you are going for nabh accreditation you would need a central speaker system which needs to be installed uh, also many people, many hospitals like to play a, play a silent music which soothes the atmosphere in the hospital a tv display system for the patient information and promotional videos and the website expenses have to be taken into care uh, these are the annual expenses which uh, usually we don't think about like pest control has to be done four times a year water tank cleaning at least twice a year staff salary be aware of the overstaffing and in covid we have seen even bigger institutes shed off their staff diwali bonus like in uh, mumbai it is uh, almost the entire one uh, month salary is given as a diwali bonus staff insurance if you have a larger staff 
corpus for uh, property maintenance has to be developed from year one because down the line 10 years you are going to paint it again you are going to have some amount of rain damage and uh, wear and tear of your property as such the signage is uh, if you are living in a main city then if you are putting up a large led there would be some tax which the local municipal corporation would be coming and asking you to pay stationery housekeeping security guards and laundry also have to be taken into account and as you grow these expenses are go also going to grow with your uh, sale networking within the eye surgeon and within the doctor community is important because what you do has to be shown to the public and your peers online forums there is a cost which is uh, associated with that uh, having a, a, a brand building is very important via your digital presence but that too has a time as well as a expense attached to it a pr staff again uh, that it's it's a personal choice whether to put up the advertorials in the newspapers but uh, if it is ethical if you have done some rare case and uh, you, you can promote it as far as it's it's not very in the face and many of our hospital chains under the brand of a private limited company are doing the marketing uh, and uh, i i there there would be opinions on this whether mci should Uh, just not lay down rules for individual practitioners and not for a private limited company to market the medical uh, fraternity to to advertise about the medical fraternity and their and their work the licenses uh, are uh, important licenses like form b just to take this license even if you have fire safety norms in place it costs about 60000 per 6 months at least in bombay so these things uh, are small but then they slowly build up almost to about 2 to 2 and a half lakh per month of a maintenance cost if you divide everything uh, to uh, 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 as a an annual fee versus a, a monthly fee a pollution board control certificate is very mandatory now in mumbai so look out whether it is mandatory to maintain it and so it attracts about a 2 to 5000 fee per uh, month to to give your uh, wastage to a proper assigned agency that's that's still an expense and you need to counter you need to chalk it out in your plan uh, nursing home registration again uh, very important if you're choosing a new place have a separate entry into it and uh, decide about the number of uh, beds that you are going to show because though it's a day care center yes agreed but a lot of cghs or uh, ongc or mtnl or bsnl act affiliations are still uh, harping about how many beds you have they don't understand that uh, we are a day care center and there is no separate norm as of now for ofthal that even if you don't have beds it's it's okay so at least you should have some space so that when they come for inspections you show that these are our beds and wards and it could be uh, your waiting area which is converted to beds in the afternoon time when the patients come in so you need to take that in the account because those are suppose you have want to have an affiliation with uh, air india you want to have an affiliation with uh, ongc or whichever is your local uh, government body those people are still stuck into having an inspection and they would find uh, that if there are no beds and no admission facilities they they would not rate you very highly um oc certificate now this is medical legally also very important that wherever you are buying the premise you have a proper oc certificate and a change of user name to that license for the working of the lift uh, your lift should be ideally a stretcher lift if you are planning your own place and if you find uh, a stretcher lift in your place where you are hiring a floor or buying a floor it it is very good uh, uh, in, in for the future licenses Uh, if you are owning a b scan then you need to uh, have a pcp ndt registration and uh, you need to give a report every month uh, uh, weird as as it may sound that we are not doing sonographies for pregnant ladies but still this paperwork has to be there and uh, indemnity certificate is best bought through the local uh, medical council uh, association of medical council because they will help you uh with the best rates also they have their panel lawyers with them in case of any problem that arises so indemnity separately for individual separately for the hospital not a combined indemnity is what is recommended the person who is doing your electrical fittings you need to take the installation report on day 1 and do electrical audits every year 
that is a very important thing have an mou with the ambulance with the lab with the blood bank with the catering with the laundry that you are going to hire facility if in future you look at, you are looking at expanding and also getting the jci and the nabh accreditation uh, have uh, the numbers for the water supply and the medical gases emergency uh, in in the emergency situations and uh, it's it's good to have a pharmacy shop or a optical shop uh, either pre owned or outsource because that adds to a bit of revenue and uh, also uh, you need to have mous with the lasik center that you are going to take your patient so these are all important from the accreditation point of view also but in general also it it helps to smoothen it smoothen the processes and your staff is more well aware about where to refer and where to call up in case of emergency and you will not be bothered about uh, these small emergency if if there is a need so about the nabh it's a whole uh, task in itself uh, my center was uh, the first uh, among the first top five centers in maharashtra to be fully accredited with nabh uh, but uh, my myself i'm not uh, renewing it because of the cost that is associated with it and uh, in bombay if you know boa is not doing any cashless treatment so that benefit is not really passed on to us because the cost difference between the nabh and the non nabh centers is about 15% and unless you have a turnover of about a, about a crore or a crore and a half uh, it doesn't justify even in, if you are doing cashless and we are not doing cashless so you need to weigh uh, the volume of your practice and then go in for these accreditations because they will come with a with a with, with a cost and not that it is not useful it definitely helps to put in uh, a, a staff discipline and um, a, a good uh, atmosphere to work in and all the checklists are maintained but whether to continue with it with the newer and newer agencies coming and charging for each and everything Uh, asking you to buy an amc and a cmc for practically each and every equipment and asking you to do infrastructural changes uh, it's a personal call whether to take it or not other expenses uh, we are humans also not just ophthalmologists so there would be personal expenses education expenses home car loans you have a dependent family of your own your in-laws and you would also like to invest in something other than ophthalmology so you need to make space for all this and uh, think about it not just go on investing blindly in ophthalmology because success is not fine final neither the failure is it is the courage to continue that counts so don't be afraid to jump into it but uh, calculate your risks as we do in all our surgeries um, i would end up by saying that you are also very important than your pro- profession we tend to overvalue ourselves and uh, rate ourselves too high that we are gods or we are doing some great surgeries i am doing an island feeling i can conquer the world but the neighbor is also doing a equally good job so don't uh, undervalue your skills undersell your skills at the same time don't overvalue your own profession your family is also there and live a life beyond of technology be thankful that somebody is ready to get operated from a 30 year old 30 year old or a 40 year old like if you suppose you have a fracture you would definitely try and go to somebody who is more experienced that would be the need reaction and uh, be ethical in charging your patient but not so dumb as to undersell your skills be kind to the needy also it's a great journey so uh, venture into it and it's it's a very very fruitful experience and as shraddha said it's it's definitely rewarding private practice is definitely reward, rewarding if you plan it out and you stick your guns out the skill set is very very important for your private practice thank you so much excellent talk dr uh, sapnesh we'll uh, move ahead to the next talk for now and then take up the discussion later uh, the next talk is by dr rohit modi who will be speaking on refurbished equipments uh, am i audible dr karan uh, yes you are and your screen is visible as well yeah thanks dr karan uh, thanks dr divyakant and the whole uc team for this opportunity so we are going to discuss about you know refurbished equipments whether to invest in that or not and after the first three talks what we have understood 
uh, you know heard we realize the importance of financial planning before starting a practice and that's where these refurbished equipments come into picture so you know why to think about refurbished it's about you know money a rupee saved is a rupee earned that's very very important concept which i have learned over a period of few years now most of the stuff we get refurbished is at least at 50% discount many a times it can be at even 70% discount and the return on investment concept is something which is very important to understand and this is one of my uncles who told me this that any equipment you buy the thumb rule needs to be at least be 4 years within the 4 years the machine needs to earn on its own like if you're buying a oct the number of scans needs to return the investment on oct and uh, that's where the return on investment concept comes the thumb rule is of 4 years or you can you know uh, apply the marwadi funda that there is 1% depreciation of any machine you buy and 1% is the interest on the capital you have invested so let's say a machine is worth 20 lakh rupees so 1% depreciation would mean 20000 per month plus additional 1% interest is what you pay uh, you know on the uh, capital you have invested that will be 2% a month and hence at least 2% investment per month should be taken as uh, return on investment which means in 4 years the return would be 96% which is as good as rule of thumb so uh, you know if you do a basic calculation if a oct machine is costing you 20 lakhs the return on investment needs to be 40k and per patient scan cost is 2k so the first 20 patients scan is only for the return on investment and mind you i am not taking into consideration the amc you pay for the machine that's additional so that way you will be able to understand whether to uh, you know invest in a machine or to collaborate with someone who has already the machine now if you buy a refurbished equipment this calculation comes down to half and the amount saved could mean less amount of loan required less interest and emi and less amount of stress you know i read uh, you know in one of the best sellers do investments which make you sleep peacefully at night and this is what refurbished equipments can do for you and you get more money for investment and if you start investing early it could mean a huge difference when you're retiring the net worth can be twice if you're even 10 years late now which are the equipments which you can think of easily getting the refurbished ones i believe the opd setup uh, which is there and the microscope because these equipments require least amount of uh, care and you know the total equipment cost for opd and plus the microscope could be if you buy a new one it'd be 23 to 24 lakhs which can cut down by at least 40 to 50% and uh, opd chair and slit lamp again wouldn't require much uh, maintenance auto ref k you know they run for years well and microscope well maintained and independent service engineers are at least available easily in the metros which can actually assess the uh, status of that refurbished equipment which is available obviously you can compare the features with the latest version and uh, you can plan a few months in advance because sometimes that particular machine may not be available immediately and if you plan in advance you can get better offers and uh, sometimes good deals can be available at odd times so one of the things we need to check is if any major parts have been replaced number of years of usage and will the original company give service if it is bought from a third party because sometimes the current dealers may not be interested in giving service even if you pay for a refurbished equipments and some of the machines can be outdated in the sense like alcon has stopped giving service for certain machines so for certain machines it may give service only for next 3 to 4 years so you know that if you're buying a machine at a particular cost you may not be able to use it after a x number of years obviously the tricky decision comes when you're looking at your operator setup in terms of faco or vitrectomy machine or an excimer laser and uh, in these things uh, well we have to you know 
basically balance out with the kind of investment we have and what is the cost of a new brand machine basic knowledge of machine functioning is absolutely necessary before buying a refurbished one and what kind of warranty is available sometimes the same companies do sell their own refurbished machines with good amount of warranty and there is some risk taking uh, required in this so a little bit of courage is required now this was one of the offers which are circulated in one of the uh, uh, refractive groups where they were you know giving a eczema laser for as uh, less as 75 lakhs and they were giving some warranty with it also in fact they have multiple offers where you know you could actually deposit some interest free deposit and then uh, you know uh, you can uh, pay per patient basis also to them now i believe the green laser as a retina practitioner needs to be buy a new one especially if you're buying the indian one they are quite cost effective because the laser cavity depre uh, depletion and the fiber optic cable status cannot be upsetting servicing can be expensive and refurbs are sometimes more expensive than the locally made so the imported refurbs are more expensive again oct one of the companies i had just contacted for the sake of presentation they said for oct we only give 3 months of warranty and that is too short a period and uh, replacement you know even for oct if you are saving something like uh, 5 to 10 lakhs one replacement of part can you know be as expensive as 3 to 4 lakhs so your uh, whole purpose uh, is not achieved and uh, companies can in fact give a 3 year or 4 year warranty and if you have a good uh, running uh, institute you can even think of il bundling obviously take it uh, carefully and don't be penny wise and pound foolish sometimes your decisions can backfire hence you know a background knowledge about machine functioning is absolutely required maintenance issues sometimes can be faced hence take uh, in confidence the local service provider and sometimes some of the people who are dealing with these machines they ask cash means taxation benefits cannot be avoided this is one of the companies which deals in refurb equipments i do not have any financial interest in it. thank you excellent talk dr rohit uh this really uh, puts uh, put some insight into you know uh, particularly regarding the refurbished equipments we have been joined by dr namrata ma'am uh, would you like to give any comments ma'am i think it was a very nice presentation i could almost identify you know with the people who started uh, private practice uh, during our times and uh, we were i went into academics but the people my friends who started i think started like this only by taking refurbished machines by taking uh, refurbished items etc so i could you know kind of correlate with that so i think very useful uh, talk for all the people who are wanting to start practice uh, thank you ma'am uh, divyesh sir any comments uh, so uh, welcome dr namrata ma'am so we've been having a great session since morning and i think you've come from a cricket match i'm sure you've had a good time too at the rpc day but thanks for joining in Uh, uh just one second ma'am your i think your camera is a little bit smudged you'll have to wipe it up with the cloth or something okay okay i'll do that yes sir yeah so i think this is a very prudent presentation so i mean i also have started practice some you know not too long ago a few years ago and uh, i too have used one refurbished equipment in my practice right in the beginning and fortunately it's been serving me all right uh, one of the things i you know took was that so i took the amc from the company for the equipment along with the equipment because the first one or two years you know when you are using it is is when you know when it's new for you as the time when you can end up with some troubleshooting so that did help because in the beginning you know there were some teething issues here and there but that was sorted out because of that initial amc but there on words you know then you can be on your own because you know your own machine and you know how to operate it it also helps to know you know the background from where it is coming Uh, whether it is you know coming from a single use clinic or is it coming from a place where it has been under multiple use multi use and that is something you may not always get to know but it's you must always inquire for it and uh, if possible you know get a demo demo before you take it up so these are some of the you know points that i could like to add to this and i think even in the previous talks the idea about the uh, finances and how to plan it is very very important i think it's something that we as often multis often don't think of uh, whether it is in our private setups 
or even you know in when i'm sure uh, in the public setups now i think dr namrata even for the newer faculty i suppose pensions and all would not be the way it is for you oh, i know i know thing. yeah for us pensions have been abolished now for the more uh, younger faculty and uh, it's a different kind of a scheme so they are not going to get all their money at the end when they you know uh, retire right so okay. that is i think one aspect that we could look in look at and i don't know ma'am if uh, as the ios or as you see we could have a body where we have some you know financial planners etc on board that people could utilize services of or you know if, or have group indemnity insurances for all the members that's something you could look at i think that is something we really need to work on and that is something which is required like you said i mean it's really required and we need to work on it that is something which it's a uncharted territory completely as far as aios is concerned and nobody has ever thought about it and i'm surprised that you know people uh, have not thought about it and i think this is the 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 need of the day uh, dr rohit what could be the uh, possible sources for procuring such republished equipment and namrata ma'am uh, again can I- Yeah, I wish we have some help. Uh... Uh, so you know, I usually uh, I have uh, only bought a couple of equipments which is refurb, and uh, so most of the times, uh, uh, you know, it's the WhatsApp groups which are there, which uh, you know people post uh, the you know they are selling something which I have seen in my BOA groups or uh, the WhatsApp groups. and then there are certain people who just deal with like one of them is refurb who deal with the uh, second hand equipments so you can probably go through them in uh, aioc only i have seen you know two or three stalls for this so you know you can get in touch with them at that time and what uh, dr digvijay singh said was very relevant to know from where it is coming how many years of usage so that background is very important i think that's a very good idea uh, rohit what we can have is that we can separately advertise in aios itself uh, the companies they do come with their equipment and they do come with their new equipment i don't know whether they come with their old i don't think they come with their old but all those who want to sell or are wanting to sell can showcase their equipment you know in uh, in the conference itself so uh, people can uh, can do the negotiations etc and can also have the look at the instrument i think that's a good idea and i think we will try to implement it this year only i think it is going to be in mumbai only so we will do it from this year that's a good idea we will take it forward i think and also there is a facebook page about ophthalmology right. equipments forum so a lot of people just post it and it has a good strength of more than 5000 members yeah so that is also one area where if anybody is looking out for a refurbish you can just pick it up from there and direct contact numbers are shared about the indemnity in in mumbai there is a association of medical consultants which if you are just a part of that then a very good uh, group insurance uh, schemes private indemnity as well as the hospital indemnity in fact they have now extended to car loans and home loans also and uh, you just need to be a part of amc and you just keep getting the flyers regarding these newer and newer uh, indemnity uh, proposals uh, also they have a team of lawyers which are there and they would have handled a lot of medical uh, cases so uh, it it's a win win situation for the the more the number of people who are taking the indemnity the next years uh, whatever is the paycheck starts reducing so it's 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 like our uh, Uh, the one which uh, dr maskati has started and dr ranjit sinha is also a part of it the life insurance policy of uh, aios similar to that like right? more and more people taking uh, indemnity from uh, that body the next year's premium fees starts reducing so i think uh, that would be a great idea something like family benefit scheme uh, yes yes so- so uh, taking this forward uh, uh, i would like to ask the entire panel and the speakers namrata ma'am also if you know if somebody is starting off and he, he is a specialist surgeon should you start off basically with the basic setup or go into a specific specialties as well a retina would definitely require it because he is a retina surgeon barring retina i am talking about 
I think current most models are uh, that people start with a basic setup first and then as they uh, become more confident and they earn more or they have more finances, they branch into uh, other fields where they have specialized in, like you said, except for Retina, because without the, uh, the machine, you can't do anything. But I think that has been the model uh, from my experience, whosoever has gone, if they don't have uh, support from the family or don't have uh, support of investment from any other major source or any, uh, if they're not joining a corporate, I think that is that is what most people would do. And then, you know, as, as and when they buy the machines, et cetera, then they keep upgrading it. Like uh, nothing against it, but just to, uh, just to give example, they would, you know, buy possibly a, a, you know, microscope first and then upgrade to a better one or an imported one at a later date. So that is the way I have seen people have been doing. But I think Digvijay can also, you know, give his own experience who shifted from a corporate to, to his own practice. And I think Digvijay doesn't need any finance. He's, he's a very uh, financially accomplished person. So. <laughs> No, no, it's always it's always difficult to start off in the beginning. But I think as you said, as I also said that I just start with some refurbished equipment, but you have to do it, take it with care and then build upon it. But the first year, the clinic's smaller, the next year you add something. So every year, you know, if you're adding one or two equipments over the next four or five years, you start to get more and more comprehensive. Fortunately, for my practice of squint neuroophthalmology and uh, glaucoma, I never really needed too much of equipment. If you have one surgical instrument tray and one prism bar, your squint is done. So, I mean, it, was, it is somewhat that simple. And uh, so I think, yeah, I mean, you're right. The idea, I think, is to build it up slowly. There's no point of over-investing in the beginning because, you know, you need to, there's a lot of other expenses that come your way as was already discussed. So just to jot that down, uh, in about 30 seconds, basic equipments in the OPT that you would like to put, this is absolutely must. Can you just, somebody can just jot down from one to 10 or more or less? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, like I just started off, so probably you definitely, you know, you have to have a visual equity chart, you have to have an auto refractor, you have to have a tonometer, you can go for a non contact or a contact that depending on your cost, you have to have a slit lamp, bio microscope, uh, a, a surgeon chair an ophthalmic chair unit is helpful, you know, so it helps compact everything in one place, or you'll have to have motorized tables. Uh, apart from that, uh, in terms of the, uh, uni I think it's it's probably very important to have an EMR these days. So you should try and invest in that right in the beginning. Because later on to shift all paper into an electronic takes a lot of effort. So in the beginning, I think that's something you definitely want to have. Apart from that, if you're thinking of an OT, then a good operating, I mean, an operating table, uh, a microscope, which is probably a step above the basic. You know, it's, it's helpful to take the zoom in XY uh, in one form or the other, whether it's your table moving or the microscope moving. A basic, uh, you know, fake emulsification machine, a crash cart, that is a very must if you're doing OT practices. And, uh, you know, in terms of lasers, a lot of things in the bigger cities, you know, you have people who can get laser machines to you or you can tie up with a colleague or a hospital nearby. Uh, as far as the, so the good to have equipment would then have be the OCT based on your practice if you're a retina or a glaucoma specialist or a perimetry. But these would be the good to have. They're not mandatory right in the beginning. So uh, regarding this, so a lot of, I saw a lot of videos also, there was one of video by Dr. Piyush Chandak who couldn't join us today. Uh, he had compared the various low to moderate cost OCT. So in your, uh, the panel's entire opinion, uh, which would be the OCTs that you would recommend? There are a couple, couple that are available in the market and the previous speakers had said it's always better to go for a newer OCT in comparison to in a uh, refurbished one, particularly com considering the fact that the guarantee won't be there much. The OCTs uh, should always be bought, which, which is actually newer in the market. Since the technology of OCT is changing, just like the technology of computers, the five year back for the OCT which are coming, uh, the usefulness of them has reduced a lot in today's time. Uh, what we have just bought, I have no financial interest in saying this, but we have just bought a Hubitz OCT. And uh, we are finding its results are uh, quite good and uh, comparable to the similar and even a little bit higher costing OCTs of other companies. And uh, that's what uh, actually Dr. Piyush Shandak uh, and I discussed this once before, and uh, he also has uh, some uh, one OCT, and uh, he has compared the uh, OCTs in between the companies. And uh, what uh, we found uh, that uh, in the newer companies and the smaller companies, like the Hubits is a smaller Korean company, so they are incorporating more deals into the OCTs just to entice us, so that we we are able to buy their OCTs 
and not prefer the ones which are established companies like Topcon or Zeiss. So that's a good option. I would look at uh, buying an OCT, which would give me give me a function of under photo also, because if you are starting off, you want uh, one machine to do something extra. So uh, I don't have it, but uh, if I were to start today, I would invest in a top one Maestro because that gives me the anterior and the posterior segment OCT. Plus, it gives me an additional advantage of the front desk book. See, going with a newer company has its risks and benefits. Definitely, they'll give you better deals. But uh, if you are a super specialist, but if you are going to do a cataract surgery also, then you are going to use the IOLs anyways. So, if you are if you are going with a, a established company like Zeiss or any other company, uh, though which, even if you are using ten IOLs per month. they can be bundled and it can reduce your emi for that particular machine so that is one thing that that depends on purely how whether you are actually doing cataracts or you are sticking to your multi your own super specialty but i would definitely look out for a fundus camera a good decent fundus fundus photo uh, acquisition capacity of the ocit also if it is my first choice any other use from anybody else i think those are very good points that that's exactly what what i am looking at personally right now uh, i think the hubits has a, a fundus photo is it uh, as along with it right fundus photo top uh, oct angiography and uh, topography and optical biometry so i was speaking to one of my senior retina persons and what he told me was also that hubits oct angiography is actually not great so for somebody like me probably uh, who is not a retina surgeon it would not be a good option but for the others it might be so you all there are a lot of retina people over here dr madan is also a retina surgeon uh, what is your take on it uh, practically i uh, sorry yeah please continue i'm sorry dr siddharth madan you can you can chip in and then i'll probably give my answer yeah actually i got confused with uh, because my surname is i am actually i have been into government uh, setup only i was in lady harding then i shifted to ucms so i've had the experience with zeiss and currently we are using nidec so i don't really have a personal experience with the hubits model per se so what i would see as a practitioner in a government setup as a faculty i still feel that if somebody wants to go in for a machine he should take a machine which is upgradable maybe if not initial investment at first time that uh, at least the oct should be upgradable to oct a i think that should be a good option that's what i think uh, please continue thank you yeah i might have a slightly different opinion when compared to most of the other people because i think uh, you know given the context we are sitting here talking about how you start your own practice so every lakh matters and uh, for somebody who's starting out i would say go for whatever you get and uh, when it comes to retina my personal opinion is that a single line scan if it's good enough it's good enough to have a decision to treat or not to treat so if your machine can give you that properly and you're getting it at a, a better rate always go for that and most of the other you know changes uh, and the other extra details that are higher end machine probably 10 20 lakhs extra that can give you i think is a little cosmetic and for 100 patients that walk into your ot i mean op 90 95 of them are not going to need that and if one or two need that i mean you can probably get it from your next center or something like that so if you can save 20 to 30 lakhs on that i think that makes more sense at least for a big i have another question now dr prasanna is over here he's probably uh, waiting for this question one, yes one, one thing before we come to that i think if since dr namrata ma'am is also here we did want to just sensitize everybody once on you know infection and end of cell mitosis and you know what eios has been doing so ma'am if you could just give a quick uh, you know Two minute comment on the cluster end offs that have happened and what you know how EIS has looked at infection control. I think uh, this year we've had this year meaning uh, in the last six months we've had two cluster end offs in the country. One was in UP and the other one uh, was in uh, Bihar. And uh, both of them, what happens is that uh, it is our duty to protect our own members and it is our duty to uh, see that our own doctors don't get caught. but the only thing is that it is also the responsibility of our uh, doctors and ophthalmologists that they they are observing all that is required to be observed to prevent an endophthalmitis 
so we've come up with the uh, we've come up with the guidelines on the end of thalmitis and the guidelines have been made in such a way that they are not very stringent they are the basic minimum that everybody should follow so that it doesn't occur we don't want to write anything in the guidelines which is going to get tomorrow for instance if there's a litigation are going to get our own members into trouble like you know something very stringent which the probably not all of us follow uh, or not all of us do like something like intracameral moxifloxacin is a must so we don't want to write anything like that and we've not written like that they are made very general guidelines a uh, second thing that we are really trying to uh, understand and to do is that whenever there is a end of thalmitis anywhere and it occurs after a camp surgery or otherwise uh, the first thing that the relatives do or the fir is lodged or the complaint is made is against the doctor but it is not the ophthalmologist who has to be blamed every time because the the fault can lie with the irrigating fluids the fault can lie with the viscoelastics the fault can lie with the iols themselves so we are we, we are in communication with the lawyer and very soon we are going to find file a pil against this in the sense that we will not get a complete relief because we are responsible for the surgeries that we do but we'll get a partial relief so that whenever an end of thalmitis occurs it is not the surgeon you know who who is the first line of attack but there are so many other things uh, which are also involved so our industry partner is equally responsible if the manufacturing is not okay and our other staff are also responsible like the nursing staff etc etc so that is what we are trying to you know get and hopefully when we are successful i will let you know but this is what we are working on with our lawyers thank you ma'am i think that will be very useful because that's kind of a fear always you know uh, and now with probably you know, more camps and all starting up again it will become a hassle so thank you for that thank you ma'am uh, so we actually we are out of time but i would i would request apurva to give us just 5 more minutes to discuss you know a couple of questions so uh, 30 seconds uh, dr prasanna you have been using the visual fields uh, the virtual platform what is your comment on it 30 seconds please uh, visual fields pardon me karan on virtual platform i didn't get your question the 3d uh, visual fields the ones that you are using lsr the one yeah 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 see the the, the thing is uh, in the pandemic era especially the lsr uh, vr headset visual fields it it saves a lot of time uh, in uh, the sterilization part of it because in the bowel type perimeter if the patient doesn't wear the mask properly then you would have to take your time to clean the bowel type perimeter once in every two patients but with the enclosed chamber the nose is always outside the chamber of testing so in that case it really works uh, well the second point is uh, for moderate and advanced glaucoma it is good but for uh, picking up early uh, glaucoma defects it is still uh, not really that reliable but still it serves a very good job is my comment for it yeah uh, thank you prasanna so uh, next question that i would like to ask our panelists uh, it was already touched on emr but i would uh, dr madan uses a free based emr and it was recommended you know that you should start off with the emr particularly in your early practice so which emrs are is is what everybody in the panel using and uh, just quick 20 10, 10 seconds or 20 20 seconds and advantages about it and disadvantages yeah karan as i was mentioning to you uh, i'd like to have something that's with me uh, the data is with me and i can in a single click i should take out everything to the excel And that was the priority when I was looking for him because all these are fly by night operators. They have two three computers. They can disappear any day. I mean, at least the lower level people. So you'd like to have your data with you, not on the cloud. Yeah, I do the Yarago EMR, uh, which I you know got customized for my practice somewhat, and it's been doing a good job for me. Um, I'm using the Crystal EMR, which is designed by a Gujarat ophthalmologist and lot of retina people from Maharashtra is using it. it's a symbian based uh, software and uh, again i i prefer not to use anything which is cloud based i am using a netra clinix emr uh, some made by an ophthalmologist from gujarat uh, and uh, it's also uh, the data is stored uh, on site and uh, i prefer it because the patient data is proprietary and should not get leaked in any in case of a hacking or something of the company so that's why it is very important to have the data on site So, uh, uh, Dig uh, Divakant, are you there? Dig Digvijay sir and Namata ma'am, with your permission, 
we would like to conclude the session there is a lot of matter to be discussed and this is always a never ending topic and i'm sure we can you know take this forward in the our uh, uc members group and i'm sure the aios and uh, our seniors will be always available to us juniors uh, for help and guidance because we are uh, in a, still in a very nascent stage of our practice uh, so with your permission divijay sir and namrata ma'am i would like to conclude the session i think it was a very nice session karan you can uh, take it up uh, as a stand alone session maybe for a longer period of time at the aios itself also and uh, it will be really useful and involve a lot more uh, many more other people especially the emr part because i i think emr is going to be the future of tomorrow and even at aios we should be you know offering at least some emr to our uh, members and i would like to also just say that you know dr namrata is very kind to tell us that our yo pavilion is waiting for us at the physically ios later uh, you know this year and she's already planned some events for yoc from the ios side so thank you for that support ma'am and we will all, all looking forward to be there physically so thank you thank you namrata ma'am digvijay sir uh, thank you apurva and devakant for crafting out an excellent session and uh, being always there for us uh, thank you to all the speakers and the panelists who laid down really important points uh, over to you apurva for the next session thank you karan that was a seamless conducting of this session and thank you so much for making it so interactive so we are ready for our next session uh, we have our innovators and trail blazers who are uh, here uh, dr hirika gosalia wants to talk after two to three talks i hope uh, the others will be accommodating of this uh, dr prasanna is here dr prasanna may i ask you to begin please is that all right with you yeah sure no issues yes 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 so uh, just a second yeah uh... right so uh, dr prasanna is one of our uh, leaders in virtual reality and augmented reality he is currently the research director and glaucoma head at mahatma ai hospital private limited he is published in numerous articles and uh, a lot of them in ijo as well he is the section editor for the regional journal in tamil nadu uh, he is uh, given various talks at the national and international level he is uh, basically very interested in uh, moving images in ophthalmology augmented reality extended reality 3d printing app developing and academic film making uh, he was I, i we discovered him in the last yo pavilion and he is he is just amazing i think we are looking forward to your talk over to you dr pasala yes, thank you for going thank first you. yeah you yeah, know issues ma'am thank you for the warm welcome and kind invitation i am just sharing my screen Yes, ma'am. Is my screen visible? Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, AOS and your pavilion for this wonderful opportunity uh, and a beautiful topic. Uh, deep dive. Welcome to augmented reality. So, uh, welcome to the world of three D ophthalmic metaverse. Uh, this is something that uh, we have been creating for the past uh, two, three years or so. And I would like to share with you my journey as well as the thought process that led into this. usually uh, as a college person as a post graduate or as a fellow for teaching we started creating the 2d and 3d animations and by creating these animations we wanted to convey certain concepts to neophytes so that uh, the learning can be made more gamified and uh, fun for example the common encountered practical difficulties like the iris process and peripheral anterior synecha i used to make these animations and then take them into real time scenario so that uh, we can show them what these really are in real time practice but then i started wondering why not we have unanimated modules so these are something that are animations which is not really real so let us go into creation of the unanimated 3d models is what led to this pondering of using the patient's own image and creating a model and it can be used for patient counseling as well as it can be used for student training as well so what we did was we used real confocal unanimated fundus images which are white field 110 degree true color 
and they were confocal not only the color images we can use an atlas of autofluorescence and infrared for the posterior segment construction and you can also use the anterior segment slit lamp and gonioscopic pictures as a photoreal visuals so the, the atlas we started collecting so this is a color fundus atlas then we had a patient of flecked retina you just need to take a white field autofluorescence and an infrared we had our own confocal fundus image edon i should say it's a no financial disclosure again and we started collecting our atlas in a diabetic retinopathy patient a retinitis pigmentosa you can see all the beautiful images the retinal nerve fiber layer defect for glaucoma it goes on the list just keeps on going a myelinated nerve fiber a splinter hemorrhage so yeah now we have collected our 3d models so now what we need to do is we thought of presenting the models in the best way possible such as a 3d atlas and augmented reality that's when we started making our own augmented reality holograms in a cost effective manner so what we did was we took our 3d i models our real time true color images and we put it into unreal engine software as you can see here and then we made the 3d i models and then we coded them in the android phones for a good ar display so this is a 3d i model and we also made sure we used complex structures not only i but structures pertaining to ophthalmology such as the cavernous sinuses and the circle of willis so all these models were coded so this is the blueprint that you are seeing on your screen so we coding these 3d models in the unreal engine software and we anchored them to this white ball called the root so by anchoring them in the white ball called the root so many of you will be uh, familiar with the the pokemon games that came in augmented reality or even the filters that we use uh, especially the the kids or someone we used to play with lot of coolers once you have the phone in you it will automatically read you so this is what is called the root the white root so this is very important for the model to get a uh, span into the mod for augmented reality uh, usage so we we started using the eyeball model the circle of willis and once all were created we had this root and this is the ar template that is mandatory and the, now it's all set you just need to install the application that we have created it's free of cost i'll just be showing the application next you just need to install the app in your phone make sure you fit the uh, fit the phone's camera onto that ar template so this is the paper that i'm again showing once again it is also available to download in the app store and once you do that so this is the qr code to download this particular app which is currently available in the android platform we are we are soon launching it in the ios as well so once you download this app all you need to do is let us see a real time scenario what you need to do so print the ar template and place it on your table and now open the app and click it and focus your phone on that particular paper you can see that on the left hand side is a real time scenario and on the right hand side of your screen you can see this is the display of the mobile camera view so the model will be spawn as a hologram now by moving your phone accordingly you can access different views of this hologram so you can move up you can move down by moving up you get a much smaller view of the eye by going down you can go and see the optic nerve the retinal vessels all these are not animated models these are our own patients real time models so with this the learning can be made more fun more interacting fundus learning angle structures learning all these can be made very interesting and this is again another model cavernous sinus once we create the model in the maya software import it into unreal engine and then we code it for augmented reality so again you can see on the left hand side the user is demonstrating with a piece of paper and a phone it is cost effective we are provided it free of cost and by just moving your phone front and back finding your sweet spot is very important you can see that on your right hand side of the screen by rotating the model you can get the different sections of the cavernous sinus which is actually not possible by textbook reading because in textbook you always have a single slice or two three slices maximum the creative cognitive learning is always impaired because they have to especially the neophytes has to have to imagine a lot but with augmented reality every 360 degree can be accessed and then this is again another model this is a recording in my phone taken where not only the cavernous sinus even the angle structures as i was saying you just need, need to move your phone back and then just go in and visualize the angle as well so normal angle abnormal angle anatomy everything can be fed and learning can be made more fun once this is done we can go into real time scenarios and even for simulations also it works wonders so we are, the 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 usp of our particular app is we have used real time images not animations real time angle structures 
real time fundus fundus images so it's it's really important that uh, we use real time images and we have also published the same in this year's uh, january 2022 uh, innovation section in the indian journal of ophthalmology and obviously the cover picture also is ours that is where the fleck retina i was just showing you and then uh, these are some of the references uh, we are also published a chapter on how to do it we have provided it open access for viewers who are seeing this it's always available for you for download and not only we stopped with augmented reality we also went one step further and did the extended reality this is a true holograms with hololens microsoft you can see this again with hololens uh, we have incorporated all our models into the hololens as well where you can see the pedagog here is actually moving on the right hand side but it's actually a museum of holograms that he is actually seeing on the left hand side you can see the display of what he is actually seeing through his eyes so that is very very important because for 360 degree learning all these models from cranial nerves starting from their anatomy where they are originating where they are inserting the extraocular muscles all these models we have created and we have provided it in the microsoft platform as well and the advantage of this is not only you get a, a visual aura or a photo immersive feeling you can also use the tactile learning you can see here the user is actually holding the hologram he is actually pulling it off by pulling it you can actually enlarge the hologram you can rotate the hologram you have access to the eyeball as a whole and by this simulation simulative learning can be made more gamified and also the skill sets can be improved and uh, not only for anatomical learning we are even trying to incorporate it for smaller procedures like gonioscopy foreign body removal and here you can see the beautiful visualization of the angle so all these are uh, uh, we have also provided a multimodal atlas uh, color fundus photograph an auto fluorescence and infrared for all the eyeball models we have also provided the cavernous sinus the circle of willis in the eyeball models so all these are available as true holograms in by, by us so we are uh, a more of a 3d ophthalmic metaverse is what we are creating and we are the team mathma center of moving images we are not only ophthalmologists we have a group of technicians as well uh, you can all feel free to visit our website we are a growing team research and development moving images ar app development and even 3d printing as well and these are some of the applications that we have created apart from the holograms we have our own 3d atlas called the img 3d we have our own windows version application as well all these are open access we have printed our own 3d models as well as a puzzle for a cognitive learning for want of time i'm just skipping through certain slides and this is the last slide that i'm clo closing with we have done totally six innovations which are all available in our website i think the users here whenever you are free you can go look at it not only augmented reality we are there for extended reality 3d printing as well and we also publish our work igo videos recently we published our animation deck and uh, we keep learning and uh, the future is going to be augmented reality and extended reality this is my daughter who is playing with the vr headset that we have actually innovated so i think in 10 years now or 5 to 10 years every home will have their own vr headsets and we can actually go into everyone's home with this particular application and this is going to be the future of e ophthalmology i thank your pavilion once again for giving me this opportunity to share the innovations that we have made thank you team aos and team uc for this wonderful invitation thanks a lot excellent excellent talk dr prasanna i, I had the pleasure of reading uh, your article um, even which you have submitted actually so oh. <laughs> <laughs> right so um right so now a uh, quick question uh, nilesh are you there yes yes ma'am and excellent talk uh, prasanna sir as always i have following sir since he started flash based animation for last two years i am with following him and learning from him so uh, excellent uh, this uh, thing is there sir it is uh, mostly right now centered on residents so uh, but i feel there is a, a large uh, chunk that can be used for patient education also sir. so are you working on that front so that at least for the complex thing like uh, uh, gonio uh, glaucoma and complex retina surgery and even uh, like the cornea surgery where the layer layers are being used so yes nilesh actually uh, to start off yeah we just started slowly we wanted to go slow and steady as you know for the past 3 years 3 years back i was only making animations you would be knowing that so now we are slowly moved on to simple simple procedures because there is something called rigging It, it is quite difficult, and the rendering process also takes a lot of time. So now we have started making the simple gonioscopic insertion and removal. Sometimes when we use the visco, that itself for residents it makes a lot of pain to the eye for the patients, especially 
if they don't handle it right the vacuum suction creates a lot of pain to the patients a simple foreign body removal so we now we have started with that also simulations so then slowly we are planning to upgrade ourselves to cataract surgery and then maybe to cornea and retinal surgery i think it will take our time but i think we'll be uh, positively be able to get that that is for the students point of view for the patients point of view we have thought of a 3d k sheet module where now we are all think, th talking about the patient's k sheet what we can give to the patients maybe we are there where we can so we have done our 3d models so it is just about removing the fundus and the anterior segment in the code you just need to feed the patient's fundus and the anterior segment so by this maybe with an emr we can attach the patient's own 3d k sheet maybe that is very near where it, it will be somewhat innovative as well as the patient can get to access the 3d k sheet so if the patient loses follow up and then maybe uh, he is traveling and he is going to another doctor the 3d k sheet will always work wonder for the patient because sometimes the fundus we would always want to see what is in the equator or maybe what is in the periphery and for the angles as well so i think it has a role to play and soon uh, we will be able to reach that is what i am uh, optimistic about looking forward to that sir number one i'm uh, a quick word from you on this uh, oh, this was completely mind mind blowing absolutely Thank i you. know that uh, uh, we always get innovations from him but uh, this was just or maybe i saw it for the first time so for me i mean it was completely spectacular and okay. i'm looking forward to the cornea part of it thank you thank you <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. It was quite a recent one. I'm just wondering, you should have had a you know prize here for second, third prize in this session. But anyway, each of the innovations I'm sure is going to be great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, Dr. Apurva, uh, shall we move on? So, uh, moving on uh, from that wonderful talk, we have the special privilege of hosting Dr. Wong Chi Wai. Uh, is he here? Hi, yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes. Hi, hi, hi. Dr. Wong Chi Wai is an ophthalmologist at the Glen Eagles Hospital, Singapore. He was a big part of SNEC prior to this. He has set up the myopia clinic there and he's also done his post graduation from there. He has an immense number of publications in the field of myopia and ocular drug delivery. And he's got several awards for his research work, he's got travel grants. And he has served as the deputy director of SNEC's undergraduate education. And he was the program director of the Duke NUS Medical School's ophthalmology program. He's a committee member, obviously, of the Singapore Young Ophthalmologist Society. And uh, he is a reviewer in the big journals in ophthalmology like IOVS and ophthalmology. He is the recipient of uh, the Sing Health Healthcare Heroes Award, the Young Eye Ambassador Award, and the Sing Health Quality Service Award. We are really honored to have you here, uh, Wong, uh, Wong Chi, and uh, I really look forward to hearing your talk on ocular drug delivery. Is uh, nanotechnology the way forward in ophthalmology? Thanks for being here. All yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind invitation and, uh, and also <laughs> introduction. Uh, I'm very impressed with uh, Dr. Prasanna's ophthalmic uh, metaverse, and hopefully, I can share something that is. Uh, uh, equally exciting. I'm going to share my slides now. So today I'll be talking about um, nanomedicine, which I believe will be the next frontier for ophthalmology. And this is based on the work that we did at the Singapore Eye Research Institute on liposomal uh, drug delivery. So first of all, what is nanomedicine? Uh, if you look at the diagram here, you see that on the nano scale, this is essentially a subcellular scale. So nanomedicine is the application of nanotechnology, which includes the uh, biomaterials at the subcellular level. And the advantage of this is that we are able to then influence uh, cellular uh, activities and processes directly. So nanomedicine has found application uh, across a wide spectrum of uh, uh, modalities in medicine, which, in, which includes imaging, uh, diagnostics, regenerative medicine, as well as narrow, nanotherapeutics. So I believe that nanomedicine could be a, the next step in the evolution for ocular therapeutics and diagnostics. And today I'll talk uh, on how it can revolutionize ocular drug delivery. 
So nanomedicines, uh, one of the first utility for nanomedicine is, uh, uh, is used as a drug delivery platform. It can be broadly classified as lipid-based nanocarriers, which includes liposomes, polymeric nanocarriers, which uh, includes hydrogels that uh, most of us would be familiar with, included, and also uh, dendrimers and uh, micelles, as well as non-polymeric nanocarriers, go nanoparticles being the, uh, one of the most uh, commonly used nanoparticles. So today I'm focusing on liposomes. What are liposomes? They are essentially naturally occurring membranes in the human body, which means they are perfectly biocompatible as well as biodegradable. And advantages of using liposomes is that you can encapsulate drugs uh, either in the aqueous core or in the uh, uh, lipophilic bilayer. So a wide variety of drugs can be included encapsulated by the liposome. And by encapsulating the drug compound, you can slow down degradation. And liposomes are selectively targeted by macrophages. So essentially, it selectively targets inflamed sites. And at the same time, it avoids undesired um, drug effects at non-inflamed sites. Liposomes are very versatile uh, drug delivery system. So there are many, many ways you can alter the uh, physical chemical properties. So liposomes, which includes its charge and size, uh, typically around, the size of it is typically around the 50 to 100 nanometers. And um, you can also modify the cell surface receptors uh, to give you a variety of functions. For example, you can make them, uh, I can, you can add polyethylene glycol onto the cell surface to make them uh, stealth liposomes. These avoid uh, detection by the uh, circulating macrophages, which allows them to uh, circulate in the systemic circulation for a longer time. Uh, you can also add cell surface receptors to make them target specific cells in immune liposomes. You can alter charges to protect the payload. You can also uh, create stimuli responsive liposomes that uh, release the payload on uh, stimuli such as heat and light. So what we did uh, with liposomes at the Singapore Eye Research Institute was that we we're trying to solve the HO problems of uh, eye drops. So eye drops have been in use in, for ophthalmology purposes since uh, 150 years ago, but yet uh, there's not been a lot of uh, innovation and we are still uh, faced with some of the limitations of eye drops, which include low bioavailability, uh, difficulty in instilling, and also uh, uh, reliance on patient compliance, which often, uh, as you know, will be difficult. This was one of the first studies that we did. Uh, it was a preclinical study where we looked at the use of subconjunctival liposomal steroid to treat experimental uveitis. So the aim of the study was to demonstrate efficacy of uh, subconjunctival liposomal steroid. Uh, we had two types, uh, liposomal triamcinolone acetonide and liposomal prednisolone phosphate. And this was the study design. We pre immunized the rabbits uh, with uh, TB antigen, and then on day zero, induced uveitis. On day three, we injected the rabbits uh, based on their treatment groups. So there was a control group and there was an eye drop group. We had two separate subconjunctival uh, liposomal steroid groups, uh, a single injection of that on day three, as well as a subconjunctival free prednisolone phosphate group. On day week, so on day eight, we simulated a relapse by injecting uh, antigen into the anterior chamber. So looking at the performance of the liposomal steroids uh, against eye drops, we saw that uh, the initial suppression of inflammation was much better than eye drops. And also it was able to prevent a rebound inflammation after a repeat simulation of uh, inflammation on day nine. And compared to daily eye drops, the, a single subconjunctival dose of liposomal steroid was able to achieve the same uh, sustained anti-inflammatory effect. When we looked at the liposomal steroids compared with the free steroid, we saw that the initial suppression of inflammation was similar between the two groups, but the free steroid was not able to attenuate the rebound inflammation on day nine compared to the liposomal steroids. And free steroid was also not able to sustain the anti-inflammatory effect at two weeks compared to the liposomal steroids. 
Histology confirmed the clinical findings uh, with more inflammatory cells seen in the eye drop groups as well as the free uh, steroid groups compared to the liposomal steroid groups. And also confocal microscopy showed that uh, the macrophages as well as the liposomes were co-localized. So this uh, provides evidence of the uh, selective targeting of macrophages to the inflamed sites in the ciliary body, as well as the iris, uh, and specifically inside the macrophages. There were no side effects, uh, which included raised intraocular pressure or cataract formation from the use of these uh, subconjunctival liposomal steroids. So we can see from these preclinical studies, the promise that is liposomal steroids uh, can be promising uh, agents uh, for anti-inflammatory treatment in uh, cases of anterior segment inflammation, and that liposomes also demonstrated selective targeting to inflamed sites with uh, little side effects. So we went on to perform a clinical trial. This was a phase one, two clinical trial using liposomal steroids. And we wanted to look at cataract surgery because cataract surgery, post-cataract surgery inflammation is the most common cause of uh, anterior segment inflammation. And there's, as we mentioned, there's lots of uh, limitations with the use of steroid eye drops, particularly in uh, certain groups of patients like the elderly, children, the non-compliant, and patients with uh, concomitant medical conditions that may uh, make it more difficult to use eye drops after surgery. So in these patients, uh, these were patients that were uh, scheduled to go for cataract surgery. At the end of cataract surgery, we gave a single subconjunctival dose of prednisolone phosphate and then monitored them for uh, ocular inflammatory scores as well as uh, safety outcomes. This was a small pilot study of five patients but we found that all the patients tolerated the uh, procedure uh, injection very well. None of them had any side effects, including raised intraocular pressure or cystoid macular edema uh, up to three months after the surgery. And all, all of the patients had complete resolution of inflammation. Laser, photo, uh, laser flare photometry also showed that there was a complete resolution of inflammation in all patients. So in conclusion, I think nanomedicine is particularly relevant for ophthalmology because um, the eye itself is a, it's a very special organ with multiple uh, barriers for drug penetration. So nanomedicine with its selective uh, targeting with its uh, uh, reduced degradation of the payload can certainly be of a huge benefit to uh, ocular drug delivery. So in particular, liposomes are very effective because they are targeted towards uh, macrophages and also they encapsulate the uh, payload, which then effectively enhances their therapeutic efficacy without the uh, off-target side effects. So there are many future applications of nanomedicine, which uh, includes delivering gene therapy, uh, involvo imaging, and perhaps in the far future, nanorobots that can allow uh, surgery at the cellular level without uh, any invasive procedures. So thank you very much. Great, great talk, uh, Wangchi. I think Nilesh has a couple of questions and we have some audience questions also. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wangchi. It was really uh, thought provoking and uh, uh, I actually have not one but three questions for you. Uh, the first thing is, uh, uh, I wanted to know what was the dosing in that clinical phase one and two trial? Like, is, is it uh, a single injection and you do it and forget, forget it? Or you need to repeat them at uh, like two weeks or three weeks, something? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. So it's a single dose of subconjunctival uh, steroid, 0 0.1 mils. We use uh, five milligrams per mil concentration. And uh, it, none of the patients actually required uh, any rescue uh, topical steroid eye drops for after the surgery. So a single dose was essentially able to replace the use of um, 184 drops of steroid eye drops uh, over one month. And uh, uh, we have an audience question. How is subconjunctival uh, liposomal prednisolone used here? Uh, better or efficacious over uh, the conventional subconjunctival dexamethasone? 
and the cost issue uh, because i think the cost issue is uh, really early we have uh, to discuss here right now because it is in clinical trial but at least uh, what are the uh, uh, what is the benefit over other subconjunctival implants or uh, depo injections yeah so um the main benefits of using a nano carrier basically um, is because we want to have targeted delivery so obviously free steroids would not uh, be targeted towards inflamed sites. It can go into the trabecular meshwork uh, and everywhere else that you don't want it to go and cause side effects like raised intraocular pressure. And also you have to deliver a much higher dose if it's uh, not targeted. So uh, the greatest uh, benefit I'll say for nanocarriers is really the targeted delivery and also protecting the drug from uh, degradation before it reaches the target the, uh, sites of inflammation. So that allows you to deliver a uh, much smaller dose uh, with much greater efficacy. So overall, what it does is that you don't need such a great uh, big dose. You have less side effects as well to have the same effect. And uh, this uh, liposomal membrane that you are using, uh, are they synthetically made or are they derived from a, a living organism? So is it a biologic or is it a completely synthetic uh, molecule? So these are basically um, synthetic lipids. So the lipids are synthesized and then, um, and then rearranged into the phospholipid bilayers. So once, once we go for gene therapy, then it won't be considered as a bio biologic, it will be considered as a synthetic drug. Yes, so, correct. So the use will be different. Yes. Okay. So uh, great, great talk, sir. Uh, and, uh, we are really enlightened and uh, all the best for uh, you getting this drug into the community, getting Thank the you. approval. And hope hope to see you in physical conference at uh, in the All India Conference. Yes, hope to see you in person too. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So... Uh, Neelish, you can uh, introduce the next speaker. Yeah. So uh, next we have uh, Dr. Amar Pujari, sir. I don't think he needs any introduction, in, at least in the uh, in India. He is a leading innovator from RP Center Ames. He is currently working as associate professor. And uh, he has multiple innovations, both uh, as new devices, as well as improving on the uh, limiting, uh, the recent uh, available uh, resources. So Sir is going to talk about ASOCT and strabismus researchers. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nilesh. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Audible and uh, screen is visible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nilesh. And thank you, everyone at the UC. So uh, today I will be telling what we have done on ASOCT and strabismus resurgeries. So, so why ASOCT studies are necessary in strabismus? Because basically, as you can see, the retina and the cornea people are much more oriented about the OCC and they want to see something in the cross-sectional imaging so that they can get some information and they can operate or they can treat the patient. But as far as the strabismus is concerned, you are going to only uh, dissect the muscle, either you are going to resist it or you are going to resect or placate it. So why do you need OCT here? So OCT can tell something about the muscle location or its uh, thickness or what kind of surgery has been done. So it can basically tell the anterior portion. So up to six millimeter of the medial lectus, up to nine millimeter of the lateral lectus and up to five millimeter of the superior and inferior lectus muscles can be visualized on OCT. In fact, practically we operate on these portion of the muscle. So hence it has some value. So that we want to show that like what are the utility or where it can use this one. So what experts have explored across the globe. So basically, uh, if you get around, uh, if you search uh, the literature, you are going to get around 25 to 30 publications. So out of around 80% have said that they are able to visualize all four recti and they have identified or correlated the normal insertion on OCT as well as intraoperative uh, measurements. But uh, we can do more justice or we can use ASOCT for more practical reasons in strabismus surgeries. And that is a, uh, that is a point when you want to use OCT as a tool based on which you can uh, plan the strabismus surgery. That is going to be key and that, that can actually define or that can do a justice for a strabismus surgeon to buy an ASOCT machine. So previously, normal identification of the muscle has been described. In addition, how we can use ASOCT and what is, the, what is the stark difference between ASOCT and UBC? UBM, sorry, that has been said. So as I said, we can do more justice if we are able to define the role of ASOCT in strabismus resurgeries. But one thing is as we have a referral center, so often we are going to get at least two or three patients per month 
where like strabismus surgery has been done, but there is no uh, available or documented details. So patient has lost this one and the clinic has lost the details because it could be 10 years, 15 years, 20 years previous surgery. So in those conditions, you can see congenital scarring, you can say some of the surgery might have been done, but you don't know exactly where the rectus muscle lies on the sclera. So you need to identify where the rectus muscle is. If you are, if you, if you have some insight, so you can either re-recess or re-resect, or you can adjust in the same eye. Sometimes patients are going to have more than 100 prisms deviation. In those cases, all four horizontal recta has been operated. So now you'll be in a, a very dilemma, like which one, which muscle I need to operate. So that is a tricky situation where you can you use OCT uh, to gain some insight. So I wanted to explore the ASOCT role in strabismus resurgeries with lost surgical details or with previous surgical details are completely not available. So it was a prospective interventional study. So preoperatively, I did OCT and intraoperatively, there are four surgeons who correlated what are the distances I gave it to them. So I took ethical clearance, institution ethical clearance, and patients attending to our strabismus surgery a clinic, so for the surgery were evaluated, and those specifically who have lost the surgical details were included. The sample size over a period of one year was 10, till now I have completed 30, but initial 10 uh, included for assessment and publication. And the number of surgeons were four, and I was the only ASOCT evaluator. So here you can see that the picture A, component A shows that the uh, medial rectus cross-sectional imaging in case of uh, extreme abduction. You can see this is a thin tendon, which is becoming more of a belly here. After four to five millimeters of the tendon, you can see this is a medial rectus belly. And similarly, you can see on the B co uh, component, you can see this is inferior rectus. Again, this is a small portion of tendon, which is becoming more thicker or more black, that is your muscle belly. Similarly, in extreme adduction, you can see lateral rectus. Again, the tendon is very thin and you can see dark belly. And here you can see super rectus and super rectus, of course, it has more of belly. So it is very clearly visible. So this is how the superior, uh, inferior, medial and lateral rectus appears. So you can just uh, focus here that like the, the contour, overall contour of the globe is very convex. It's very crystal clear. You cannot see any uh, bumps here. So it is very well defined. It's like one fourth of an arc, right? So for just uh, practical understandings, what I said is the scleral or the ocular coat between the insertion and the limbus, let us consider it as an anteroocular coat. And from insertion onwards or towards the posterior, let us consider this as a posterior ocular coat, right? So here, this is a one example where you can see the larger red row shows that there is a slight bump, right? As we know that the sclera is going to be thinness just behind the rectus insertion. So you can see the thinness clearer that is depicted by subsequent small arrows, red arrows. And the largest red arrow indicate that probably here was the medial rectus muscle. And you can measure from the angle. So distance was on four to five millimeter. That's what the normal distance is going to be, right? So we are looking for the hypo intense area along the scleral coat. It is going to be at the 50% depth, but here I'm not able to see anything. So I'm able to see some kind of hypochoic intensity at 10.8 millimeter from the angle. So in addition, I can see that there's a congenital scarring. So this appearance of the original muscle stump bump and the thin sclera and the congenital scarring, all three indicate that yes, probably this eye has undergone some sort of surgery. And where the muscle lies, so probably the hypointense layer lies at 10.8 millimeter from the angle. So I need to compare with the other eye medial lactus muscle. If I'm able to get at 4 millimeter or 5 millimeter, I can subtract 10.8 minus 4 or 5. And that is the amount of precision I'm going to get. Similarly, you can see here, this is a, another example where medial lactus has been dissected. You can see this is an initial hump. You can see congenital scarring and there is a th thickening of the ocular coat because the muscle has moved anteriorly. And in com comparison to uh, the previous examples of normal medial lactus, you can see the medial lactus here, it is quite thick. So it has to be the belly portion rather than the thin tendon region. So again, the distance is 8.4 millimeter intraoperant showed that there is a stretch scar. So this is how we need to identify the resected muscle. This is for lateral sclera. You can see the ocular contour has completely lost. It has become more of undulating. So this is how when you expose the sclera, it's going to lose its rigidity, it will become more of undulating. And you can see this is the initial bump, the large red arrow. And subsequently, you can see that the ocular coat has lost its contour. And I cannot see a hypointense layer, consistently visible hypointense layer till up to 15 millimeter from the angle. So I need to relocate the LR in the other eye and I need to correlate where exactly the LR in the other eye. And here I need to subtract that one. So it indicates that probably nine, more than nine millimeter of lateral lactus has been recessed. 
and this is for lateral rectus you can see that the bell you can note this is not a normal rectus it is a muscle bell in, instead of tendon so it is a resected lateral rectus so again i need to call it to the other eye lr so if it is a 7 mm and this is a 7.5 mm yes probably this is a resected muscle and with respect to a tendon uh, thickness i can say that this is a belly so it's a resected lateral rectus muscle so i evaluated 10 subjects right so the mean age of 10 subjects was 23 years and the mean preoperative as team age of distances was 8.9 millimeter and the interoperative distance was 9.12 millimeters so you can measure within 0.5 difference right so you can get a quite agreeable uh, measurements on asoct so to conclude in strabismus resurgeries with lost surgical details we can use the asoct as a reliable tool where muscle details can be assessed with respect to type of surgery as well as amount of surgery right so but the limitations where it is an evolving tool uh, i got another publication where they are able to image the muscle cross sectionally i mean to say uh, i was able to image cross sectionally but they were able to image in phase so they are able to see the muscle they adopted new software probably in future that is going to be more common right and subjective variations are high because of all the scarring and this thing uh, subjects need to learn how to image the muscle how to identify normal subjects then we can extrapolate and we can understand original circumstances then we can use it as a tool with more accuracy right so this i have published and thank you thank you so much sir this was uh, i think you have extracted most out of anti segment oct uh, from using it for posterior polar cataract evaluation and right now to strabismus resurgery so uh, really excellent innovation sir uh, i would like to ask a question sir uh, is there any uh, uh, utility of it to identify lost muscle also because that is a real problem that is with surgeon face exactly exactly so you can compare in the other eye and if you are not able to uh, the best part of the sweat source oct is we can visualize up to 15 millimeter of the overall ocular code so from angle if you are not able to see muscle up to 15 millimeter so because the medial rectus normal distance is around 4.5 inferior rectus around uh, 5.9 lateral rectus around 6.9 and the superior rectus around 7.1 so it can give beyond that one right so if you are not able to see within that one so obviously the clinical findings and the base clearer everything can correlate and you can conclude that yes probably there is a slip muscle lost muscle anything can confirm and sir, uh, going beyond this strabismus, sir, because it is giving such a nice view. So can it be utilized in uh, two areas specifically if there is a resurgery uh, in uh, buckling and all where a lot of uh, tissue destruction has happened. So it can give areas where we, can, we need to focus. And second, uh, uh, what came into my mind uh, in my uh, area of interest is uh, in uh, uh, repeat traps or placing uh, finding the area where we can do uh, the drainage implants. So, uh, do you think it is it will be implied uh, implied in that? Yes, ASOCT using soft source OCT, you can explore where is a which, which is a much potential site. And recently, there was one paper from uh, ophthalmology science where they have identified the lymphatic drainage in trabeculectomy patients. Yeah. So, in that manner, they described very subconjunctal, very good uh, subconjunctal space of the lymphatic flow. So, in that manner, what I learned from that publication also, you can identify the conjunctiva, tenons, and the episcleral tissue, scleral health also. So if you want to do a trap or the EG, if you want to put, so you can just clean the superior temporal in between the muscle area on the nasal, superior nasal and superior temporal part. If you feel that this is not scarred, it is quite easily dissectable. So you can use in that manner also. Yeah. And uh, Namrata ma'am is here from uh, Namrata ma'am. Uh, I would like to ask ma'am and uh, you also, sir, uh, uh, how is it going for the with the use of uh, anti segment OCT for the posterior polar cataract. What are the recent development in that? Going okay. beyond your topic right now. <laughs> uh, okay. So I'm doing that one. So initially I did 101 eyes and I published that report. And routinely we are using that one. So any of sort of even Namrata sends me patients. So I might just do OCT and tell me whether PC is deficient or intact. So I do that one. I give information. So it is around 10% of the patients you are, they are going to have deficient capsule. So you can use active actually that one soft so it should be uh, it's going to become more common in future so it will be available with the manufacturing in india so we hope that one and in addition i'm going to do uh, i am right now doing some kind of histopathological studies just to understand how it like whether the uh, postpolar opacity lyses the capsule or it's a pre-existing deficient in the capsule because of which vitreous has hydrated the poster part of the lens i just want to identify or i want to correlate histopathology i want to understand more so that is my second part which i am doing 
Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. All the best for your future endeavors, and we would uh, look Thank forward you. to listening to you always. Thank, Thank you. you so much, sir. So I would uh, next like to in, uh, invite Dr. Purna Chandra uh, B. He is an uh, ex accomplished ophthalmologist. He has completed his uh, PG from AFMC, and after that, uh, he has uh, done his fellowship from uh, VR uh, uh, in Narayan Netralaya. And his area of interest is inherited retinal diseases, uh, retinal vascular disease, and gene therapy, for which he has done his fellowship uh, from Moorfields, uh, London. So, uh, welcome, sir. Uh, looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank you, Nilesh. And I would like to thank all the core members of UC for giving me this opportunity. And also, thank you for accommodating my talk a little early. So, I'll be talking about the basics of gene therapy. I know, like, uh, there are a lot of postgraduates and uh, residents who will be listening to this uh, talk. So, I thought I'll cover very basic aspects of gene therapy. Okay. So, before going to the gene therapy, you need to understand what is gene it is the study of heredity in general and of genes in particular and it forms one of the central pillars of biology and overlaps with other areas like agriculture medicine biotechnology etc and we all know like field of genetics is evolving at a very high pace and uh, it's very surprising to know that eye is the second only to the brain after, uh, as an individual organ in its frequency of involvement with uh, genetic disorders and almost 50 percent of pediatric blindness will have some genetic etiology and clinical picture also can be overlapping sometimes which may not be enough for proper and full diagnosis. So before going to the gene therapy, I'll just show you this example just to reiterate the fact that gene therapy is the need of power for some group of uh, patients. So this was a 16 year old female who presented to us in 2017. If you can see the autofluorescence, there is some definitely atrophic changes in the foveolar area. It progressed over the next two years. Atrophy became even more prominent by 2021. So there was a total foveal atrophy. So now she's 20 years and presentation she had a vision of around 612, now it's 660. So this was her OCT and presentation in 2017, over four years, this complete atrophy. So basically this is a very mild variant of star guards, which is uh, uh, usually star guards happen because of a defect in a gene called BCA4. If at all, if you want to progress this uh, uh, disease from uh, an initial taste to an advanced atrophic stage, as we saw in our case, what we need to do is we need to fix this gene called ABCA4, which is defective. So that's where the role of gene therapy comes. So basically, a gene therapy it is a technique of correcting effects of a defective gene that are responsible for the disease development. There are different approaches by which it can be done, where a normal gene is inserted into the cell to compensate for a non-functional gene, or abnormal gene can be traded with a normal gene, or we can also do an abnormal gene can be repaired without replacing. We can just repair that gene by a technique called selective reverse mutation or gene editing. And sometimes uh, we can introduce a stop codon You know, like there are some exons which are uh, usually the coding sequence. By introducing stop, so we can do some kind of a gene editing. And uh, sometimes what we can do is we can also uh, intervene at the regulatory sites of a gene. We need not directly interact with the gene by changing the regulatory sites also. We can. To some extent, we can give some functional recovery. So for this gene therapy, we use something called adeno-associated vectors. So these viral vectors are uh, like most preferred compared to other vectors. The reason being these have got a very efficient delivery system and they have got a very high level of gene expression and they don't have like unwanted this viral genomes which can cause undesirable immune response, toxic reactions in the host. All these are literally almost none. Okay, and also most important thing is it has got an excellent stability which allows it to be manufactured, stored and handled so that it can be safely transferred to the delivery site. So that's a prerequisite for any new drug what to develop from the manufacturing site to delivery. It should be stable without losing its efficacy. These are the different gene therapy trials which are currently underway. I'll not go into the details of each and every trial. So these are our main focus for gene therapy because these are quite common in, uh, I mean, everywhere. Of course, in Indian setup also, we keep seeing these cases quite often like retinitis pigmentosa, LCS starts very early, star guards, some of the corneal abnormalities. Okay. So, and uh, we ophthalmologists are lucky because there are several factors which makes eye an ideal organ for gene replacement therapy as compared to the other organs in the body. The reason being eye is easily accessible and we all know it's immunologically privileged. And because of the small size, whatever we inject, either intravitreally or subretinal, it kind of get compartmentalized. So the systemic absorption is little less, so no undesired immune effects. And the very good thing is we have a, the possibility of using a contralateral eye as the control. 
okay and mo monitoring is also easy we have many non invasive monitoring like oct out of fluorescence erg with, where it becomes very easy the effects can be seen and monitored easily i'll just show a short video which i made as a kind of a cartoon which i made last uh, maybe four, uh, two three years back which uh, basically shows the how how a gene Basically, it's a form of treatment that is offered to people with single gene defect. This is very important for multiple gene mutation. If it's causing a particular phenotype, then uh, it, it becomes quite complex to correct it. So preferably, we prefer patient with single gene defects. So where a virus is made, uh, what you call virus DNA is taken out and replaced with the one that treats the patient. And this virus is mixed with the normal human cells and they are cultivated. Then they are injected into the, uh, for the patient for the treatment purpose. Okay. I'll just mute this. So the inject, then they are injected into the retina. Okay. So this is the video which I took when I was in the Moore fields. So before doing the gene therapy, we do a complete thorough vitrectomy to remove all the residual vitreous. Then we, we uh, select the site. And most preferred site is subretinal. This is the subretinal injection which is being done in a case of polyremia. Okay, so once this is done, these viral vectors will go and bind to the uh, plasma membrane. They get internalized and travel all the way. The virion particle unports itself. It releases the material and this will travel all the way to the nucleus. Once it is inside the nucleus, it will get incorporated into the host genome. So where it is, uh, this is the animation showing the incorporation. So once this is done, the, it is expected to function normally at the way we have edited that gene. Okay, so that is in brief or in simple. It's not that simple a process. It's quite complex. Uh, this is the thing. Uh, this is how it is done. This was the team in which I worked. Present team uh, for about in Shell when I was uh, getting trained for gene therapy in more fields. So and mentioned like uh, see these AV vectors. They have many advantages, but there are some limitations also. For example, if you take the our case example, which happened because of the APCA4 gene, this is quite a large gene, but the carbo capacity of AV vectors is quite limited. So because of which we have come up with a novel technique called dual vector technology, where we split the gene, they are loaded into the separate variants, and they are co-infected together. Once they reach the host cell, uh, function normally. So this is the uh, this uh, these are the scientists like Professor Arkand, uh, so Shomi Bhattacharya, who are the like uh, main this the this the this their brain child this the dual vector strategy. This is an ongoing research in Narayan Netralaya. So why there is an unmet need for uh, gene therapy in India? Because we know like uh, the patient there are many patients of retinal dystrophy. We are fed up of telling there is no treatment and all that, and most of the disease they occur in early childhood. And when we diagnose uh, a retinal dystrophy and when we uh, diagnose patient but also for the parents and the family and we all know like a couple of years back fda approved only one gene therapy product called luxturna which costs around 6.5 crores obviously novartis is trying to bring it to india reduce the cost but still i mean 99.9 percent .9 of indians can't afford this kind of a therapy but that's the reason the treatment needs to be developed indigenously to limit the cost to the patient so once we develop the viral vector first we need to do an animal well, this is what I am doing here. This is the injected uh, some few viral vectors subretinally, and we also used uh, some fluorescent bead tracking technique to make sure that the, the viral vectors are in the correct place. So we have a dedicated gene therapy production platform laboratory with an expanding team of uh, scientists. I was telling vectors from the vital role in gene therapy, but how to produce these vectors? So these vectors are produced in an area called, this requires class 100 clean room facility. So the class 100 clean room facility uh, means, basically it's a, what is what we routinely use for cataract and uh, uh, retina surgeries are class 100. So these vector production facility are like, there are 10 times more sterile than our routine OTs. So after crossing several barrier, finally you enter the vector production facility. That's where the clinical grade vectors are produced. So we have built the first in India gene therapy production, vector production facility at Narayan Netralaya. And also the national guidelines for gene therapy uh, development and clinical trials is out in the ICMR website. Whoever is interested, they can go to the ICMR website and download these guidelines. In case if some of you are interested in starting these trials and all that, you need to go through these guidelines, get an approval from the one committee in ICMR called Gene Therapy Approval and Accreditation Committee. You need to get an approval from them before you start any trial, either animals or humans. 
So if any of you are interested in knowing more and want to collaborate with you, are free to do so. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. I think that was an eye-opener talk on gene therapy and a very good primer. Uh, Narayan Netrale actually has been leading uh, uh, these cutting-edge technology in India. So really happy to see that, sir. Uh, the, regarding the cost that you have uh, really well pointed out that it is very unaffordable. But in India, there is a concept called as orphan drug. So do you think uh, these, uh, the, these gene therapy will come under uh, orphan drug and get subsidized from government? Because uh, it is such less population. If that happens, nothing like it, Nilesh. <laughs> that will be very good. But uh, I mean, of course, obviously, you know, like just to start this vector production facility, only we have to fight law with ICMR. But finally, they've given some grants and all that because the cost involved is huge in this vector production facility. Just to build that gene therapy production facility, we have taken some six years. You have to collaborate, correct experts and all that. But as you rightly mentioned, if they can give the tarpon drug and if you can get aid from this thing, which eventually is going to happen, because before government does that, it's our responsibility as a clinician to show the data to them. We have done this, it works. Yeah. So then maybe they'll be motivated to extend that support. Yes. And so uh, regarding the practicality, what do you think will be a more better option of uh, drug injection? Will it be uh, intravitreal or subretinal, which will be more, uh, up, which will have more uptake? At this point, if you ask me, subretinal. So the thing is, the defect lies either in the RPA or the photoreceptors in the retinal dystrophies. You better introduce the vectors as close to the site where you want to add them. So that is the thing. Intravital, everything you've been trained, but I'm a fan of a subretinal one. So even my guide, whom, whom I worked, they all prefer in, in, intravitreal injection. There are supracoronal methods also have been tried intravitreal. Yes, that's what I was coming to, sir. Uh, one... Uh... So one method which I uh, one method which I uh, read about uh, in my area of interest that is uh, the anti uh, It was uh, it is uh, they are trying to inject into the iris uh, so that it keeps producing aflibercept and then we don't need a repeated injection. So that can be something also like uh, not going to treat the ge genetic disease but also for ongoing uh, retinal pathologies. Yeah, eventually we never know. We may come up with a depot like that where it can be vectors can be loaded into that implant in the iris somewhere. Yeah. That is possible. So exciting, exciting things are coming up, sir. So thank you so much for your uh, time and looking forward thank forward you. for more talks, sir. Thank you so much. So uh, next now we are, we are moving to a. Uh, So next, moving on to a young innovator, Dr. Hirika. Uh, she is a second year DNP resident from uh, Arvind uh, Koyambatore, and she has developed a recent, uh, a very marvelous in, uh, innovation. I just came to know about it last, like two months back, and uh, I am exciting, uh, excited for her talk. So welcome, Dr. Hirika. Stage uh, is good stage evening, is everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you to Yossi and EIS for this opportunity. So, uh, can you share your screen? Yeah. We are not able to see the screen. Uh, Magnifix and Iwater, a do-it-yourself innovative tool for uh, just, 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 and safer pause? ocular examination. Yes, sir. Uh, you, uh, you need to minimize uh, the panel where we, you are seeing the speakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, yeah. As a first-year resident, it was just few months into the residency program of my prestigious institute. I carefully observed my mentor as he did the ophthalmic examination of the patients. I realized few problems which were maybe were quite unnoticed for any other ophthalmologist because they adapted to the routine system of the ocular examination. The two main problems that I'm talking about here is first target fixation and the second is lid aversion. So first talking about target fixation. It is important to acquire fixation of patient's eye during slit lamp examination for a careful and proper ocular examination. Routinely, we tell patients to fixate their eyes on our ears, but due to inability of few patients to comply with instructions, it is often difficult and time consuming. The COVID pandemic led to the introduction of the safe slit lamp shield, which prevents aerosol transmission between the doctor and the patient. I used the safe slit lamp shield as a base to attach two magnets on either sides of the shield and came up with an innovation called Magnifix, formed by three important words, 
magnet, eye and fixation. Materials used were block magnet, coin magnet and a red reflector. With the basic principle of law of attraction between the two magnets, we acquired a freely mobile target fixator. In this video, we can see how we use this to obtain a target fixator. I then came up with the idea of fridge magnets for pediatric patients. Look at how well these work on pediatric patients. Magnifix is now used by other Arvin centers with the help of the Arvin Center for Eye Care Innovation. This can be used by all other centers and it also makes a slit lamp look more pediatric and attractive. Hence, it is a do-it-yourself, cost-effective, easily accessible, quick solution which can be used to obtain target fixation for corneal foreign body removal, uncooperative hard-of-hearing patients, pediatric patients and also for fundus examination. We have published an article regarding the same in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. Coming to my second problem of lid aversion. Aversion of eyelid is a skill-based technique performed routinely by ophthalmologists by using their hands or sometimes caught in buds. It becomes difficult to perform this procedure with patients with no eyelashes or madurosis, patients with deep sockets or uncooperative or anxious patients, especially children. It has also become a concern in the COVID pandemic wherein there is a risk of transmission of viral infection due to exposure of ocular fluids such as tears and conjunctival secretions following direct contact of the examiner's fingers and the patient's bare ocular surface. Eversion of eyelids using fingers occurs with a combination of two forces. Pulling force by the fingers on the eyelashes and a pushing force by the fingers on the upper tarsus. In Hackathon 2021, an innovation forum organized by ACEI, we came up with the idea of a tool for lid aversion with no direct contact to the ocular surface. A simple tool called Iverda was made initially with an ice cream stick with the given measurements. The following video demonstrates the use of Iverda. The Iverda can be used in routine ophthalmic clinic in adults, children, it can be manipulated to observe the area of interest. Its uses include examination of the upper tarsal conjunctiva and superior phonics, removal of the foreign body, saline wash in chemical injury and in lid pathologies. It can also be used by an assisting nurse while the doctor is examining the patient on a slit lamp. A refined version was made with the use of coffee stirrer sticks scalpel and double-sided tapes. A double-sided tape was attached to the edge of the coffee stirrer stick and you can see here how it is really easy and less cumbersome to make. The following video is a demonstration of the same. Hence, iWater is a do-it-yourself a tool for corneal foreign body removal, also for madrosis patients. It is cost effective and really safe in the COVID times, easily accessible and quick method of lid aversion. The method is also published in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. As a young resident, I could find solution for two important problems of target fixation and lid aversion. Hence, in the same way, Many other residents can find solution to many other problems by just thinking out of the box. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hirika. Uh, and it was really, uh, I think uh, uh, we have uh, in chat box, it is uh, being appreciated by everyone. But it is very, very innovative. Uh, the only question I want to ask you is like, are you going to uh, make it uh, commercial? Because uh, uh, many people won't be doing it themselves, uh, despite how easy it is. Yeah, so actually, um, MRE Sir and uh, the team in Pondicherry, they are already uh, 3D printing the eye water. So it was done with a team there. 
So we are looking forward to that. And uh, Magnifix is what we have already applied to all the slit lamps in our hospital and also many other centers of Arvind. Um, so it's a very easy thing and I hope like everybody else can also follow. Yeah, uh, so uh, Magnifix also, if, because it is very easy to manufacture and you can just uh, uh, manufacture it and uh, start selling it. Yes, uh, do you yes. do you believe in that or do you want to take it forward like, like that? Uh, yeah, I've uh, not really thought about it that way. I'm very young right now, but yeah, definitely with the right guidance and some uh, with some advice from the seniors, maybe I'll look forward to that too soon. Yeah, I think everybody in Arvind is uh, right now into innovation. Yeah. Uh, Venkatesh sir can help you and even uh, uh, Dr. Prithvi is there to help help you. So I think you can take it forward with uh, and uh, hope to see it in market very soon. Thank you so much for this uh, innovative talk. So uh, moving on, because uh, we have uh, slightly running behind, uh, I would like to invite Dr. John Davis Akara. He is an innovator par excellence and uh, he is one perpetual innovator, I think, because uh, every day if he doesn't innovate something, he can't sleep. I so uh, I would welcome him. He is working right now as a glaucoma consultant in uh, SRHC, uh, I think. So I'm... Uh, so, uh, SRM, 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 SRMC and West End High, High Hospital coaching and uh, I don't think anybody need, needs, uh, uh, sir needs any introduction to anybody. So, sir, stage is all yours. I'm looking forward to your three. Thank you, Nilesh. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I would like to thank AIOS and UC for organizing such events. This is a very useful platform for uh, all the youngsters who never knew what all the are the possibilities in ophthalmology. So very, very much uh, thankful that we are having such a platform. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about my first 3D print. I'm Dr. John Davis Zakra and I'm working as a glaucoma consultant in Sri Ramachandra Medical College, Chennai and also Western Eye Hospital, Cochin. I think uh, many of you must be familiar with 3D printing by now. There has been a lot of innovation in uh, 3D printing uh, in the past few years. They are 3D printing even houses. So making a three-dimensional solid object from a digital file is the simplest definition of a 3D print. So if you see on the right here, this is a, a filament-based uh, 3D printer, which is printing a model of a hand. And it is made by laying down layer after layer of the material. So this is the basic principle. This can be done in plastic, resin, metal, uh, concrete, uh, even uh, ice cream or <laughs> chocolate, all these things. These are the two most uh, common, easily accessible 3D printers. This is a filament-based printer, or also known as an FDM uh, printer, fuse deposit modeling. And this is the one which I'm going to be uh, talking about. This is the one which most people are familiar with. Also, I recently used uh, resin printers, which is also not uh, difficult to find. And it is available very easily uh, in Amazon and everywhere. It costs around 30,000, this one. This is more expensive, but cheaper ones are also available around 20,000. You can get the low end models. So if you want to get started with 3D printing, what you need to do is, uh, the fastest way is to just download and print. So if you go to MakerBot Thingiverse, this is where I started from. Or if you go to National Institute of Health 3D Print Exchange, you get medical related uh, 3D models or so many websites, Free 3D, NASA has a 3D uh, page. All these places allow you to download and print your own 3D models uh, designed by other people and shared. You can also design your own 3D models by using these softwares, many of them are free. FreeCAD, Fusion 360, Tinkercad, SketchUp, all these are free softwares. So you can just uh, go to this website, search for what you want. If you find something interesting, download and print. As simple as that. This is one of the ophthalmic designs. Uh, this is uh, from Odox. Uh, this is from an ophthalmologist in New Zealand. He designed it and uploaded it on Thingiverse back in 2015. So this is something which anybody can download and print. If you want to design, you can go to tinkercad.com, do it online, or you can download uh, Fusion 360. If you want a free version, just provide them with an .edu email address. Um, 
or you could use FreeCAD, which is what I used. So this is FreeCAD. And recently I designed a glaucoma valve. I had made a design for a 3D printed glaucoma valve and uh, it was done using FreeCAD. And this is a design for a forceps. So if you have any idea for any instrument or anything like that, just think it, draw it and just draw it in 3D. You can prototype it. This is the workflow of 3D printing. First, you design in CAD or you can download, export as uh, STL or step files and use a slicer software. All these are free softwares and it generates the support. So if you see this, the empty spaces have to be filled in with something which can be broken away. That is support. Generate the G code, send it to the printer and the printer will print it like this layer by layer. It might take between 30 minutes to 30 hours, depending on the size of the print and the fineness at which you are printing. So once you print it, you can remove it, break off the supports. That is the base. You break it off from the base and then you remove the supports. Okay, you might have to uh, break off the supports with some force if it is uh, such a print. But then you are ready. This is what I printed first in Arvindai Hospital, Pondicherry, because of uh, Dr. Rangaraj Venkatesh, sir. We got a 3D printer just before I finished my fellowship. So the first thing which we printed there was uh, this smartphone fundus camera. Uh, the very next day was the hospital day. So we printed it and presented it to, uh, to the chief guest on the hospital day. This is how we could take fundus photos with the device. This is another thing which I printed while I was in Ramchandra. I was working on a device, a head-mounted device. So this is a case into which we put all the electronics of the Raspberry Pi and ultrasonic sensors. So this is case I designed and printed here. This is the glaucoma drainage device which I had designed and printed. And uh, this is a slit lamp adapter Dr. Ahmed Ataya had uh, designed. This is an Egyptian ophthalmologist. So the basic thing is you measure, draw it in 3D, print it. And this becomes a slit lamp adapter, smartphone slit lamp adapter. There are several other things which we printed. So this is a spectacle. This is a eye drop helper by Dr. Anamalai and Dr. Shivagami and uh, so many other adapters. I have put all this together in an article in Kerala Journal of Ophthalmology. And if you look, there are so many other things which you can do in ophthalmology with 3D printing. This is just uh, some of the things, spectacles, lenses, uh, even moisture chambers. So all these personalized things are ideal things that can be done with 3D printing because they can be customized. So I model for fundus viewing. This is one model. Dr. Rajesh Vedachalam here, he has also designed some 3D printed models uh, of eyeball for practicing examination and even with your retinal surgeries. Uh, for, this is also available for orbital dissections. And these things which are uh, being sold in retail by uh, this company, Bionico, they are also supposed to be 3D printed models. And there are surgeons who say they have designed forceps and other instruments with the help of uh, 3D printing for prototyping. You can even 3D print in metal if the need arises. This is uh, a transconjectival uh, vitrectomy troca, which was initially designed with 3D printing. This is Dr. Sergio Canabrava. He said he designed the Canabrava ring using 3D printing initially. This is a glide, uh, a smart storage glide for DSEC. And this is another uh, 3D print artificial anterior chamber. Dr. Rajesh Vedachalam has made this. And for anterior segment imaging, an attachment was made uh, by this is the same doctor who made the Odox fundus. And this is the one which uh, we printed from um, Xiong Chang. And this is another one. This was designed by, uh, this is designed by Dr. Ahmed Ataya. And all these things have been designed by people uh, who had not much experience in engineering. So this is a 16 year old girl who designed this smartphone fundus camera. So everything is simple. All these things you can simply draw. If you have an artistic eye, you can do it. 3D printed prosthetic eyes are also available. You can, uh, you know, uh, take a CT scan and use that to make the appropriate size and shape devices. So all these orbital implants for children, 3D printing has a big role to play. And not uh, last but not least, bioprinting is going to come up in a big way because then you can 3D print the cornea 
there have been uh, multiple researchers working on this and uh, so that is going to be the very close future thank you to all the institutions where i have studied and where i have been given the opportunity to practice uh, all these extra curricular activities in ophthalmology as well thank you thank you so much sir i think uh, again uh, uh, a bunch of innovations and a bunch of uh, new ideas that you have given to all the innovators i think a 3d printed uh, renal implant has already uh, happened or 3d printed screen grafting something like that has already 3d printed screen grafting has uh, has happened so that is bi basically bio printing a layer onto the skin so, so that's also very useful so cornea is not much behind we might have artificial cornea and get uh, get over they the... have done prototypes but still working on the transparency it's difficult to print transparent things so uh, i just wanted to ask all these uh, prototypes that are at least coming from uh, you and uh, your associate institutes uh, are they available can somebody access them if they want to print it at their own uh, setup uh, so they... i have started i have started uploading them to uh, <laughs> the website so thingiverse i have uploaded on thingiverse as dr jonda uh, mm -hmm. so <laughs> you can go to thingiverse.com and uh, find it on the website okay sir so uh, it would be great if you can share it on the uc groups also so yes can... yes absolutely yeah. so i've just started uploading this is the glaucoma drainage device i will upload the other designs also here so uh, i'll i'll send the link as well yes sir. dr thank john you so thank, thank you so much sir thank you so much so uh, we will move ahead uh, due to scarcity of time uh, the doctor uh, the next speaker will be dr uh, sagnik sen dr sagnik is a, a research fellow right now in um, so just just a minute i lost the intro dr sagnik has completed his uh, specialist training in ophthalmology from aims uh, rpc and now is working as clinical research fellow in uh, vr at uh, arvind madurai and uh, he is an avid surgeon and actively uh, uh, interested in clinical and translational research so uh, he has a strong advocate for diabetic retinopathy and myopia awareness and uh, we are looking forward to his talk on uh, the non capillary perfusion areas and the reclassification of diabetic, diabetic retinopathy so over to you dr sagnik looking looking forward to your talk hi sir thank you for the introduction can you hear me yeah we can hear you we can't see the screen yeah i'll just share it Yeah, can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, I thought I'll uh, bring uh, an interesting topic today for discussion. So today is about reclassification of diabetic retinopathy with a focus on capillary non-perfusion. So as you all know, that uh, the International Clinical Diabetic Retinopathy Disease Severity Scale has divided diabetic retinopathy in these five stages. which are no apparent retinopathy mild moderate severe npdr and proliferative diabetic retinopathy this is like everybody every resident who is passing out of a medical school they know this classification so this classification was based on the diabetic retinopathy severity score uh, which was decided in the early house meeting in virginia in 1968 so that was 54 years old and uh, the classification was based on seven field stereoscopic film based fundus photographs Uh, however later on it was realized that the seven field photograph was almost equivalent to a four wide field digital photographs that we use today so this is just an overview of the classification mild to moderate npdr was levels 35 43 on atdrs drs score which uh, included intra retinal microvascular abnormalities hemorrhages microangiomas levels 47 53 were moderately severe to severe npdr again we uh, patients would have intra retinal hemorrhages which were more severe and uh, including all the quadrants then venous bleeding intra retinal microvascular abnormalities lipid exudates and 60 to 75 would be moderately severe to severe pdr uh, where we'll have neovascularization this is again another infographic so the drss score would range from 10 to 12 up to 85 so below 47 the previous scores would be subclinical dr and 47 to 85 onwards we'll have moderately severe to severe npdr then mild moderate pdr and high risk pdr so as you know that the conventional treatment strategy for pdr is of panretinal photocoagulation and for diabetic macular edema it has been anti vegf but uh, nowadays we are getting a lot of studies which have started evaluating anti vegfs for dr itself so these are some of the later studies from uh, vitam i center jocelyn so they started evaluating more peripheral retinal lesions on ultra wide field color fundus photographs like optos 
and they said that peripheral retinal lesion could better predict the risk of dr than conventional ettrs photographs so this ettr is seven standard fields you can see in the center and these are the peripheral fields so the uh, they divided lesions into predominantly central lesions and predominantly peripheral lesions and uh, later on they also uh, measured the capillary non perfusion on ultra wide field fluorescein angiography and they found that dr peripheral lesions were associated with the severity of diabetic retinopathy so in this uh, chart you can see that as we progress from no dr to pdr the uh, di the diabetic non perfusion index is correlating quite well with the severity of dr here you can see uh, a wide field angiography photographs which are showing uh, peripheral new vascularizations quite well and here you can see in the right side photograph you can see a uh, comparison of uh, fluorescein angiography and non dye based octa wide field octa uh, you can see in both the photograph that the octa picture is showing us the capillary layer a little bit better than fluorescein angiography then the dave trial came which uh, evaluated total retinal non perfusion and they found that non perfusion was greatest in the mid peripheral retina and they also evaluated that uh, capillary non perfusion was correlated well with vascular leakage in all three retinal zones so coming to the role of oct angiography in all of this oct angiography is able to image retinal vasculature with different retinal layers at resolutions which are not possible with fluorescein angiography and uh, as we all know that octa cannot demonstrate leakage but it's a benefit for us because it allows the imaging of capillary non perfusion better which may be masked by leakage and octa also is more reliable for correlations between dme and biomarkers of interest including non perfusion so this is uh, one paper which we did this was an exploratory review article on diabetic macular ischemia and uh, diabetic macular edema, uh, edema development so we can see that uh, diabetic macular edema develops as diabetic macular ischemia first so non perfusion appears first leading to breakdown of blood retinal barrier leading to uh, superficial capillary loss deep capillary uh, plexus loss and finally what we see is diabetic macular edema coming to role of anti vegf as we all know that anti vegf blockade the vegf blockade has been used to reduce retinal edema so vegf blockade is also being proposed to help reverse the progressive capillary non perfusion development which happens in dr coming to rise right studies their post hoc analysis all of them showed that capillary non perfusion can be prevented with vegf blockade these are some of the studies which have shown that use of anti vegf can prevent uh, development of non perfusion so these are some tri prospective clinical trials in pdr like drcr protocol less clarity trial which have uh, been done in pdr and prospective clinical trials also have been done in npdr which are protocol w and panorama trial so these are all evaluating clinical outcomes of anti vegf in dr and a lot of them have evaluated capillary non perfusion so a patient of high risk pdr you can see uh, has undergone nine injections of anti vegf patient has progressed to mild npdr reduced regressed to mild npdr and has stayed stable over year 2 similarly this patient also had high risk pdr and has uh, has regressed to mild npdr this patient had moderately severe npdr level 47 which has uh, reduced to level 20 after 2 years and another patient who was at se severe ntdr stage had reduced to mild ntdr again repeated anti vegf injections have been shown so we have evaluated they have evaluated ranibizumab in this uh, graph and we can see that with ranibizumab the dr progression the levels of dr progression is also stabilized so dr has not progressed compared to sham and there are a lot of new therapies which are coming which are specifically targeting non perfusion like semaphorins so semaphorins Uh, they are neuronal guidance proteins which are involved in a wide variety of signaling pathways and they increase the vascular permeability in the retina so the way ahead is uh, to develop an integrated dr classification with clinically detectable peripheral lesions angiographic features and also including the macular status so in this infographic you can see that uh, so we can use clinical photograph for detecting microaneurysms heart exudates irmas which are included in the conventional classification then on this arm we can have diabetic macular edema and diabetic macular ischemia the severity and with that we have to correlate capillary non perfusion probably with either ultra wide field fun fundus fluorescein angiography or we can include ultra wide octa which is coming up dr classification needs to somehow take into account the treatment effects of patients receiving repeated anti vegf for example if, if a patient has received anti vegf and has regressed to mild npdr 
this mild NPDR is not similar to an untreated mild NPDR patient. So we need to include that as well in the classification. So we need to differentiate between treated DR grade and non-treated DR grade. Again, uh, in this endeavor, artificial intelligence and machine learning based platforms can help in the integration. And we need to finally incorporate newer biomarkers, which can be used in next generation clinical trials, because we, we are having newer drugs which are coming up every day, apart from anti which can help in reducing non-perfusion, for example. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarnik. And uh, I really thank you to finish within time because we are running short. So I just have a quick, quick question for you. Uh, what do you think is the uh, real practicality of using OCT angiography for uh, peripheral, the far, far periphery, mid periphery and far periphery? So uh, that will be very difficult to say because wide field OCT has not come into practice as of now. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the papers have started coming from uh, Jocelyn Eye Center, Cleveland Clinic, and uh, MEI. So they have started evaluating how peripheral leakage index and peripheral new vascularization, they can be imaged well with wide field OCT and how that correlates well with uh, visual acuity and uh, you know, progression of DR. So we don't have the studies yet. Probably the next five to 10 years, we are going to have wide field OCT open in the market. As of now, we are still evaluating macular status. So currently, uh, it will be better if we do a wide field FFA or, and then evaluate. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we have UWFA. Now wide field FA we have. So FA can be done. Okay. Like Optos, the higher versions of Optos has FA. Okay. And uh, so I think it's still in the research level. I mean, practical uh, in the clinic, wide field FA, it's not really done to evaluate uh, peripheral CNP areas and then correlate it with the patient progression. But yeah, it is definitely used for uh, titrating panretinal photocoagulation if a patient has adequately got PRP done or not and targeted non-perfusion areas can be uh, lasered. For example, in CR views and VR views also, that is done. That is being used. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sagnik, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, looking forward for more. Uh, now I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Sumit Grover, sir. Sir is an ophthalmologist at admission and a public health professional with credentials uh, that are highly acclaimed. Uh, uh, highly admirable. Uh, he is a DNB Optal, MBA, and then MPH from London, and then FICO, and he is currently working as a PhD scholar in community ophthalmology at uh, Ames. And now we are going to uh, hear from Sir. Uh, sir also has an NGO non-profit uh, organization for community eye, uh, that is uh, Mantaraya Healthcare Foundation. So looking forward to your talk, sir. Sir, we are not able to hear you. Sorry, I think I was on mute. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's uh, now I'm audible. Yes, sir. Audible and slides are visible. Sir. To you? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before um, not wasting too much time. Uh, from you know such in uh, my talk will not be so much innovative but definitely i had a very trailblazer journey in the field of community eye care uh, full of you know risk uh, and perks uh, challenges and opportunities the scope of my discussion today will be the recent advances in primary eye care and how you know we leverage the technology in enabling the diagnostic and data solutions for primary care so uh, back to the basics, primary eye care is the provision of appropriate, accessible and affordable care, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, lead to a comprehensive uh, and competent, uh, giving a comprehensive and competent eye care needs to the person's patients. And also it is the first contact for eye care for the patient and also uh, in the continuum journey of his lifetime. The primary eye care should should be integrated and should be coordinated with the general healthcare services. Like for example, our NPCB or the eye care services should be coordinated and integrated with the national health mission, with the primary health centers, community health centers to make it more efficient. And we should be very competent and there should be a managerial skill and a decision-making skill for uh, these are all critical things for promoting the quality and efficiency in primary eye care. If we see the concept of primary eye care, the left-hand side, leftmost side showing the eye disease, the 
in between is activity which consists of the primary secondary and tertiary prevention and these all types of uh, you know service deliveries are possible in primary eye care not only the preventive and promotion uh, and we can see the stakeholders on the right hand side i am always amazed to see the stakeholders right from the community leaders school teachers nurses primary health care workers optometrists ophthalmic technicians in the field of community eye care and not only the optimal ophthalmologists and optometrists there are various model of primary eye care the heart is the vision centers which are defined as the permanent fixed facility first point of contact with the community and equipped with uh, all the all the equipments which are needed for the primary evaluation and especially the refraction for the patients they can be fixed facilities mobile units integrated stand alone or mobile with or without tele ophthalmology so uh, this is the this is the talk for intended for the all the young ophthalmologists who wanted to you know who who want to come into the arena of community outreach and reach in program and uh, those who want to you know uh, live a life of a you know both they want to you know balance their self serving goals professional goals and the uh, altruistic goals in a way that how they can start the community outreach how can they do the uh, you know reach in programs in their group practice solo practice or if they are part of any i care hospital etc so i will start with the quote of helen keller who said that the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision the other worst thing is having a good number of tertiary centers but no vision centers in our country this is the uh, state of affairs uh, in which we can see the central obesity of the pyramid central obesity is always not good so we have to see the um, by 2020 we should have more than 20000 around 20000 vision centers but now we are lagging we have just 4000 and uh, this uh, this slide is a more of a theoretical slide which uh, the the data has been you know extrapolated from the various surveys and prevalences of various eye diseases to to come up to the need uh, we always say that uh, vision center caters to a population of 50000 and these are the estimates of eye care needs of these 50000 population and we see uh, almost 25% of them need any form of eye care services so this is the main uh, main uh, i think the slide of this whole presentation which shows the hub and spoke model in which the hub is us we young ophthalmologist any base hospital it could be rp center it could be gurunanak eye center it could be your private practice hospital something a base hospital with all all uh, you know facilities of surgical and medical intervention and spokes are the vision centers vision center as discussed earlier can be fixed mobile van health and wellness school you know you had tie up with schools you have tie up with primary health centers and the human resources we need is the optometrist ophthalmic assistant you know trained nurse your uh, uh, optometrist and uh, asha workers uh, trained asha workers or even a school uh, trained school teacher who has been trained in uh, you know taking the vision and referring the students this model has been a very cost effective model and has been uh, you know it has been used in uh, various parts of our uh, country as well as around the globe our uh, uh, strategy of vision center has been guided by the national program for control of blindness and uh, these are some uh, list has been given by npcb that these are some essential um, uh, equipment which has to be there in a vision center and there are some desirable which are uh may or may not be but are desirable so the two two things always you know uh, have been a barrier for starting community outreach first how to take the equipments of your uh, fixed facility center to the field in the community and second is the data so for the first barrier we can see that now there are many portable set lamps portable fundus auto refractor meter and we have just seen the presentation of dr john davis that he can make everything i mean uh, you know out of 3d printing uh, mobile he makes use of mobile to you know take the fundus photo at anything so uh, we have to be very innovative and all these auto refractor meters tono pen portable uh, visual field analyzer these are all real pictures uh, real time pictures taken in our department and the, the ngo i must associated with uses all these uh, portable devices previously we used to you know uh, take a mobile van or a, a, a we have to you know think about the transport logistic but now everything you know packs up in a small briefcase 
This is the community I care initiative, uh, which was started by RP Center in association with Stride Savers, and we all use all these portable slit lamp, portable handheld uh, uh, auto refractometers. And uh, right now, currently, there are more than twenty vision centers which are uh, spokes uh, with the hub of uh, RP Center. Another thing which I personally I have suffered in my journey of community I uh, care was the data management. I, I I I suffered a lot in this because since 2013 I was involved in many 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 outreach camps. But the uh, like in the name of data, what I had were the newspaper cuttings, were some registers having the names and demographic details of the patients, and uh, you know some uh, pictures or videos. But nobody cares about that. We cannot generate any you know evidence. You cannot publish that. So the main uh, lacuna I had in my own practice was the data. And now uh, there are innovations in this uh, data collection also. It's very feasible because we are the busy clinician. You are you guys are the busy in your uh, you know uh, tertiary care centers. You don't have time to you know uh, feed the data in the app or something. So uh, here is an open data kit. It's an open Android uh, based uh, source Android app, which is designed to work without network connectivity which is the main advantage of this you can you, you can use it in fields where there is there is no uh, network available and it collects support of location audio images video barcodes any anything free text multiple choice you can you know make a, a custom made form and upload and link that form to their server and then start collecting the data we are using uh, all these entry forms um, in RP Center as well as the various NGOs I'm associated with. This is the example of a daily report. With daily PEC report, you can see that it, uh, it can show us the how many old cases were there, how many new cases were there, how many spectacles were prescribed, booked, and how many were referred. You know, this was the custom-made uh, list of uh, diagnosis which we have fed in the form and link that form to the server. And it just takes, uh, you know, five minutes for an uh, optometrist to fill in all these details or even a data entry operator, which is not much, uh, you know, uh, technically qualified can, you know, in, in uh, liaison with the ophthalmic assistant can fill the form. Second, this is a, a form of a diabetic retinopathy screening, uh, which, which is being also uh, done in the vision centers associated with RP center. We can see the NSC classification, uh, this form has been designed and operators who see uh, uh, with the funds form in five, uh, five minutes. And when this data is retrieved uh, from the server, it can be downloaded in the form of Excel. And uh, you can you can uh, make beautiful graphs and all 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 things on in just how you make a, an enter and you all these data is comes comes up beautifully in the form of graphs and biographs. Health education talks which have been done, a topic number of participants. Now this uh, uh, data is uh, data app is also used for the reach in program that how many patients you know reported to your uh, base center the hub and how many uh, got uh, uh, cataract and uh, how many were admitted for the cataract and what were the reasons for not uh, uh, getting admitted for the surgery so all these details can be you know you can frame the forms like that and these data can be retrieved very easily. In fact, the cataract surgery outcomes for the monitoring and evaluation uh, in the form of, you know, uh, outcomes in the form of visual equity can also be done. Uh, you can, if in this, you can see, see that the, this all shows the preven uh, presenting visual equity surgery date and which I was operated in post-operative visual equity. And in the previous slide, we can see that uh, even the cause of the, uh, uh, post-operative visual equity, poor uh, visual equity uh, outcome were stated by the uh, staff, which was present in the post-op follow-up. And due data follow-up also can be, uh, can be you know, fed in the forms and even the reminders uh, messages are also given to the patients. I'll not go uh, in depth into the artificial intelligence. I, in this um, elite gathering, there are many, many, many stalwarts, but I just want to reinforce the uh, importance of diabetic retino, uh, AI in field of diabetic retinopathy. Remedio has come up with many softwares, uh, which uh, has an inbuilt AI and which differentiate that this is DR, not DR, and same with the plus disease in ROP, ARMD, and glaucoma diagnostics as well. 
And uh, another thing, just one slide uh, about the tele ophthalmology. We all know tele ophthalmology, but just one slide: the success story of the Tripura Vision Center project. I think this this project all uh, inspires uh, us all that uh, the small northeastern state. And if we see the statistics in year two thousand seven eight, only three thousand patients were referred to the you know, uh, but the toll of the patient, uh, while it becomes, you know, around 90,000 in 2015-16 and the cataract referrals, uh, we can see they all, you know, shoot, shooted up uh, after the uses of this uh, tele-ophthalmology practice. So all, all we all can start our own community outreach, community uh, reach-in program by using these portable equipment, by using these uh, open, freely available open data kits which are uh, available and uh, we can make a custom made form according to our needs and uh, this thing. Uh, another thing that this is not something, something philosophical, all these which I have told uh, or discuss, uh, this is all evidence-based that the use of technology enable us, uh, you know, for, uh, for the delivery of low cost and uh, quality eye care at the, at the community level in three ways. First is the remote screening and diagnosis. Second, the real-time delivery of the treatment on the spot. And third is the monitoring of continued care. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, 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 Dr. Praveen Vashish, uh, my our in charge of community ophthalmology in uh, making of this uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think uh, it was a really wonderful talk and uh, due to lack of time, we can't discuss actually uh, too much, but uh, I think it requires a separate session in itself uh, to train everybody, young ophthalmologists in community outreach program. It can't be done in a discussion over two to three minutes. So I uh, urge uh, UOC to provide us a, a bigger uh, uh, time segment for community ophthalmology. Uh, over to Apurma, ma'am, ma for uh, wrapping up the session. Thank, Thank you, so you for moderating it so well. Thank you, Dr. Sumit. I think you're one of the foremost young ophthalmologists uh, who's doing this work and one of the few who's actually done a master's in public health. So uh, Dr. Namrata has been with us for the entire session. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to give some final comments? <coughs> I think ma'am just uh, logged out. She's away, I think. Uh, ma'am, you are, uh, Apuram, you are on mute. So without further ado, let me begin with the next session. Thanks a lot to the speakers of uh, Innovators and Trailblazers session. So our next session is uh, how to avoid a premature midlife crisis. Um, so it's it's basically uh, pertinent because most of us, although are less than 40 years, are, uh, I feel, aging faster than our predecessors. So I think we are at, a, at the crossroads of, uh, you know, either falling into the trap of being uh, digitally addicted to screens, to social media, and not being uh, in the moment. So all this has added to a lot of stress, anxiety, um, a lot of uh, premature thinking about what life is and some personal crisis that is happening, which is a lot more than our <clears throat> previous generations. And uh, this session is also about how to go beyond just ophthalmology. So this in this session, we have talks ranging from thinking beyond ophthalmology in terms of administrative jobs, in terms of uh, de-stressing, in terms of uh, nurturing hobbies, in terms of managing time and productivity, and uh, uh, lastly, um, having an influence in the social media sphere in the form of uh, you know uh, in being influencers or uh, even entrepreneurship. So uh, let me call upon the first speaker, Dr. Sayantan Ghosh. Is he here? Yes, I am here. Yes, so Dr. Santan Ghosh, uh, is, it's my pleasure to introduce him. He is uh, MS Ophthalmology, Diploma in Ophthalmology. He's got a Master's in Political Science and International Relations. He's got a Diploma in International Law. He's the awardee of the BUILD grant. He has stood seventh in the state civil service. He has cracked the UPSC 
and was able to get into IPS, but then he's chosen our stream and he's at present the uh, medical officer come tutor at the Calcutta National Medical College. So it's our pleasure to have you here, doctor, and we are really looking forward to your talk on administrative jobs. Is my screen visible? Yes. A very good afternoon, or rather good evening to everybody here. So uh, my talk is on administrative job, dream big. So I wanted to have an interactive session. So uh, may I may I have an interactive session? It won't take long. Absolutely. Then Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. So would anybody volunteer? What is the idea about administrative job in two, three lines? What is an administrative job? What do we understand by that? Okay, come Maybe to the taking on some administrative uh, capability in okay. your. So, what is administration? Administration is nothing like uh, you know uh, uh, being the superintendent of an hospital or being the superintendent of an office, be the supervisor. This is administration, isn't that? So, first, I'm coming to the definitions. What is administrative job? This administration include both public and private sphere. So, in administration, in the public sphere, we can tell that this Indian civil service, I know this is a very famous picture in many forms. Uh, this ambassador, this red board and this, this man uh, signifies the Indian administrative service. And this is another administration, right? In the backdrop of North Block, uh, this is the convoy of a political leader. So what is this? This is again uh, administrative job, but this is from politics, the point of view of a politics. So if we, uh, if we if you summarize what is administrative job in public sector, it has two parts. One is Indian civil service or any kind of civil servants. Another is politics. One is legislature, one is politics. So this is legislature and this is politics. Both comes under the administrative job. So are we going to the 40s? Why, you should, why should we be interested in administrative job? What are the prospects are we having in this kind of job? And are they, uh, are they cover the insecurities we are going to have after the 40s? Coming to the civil service, this man, probably you have seen this man, this is Roman Saini, he is from Ames, he has run, uh, he has the job of, uh, rank of uh, 13 in UPSC 2014 or 15. And this is Orjun Goda, he has the rank of, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, 213 in UPSC civil service, he is IS in Manipur, he is a doctor, he is a doctor from uh, Chennai. So what are the pros in the civil service, a kind of administration job? We, we roughly know about civil service, right? It's DM, IPS, or IRS, or Indian uh, Corporate Administration Service, Indian uh, Revenue Service, Railway Service, all these services comes under civil service. What are the pros? Pro, pros about the civil service. It gives you recognition. Yeah, even, after, even after 60, you will be recognized as an important person. The car will every day come to you to pick you up. This will respect, the people will respect in your office, probably in your district. Or if you can reach the higher ranks than uh, in a state, have even more higher ranks in, in country, we will respect. Shoshikanto Das, if you, if you can re really remember, he is now about put into the finance ministry, right? So he is uh, he is, he is a revered figure in all around the world. Why can't we dream being like them? Even being a doctor, we can go to the Urjun, can one be, uh, Urjun Goda can want one day, he can be the speaker, he can be the uh, finance, finance secretary. So there is a career progression which is assured, time bound, and the power comes with this rules. What are the cons? There is uncertainty. There is definitely uncertainty in any kind of job. But the civil service is not without uncertainty. So you will see some, some people have progressed regularly with time and some people have failed to do that. It's time taking, definitely it's time taking. The basic ranks of civil service takes around uh, five to 10 years. So after only 10 years or so seven to 10 years, you can be a district magistrate, the basic rank of any civil service. Then there will be political obligations vis-a-vis -a, -vis a freelancer surgeon. If I'm a freelancer surgeon, I can go to any, any hospital, I can do surgery, I can, if, I do, if I want, I, cannot, I can skip surgeries, I can just stay at home and the income, Yes, there will be limits. There will be limits in income if you are a civil servant. Uh, coming back to this Roman Saini, what did, did he do? He had a fine rank and he left the job. He left the job after two. He's a, a surgeon. He's an MBBS from um, Ames. He left the job after two years. He started his own, uh, own academy, an academy. 
you must have heard about unacademy. That's his entrepreneurship. That's a different topic altogether. Coming to the pol politics, Mr. Harshvardhan, he is our uh, health minister, right? So uh, he is a doctor as well as he is a politician. He started his career in 1960s as an ENT surgeon. Then he went into philanthropic job and finally joined politics. So our health minister is a politician. Can't we dream like that? Can't we dream the ranks of being being there, doing something good for the people? What are the pros of being in politics? The power, you know, every time this administ administration gives you the test of power, is the easy ride, and is the experience with the human handling. We do have the experience with human handling, be it at the private sector, be it the public sector. We definitely deal with people, so we know how to deal with people. That comes handy, quite handy in politics, and specialized skill set. We both have, we have uh, two kinds of skill set, physical as well as mental. What is mental skill set? We know that before the MBBS or before the MS final exam, we have to study, otherwise we will fail. So we can take the pressure out. And what is the physical skill set we have? We can do surgeries. So even after being a surgeon, even after being a politician, you can go to the uh, hospital and you can do surgeries to show that this skill is still available with you. What is the ultimate definition of power and money? Is definitely this man. I mean, this man uh, symbolizes the situation of power and money. Now, this money is yes, a little bit debatabilities, but whatever it comes with money. There are chances to work. Although this is a, just a small point at the end, but uh, theoretically speaking, this is the thing that should attract you. If you don't have this thing in your mind, then please don't go to the administrative job or politics. What are the cons? There are huge competition. Dynastic politics is going on everywhere and huge competition is going on. Not so clean image. You will lose the clean image of being a doctor. And public perception is very short-lived. One day they will put in the king's position and the next day they will put in the bottom. It's swinging in the nature. That's the biggest problem. In politics, one day uh, the party will uh, carry you in the higher ranks. The next day it will, it will throw you off. So it's, it may be the situation of a king of a one day and slow rise to the top. So uh, there are uh, many studies like median, median age of Indian policymakers at the top would be more than 45. So this is a slow rise to the top. But we are uh, all together, this talk is about after 40, right? Then comparison with the conventional career of eye surgeon. Uh, what is the conventional career of a MS, DO, DNB or fellowship, uh, an eye surgeon, right? So in a private, uh, private sector, he will start. He or she will start with the junior consultant post. In a uh, government sector, he will he or she will start with the resident. Then assistant professor, associate professor, or professor, head of the department, principal, director of medical education, head of the institution, start of own institution or chain. And in between, senior consultant or segmental head. The last point is head of the institution or head of the department. Yes, they are kind of principal or DME. This comes with a kind of an administrative job, but it's intermixed with being a doctor. It's not purely administrative job. Although this principal or director of medical education has the rank of a secretary to a government, so it's kind of a uh, you know, uh, kind of a administrative job. But the problem with this is that uh, very few people reach the top of this pyramid. Mostly retire at this phase in the middle phase. So money, you know, the basic thing that counts is the money. It's the foundation of everything. We have to accept the money is the foundation of everything. So start at the base. My figures are just indicative. Please don't get provoked by them or angry with that. So uh, in the government, we start at the lower, uh, lower situation in a private, e a little bit higher situation. And the top of the private is quite high compared to the government. So in the basic junior consultancy, it is around 70K to 1,40,000, where it is 1,50,000. And in the mid-career zone, so 45 to 50 or above 50, it will be around more than six, uh, uh, more than 45, more than 6 lakhs per month. This is all in per month's basis. More than 6 lakhs you can expect after 45. But that would be hardly more than 2 lakhs in the government sector. And finally, you settle down at 3 lakhs and whether that's more than 10 lakhs in a private sector. So what the public sector give, gives you? It gives you a respect in the public sphere. If you are appointed in a, a, a medical college, it, it, it comes with a respect clause, right? Next, teaching. If you, if you love teaching, teaching as a passion, it definitely comes with the government sector, especially being this professor, associate professor, whatever you want. Next, the public service. So if you're in the public sector, actually you are doing the public service. 
so uh, ethics is over talked i think it's the over hyped thing for all of us professionals but uh, public service is kind of a thing that should be the basic string of our all encouraging uh, you know all inspirations and that should be the underflow and that is there in the public sphere an income increases with the private practice although this is a, a debatable topic because to handle both the uh, official job as a government servant as well as keeping uh, keeping up with the practice is not so easy and it, it's difficult to handle what is in the private sector there is no upper limit for the income money is uh, you know there is no upper limit you know we all know that the independence that is huge a factor that's a very huge factor you have the independence of doing your whatever you want to that is not there in the public sector then again the sub speciality service is more developed in the uh, public sector so is it dreaming big you know if you talk about the normal conventional career services is it dreaming big this all this uh, uh, private sector job or public sector job, junior consultancy hod kind of a thing principal uh, can you tell me what is this anybody of you what is the relevance of this term anybody please okay it is smriti yeah the planning commission national planning commission yeah yeah npc has been replaced by niti aayog can you ever imagine that you can have a job at niti aayog if you in the if you are in the administration mci it has been replaced by right now nmc can you have a job at nmc after being in after being a i surgeon this is our administrative job block at uh, new delhi this is the uh, north block in the right and south block in the left can we have a job at that 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 building and this man every, i think everybody knows right please anybody yeah our uh, foreign minister jay shankar so oh, can we have a job like him as jay shankar politics or civil service are the best baby steps to have the jobs like here coming to coming to them one by one this niti aayog it has a post of assistant director it has a post of members so what are these members taken for these members are taken from the post persons of uh, having kind of a educational qualification just like us but with an added feather with a, a an experience in the administration it can be administration of public public service it can be an administration of a corporate service but has to have an administrative experience with to get an appointment in niti aayog so in niti aayog you will you will decide the basic framework of planning of indian government's uh, future 5 or 10 years so you can have an impact over india in progress this nmc there are so many you know so many controversies are going on with mci to nmc conversion there are so many controversies with uh, neat pg the exit exam the next exam coming right can't can't you think of a position of yourself where you can be at that seat where you decide what is right what is wrong we are all you know critics of the system but can't we be in the system and criticize the system from in, inside outwards we can be there but for that we need to join this administrative service in any kind join politics or if you can if you have the still age limit with under your career then go for indian civil service we go for state civil service why not and this north block and south block both this politics and civil service leads to leads to you to the here this north block and north block and south block and this foreign affairs it's a huge payment huge usually paying job if you are coming from the civil service the parks of the compensation around it's 12 lakhs 10 to 12 lakhs at least for it, for any country you will get the compensation because you are working in the foreign countries so 10 to 12 lakhs for at Dr. least what you need to wrap up fast please and uh, and uh, this this service gives you immense amount of respect so dream bigger can we dream bigger so this is a who headquarters this is world economic forum and this is the world economic uh, world parliament at who can we can't we reach there through administrative job yes all three actually gives appointment to doctors but they need to have an background of an administration or community of ophthalmology so what is the comparison between income effort and time the civil service gives you around 2 point maximum uh, income of 2.24 lakhs plus parks ifs and iss get more parks an effort is absolute exclusion you know it's absolute exclusion just like neat pg and median is 3.9 years it's a survey data in politics there is no limit as long as office of profit clause is not violated it's a full time job 
requires learning by experience. Don't take politics as a side time job. It's not a side arm, right? And there is no limit and no such study is there. How, how long does it do you require? Then the corporate administration is another term for administration, but it's a topic, topic of a different talk, probably food for thought. So it's MBA requires after post-graduation and individual entrepreneurship can be started. There are so many uh, schemes available, so many fundings available. Administration in hospital administration, administration in other fields. Even I know a few doctors who are actually working in Goldman and Sachs. Uh, why is this image to conclude? Whatever we be, be in administration or be in uh, public service, be in private service, let's not forget our roots. This is what we come from, right? This is the Bharat. This is not India. This is Bharat. And we all are Bharatvasi. So let's, let's keep it in mind. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we shouldn't forget this, this image, right? There is another India living with us. And we have some responsibility to, to do that. And probably coming into administration will help them better to progress. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, any questions from anyone? I think uh, it was slightly longer talk, so we'll have the questions at the end. Uh, next uh, speaker is Dr. Arnav Saroya. He is a third year postgraduate resident at Ambala and he's got a few publications in international journals and he's given faculty talks at various conferences. So Arnav could not be here. So I'll be uh, playing his talk. He sent us uh, his video. So I'll just share uh, his video here. Yeah. A very warm good evening, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank the entire team of the uh, all in ophthalmic society and the young ophthalmic society of india uh, and the young ophthalmic society of india to give me this opportunity to talk at the aios uc forum 2022 <laughs> my topic for today's talk is laying stress on de-stressing according to a survey published in the indian journal of psychiatry as many as 30 percent of doctors in india are suffering from depression while 17 percent of them have even thought of committing suicide this is not a very great start to the talk, but this is the uh, this is the bitter truth. Reasons for the meltdown among doctors could be many. Before they graduate to become registered doctors, doctors undergo an Apurva. We can't hear anything because you have gone on mute. Apurva, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. And seeing trauma from close quarters is not an easy job. This predisposes uh, the healthcare professionals to the condition of being diseased. Among medical students, uh, which eventually deteriorates their academic performance, and at the same time predisposes these uh, individuals to the risk of substance abuse. This causes attrition from the profession, inability to maintain an effective uh, doctor-patient relationship, failure to establish uh, healthy interpersonal relationships, suicidal thoughts, despondency, feeling of worthlessness, and even guilt, uh, which may cause further complications that eventually creep up over the years. In the long run, they end up contributing to the failure of the entire healthcare system in the country. In a country like India, where uh, we have such a competitive atmosphere, and I, coming from a city called Kota, which is called the education hub, uh, students have uh, students are subjected to a lot of uh, competition pressure, uh, which uh, causes a lot of stress. According to a recent study, which is published by the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, one in every five teenagers in India faces some sort of mental illness. Other factors which contribute to this include uh, the parental pressure, uh, the peer pressure, fear of failure, and irregular sleeping patterns because of the rigorous uh, study uh, curriculum. Growing uh, competition and uh, performance pressure is turning these Indian students, the victims of stress, which is truer for those appearing for multiple uh, competitive exams. 
starting from under graduation to post graduation uh, the disparity in the seats and the number of uh, students appearing for these examinations is huge 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 the government has um, however increased the number of seats in undergraduate as well as post graduate level over the years but still there's a huge huge shortage Uh, in 2014, there were around 23,000 PG seats in both the government and the private medical colleges, which has been raised to around 44,000, uh, which includes the uh, MDMS as well as the DMB seats. However, more than 1.5 lakh students apply each year for these seats, both fresh and the drop uh, dropper candidates. Even those who might actually make it to the cutoff list might not get their stream of choice or the college of choice. Uh, and would uh, take a drop in appear for the examination next year as well. MBBS doctors usually attempt two or even three times for PG admissions, thus uh, adding to the burden each year. Uh, even when one, uh, even when uh, the resident has gotten into his choice of college or his choice of uh, 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 residency, it is followed by more competitive exams like the super specialization exam or fellowship examinations. Getting a fellowship of choice at the desired institute is another Herculean task with variable amount of exposure at respective places, followed by stepping into the actual real world, which includes uh, tougher challenges like finding jobs, settling family, or starting their own practice. Uh, a study done by Khanna et al. evaluated the psychological impact of COVID-19 crisis on ophthalmologists in uh, training and practicing ophthalmologists uh, during lockdown in India. They concluded that out of uh, 2,355 ophthalmologists who responded, 765, that is around 32.6% had some degree of depression, which was mild, moderate, or even severe in um, strength, uh, which had and had they had a lot of uh, mental issues. Uh, there can be many recommendations to create awareness among the medical postgraduates regarding the health charge of excess stress. Periodic counseling sessions should be taken. Uh, they should be organized by the institutions as well as other bodies. Medical college authorities must organize some screening programs in their colleges to identify and treat early cases of stress and mental breakdown to prevent its late complications that we have discussed so far. Uh, distribution of the workload among the residents and optimizing the duty hours in order to provide appropriate relaxation time should be made mandatory at all levels of uh, work. If work is causing you stress, you're not alone. Nearly 44%, 44% doctors are burned out. Why we need to think about stress among young doctors? Because these can uh, cause public health crisis. Uh, de-stressing and solution. Uh, in order to uh, serve the society, doctors invariably suffer, and most of the times, like ironically, they have no one to turn to. Mental illness still remains a social stigma, and um, as surprising as it may sound, many doctors find it equally hard to defy the social norms for reasons such as doctors being uh, as doctors being incapable of treating others who are suffering from mental health condition. They themselves are suffering. Now, so far we discussed about all the uh, stress stressing factors. Now let's enter the stress free zone. How can we actually manage the stress? Uh, stress management involves the use of coping strategies in response to stressful situations, uh, and uh, adopting what's the source behind your stress. Talking to the loved ones, simplifying our life by shortening our to-do list, and learning to say no when we don't want to work. Uh, quiet our mind through yoga and other relaxing exercises, or find time to do something that you enjoy or uh, following your. activities this is this uh, simple algorithm that um, i try to follow in my daily life and it has been said by a lot of uh, wellness speakers uh, it says uh, do you have a problem in life yes can you do something about it no then why worry if you can do something about it then why worry do you have a problem in life if the answer is no then exactly why worry 
there can be various strategies of coping with stress, like awareness. The initial step is managing the stress to become aware of the stressing factors that we have. Getting organized. Coping with stress uh, in, uh, involves a lot about the planning. Uh, organized uh, time for work, family, hobbies, spiritual time, time with friends, alone time, exercise, and time for relaxation. We should visualize what do we actually want and uh, working along to uh, uh, visualize the outcome. We should not tr uh, try to postpone the action that we're taking. Coping with stress becomes more di difficult when you defer the, uh, defer the situation. Do your least favorite choices first, followed by uh, the uh, later ones, and you should uh, award yourself with some rewards. Uh, we should be realistic and set realistic goals, emphasize quality over quantity, and work at leisurely pace, taking breaks often that helps to avoid stress. Sleep, eat, exercise. Coping with stress is all about treating your body properly. Eat food that, eat food that nourishes you and get plenty of sleep, taking frequent breaks again. This will help you boost your energy, enhance your mood, control your weight, uh, strong, strengthen your bones, and even improve the memory, which is very important for doctors. We should uh, we can consider going for a walk, meeting with friends, reading. It is uh, a, a, a wonderful hobby, which is a favorite of many. Listening to music is my favorite, and even singing as well, uh, or just take a bath. Begin by practice relaxation. Uh, Technique, relaxation techniques like meditation, deep breathing exercises, or muscle relaxation exercises. This will uh, lighten the entire body. Talking about all of this, we should make sure that uh, dealing with unhealthy ways of coping, uh, uh, dealing with uh, unhealthy ways of coping with stress is should be avoided. Like smoking, drinking too much, overeating, undereating, using pills or drugs to relax, zoning out should be avoided. We should seek help if we are uh, facing any of these problems. The solution, however, lies in the basics. If we wish to deliver an effective universal healthcare in the long run, we need to bring an academic plan and uh, the work uh, working plan, which will help to lessen the uh, stress among the uh, doctors and healthcare professionals in total. So uh, in the end, I would just like to say that uh, you, you can reach out to anyone, a psychologist or even any other doctor to uh, eliminate your personal stress. And we, we can work together to eliminate the stress the, of the entire community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing Dr. Arnav's excellent talk. Uh, now, uh, I can see that um, Namrata ma'am has joined. Uh, would we like to uh, have uh, some comments from ma'am if possible? I think it was a great talk. I think uh, this is the need again, what we need to do together. And the way we work, I think there is a lot of stress. There is no doubt about it. And if you have a hobby, uh, extracurricular, it always helps to, you know, just detract, distract yourself for some time. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I would like to now invite our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Nupur Goyal, uh, who is currently working as consultant in data segment and oculoplastics at Eye Care Hospital and PG Institute, uh, uh, NOIDA. Uh, she has completed her long-term fellowship in oculoplastics and also uh, in a comprehensive one at a prestigious LVPI. She's also my batchmate from SMS Medical College, Jaipur, and a dear friend. All the best to you for your presentation. Um, thank you, Sonal, and thank you, Apurva. Hello, Anul Amrata, ma'am. So uh, before, you know, we've heard about de-stressing, etc. Let's move on to move on to a talk. I hope, uh, you know, will help you de-stress further. So before we move on, um, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would like to ask the audience, um, uh, when, you hear, when you hear the word dance, so what is the first memory or the first thing that comes to your mind? Um, Sonal, would you like to share something on this? Yeah, I think uh, my first memories of dance are the Katha classes in school. So we had to, you know, those uh, wear those uh, nice, uh, lovely dresses and sashay our arms gracefully on the stage uh, on annual function days. So those are my memories. And I think I didn't uh, totally <laughs> love it. Uh, so I left it after class 8 and took up uh, French and all. So I was not really the dancing kind. 
so that those are my memories and now it's uh, maybe limited to parties and uh, uh, i should say marriages yeah so, uh, namrata ma'am if you're around what would be your um, you know the first thing that probably comes to your mind when you hear the word dance if you're there ma'am you're asking me yes ma'am yes ma'am i wish i really could answer this because i am that way a very uh, what do you say a very uh, this thing i mean i really hardly have any hobbies except for maybe watching movies i, I can't dance i can't sing so and i can't paint so uh, uh, so so uh, you know this thing not dancing doesn't come naturally to me but i'm sure nupur does a great dance and so all uh, other all the others also who are over here and like i said you should develop it at at this stage i realize that i should have worked if you say what is a regret then regret would be this only that i never worked on any you know hobby or anything that was that i was more passionate about other than ophthalmology because you can't keep doing ophthalmology for 24 into 7 into 365 true and apurva uh, your uh, your um, uh, you know the first yeah. thing that you associate with dance which comes to your mind and well, you can just ask the audience also to probably type in the chat box and let's have you know a best response judgment maybe namrata ma'am can take a call at the end of the session we can have we have any live audience right now they can also start typing you know what is their first memory or um, Uh, the first thing that comes to their mind with respect to dance yes apurva please go ahead yes so first thing that comes to my mind is that uh, i have been told i'm good at it so uh, throughout school and college every year i've never missed a chance to dance <laughs> and uh, my some of my recent uh, performances has been in my own sangeet a couple of years ago and in my friend sangeet so i just love dancing and i dance like nobody is watching that's the that's the spirit i think that's wow, the wow. yes yes so great so with this prelude hello everyone i'm dr nupur goyal and thank you very much the ot team dr sonal dr apurva namrata ma'am for giving me this opportunity to speak on this wonderful topic of dancing your worries away i'm not here to give much gyan rather i would just share you know what i have experienced and how dancing helps me so i don't know if it helps you too so i just took a small survey at my own institute uh, you know people how what do dance mean to them and got some really wonderful um, responses from everyone a divine way uh, dr prashant uh, he feel that it's an art and i am not that artist for sure and couple of wonderful responses these are the other ophthalmologists who are good dancers my very good friends it's for them also they have the expression of dance is different for some it's fitness for some it's it's just expressing yourself it's it's just about dancing like not getting from one place to another but just just enjoying every step for some it's just just letting your head down and have fun and of course dr priya who's a very good friend it's, she says it's an ssri for her then also some people feel it makes her bond stronger so um, going further dance the literal dictionary meaning is moving rhythmically to music typically following a set of sequence of steps for me dancing is the closest thing to magic fine so uh, dance for me is a de stressor it's athletic it is about having non stop musty and fun making it has helped me make lot of connections and new friends and it has enhanced me professionally so my whole talk i would be elaborating this this acronym dance aspect uh, before that i'll just tell you a little about myself my journey as a dance i started dancing at a very early age at the age of 5 years just it just just happened you know so i am a trained kathak dancer i have given three exams uh, although not completed the course completing that is surely on my bucket list uh, participated throughout mbbs ms fellowship and now also i keep performing as in when so as you can see i started dancing at an early age dressing up this these are this is my first year mbbs second year mbbs this was one of the uh, marathi uh, uh, festivals we used to have in our college i have done my mbbs from mumbai then this we had gone for a youth fair um, in stuttgart germany uh, represented india at an international level so this was our team uh, we i was during my internship at nair hospital mumbai so during my ms as well i whenever i got a chance i performed uh, this was uh, we would go out for dandia night um, then post my fellowship after i just was dancing with my daughter at one of the ganpati festivals with my friends these are the other moms 
at a peach festival this was the aiot cultural dance then one of the events so coming to the uh, elaborating aspect de stressor i don't have to stress on the de stressing aspect of dance everybody i'm sure can associate with it it has lot of scientific uh, things to support it as well so this um, very good book uh, dr sonal has actually shared with me uh, burnout and this um, uh, actually says that you know the whenever you're stressed out uh, rather than just just following and just relax utilize that energy and the best way to have it is some form of physical activity for me it's dance it definitely helps you de stress yourself um so nothing else nothing can clear a mental cobweb faster than a good dance as apurva said dance as no one is watching you da don't dance for anyone else just dance for yourself because it makes you happy dance is the joy of movement and the heart of life athletic coming to the fitness aspect so this is my fellowship photo uh, uh, so you can see the different post fellowship i have pursued dance fitness in various forms watching youtube videos zumba videos uh, more pursuing dance and you can see the difference so yes it is it is a very very important um, uh, has a very important fitness aspect to it um so non stop musty and fun this is my uh, pg uh, time photo uh, we would just you know go to a place this is or just in our hostel rooms we would play music and just just dance our heart out you know so this is about having non stop musty and fun connections it has especially during the lockdown period it has helped me to make so many new friends um uh, we connected virtually we connected we had a lot of collaborations dance videos and uh, we now actually have a group you know where all of us have connected to dance but now we are the best of friends some of us have haven't even met but that's how also dance has helped me uh, develop so many connections and so many new friends it has enhanced me professionally it has built up my confidence people know me more so there have been couple of virtual cultural programs where i have participated it helps me surgically too it helps me keep me more focused discipline it gives me a more positive frame of mind so um, so great dancers i would say are not because of their technique they are because of their passion and i'm really really passionate about dancing i hope that you all also find this passion it's it's not about being a good dancer or a bad dancer it's it's just about getting up just just put on your shoes and just just play the music or just hum a song and just start dancing and de stress yourself so thank you so much and just just dance it out apurva if i have time is it okay if i play a video of mine um, yeah yeah go ahead yeah, yeah thank you so i'll just share the dance video if it's playing one second you all can hear the music yeah we can but we can't see the dance oh nupur uh, may i suggest can we can we have it in the end that will be yeah, yeah, like sure 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 most amazing uh, wrap up to this entire uh, sure, sure, sure. Yes. yeah uh, great 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 yeah so yeah yeah thanks nupur for that amazing talk over to dr sonal i think she'll have more to say about her best friend <laughs> yeah so uh, she she did not put up any of my pictures because i was never on the dance stage with her i need to learn some moves and i need to de stress according to her so now uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, the talented apurva uh, who's a consultant at uh, at mm joshi i institute she specializes in vitreo retina she has done her pg from uh, molana azad medical college new delhi and she is the assistant editor of ig along being assistant editor and academic in charge at yusi she is the brain behind a lot of the program that we've been seeing today over to you apurva to you know elaborate on uh, productivity today and uh, being a new mom i think she would be the best person to guide all the female listeners especially yeah so thanks thanks for the kind introduction so i am not an, any authority on this i just want to put that disclaimer out if you see my topic it says the theory of productivity 
it doesn't mean i am any productivity nerd or productivity guru here it's the theory of productivity because who am i anyway i am no authority and my number one excuse out of the 100 excuses for not being productive is that i am mom to a toddler she's 2 years old she she uh, occupies vast expanses of my time and whatever time i have left i want to switch off my brain and mindlessly scroll through instagram reels for i don't know several several minutes so i'm the master mindless scroller and the procrastinator in chief so why i'm giving this talk is because i'm fascinated with productivity i'm in awe of hyper productive people i'm constantly bugging them to share tips i'm constantly looking at productivity videos on youtube and productivity hacks so i'm basically a student i'm not a teacher so with that disclaimer i want to begin this talk by asking ourselves one major question why do you want to be productive what is it that you want to put out what work is it that you want to show so it could be work related career related so in our field it could be that we want to read more research more plan our classes more teach better create content maybe for a youtube channel create content in terms of videos of your surgeries you prepare, want to prepare for conferences all these are work related productivity next is personal growth uh, do you want to be productive because you want to enhance your personal growth it could be because you want to be fitter you want to work out or you want to nurture hobbies like nupur does it could be because you want to spend more quality time with your family or you want to keep house better like you want to be more organized you want to uh, focus on uh, your kids or cleaning cooking organizing that's a very important priority for a lot of people do you want to be more productive in the social sphere like you want to have a more vibrant social life do you want to catch up more often with friends is that important to you or you have other avenues in your life do you like do you have an alternate career like we we heard dr go speak about administration maybe there is somebody who uh, is monetizing a youtube channel about something entirely different or having an instagram page like neha will speak about in a couple of minutes or they have a leadership role in their local communities like i know one of my mentors is a leader in the youth uh, youth of india why i so that's something completely different from what he does as an ophthalmologist so i want to tell everyone that we make a list of all our priorities so you make a list of 20 priorities in your life just think about it and put it down on paper the next step is to do only the top 3 4 to 20 you need to cancel out because that's not going to happen it's not going to happen right now perhaps you may want to postpone it you may want to delegate it maybe it will get done but not by you but by somebody else who's willing to do it for you or you make peace with the fact that you may not be able to do them so the top 3 things you want to do how to do them so the main thing is time management here comes the role of routine how how to create a routine to go about doing the things that you have prioritized in order to be more productive about the three things that you have prioritized so these are some things i am a stationery lover it's like jewelry for me like i i don't know i have the biggest collection of notebooks diaries pens uh, fancy planning stickers and color pens and highlighters and i make a big deal of planning and everything i don't execute a lot of it is a different thing but yeah so this is one of my journals where it gives me the ability to have a daily plan here you can see time blocks this is what i mean by time blocks this is what elon musk also does uh elon musk apparently blocks time so this this there is something called the parkinson's law wherein work expands to fill the time you have allocated to it so suppose you say you have a class like uh, you have a seminar to prepare for and you say okay i have 15 days left for the seminar so in 15 days i must do the preparation for the seminar 
so the work will expand to fill the 15 days like all 15 days will be devoted to thinking about doing the class because you have allocated 15 days to it instead you allocate time you make a time block that on thursday and friday from 4 to 6 i will prepare for this seminar so the work will expand to fill only 4 hours instead of 15 days so maybe you will not be able to finish in 4 hours but setting deadlines for yourself is going to make you more productive so you can make time blocks like say this is just an example like you want to go to gym from 8 to 9 don't miss it this is your work timing this do some random thing sleep is also important make a to do list okay so now what about the other things of daily plan so there is this book called make time which says that do only one thing in a day one highlight of the day has to be done has to be written down and you do only that if you maybe you will say okay what what about the other things there are so many things to do if you just do one thing is it enough but think about it this way that if you do one thing every day you get it done in entirety you'll have done 365 things in a year and you'll have to you'll have a lot of stuff to show at the end of one year maybe maybe you will write just the materials and methods part of a manuscript that you're preparing on one day that's the highlight of the day i am going to write this you've done that tomorrow you'll write the results day after tomorrow you'll write the discussion your paper is ready by the end of the week so basically when you give yourself one task to do every day you'll actually get a lot more done than you know having a to do list that is so cluttered with 10 20 things to do so that is about daily plan now weekly plan is something i have uh, found to be pretty useful where you make a physical habit tracker and say you want exercise is your top priority or research is your priority you actually mark the days that you did those things and you you say you don't mark the days you didn't do those things so having so having a proper habit tracker of your priorities will be a good visual reminder of the fact that you are actually doing your priorities right so bullet journal is something i did dabble in for a couple of uh, months i have some bullet journals filled you can have an index for the bullet journal that bullet journal is a talk for one hour you can look up bullet journals on youtube so yeah so now we got our priorities in place we've got our daily plan and weekly plan and monthly plan in place so what are your goals in life so you've got your priorities now let's look at goals so suppose somebody wants to say my goal is to have 50 publications this year or my goal is to lose 20 kg this year or my goal is to read 20 books in this year so this can be very overwhelming 50 is a big number so instead of that i found this incredible gem of a book called atomic habits by james clear who talks about how 0.1 is greater than 0 so instead of trying to have 50 publications a year in which you might end up having zero by the way knowing most of us or at least knowing me so instead of 50 publications a year focus on writing 50 words a day that's it 50 words a day don't in fact if you want to write more it's fine if you don't want to write more just stop that equals all to almost 20 publications a year if you think about it every week you get in about 350 words 700 words is two weeks that's like a case report and you have like 20 publications in a year so 50 is greater than 0 so make sure you get in 10 words or something anything greater than 0 you do so instead of saying i lose 20 kg in a year you lose 1 kg and do it 20 times so or you do you lose 0.5 kg and do that 40 times that is the power of habit instead of saying i'll read 25 books this year read one book a month or read one page a day that's that's going to that's going to be greater than zero so how how to focus now we've we've got our goals in place now how do we actually do the thing like this is Do, doing the thing right now how do i get myself to focus so now if i say that today i have 4 hours and that 4 hours i am going to write a manuscript 
it's not going to happen you're not going to get 4 hours dedicated time being a full time professional having a family and having to do 100 things in the day you're not going to get 4 hours to write that manuscript instead you're going to get small small you put you've got to snatch like intervals of time so here uh, the pomodoro technique comes into play where the pomodoro technique is basically 25 minutes timer so you set a timer for 25 minutes and you do deep work don't get out of that work for 25 minutes after 25 minutes take a 5 minute break or take a longer break it's all right and then do another pomodoro for 25 minutes do the deep work just 25 minutes so in our generation of very reduced attention spans i think 25 minutes is reasonable so if you do just two pomodoro techniques or two pomodoro sessions in a day you worked for one hour so that one hour you will get in a lot of manuscript material so that's the idea of snatching pomodoros from the air and just sitting tight for 25 minutes so uh, i find this pretty useful where there are these study with me uh, videos on youtube where you see all these highly efficient people just switching on their 25 minute timer and you also plug in your uh, earphones and you sit with them and do work with them so that's that's one way so uh, a lot of us like i said in the beginning of the talk uh, we work for some time and then we take we tend to take long breaks so in those long breaks it usually becomes long because we are so much into social media like if you notice uh, when you're on facebook or instagram or whatever it is you don't know how several minutes have passed you don't know like you you spent 45 minutes one hour on some social media app so you need to set time limits for apps like i have this time limit for like if you take up the entire usage of facebook in a day it probably runs into easily one hour or more so instead of uh, social media you can either read a book or you can call up somebody and talk that will cause much more relaxation so uh, one of my last slides i think uh, so you need to be flexible so although i talked about time blocks you may not be able you may not be free from 8 to 9 because maybe uh, somebody needs you in the family your kid needs you you've allocated 8 to 9 but you you couldn't do it so don't stress maybe be more flexible you'll probably get 9:15 to 10 or 10:45 to 11 or something just just try to snatch those small small intervals and uh, one more thing is to uh, make a routine if you have a deadline to meet make sure you've done it much before the deadline to avoid any last minute crisis uh, in fact if you if you finish before those deadlines you will have more spontaneous plans and you can you can actually live life better if you have a routine so i i know most of us will say you know what i want to relax in life i don't want to do all this i why should i you know publish why should i uh, teach students or why should i do this or that why should i go work out but then these are the things that give us the long term results so actually speaking if you love yourself and you want to say no i don't want to do all this i love myself too much i'd rather relax no in fact if you do love yourself you will know that discipline is the strongest form of self love because you are prioritizing your long term results over your short term gratification so some of my sources are atomic atomic habits i cannot you know stress this enough atomic habits is something we should all read we uh, this make time and deep work are two other books and these three are like the original gangsters of productivity ali abdal and matt diavella and uh, thomas frank i urge you to watch their youtube channels for most of the stuff i have discussed thanks excellent presentation and and really uh, really very pertinent points apurva there is so much of you know uh, time being snatched away from us through all these screens i have kept my whatsapp notifications on off people have to really you know call me and say check your whatsapp so this is something that i i do personally to uh, you know try to have some productivity in uh, so uh, maybe apurva would you like to introduce uh, our next speaker who's been your uh, senior at uh, uh, your uh, alma mater perhaps Purva, you are muted. I think it was an excellent talk, Sonal. 
Yes, so ma'am. much to learn at such a young age, Apurva. You, ma'am, I, you are in talk. <laughs> ma'am, you are my inspiration. I, I've told you so many yeah, times. Yeah, but such an such a such wonderful things. Uh, <laughs> you you know just crystallized it, and I think I'm. We are going to again hear a very interesting talk about from Neha. Yes, Apurva. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So, Dr. Neha, it's it's my distinct pleasure to introduce her. She is my senior from uh, Mulana Azad Medical College. She's done her undergrad, postgrad, and SR ship from there. She is uh, one bright star in our uh, fraternity. She is also uh, have has her own setup now. She is the director of her own super speciality eye center, Tetra View, at New Delhi. And interestingly, she is uh, started an Instagram page about. how she single handedly raises her twins uh, who are really young and she does so much i think uh, i'm i'm waiting to hear from her she has got thousands of followers on instagram now so let's hear it from dr neha thank you thank you apurva for that kind introduction uh, regards to namrata ma'am nice to see you ma'am even though virtually <laughs> <laughs> and thank you sonal and the entire uc for uh, first of all congratulations it's been a wonderful two days of sessions and i particularly enjoyed this uh, session uh, a lot so before i start my talk i just want to correct you apurva because we don't want a world war i'm not single handedly raising anything or anybody <laughs> i uh, strongly believe in equal parenting and that is no, what no, no, you know what i mean <laughs> no 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 I, I, and I, and i i can vouch for it we know this also helps <laughs> so, uh thank you and um, uh to be honest when apurva sent me this topic uh, for a moment i was like oh no it's something you know which i i have not made before or <laughs> it's not something which i can dig up into my hard drives of photos and videos of retina and uh, make but then uh, i i gave it to about 4 5 days and it's been very interesting for me also to put down so many of my thoughts so um the let me start by uh, the term used for this session which is a premature midlife crisis so uh, basically what is a midlife crisis and as apurva rightly said i feel that our generation uh, you know especially with so many over achievers tend to reach it much earlier i myself have uh, spoken to many ophthalmologists uh, my colleagues my juniors and even uh, friends in other professions in in high productivity professions so as to say mbas scientists graduates uh wherein they reach a point uh, where they feel that they've already done their best you know it's it's a transition of your identity feeling your best years are behind you i've learned all the surgeries i've published so much i have my dream job what now so you kind of get a monotony of your work or your job am i just going to keep operating my whole life am i just going to keep publishing and seeing patients or even am i just going to keep earning my whole life you know this is this is what the crisis actually is uh another uh, thing which i feel talking to all my peers and colleagues and juniors is a feeling of restriction that they get or we get due to family obligations on the other hand once you start a family or once you settle down or you move to a new city you might feel that you are not able to do uh, what you want to do the way you want to do maybe you're not able to devote that much time to work um, or uh, you know you are not able to uh, publish the way you want etc so in my mind these are the two common issues that i see talking to people uh, of my generation so it's basically you know a lot of uncertainty questioning and part of dissatisfaction and frustration but what i would like to say is that it is not actually a crisis when you enter the stage it's an opportunity it's an opportunity to do more to do things differently and here um, though i am not strictly an influencer per se uh, but uh, this is something i'll i'll take you through my journey also uh, uh, this is something which struck me uh, and i went into it so what exactly is a social media influencer basically it is a person who is an expert in his or her field with some amount of credibility and following uh, with the ability to influence people's decisions uh, it may be their personal decisions it may be their um you know their buying decisions it it may be a sort of marketing or it may be a sort of publicity and uh, in this is a subset which are the bloggers the bloggers as in who uh, literally live their life on social media for people to see watch and learn 
So uh, further adding to this is uh, the term the mom influencer. So the mom influencers are ones who, like I said, use visual storytelling. So there's a lot of photo photography, a lot of videos to share their own experiences of parenting, their interests, and most importantly, their recommendations and products. And what sets them apart is that if you would look at them, literally, you would feel this is the mom who can do it all, which may or may not be true. So how do you become an influencer? Uh, basically, you select your niche, uh, which is what I did, you know, two or three points which you feel are your strengths or which uh, you can inspire people to do. Then you optimize your profile accordingly. So for instance, if let's say I have a hobby of photography and I want to highlight that, then I would not suddenly put in a video of me cooking one day or start sharing recipes one day because then I would be targeting people who are interested in photography to follow me and if they see me cooking or see me sharing more content on cooking they are likely to unfollow me so at the same time you have to understand your audience you have to engage with them you can't just be one-sided on social media and you have to solve their problems so it is uh I would say I find a lot of analogy to the medical field where uh, you know actually you are uh, engaging and solving problems of your patients as well. Uh, you have to create and post relevant content, like I said, and there has to be a wow factor in it to stand out. And from the beginning, I feel you should be clear about your collaboration policy. You are definitely going to be contacted by brands. You're going to be contacted by, you know, other influencers, etc., for collaborations. And you should be clear what you are here for, what are your expectations and what lens you will go to. Um, so why I started? Uh, so basically, I, we've talked a lot about hobbies and all. So for me, the primary purpose was to nurture my creative side. Uh, I, I am a trained classical dancer as well. And in fact, uh, Nupur's talk was also very interesting. Uh, I could have talked on that for hours. Uh, but also your creativity in art in expression of, uh, you know, what you feel uh, life is being. So this was the primary reason I started to nurture my creative side. And secondly, to give back to the community. I see so many young parents. I will not use the word mothers here because a large part of my following is also dads. So it is um, a, a lot of giving back to the community. What I have learned as a parent, uh, if I can present that information in a nutshell, in an easier way, I will be educated a lot of parents. Thirdly, uh, the networking potential is immense. So, um, you know, sometimes a, a, a part of the crisis is because all you're talking to is ophthalmologist, all you're meeting is ophthalmologist, you may even be married to an ophthalmologist, and then <laughs> at work ophthalmologist again, uh, meeting people from different spheres of life uh, is very interesting, and it rejuvenates you. And finally, of course, the recognition, the fame or the recognition it gives you. And I'm, I'm still a micro influencer. I would say but then you know when people recognize me in the park that oh you know we follow you or they see your kids and say oh these are uh, you know Dr. Momni has uh, kids it does give you a kind of kick and that is something what we are looking for whether it's in our career or in our hobbies or in our passions so this was the reason why I, I became a mom influencer from a mom and my mantra has been to inspire rather than to influence. So what I do is I simply document my parenting journey. I give out honest recommendations. I share what worked for us and also what didn't work for us. Uh, I share information on day-to-day -day topics, which, which every parent needs, every person needs, on events, on things that are happening, where you can travel, how you can travel, uh, et cetera. And uh, being a doctor, I also offer support, not medical advice, but other support. I bust myths. I do lives with people from professional fields. And of course, uh, the, I encourage other mompreneurs in this community. So uh, man is ultimately, man and women are ultimately selfish animals. How it helps me. And this is what I got down to thinking when I was making this presentation. So uh, three aspects. First is learning new things. Now, like Apurva said, that mindlessly, uh, you know, navigating social media. If you have a strategy, you can actually learn a lot of new things in a very short period of time. Not all of us have the time to read books, read entire books or listen to podcasts. But social media, if you are selective and if you are smart you can learn a lot i learned a lot about lactation support gentle baby sleep baby led weaning montessori right brain education phonics gentle parenting diet nutrition toy and book recommendations which i could 
never have uh, just reading about it. So, uh, you know, the key is to be selective and to be smart. A lot of non-monetary gains, some things I have talked about. First of all, it helped me to document what all I am doing, you know, a one-stop place for my recipes, for my activities, which even I refer to. Uh, social media, uh, it acts like, a, you know, kind of a push. Uh, it urges you to perform and innovate. I have to keep giving content. So for that, I have to do stuff. And it urges you to get up and show up. Even if you are feeling a bit down in the dumps on one day, you know that, you know, there are hundreds of people waiting for a story or waiting for a picture. And that does make you get up and dress up and, you know, go out even if you don't feel like. Uh, it, it, it tells you you are not alone. Uh, you connect with like-minded people. And as I said earlier, it gives you a kick, a sense of achievement and very quick route to uh, fame and recognition. So just to give you an example, this is what 4,000 people look like. And when you have 4,000 people uh, following you or looking at your stories or commenting, or that's a whole lot of people. <laughs> it's a lot of people that you can reach, which you couldn't have otherwise. And finally, it since you're talking about midlife crisis, it, it helps you to, uh, you know, learn new skills, new lingo, be young and stay young, you remain social media savvy. I, for one, am a person who has multiple passions and is always ready to learn something new. And this has been a new learning experience for me. Now, finally, you can always monetize your account, your, you know, your, your page, your brand, uh, you can do giveaways, you can do barter collabs, which uh, I do sometimes do because, you know, just to encourage other mompreneurs, they will send you, uh, companies will send you products and uh, ask you to do an unboxing video or just to share in your story so that they get some more orders. You can do paid collabs or brand partnerships. You can also have your own storefront with affiliate links, which you get paid for every time anybody buys from there. And now Instagram also pays you to make reels and uh, TV, uh, their IGTV videos. Uh, like all good things, this has a downside too. In my opinion, the most important is to set and to adhere to a boundary. There are things which I will not put or not share on social media. There is a certain time that I will devote to it, not more than that. I think if you stick to that, there is a very less tendency of it getting addicted uh, to the point of being harmful to you. Uh, the other downside is comparing yourself and your family or your way to others and feeling guilty. I get a lot of DMs with moms that, how do you manage to do so much? You have a hospital, you have this, you have that. So the key is not to compare yourself because obviously I don't show the entire picture. I may not show the days when I, I'm very stressed or you know very overworked and that holds true for everybody. So these are the two things you know to remain happy on social media boundaries and don't ever compare and then it's it's all uh, up game i feel mindless browsing naturally you have to be strict with yourself as a creator sometimes you can get a creator's block where you don't have content and this is another thing which i learned is you cannot always strive for perfection you have to put it out there and for people who are perfectionists like me it's it's a learning experience and then sometimes when you don't do well you know your posts don't do that well or, or uh, etc you might feel a bit disappointed as well. But to conclude, momfluencers are a league of their own, and I am uh, honored to be one of them because this has been a great learning experience for them, uh, for myself. They are relatable, funny, and, and you know, it, it's both a very glamorized version of motherhood as well as a very real version of motherhood. And the aura of moms know best is actually very lucrative for marketing and, and uh, you know, a lot of uh, I, I think it's a lot of the marketing industry is now focusing on influencers and momfluencers. So finally, a word about mompreneur, because that's in my topic as well, but I feel that's a whole separate topic altogether. So what is a mompreneur basically? A creative, multitasking woman who bravely manages the demands of running a business as an entrepreneur and the blessings of motherhood at the same time. So the key words here, I feel, is a being creative, B, multitasking, and C, being brief. That is, I think, the most important. And I, I, Apurva's talk was, of course, very interesting, and Atomic Habits has been a favorite for me. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's always this debate whether you should focus on one task at a time or multitask. And me, myself, have always been an advocate of multitasking. In fact, people who do a single task only somewhat irritate me. So just to give an example, while I was attending this 
uh, session, I have um, responded to one reviewer for an original article. I have done a survey uh, for a senior. Uh, I have collated a post for Instagram and I've also picked out a recipe that I need to make. So um, it, there's no limit to what all you can do. You are the only one who has to set your limit. So the key is having clarity of thought, what you want to do, having not just a work-life balance, but a work-life home balance. And you have to prioritize and strategize. You have to decide this is what I have to do and this is what I can or cannot do or may not do. Uh, make a routine or a to-do list and stick to it. Uh, look at small goals before big goals, like Apurva was saying. You can't target 50 publications. You have to start with one or two or five. Ask for help. This, I would say, is the most important or rather demand help from people around you. You know, sometimes we tend to take on so much ourselves that we feel guilty in asking others for help and use the power of delegation. Someone once told me that if you do everything, you can't ever be promoted. So the work which you can delegate to others, always do that in order to enhance your own productivity and your own creativity. And of course, take care of your mental and physical health. Um, so thank you for your patient hearing. Uh, I just like to end by saying there's a difference in just being alive and in living and you should never settle for the first. Thank you so much, Dr. Neha. That was amazing. And I am an ardent follower of yours, like I've told you so many times. <laughs> you know that and uh, I think one thing I want to tell everyone is uh, not to be intimidated by this hyperproductive woman you don't have to do so much <laughs> yeah so yeah I, I, I think yeah like she said don't compare so I think we've come to the end of this session and uh, we've uh, got a very interesting financial planning session uh, uh, the moderators of which are uh, Dr. Shraddha Surekha, Dr. Nilesh and uh, Dr. Sonal and me also will be here. So I think the, the, the Google form that we circulated had very interesting submissions about how financial planning is so essential for ophthalmologists and Dr. Shraddha has been uh, uh, also talking about, you know, uh, uh, doing, uh, I mean, financial planning essentials for women ophthalmologists, especially, and she's been, uh, been playing a key role in, uh, you know, organizing DIY practice setups and uh, the, 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 the setting up of so many assets, ophthalmic assets. Uh, she's she's a mompreneur herself, I should say. And uh, looking forward to a great question and answer session on financial management by Dr. Shraddha and Dr. Nilesh. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, UOC and AIOS. Uh, thank you, Namrata, ma'am, for gracing your presence. It's an honor uh, to you know do this in front of you. Uh, so thank you, Apurva. So we'll start off with this interesting session. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, let's start off uh, with residents and fellows. And uh, Dr. Sonal, I think, has a few pointers to tell us how and why residents and fellows should be thinking about money. And then we'll go to the jump into the game. Yeah, um, very good evening once again to all of you who are still staying on for this, you know, panel discussion time till 6.30 on a Sunday evening. So uh, the uh, the first few things that I would want to, you know, request residents to not compromise on our, uh, uh, you know, uh, books. Uh, I, a lot of residents I'm seeing now, um, I was myself a resident till 2013 and then SRship is almost like an extended residency if you join in your own alma mater basically. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of residents just take online uh, copies and soft copies and they don't want to spend on even, you know, photocopied print versions. I'm not trying to propagate that don't buy books, but I'm just saying that uh, don't buy real books, buy a photocopied version. A print version has certain advantages to it, which is coming out in a lot of research also. So, and then the retention improves you you tend to read the whole 
you know uh, perspective instead of just you know picked up paragraphs when you are reading something online also a uh, lot of uh, memberships uh, should be taken up as early as possible in the uh, career i i feel that uh, not just yusi because i am associated with it but uh, aius dos your state membership and your city membership should be taken up within your first or second year of residency as soon as possible you have to set money aside for these things and uh, good uh, good yusi schemes are there so fbs aius is also a very good uh, you know sort of uh, uh, alternative to investing in lic or something which which maybe you know is, is not feasible at that point of time then uh, spending on uh, you know ot instruments your indirect your direct ophthalmoscope lenses and uh, some of those things which are very personalized like your choppers and rexes forceps and all should be done early enough in your career because it's not necessary that you are going to immediately after your residency is done join a place where uh, uh, you know all these things are going to be tailor made to your uh, uh, to to your preferences so going and buying things at that time rather have a look at what is available in your center would do you do you like it do you want something else you're seeing a lot of life surgeries if you're comfortable with those instruments buy them if not try to hunt for your instruments and try to make some uh, some sort of a uh, uh, you know uh, uh, space in your money planning for uh, for your future in in these are investments so books lenses you know memberships these are investments these are not uh, expenditures so whenever i i i urge residents to you know uh, take up some membership or the other many times they get an itne kharche hai ma'am how to do this also how to do that also this is not kharcha this is an investment so the way it is going to pay you back is in terms of your knowledge and that knowledge is how you are going to multiply and make money in the future ultimately what are we all doing as doctors so that is my uh, first thing so instead of you know uh, uh, maybe you know watch a few movies less or 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 you know buy some less clothes but uh, these things should not be really compromised on then your personal care meditation apps exercise after after all this that you know that would make you an excellent resident and you can have something planned for the future then comes the uh, you know question of investment proper investment ppf lic i started all of that in my residency itself although the pay was not uh, too much but then yes i i made it a point to have some amount saved up each month for putting at the end of the year uh, in a ppf then i realized that it should not be end of the year but should be as soon as possible because there's something called as uh, interest in compound interest and all that so i am quite naive on those topics i would now uh, request dr nilesh who is now back in the game after uh, residency and he's seeing uh, business side also so he'll tell us how person business finances are different perhaps thank you so much ma'am so as you have really uh, pointed out uh, uh, we need to uh, have a separate uh, thinking that there is a business uh, that we are going to take care of uh, once we pass out and that's why the investment starts uh, early on uh, as you said power of, com of compounding is uh, is uh, is like the eighth wonder uh, they tell because uh, it just uh, keeps on doubling and uh, 2 to 4 to 8 and to 16 to 32 you will never know when you are going uh, you will accumulate so, so much wealth so uh, first thing first uh, ma'am what you told uh, the investment uh, what we what they need to make so they, uh, whatever you are earning you need to divide it into uh, like if you are earning 100 50 uh, has to go for your needs so if you need to do something you have to spend 50 rupees of of the 100 that you are earning and 30 can be Uh, uh on your wants like if you want to attend a conference that is 30 like you need to buy a instrument that is that comes from a 50 rupees and then you want to attend a conference that comes from a 30 and 20 you have to save because you also need to grow and take care of your thing so uh, whatever in personal finance that we are going to talk about uh, will be from that 20 but from this uh, the 80 that you need to spend uh, 50 you need to spend on what you need you you need your uh, instruments you need your um uh, uh, surgical instruments you need to invest into into your uh, property and everything so that that goes into 50 and then 30 goes into your wants so that is one thing second thing is uh, as soon as you are going to start you you have to have a separate uh, account for your business and a separate account for your finance you start if you even if you are starting your own practice your own clinic have a business account separate and then fix yourself a sa uh, salary like uh, say 1 lakh 2 lakh whatever you think that you it is feasible to take out for yourself you take out that so make personal personal finance separate for your uh, house uh, house needs or uh, anything you want to spend but for business account that you are going to uh, keep it separate 
uh, this is the first thing that uh, I think Dr. Debashi Bhattacharya sir in one of his LDP session uh, told that you you should not take money out of your uh, uh, clinic and then spend in the evening and whatever is left then you take it uh, to home it, it should not happen like that so uh, you have to have that separate and then we will move ahead with uh, personal finance the 20 that you are saving how to go ahead with that so ma'am sonal ma'am thank you so much for uh, you know really uh, start hitting the nail on the head i should say by saying that you know first of all the two bank accounts should be separated uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm really wondering uh, after this, you know, uh, once the accounts are settled, once some sort of a saving scheme has uh, started, what are the basic, you know, insurance policies which we should take? I, I remember having invested in one health insurance and one uh, professional indemnity as soon as my uh, PG was over. Uh, I think maybe Dr. Shraddha would be able to answer that question. Right. So, so uh, Dr. Sonal, taking it forward from what Dr. Nilesh said, uh, one of the famous uh, books on fi personal finance uh, tells you that your income minus your savings should be your expenses. Okay. So people take it income minus expenses equal to saving, but that should not be the case. You should have discipline in the fact that your income minus your savings, you have to allot that out of whatever my income is, this much will be my saving, then you take it on to your expenses, which would be your wants and your needs. So coming back to the topic that you asked me about Dr. Sonal, uh, about the insurance aspect. Now, there are many insurance and there, there'll be, you know, enough advertisements about insurances all over the place. So let's start with life insurance. Now in life insurance, basically you would take life insurance. Why would you take it? You will not take it to earn money out of it. It's not an investment strategy. It is basically something that if something happens to you, your dependents will continue to leave, lead the same lifestyle. So you basically calculate all the assets that you have, all the savings, all your investments. And if you feel that that much is going to be good enough for if something happens to you for your dependents to carry on, then you don't need life insurance then you don't need to spend into that. But if you feel that is not going to be enough, then you need to go and buy a life insurance. And basically, you should go for something known as term insurance. And term insurance, you should buy it as soon as possible because lesser the age, the premiums are lesser. And then the premiums are said that, you know, over the course of years, this is going to be the premium. So that is something you should focus on. Don't go into fancy schemes, just simple term insurance. Then the other insurance you should get is a health insurance. So health insurance for you, your spouse, your dependents. And again, go for the simple policy. Just to add up because we don't have too much time, you should read up about the super top-up policy. Okay, so if you have taken a health insurance of say 5 lakhs, you take a super top-up policy of say 7 lakhs with 5 lakh deductible, you get a total coverage of about 12 lakhs. That would be cheaper than going for a total policy of 12 lakhs at the basic as a basic health policy. So just read up about super top up policy and go for it. Third thing is as a professional, you should go for a professional indemnity insurance. So in Mumbai, we have something known as Association of Medical Consultants, which has a fantastic policy. And in other places, you uh, also there would be similar organizations, but that is something you should go for. And for your clinic, you should go for error and omission policy and fire or any accident policy for your clinic setup if you have a clinic so this would be these would be the major things you focus on and the bottom line is your insurance is not your investment it is a spending that you have to do so from this we will go on uh, to dr nilesh who had something to add about emergency fund planning uh... So uh, very well put for the insurance policy, ma'am. Uh, uh, COVID has told us that we uh, two things. That first, we have to take insurance because anything can happen anytime and you need to be prepared. And second, your job is not fixed because suddenly a pandemic can come and shut down everything and then you don't have any money to spend. Uh, it was a sad situation, but a sad reality that we all saw on everywhere. So uh, what is emergency fund? Uh, emergency fund is something that you keep so that if whatever you are earning, that uh, if that earning stops, still you can maintain your lifestyle. 
uh, it is not that extravagant uh, spending that we do that that not the 30 percent of wants but the 50 percent of needs uh, need to be uh, full uh, taken care of with, with this emergency fund so the emergency fund uh, can be for your business also and should be for your uh, personal finance also so for personal finance it should be uh, at least six months of your total salary or one year of your total needs uh, it is the same thing like 50 percent of your uh, salary goes for needs so it's a six month of uh, salary or 12 months of your needs so that even if you are un unemployed for one year or you can't do your work still you can uh, complete your needs your pay your emis uh, pay tuition fees for your uh, children and anything uh, any dependent uh, thing and similarly for business also you can't have because business expenses are more you can't have a, a, a cash of uh, around uh, six months lying idle. So at least three months of emergency fund funding should be there for your uh, uh, business also, so that uh, if a pandemic comes and you you have to shut down your uh, hospital, still you can pay your uh, employees and you don't have to lay them off. So these are the two things that you have to do for emergency funding. But these emergency funds should, be, uh, should have two characteristics. One, uh, they should not be cash because cash, when you are keeping in your uh, own place, uh, there is a risk of theft first. Second, it doesn't grow. So uh, the inflation is growing at 5% or 7% per uh, year. So your uh, emergency fund at least should grow at that time. So you don't need to keep adding fund into that emergency fund. Once you are done with that, uh, you are done with that. So it, it has to grow at 7% at least. So uh, a long-term bank FD or something like that, something uh, should be looked upon. It should be safe. It should not be an equity market where share market crashes and then you your fund becomes half. So it should not be that. And uh, third thing is that whenever you want, it should be available. It should not be in a property that you have to sell a piece of land to get that emergency fund. It should be accessible. You want it today. Uh, you can have it today or uh, in a day or two. So those are the characteristic of emergency fund. So when you are planning your investment, first take an insurance. Second, you uh, build up your emergency fund and then you start your investment journey. So that is the learning that I have uh, gained during my four years of uh, the investment that I am doing. So, Dr. Nilesh, one of the ways of do having an emergency fund is basically having, you know, FDs and, uh, uh, you know, putting money in debt, liquid, uh, debt fund, mutual funds like liquid yeah. funds. So, uh, just talking, uh, uh, sharing uh, some light about that. So, basically, debt uh, is basically funds or any uh, place where you park in your cash, which will give you steady and low return. So, they are low risk but they will also give you low return. So you have fixed deposits. Now fixed deposits are something which is very common. I am sure each of our parents must have, uh, you know, trained us about fixed deposits. And right now they're very easy to make. You just click a button on your bank website and it's uh, done. You have steady assured returns and it's there since years. And, you know, they seem very safe. Now the problem is that the FDs, say they the rates of the FDs are lowering with time 10 years earlier whatever rate you got they are lowering the other thing is whatever rate is mentioned over there you will think that is your return but then that is taxed also so your eventual return that you get is actually lower so instead of that you can also think of putting money in another uh, kind of modality which is debt mutual funds so there could be overnight funds liquid funds cash funds so those are also one more way of parking your extra cash. Now, the advantage over FDs in these rep mutual funds would be that you would get, say, similar rate of interest. But if the money is parked there for three years, then that money, uh, they accounted for inflation. So there are calculations which are done wherein you eventually end up with more return than the FD. So that is something which is a little complex. Again, it would require some slides to you know understand. But uh, you should read about the debt mutual funds. And instead of FDs, you could think of parking your money there. Of course, there's uh, also something known as PPF, which is Public Provid uh, Provident Fund, wherein your money gets locked in for 15 years and you have no liquidity. But the interest which comes out of it and the money which comes out if it is tax-free so that is something again a lot of people do what you can do is as soon as a child is uh, born you can make a ppf account put minimal amount in that so that the parking the you know the 15 year lock-in period is taken care of and then later you can decide what to do with it but at least once it started then those years keep on going on so the rate of interest today is about 7.1 
and uh, it's it's again something that most indians would do now these would be the safe bets low risk uh, low return items uh, dr nilesh uh, would uh, share some details about the high risk and high gain items uh, yes. for so uh, there is a saying in investment that uh, if you have to uh, gain high returns you have to take high risk so uh, i am not telling you to take high risk such as crypto that uh, that is so volatile they give uh, much more return but they can suddenly crash like uh, like right now uh, but uh, equity is um, uh, a good option to look at because uh, it over a over like a period of more than 5 years uh, they give you positive result whatever we hear about uh, equity market that like uh, it is a satta bazaar or something uh, it is uh, it is true actually when you uh, daily buy share and daily shares, uh, sell shares it is not true when you are going to buy and keep it with yourself and uh, let it grow over over time 5 years 10 years 20 years so uh the main problem with uh, investing in equity or directly into stocks is the uh, time because uh, to pick a company there are 5000 companies that are uh, today in share market and it is growing we are daily seeing uh, two or three ipos coming in so it is uh, constantly growing to pick a company from that 5000 is uh, is a really a tough task and uh, we end up uh, asking our uh, relatives and uh, which company to invest in and then uh, invest in that and suddenly it crashes because you don't know anything about that company it should, uh, suddenly crashes and then uh, you are like uh, this is not for me and then i'll go back to fd which is giving me 4% return the equity can give you 15 to 20% return if you are really invested for a long time so uh, how to invest uh, for us for ophthalmologists practically there are only two solutions that are available one is mutual fund as sardam ma'am said uh, similar to debt fund uh, even uh, mutual fund for equity are available where uh, there is a manager that is sitting and uh, he makes the decision these are the 10 or 20 companies that we should invest in so you give him money you give him 1000 2000 per month and then he will uh, invest in those companies on your behalf and give you the returns but as uh, the manager is there so he is going to charge a fees so that is called the expense ratio for the uh, mutual fund so uh, that uh, takes about 1% of your return so if you are getting uh, 20% from the uh, share market you will get 19% from the uh from the mutual fund so uh, 1% doesn't uh, it 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 seems like very mini minuscule amount right now but uh, uh once you uh, see that uh, over long term it it uh, it can cost you around 10 to 20 lakhs on a, over a long term so uh, the second option to save that 10 to 20 lakhs is to go for a small case small case is uh, something like a, a manager is there but it is really low fee like uh, Uh, they will charge you around three thousand for a year. There also there is a manager that is sitting. They will just uh, give you these are the ten companies. Now these ten companies like for us it is uh, we know uh, with the COVID that now people are going to buy more insurance. So we will just ask them give me ten companies for from insurance. So they will tell us that these are the ten companies that from the insurance you should invest, and then you invest directly into that and you take the gain. They are going to just charge that one time fee. so small case is one another option that we can look at for equity and uh, the uh, equity investment should only for a long term goal in uh, in the financial planning you have something called a short term medium term and long term goal short term is something that you need for uh, less than uh, within one year so you have to go for a debt fund uh, or debt instruments uh, then there is a medium term goal that is you want something to do in 1 to 5 years like buying a car or something so that for that you have to go for a mix of uh, uh, a low risk equity and debt a mix of that you have to go and for long term for more than 5 years uh, like uh, buying a house or uh, going uh, uh, your retirement planning or education uh, planning for your children so that that will require 10 after 10 to 20 years you require that so that you can directly go and invest into equity you will get 20 15 to 20% return and then you can, you are going to see marvelous uh, uh, amount of corpus that you are going to accumulate at the end of it thank you so much nilesh uh, for you know these insightful comments about mutual funds and stocks uh, now i would like to ask dr shraddha regarding you know investments like property and gold um, like every around every diwali time i keep purchasing some little bit of gold or something and then uh, you know like uh, uh, men around me in my department they make fun of me and say that you know you should invest in gold bonds not in gold but you know you can't wear gold bonds can you but uh, <laughs> so <laughs> what do you have to say to that <laughs> so uh, ma'am uh, gold per se okay uh, it's considered as a strong investment option now uh, the people who are pro for that believe that you know the women 
since ages since centuries have been doing a fantastic job of accumulating uh, gold by uh, any means and uh, you know they because of them uh, the families have a very strong gold background but uh, then there are other people also that who believe that gold is not a good investment option because what happens when you buy the gold jewelry you are already losing out on some amount of the actual pricing then when you go to sell the gold gel, uh, jewelry again you lose out some amount plus during the buying and selling there are also taxation things which happen and of course the safety part of owning the physical gold uh, so it's really more like uh, if you go by actual financial calculations gold is not a very good investment options except to make uh, the women in the house happy and uh, if you calculate then it will not give you too much appreciation also but that's according to finance now for sentimental value people want to you know buy gold keep gold that's up to them whenever they have extra cash instead of jewelry what you can do is think of buying the uh, gold coins or gold bars or biscuits which that way you won't lose too much money in the making of the jewelry and all also there are something known as sovereign gold bonds so sovereign gold bonds are something which you go online and you can purchase it and it's available on your bank websites and that will you know if by logic it will the uh, appreciation would be there as a gold prices keep rising and you would get that appreciation and there are certain tax benefits also so there's nothing to you know get scared about that just go online read about the sovereign gold bonds and just you can buy it when you want to and jewelry just don't consider it as your investment just consider it whatever you are doing to make you happy the other thing is like you said ma'am uh, the other way i'll be the devil's advocate here now if you have to buy 1 kg of gold versus buying a bmw both of these are luxury items okay so if you have to convince uh, somebody uh, or the men then your bmw the cost value will reduce with time or when you buy it or try to sell it the gold value will not decrease so much so for that extra cash if you have to compare your luxury items then yes gold would be better than those now coming to another uh, investment opportunity which is property and uh, again uh, you know people are very pro property that you can use it it appreciates very nicely and you can generate income out of it rental income you can sell it and get a huge profit so yes that's again one of the options that you can look at when you have extra cash now uh, the disadvantage of property is it's not very liquid if you go to sell it you may not find buyers again there are many taxes in buying in registration while selling you will have a constant maintenance fee and a development fee and when you go to buy property you'll have to put in a large capital uh, input where in something if you compare that with something say mutual funds or something you can start off with something as small as 1000 or 2000 also so you can start small also well property would be something that you kind of you know have a large sum of money and only then you can get it also naysayers say that when you get the rental income out of property it's not so much it's just about 3 to 5% per annum which is not a very big amount that much amount if you just put in your mutual funds you can earn more out of it so that is uh, something that you need to consider but uh, property traditionally has been uh, something that indians like to buy and you know uh, there would be a story of this guy buying that much and he got so much uh, profit out of selling that much property to uh, be on the other side i would uh, give you an example that in the past 50 years if you had say x amount of money and you bought a property in bombay the uh, the, um, the cost became 100 times but the same amount of money if you would have put in bsc sensex that became 400 times in 40 years so it's not like property only appreciates again people who do financial calculations a lot of them believe that it's not like it appreciates too much as compared to the sensex so again mutual funds may be a better option to invest in so i think we've like touched up you know a little bit about the different avenues and um, and uh, i strongly urge you know all of you all to read about personal finance because that's what we are working from 9 to 5 uh, every day right for gaining money and uh, you know making something out of it the excellent books uh, the uh, like uh, this uh, finance for doctors by amar pandit and uh, rich dad poor dad and these are good to inculcate some values into our children also 
So uh, with that, I would just like to end with Dr. Nilesh, you know, kind of giving us a basic thing. Sir, you have money. How would you allocate it into the various uh, uh, types of investment opportunities that we have? Thank you so much, Amanda. It was a really uh, a great points that you put forward for uh, both uh, the uh, real uh, that uh, properties and for gold. Both both were really succinct. Uh, uh, so let's uh, make uh, let's assume that we are earning uh, hundred rupees. So as I told earlier, that fifty uh, you, you eighty you can spend. It is uh, not uh, a very small amount that we are telling you to save twenty. We are asking you to save twenty rupees only. Eighty you can spend, and uh, if you are earning. Uh, uh, say right. uh, any any a very small amount that we are telling you to save twenty. We are there is go cool. okay. So uh, uh, like you are earning uh, uh, if you are junior resident, you are getting a stipend of around forty five to fifty in most of the cities. So you can spend forty, and you are we are just telling you to spend uh, save only five rupees. Uh, sorry, five uh, ten thousand rupees. That is twenty percent. So uh, now I am going to first give you an example uh, of the power of compounding. Uh, that will uh, really motivate you. That that motivated me to uh, start investing. Uh, so, like, if you are investing just five thousand rupees per month in in all the assets, and you are getting fifteen percent. Fifteen percent is a very uh, conservative estimate. If you are really planning, you can uh, gain up to twenty. But I am telling you, fifteen percent only. Five thousand and fifteen rupees. Fifteen uh, percent for five years. You are going to get four point five lakh. For five years, four point five lakh. For ten years, it becomes fourteen lakh. For 15 years, it becomes 34 lakh. For 20 years, it becomes 76 lakh. For 25, it becomes 1.64 crore. And for 30 years, it becomes 3.5 crore. So at the end of 35 years, if you are uh, investing only 5,000 rupees per uh, per year, it might uh, for young ophthalmologists it might uh, be a little harsh uh, to start directly with 5,000. But after you enter into your uh, business and then you start growing, 5,000 will be nothing. You are totally at the end of 30 years, you are invest investing only 18 lakh and you're getting a return of 3.3 uh, crore extra. So on 18 lakh, you're going, going to get 3.3 crore. So that 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 gives you a power. So uh, if you want to get, retire at, uh, say, 55, you start at uh, 25. You have at the end of uh, 30 years, you have 3.5 crore, you can retire. At the end of 35 years, you will have uh, 7.8 or 7.9 crores. So at the age of 60, you can have that 7.9 crore. You can just uh, buy a house at Goa and you can just chill. So that is the power of uh, compounding that will give you the freedom. So uh, then you have got your 20% how to uh, invest. So as I told, there are uh, short-term goals, the medium-term goals and the long-term goals. So short-term goals, uh, you have to, uh, similarly, there are mutual fund calculators or SIP calculators. SIP is something like monthly, whatever, uh, what investment you're going to make. So you have uh, you use those goal calculators like if you want to buy a car at the end of five years, it is costing you around ten lakhs. So how much uh, you need to invest per month to get that ten lakh at the end of uh, five years? So those goal calculators are there. So for for uh, the short term and the medium term goals, go for a safer option such as uh, uh, the debt mutual fund, the uh, fixed deposit, recurring deposit, not the fixed deposit, but the recurring deposit. Every month you can keep adding on that. And for the long term goals. Uh, there is a formula that 100 minus your age will go into equity. So like if you are 30 years, 70% of your investment should go into equity for long-term goals and rest 30, you can uh, either buy gold, which is a very good appreciation, uh, uh, which appreciates very uh, well, but we should not invest into jewelry as ma'am uh, as ma'am told, because jewelry is uh, something that goes from your wants that 80% 80, 80 what you're spending, you can buy jewelry from that. For invest investment purpose, you only have to buy uh, the gold bonds. So 30% can go into gold bond. And if you are uh, really earning well and you have uh, a lot of corpus uh, lying around, you can buy uh, some property also like 5% or 10% or of your equity uh, of your investment can, can go into property. So that is the basic broad idea. And uh, it depends on uh, individual basis. Like you have to talk to your uh, planner or you have to read up more on this to plan your uh, finance. But this is the broad idea that we follow. Uh, for any uh, investment journey. So that's all from my side. Thank you, ma'am, for this opportunity.
I would like to suggest a book called as uh, Let's Talk Money by Monica Hallan. I think it's a very, very good book. Uh, I got a copy recently and I've just read a few chapters. So uh, I was uh, really looking forward to all your, uh, you know, tips and tricks. Dr. Shraddha and Dr. Nilesh have summed it up pretty well. What do you say, Apurva? Is everybody else also able to see that she's frozen? Yeah, yeah. ma'am is frozen. So, Dr. Namrata, if you're here, you want to... Uh, uh, uh... Yeah, very much here, trying to uh, trying to understand the finance part. I think uh, for people it's who are in government organizations, it is really a challenge to understand it. And the way both Nilesh and uh, uh, Shraddha, they went off, off and on, off and on, that, you know, uh, <laughs> you have to be really good at it. Because we never bother about finance because our finance is limited, which comes and what goes into investment, we really don't bother. I think Sonal will also agree with me, but yes, still, Sonal still has a lot of you know knowledge about finance. But I think this is something which is required, which should be discussed because this is something which is not given in the books, which nobody teaches and only experience teaches. So if you've had the experience, others you know will not have to go through it again. But it, it was, I was, you know, hearing the whole thing and it was really a pleasure to hear and to know about certain things. For me also, it was really educational because I myself did not know so many things. So we know where to go uh, when, you to, when you have to seek for, you know, help for finance, it's Nilesh and Shraddha. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, with Ma'am. that... Invite everyone for a group picture in the uh, uh, before uh, we close the session. Yeah. Nupur ma'am had to share her uh, dance video. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I think we are running short of time. Uh, so, yeah. You can still what share. If, yeah. If you if yeah, your okay. video is one or two minutes, we would love to see it, Nupur. Okay. Sure. And let me. You can see. Uh, no, no, we can just see the uh, screen where uh, three video uh, small icons are there. We can't see the whole dance. Okay. Sorry, guys, my Wi-Fi just got disconnected suddenly at a crucial juncture. I'm sorry. So we didn't finish, Apurva. We can't without you. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am, can we have a group picture? Did we have it, Dr. Sunal? No, 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 no. No, no, no. We were waiting for you. <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, yeah. Let's have one. If Neha is around, can she switch on her video? Dr. Digvijay? Yeah, yeah. Just switch it on. Yeah. 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 Yes. Right. Done. Right. Thanks everyone. Lovely session. Oh, uh, Thank you. Dr. You want me to share? Yes, yes, yes. yes no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Is it visible? Yes, no, but it's visible. Pag 
graceful performance nupur thank you thank you very nice yeah. fantastic so this is at 6 in the morning so that's what you know dancing is like that you you want to just do it it's and <laughs> ma'am there's no age you just have to just just put on your dancing shoes and just start dancing it's, it's those who are born with two left feet cannot really relate to this no, there's nothing like two left feet really <laughs> thank you so much very nice performance and a very fitting end to the entire session entire uh, forum in fact i would really want to extend my thanks uh, to namrata ma'am for being here and being our support she's been so kind and it's so nice of her to kind of spend her sunday evening with us <laughs> so thank you ma'am thank you so much it's such a pleasure to have you as always and uh, of course thank you to all the office bearers of uc uh, without it's a dream team really dr digvijay dr sonal dr divakan dr karan dr avnish it's it's i i'll miss this dream team i think this is one of the penultimate events that we'll organize together as a team dr nilesh is like the uh, one of the unsung uh, heroes and like uh, one of the office bearers unofficial of uc and he's just so active and proactive in helping out and he, i am looking forward to seeing him in a executive position at uc uh, nupur has uh, always been very at the forefront for so many things she's hyper enthusiastic for everything uh dr shraddha thank you that uh, yours and dr nilesh session was so informative even for dummies like me who doesn't know like the f for finance i'll be contacting you for any questions i might have so um, i would uh, like to thank everyone the mentors that uh, attended uh, the mentors of aios uh, dr namrata dr lalit verma dr nayak dr rajesh sinha dr uh, 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 santosh hanavar and the the, uh, the 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 seniors who've always uh, taken us under their wings and helped us grow from strength to strength and um, uh, thanks uh, uh, thank you everyone i i don't have any not, i don't have much more to say thank you no, a special very special thanks to you apurva you put in a lot of effort yeah, to put this together this program would not have been task mammoth task to do it thank you you guys really are a dream team you know really i totally agree it's like when you say this is going to be the penultimate event so i feel like we're going to miss you all so much you know it's like <laughs> Yeah, ma'am. They're also approachable. All of them, ma'am. Very approachable. You know, like everybody has this thing that the entire UC core team is so approachable, can so so open to new ideas. So I think that stems from you because you yourself are like that. Mm -hmm. The mentorship has passed on. It's it's amazing. It's. Really I'll just add one thing. So since we had this forum beyond ophthalmology, why don't we add a cultural wing to UC as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can head it That's for sure. <laughs> no, no, just uh, yeah. We'll have yeah. one uh, performance yeah. thing, uh, cultural evening at your pavilion also. Yeah, you so, should because, because like I said, that. no, the in American Academy of Ophthalmology, you always have a gala night separate. So maybe you can have something like this, you know, and yes. uh, it is only for you. The elderly are not allowed to come inside. <laughs> Best, ho gaya ye to. <laughs> 
so we will also thank get in so one more at the you see thing for us also Absolutely. financial planning mumbai yeah, yeah. all places yeah. you like, like mumbai yes. yeah yeah <laughs> kamla mills <laughs> yeah stop the live now